And now, Saturday Night Theatre. The Case of the Late Pig by Marjorie Allingham, dramatised for radio by Gregory Evans, with James Snell as Albert Campion and Cyril Sharps as Lug. The Case of the Late Pig. <laughs> The main thing to remember in autobiography, I've always thought, is not to let any damn modesty creep in to spoil the story. This adventure is mine, Albert Campion's, and I think I was pretty near brilliant in it. Though I must admit, I nearly got myself and old Lug killed, and even now I hear a harp quintet whenever I consider it. It begins with me eating in bed. Lug, I ought to explain, is my, um, gentleman. He's an old Borstalian, and he came straight from serving time at His Majesty's pleasure to serving me at mine. Some time ago, Lug acquired the habit of reading the Times to me while I eat, whether I like it or not. His taste doesn't run towards the literary and journalism, so he only reads the columns that appeal to him. He reads the deaths. How about this one, then? Peters. I was reading a letter. It interested me particularly because it was both flowery and unsigned. Lug laid down the paper with gentle exasperation. Know anyone called Peters, cock? Hmm? Oh, God. Peters, R.I., aged 37, on Thursday the 9th at Teverin, after a short illness. Funeral, Teverin Church. Peters? Did you say R.I. Peters? Why? Know him? Well, not now. Oh? We were at school together. Sweet little angels at St. Botolph's Abbey. Pig Peters took three inches of skin off my chest with a rusty penknife to show I was his branded slave. He made me weep till I was sick, and I kicked him in the belly. Then he held me over an unlighted gas jet until I passed out. Blimey. I haven't seen Peters since I went into the sicker with carbon monoxide poisoning. I promised him then I'd go to his funeral. Oh, get your black suit. I like a nice funeral when it's someone you know. Have a look at this. What do you make of it? Why should he die? He was so young. This what come this morning? Yes. Yeah. There are thousands more fit in the knee for the journey. Peters, Peters, saith the angel. Why? He was so strong, so unprepared. The roots are red in the earth. And the century creepeth on its way. Why should the mole move backwards? It is not yet eleven. Well? Bid out the prayer book. Don't be an idiot. I remember learning it when I was a nipper. <laughs> What's the machine, then? Uh, royal, portable, new. No peculiarities. Nothing special about the paper sold everywhere. Let's see the envelope. Oh, WC1, the old central stamp. Ah, chuck it in the fire. I don't know. Peters, you see, this and the announcement... Don't be daft. Sling it in the fire. Lug got up and waddled out with the tray. R.I. Peters. It was Pig, all right. I remember him booting me to persuade me to call him Rip. He was the major evil in my life, along with the devil, injustice, and Latin prose. When he fed my collection of leaf skeletons to the junior study fire, I wished he was dead. Remembering the incident twenty years later, I was mildly surprised to find that I still did. I just did a look at the map. Know where Tevering is? Should I? A couple of miles west of Keepsake. We can pop into Eyewaters and see Sir Leo. Oh, I don't know. And Miss Janet. I suppose that's what decided me. Sir Leo Persuivant is chief constable of the county and a lovely old boy. He's got a daughter, Janet. I still like her, in spite of everything. <laughs> tethering. It was hardly en fait, a ploughed hill with a huddle of cottages on it. The churchyard in late winter was a sodden mass of dead cow parsley, overgrown and pathetic. Peters had been an ordinary unlovable sort of twerp, 
and he was being buried in an ordinary, unloved sort of way. I began to wish I hadn't bothered coming. But then, as we were standing by the graveside in the light rain... ...to take to himself the soul of our dear brother here departed. We therefore commit his body to the ground. <coughs> earth to earth, ashes to ashes. Good Lord, dust watch it. To dust. Pig, you always to have me in with him. What's the matter? Of the resurrection to eternal life I'd know it anywhere. What are you Christ. twittering about? Pig had Without several revolting habits, body, even at twelve and a half. Like One of them was a particularly vicious way of clearing his throat. According to the mighty I've just heard it for the first time in twenty years. Amen. <clears throat> Four others had come to see Pig laid to rest. A pleasant, stolid-looking chap, a girl in rather flashy black, a rather nasty old man, and... Whip it! What are you doing here? Uh, oh, <clears throat> well... You see, I, um... He didn't answer, and without thinking, I raised my hand to clip him. He never did answer unless he was clipped, and force of habit was too much for me. Gilbert Whippet had been my junior at St. Botolph's. I hadn't seen him for 15 years, but he still looked the same. It's about as easy to describe Whippet as water or a sound in the night. I can't really say what he looks like, though presumably he's got a face, since it would be an omission I'd be sure to observe. Somehow, he made me unreasonably angry. Whippet! What are you doing at Pig's funeral? I, uh, uh, was invited, uh, I think. Uh, yes, look, I had this. Came this morning. Uh, why should he die? He was so young. There are thousands more fitting than he for the journey. Uh, goes on in the same vein. Here. Odd. About the mole, I mean. Informal invitation, I suppose. Uh, I, um, uh, I came. He drifted away as though there were nothing to keep him in place. He left the letter in my hand. It was identical to the one that I had received that same morning. As I came out of the churchyard, I noticed the stolid, pleasant-looking chap glance at me inquiringly. I went over to him, wondering how to put the question that was in my mind. He helped me out. Sad business. Quite young. Did you know him? I don't know. I mean, I was at school with an R.I. Peters, and when I saw the Times this morning, I thought... When I got here, I, I felt... I felt it must be some other Peters. Big man, too fat. Uh, sandy hair and light lashes. Went to school at Cheapskate. Yes, that was the man I knew. Mm, sad business. He came to me after an appendicectomy. Shouldn't have had it, really. Weak heart. Picked up a touch of pneumonia on the way down. Well, I see. Couldn't save him, poor chap. I'm in practice here, round the nursing home over the hill, taking a few convalescents. Never had a death here. We stood there chatting aimlessly for a while, and then I went back to town. I didn't call into High Waters to see Leo and Janet. I wasn't in the mood. Pig's funeral had rattled me somehow, left a sort of half-heard echo in my ears. Later, I looked out some old-school photographs and had a good look at him. You could see even then what he was going to turn into. But it was nothing to get excited about. He was dead. I shouldn't see him again. Well, all that was in January. By June, I'd forgotten the fellow. And then Janet, uh, Janet Persuivant, rang up. I'd never heard her hysterical before. She was twittering into the phone like a nest of sparrows. It's horrible. Leo wants you to come at once. I, I can't see it over the phone, but Leo says it's... Uh, listen, Albert. M for mother, U for uh, unicorn, R for rabbit, D for darling, R for Arthur... No, 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 I mean R for... Uh, no, E for... What? Oh, Albert, murder. Hang on. I'll be there. Leo was standing on the steps of High Waters when Lug and I drove up. He came down to the car and grasped my hand. Uh, Janet told you. Yes. Not a word, not a word. Move over. Uh, the mortuary is behind the police station. I'll direct you. Uh, now, my boy, I want your opinion. We're going to trust you. I haven't put a thought in your mind. I haven't influenced you in any way, right? No, sir. Good. In here. There, under the sheet. Take a look. I said nothing. Lying on the table was the body of Pig Peters. He was unmistakable, and I knew without touching his limp, podgy hand that he hadn't been dead for twelve hours. Yet in January, and this was June. Dead. What? Huh? Damnable cad, though. Or not to say it, perhaps, but... You knew him? I met him. Had a most unpleasant interview with him only last night. Rather awkward in the circumstances. What was he calling himself? 
Ah, alias, eh? Very likely. It never occurred to me. Um, Harris. Oswald Harris. More money than was good for him. And the manners of an enemy NCO. Terrible fella. See the wound. It's hard not to. It looks as if he's been kicked through a felt hat by a cart horse. Yeah, very good. Damn nearly right. A substitute urn for cart horse and you bang on the button. Urn? Geranium urn. Stone. Big so-called ornamental thing. Madness to keep him on the parapet. Always said so. So, a stone urn fell off a parapet. Oh, and... very good, very good. Except the fell part. What? No way around it. The urn was one of several, all firm as the rock of Gibraltar. Must have been pushed. I see. Damned awkward. Still, I thought you'd agree with me. Seen all you want? I glanced down at the corpse. Pig, certainly. Dead again five months after the funeral. There was enough mystery in the business already. I kept my contribution to myself. I let the sheet fall back. I couldn't believe that Leo had dragged me down here just to confirm his suspicion that Pig had died from a bang on the head. There was more to come. I'd like to have a talk with you. Private matters. We'll get out of Halt Nights. See poor Poppy. Have a look at one or two things. Halt Nights? Is that where it happened? Uh, come on. Getting chilly in here. As we walked to the Lagonda, I considered the business. Halt Nights. You see... If Keepsake is a sort of county Eden, which I suppose it is, Halt Nights, well, that's the Rose Garden. Keepsake's as perfect a village as you can imagine. Norman Church, Village Green, two splendid pubs. On one side it's got an estuary, on the other a ring of modest estates. Halt Nights is the largest. It was run down for a long time, just a millstone round someone's noble neck. Then Poppy Ballou retired from the stage and bought it, and, well, she turned it into the finest hotel and country pub in the kingdom, with an 18-hole golf course attached, all very lazy and homely and comfortable. And now... But we'd reached the cars by then. Leo was looking at Lug with mistrust. I stepped in. Ah, uh, Lug, um, I'm going to drive Sir Leo over to Halt Nights. You'd better go back to High Waters. Take a bus or something. A bus? A Bus? Yes. Uh, one of those big green things. You must have seen them about. Extraordinary fellow, your man. Saved your life in the war, did he? Good Lord, no. Why? Well, it just crossed my mind. Serious business, this, you know. Yeah? Uh, more than half a dozen good fellows, including myself. We're in a good mind to put that Harris chap out of the way last night. What? Well, one of us must have lost his head. I'd better stop the car. You see, uh, Harris was going to buy Holt Knights. Buy the Knights? How on well, earth? Well, Bobby was a bit in debt, apparently. She'd accepted a mortgage from some fella in London. Nice chap, good terms. Seems he was an agent for Harris. I see. Harris came to the hotel and started bragging, throwing his weight about. Said he was going to rip up the golf course, close the hotel, build a dog track, a dance hall, a fun fair, buy up some of the other estates, perhaps. He would have killed the village. Yes. Killed it. We tried to buy the mortgage back, me and some of the other fellas. He wouldn't have it. He was such a bore. And then this morning... He was sleeping in a deck chair and an urn fell on his head. Damned awkward, Captain. Halt nights on a June evening. Breathtaking. The lawn rises to the Georgian facade of crushed strawberry brick and the high chestnuts mass behind. As we pulled up, the place seemed deserted. I decided to have a look at the spot straight away. Leo led me round to the terrace where the deck chairs, flimsy and oddly Japanese-looking in their bright colours, straggled along under the windows. There, under that sack. Just fell off the parapet and... Uh... Good Lord! This must weigh the best part of a hundredweight. Yeah. I'm surprised it didn't smash him to pulp. Oh, well, glancing blow, my boy. Uh, there's the chair over there. Good Lord. Yeah, a heap of firewood, huh? He was out here by himself, you know, snoozing. We were playing cards in the lounge. None of us would speak to him. Childish, if you like, but there you are. The fellow was an unmitigated tick. 
The clouds are blowing up. What? Oh, there's Poppy. Let's go in. Albert, Albert, good to see you. Mm. Leo, you're a lamb to send for him. Come and have a drink. Isn't it awful? Such a horrid man, Harry. Has Leo told you how he tried to see It's not easy to describe Poppy. Over 50, I suppose. Tight grey curls, wide mouth, enormous blue eyes. That's the easy part. The rest? Well, she's friendly, generous, with a sort of naive obstinacy. She dresses with enough frills to rig a frigate. It suits her nature, if not her figure. You see her you and you see like her. That's all there is to it. But it was very wrong of someone. I'm not being silly, am I, Albert? I did tell them it was dangerous. I said it would lead to trouble. To what? Last night, when... Haven't you told him? Uh, well, I... But you must. It's not fair. Oh, I, I, I was coming to it. Uh, I only had him down here half an hour. It was like this. Two or three of the more hearty old pets hatched a plot. Mm -hmm. They were going to get Harris drunk and get him to sign a document relinquishing the option, right? Well, uh, yes. I told them it was dishonest. I said it wouldn't work and, well, it didn't. Uh, Harris just got truculent and passed out. We had to put him to bed. He went to sleep it off on the terrace next morning and that beastly thing fell on him. Awkward, you see. Damned awkward. Leo's Inspector Percy. A pusey. Such a nice man. He's been through the servants with a tooth comb. Hasn't found a thing. Not even a brain, poor ducks. So, <clears throat> it looks like one of the guests. And I only have such dear people. There's going to be a hellish scandal. I think I'd better see that parapet. Be careful, my boy. The slates aren't all they should be. Well... Any theory I might have had about a feather-brained cat is out of the question. I know. Someone must have lifted the thing up before they pushed it out. The parapet's wet here, just underneath where the urn would have stood. Yes, I noticed that. Do you know why it is? No idea. No water anywhere else on the parapet. No. <coughs> but it must have been under the urn. Yeah, look there, mincing down the drive. Horrible little man. Uh, yes. Do you know him? No. Poppy seems to, though. He's been hanging around here recently. You must have a word with her about that. Uh, let's go down. I glanced out of the window and saw the little figure at the bottom of the drive. I recognised him immediately, principally because of the extraordinary sensation of dislike he aroused in me. The last time I'd seen him was five months ago, weeping ostentatiously into an enormous black handkerchief at Pig's first funeral. As I stirred the Lagonda back towards high waters through the yellow evening light, I did a bit of constructive thinking. I'm not one of those intellectual sleuths with a mind like an adding machine. I'm more like a bloke with a sack and the spiked stick. I collect all the odds and ends and turn up the bag in the lunch hour. Well, it seemed to me then that the bag was pretty well full and I had a fair idea what was going to come tumbling out. One of Poppy's guests had clearly got overprotective. A sad business, I felt, but thankfully almost over. I had no idea then what was still in store. As we drove down the narrow village street, I thought of Pig and his two funerals, past and present. I asked Leo a question, as casually as I could. Tethering? Yes, yes, of course I know it. Just across the fields. Isn't there a nursing home there? Yes, run by Brian Kingston. Good fellow. Very small, though, very small. Is he? No, 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 the nursing home, not Kingston. Big fellow, you'll like him. Yeah? Oh, dear chap. Coming to dinner tonight, just the four of us. You know him well, then? Mm, fairly well. I was playing a hand with him when this confounded urn fell and made all this trouble. And bridge? Before lunch, good grief, no, poker. We were just settling up when a shadow fell past the window and there was a sort of thud. It wasn't an ordinary thud and... Oh, damned unpleasant. Didn't like the look of him, did you? Dangerous. Thought a fellow you'd set the dogs on instinctively. <laughs> Who? That chap we saw skulking around in the nights. Told Poppy about it, but she just brushed it off. I... I think I've seen him before. Where? Where was that? Oh, a funeral somewhere. <laughs> Very likely. As we rolled up the drive to High Waters, Janet came down the steps to meet us. She fussed about Leo lovingly before she bundled him off to change for dinner. Her attitude to me, however, was uh, rather different. Oh, by the way, your friend called at about half past six, but didn't stay. I said you'd be in for dinner. Lug? Oh, so that's it. What's he done now? Oh, not Lug. I like Lug. Your girlfriend. 
Girlfriend? Did she leave a name? Yes, she did. Miss Effie Rowlandson. Never heard of her. Was she a nice girl? No. No, she was not. So I went into high waters alone. Old Pepper, pottering around in the hall, doing the odd jobs that butlers do, seemed pleased to see me. Mr. Campion, how nice to have you back at high waters, sir. Thank you, Pepper. The letter came for you this morning, sir. It's on the chest. Oh, thanks. Uh, you're in your usual room, sir. I'll bring up your bags. Good Lord. I beg pardon, sir. Nothing, Pepper. Oh, saith the owl, a ho sobbeth the frog, oh, mourneth the worm, where is Peter's that was promised us? The angel weepeth behind golden bars, his wings cover his face. His wings cover his face? Why should these things be? Who was he to disturb the heavens? Consider, oh, consider the lowly mole, his hands are sore, and his snout bleedeth. Same envelope and paper as the first. A pleasure to read. Poor little Mo. Analysis lug, that's what I want, not sentiment. But, uh, help me with this tie. Uh, right. I've got four minutes to get down to the dining room. An owl, a frog, a worm and an angel are all upset because they can't find this here Peter. Keep still. Oh. Well, that's clear, isn't it? And it was Peter's that was under that sheet this morning. The same. Queer. What did he die of? Flower pot on the head with intent. Where are my cufflinks? Dad, it's rubbish, that note. I told you, chuck it in the fire. The point you seem to have missed is that Peter's died this morning. Well? The note was posted last night. So, the bloke what posted it... Knew that Peter's was going to die today. Yeah, well, maybe I was wrong. The little mole's a prophet. The puff pastry has a sausage in it after all. Botulistic, most likely. I arrived at the dining room with half a second to spare, and Pepper regarded me with affection, which was more than Janet did, I was sorry to say. I sat down and found myself next to the pleasant-looking chap with whom I had chatted at Pig's tethering funeral. Oh, Brian Kingston. I think we met before. We had a funeral near tethering, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, no, um, that chap we saw at Holt Nights, you know, Camion. Yes. Kingston says he's staying in the village. Mm. At Mrs. Swift's. Mm. Apparently, this Mr. Hayho. Oh, what's his name? Hayho. <laughs> well, apparently. Hayho? Hayho? Idiotic name must be false. I don't think so. Hayho is quite a common name. <laughs> Hayho? I don't believe it. Look, this is hardly the time to be funny, Kingston. I mean, this is a serious business, my dear fellow. It's very serious. I mean, I was saying, it wasn't. Wasn't was Hayho that serious? queer fellow at the funeral? Well, Peter's funeral? Yes. Yes, I think he was. There was an odd sort of girl there, I remember that. Wait a minute. What? I just thought of something. Perhaps we can have a chat after dinner. Did you know Peter's well? Not, uh, not intimately. He wasn't a nice chap. I think I'm on to something. Can't tell you here. But we didn't get a chance to talk after dinner. The inspector in charge of the case came to see Leo and he excused himself taking me with him. We adjourned to the gun room. Well, then, Pusey, what have you come up with? Uh, I don't know what to make of it, sir. It, it seems like we've made a mistake. Uh. But where it is, I can't tell you. I spent the whole day questioning people, and, well... And no one but Sir Leo has a decent alibi? No, sir. Everyone has an alibi. And a good one, too. They all knew each other well. One of them couldn't have done it, unless... Well, unless what? Well, go on, man, we're in lodge here. Unless all the gentlemen knew, sir. Unless you... They... Unless they were all in it together. Ah, conspiracy, eh? Is that what you think? Well, sir, it hardly seems... Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know, Pusey. It's an idea. And yet, but it couldn't have been so in this case. They would have all had to be in it. Don't you see? And I was there. Yes. Of course, sir. I was forgetting that. Oh, no, 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 no. Impossible. We'll have to think of something else, Pusey. No, we'll, we'll go over the alibis together. I mean, there, there may be a loophole. They settled down to work, and not wishing to trespass on the inspector's province, I drifted off to find Kingston. I finally tracked him down on the terrace. He was standing alone in the moonlight, smoking a cigar, and looking rather like a Hollywood leading man. He took my arm eagerly. 
chap Peters. Yes. Well, this is uh, rather in the nature of a confession. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't rob him or anything. I uh, took down his will. I wrote it out and he signed it. I don't quite see what... Uh, look, I, uh, I know I can trust you. I have heard about you from Janice. You see, uh, I altered it a bit. Did you now? Oh, not in substance, of course, in form. As he dictated it, it ran something like this. To that unspeakable bounder and unjailed crook, my brother, born Henry Richard Peters, whatever he may be calling himself now, I leave all that I possess. I do not do this because I like him. <laughs> well, it went on in the same vein. I didn't think it was decent. A thing like that can cause a lot of trouble. I cleaned up the wording a bit. Very sensible. But I don't quite see where this is leading. Well, you see, as soon as I saw Harris, he reminded me of someone. Tonight at dinner, when you mentioned the funeral, I remembered who it was. Peters? Yes. The more I think about it, the stronger the likeness becomes. Well, you see what I'm driving at? I think so. You think Peters and Harris are... Brothers. Oh. <laughs> now I've said it, it doesn't sound so exciting, does it? <laughs> anyway, I thought there might there be... There you are. I've been trying to find you. There's a call for you, Dr. Kingston. A Mrs. Bedford. Oh, yes. I've been expecting this. She's a week overdue. <laughs> I'd uh, better go. Uh, would you say goodnight to your father for me? Of course. Good night. Good night. I'll let myself out. Thank you for a splendid evening. <clears throat> Quite uh, romantic, isn't it? Out here in the moonlight. Night-scented stocks in the garden. Nightingales in the ilex. Albert? Yes? Do you know who did this beastly murder? No, not yet. You think you'll find out? Yes, I'll find out. Albert, will you hold my hand? It'll be a dreadful shock to Leo when he... he has to know. Poppy? Well, they'd all shield her, wouldn't they? After all, she has the most to lose. Go back to town, Albert. Give it up now. Don't find out. You look very lovely tonight. Your hair, your dress, it all... Oh. I'm sorry about this afternoon. I'm sorry about what I said. That woman, I know... Oh, Mr. Campion. Oh, I beg your pardon. Forgive me, Miss Janice. What is it, Pepper? A young lady has called to see you, sir. Uh... I put her in the breakfast room. Uh, uh, Miss Effie Rowlandson, sir. Miss Effie Rowlandson. I'm afraid I looked at her blankly. She was petite, blonde and girlish, with starry eyes and the teeth of a toothpaste advertisement. Her costume was entirely black, save for a long white quill in her hat, and the general effect lay somewhere between Hamlet and Aladdin. Oh, you don't remember me. Oh, I was sure you would. Oh, how awful of me to come. Perhaps you've got the wrong man. Oh, no. I remember you. At the funeral. Oh, yes. P uh, Roly Peters' funeral ever at Tethering. That's right. I do remember now. I knew you would. I just knew it. <laughs> I like that sometimes. I just know things. I knew you'd help me. He trampled on me. I beg your pardon? I don't know when I've been so mistaken in a man. He was hard. I knew that. All men are hard, aren't they? Not like him. Oh, but I ought not to talk about him like that, did I, when he's dead? If he is dead. Is he? Who? Oh, you're cautious. Roly Peters, of course. <laughs> I used to call him Roly Poly. <laughs> Didn't half make him cross. Well, it's wrong to laugh when he's dead. If he is dead. Do you know? My dear girl, we went to his funeral, didn't we? Look, I've come to consult you, Mr. Campion. I'm putting all my cards on the table. I want to know if you're satisfied with that funeral. It wasn't much to do with me. Oh, wasn't it? Well, why was you there, hmm? I want a straight answer. There was something funny about that funeral, and you know it. I'm perfectly willing to help you. Suppose you tell me why you think I can. Well, I'll trust you. I was engaged to marry Roly Peters, Mr. Campion, and then he went and died in a hole-and-corner nursing home and left all his money to his brother. And if you don't think that's suspicious, I do. Because he left it all to his brother? Well, it's funny he died at all, if you ask me. I think he's done the dirty on me. If he's hiding, I'll find him if it's the last thing I do. I came to you because you're a detective and 
I like your face. <laughs> Splendid. But why come here? Why come to keepsake of all places? Oh, I've got a friend in the village, and he's seen my photographs of Rowley. Um, a few days ago, he wrote to me, this friend. There's a gentleman in the village very like a friend of yours, he wrote. Come and take a look. Well, when I got here, I found the man I'd come to see had got himself killed this morning. So I came to you. And you want to identify him? Yes. <laughs> why me? Why not go to the authorities? Well, you see, I felt I knew you. It was a strange night with a great moon sailing in an infinite sky. Lug, peeved at being fetched out at such an hour, drove us through Keepsake, its streets empty and mysterious in the false light. Miss Effie Rowlandson shivered in the back seat with a blanket round her knees. I began to feel that she was going to be a great responsibility. Well, here we are, Miss Rowlandson. Are you sure you wouldn't prefer to save this till morning? No, thank you. I made up my mind to go through with it tonight. I've got to know. Come on. We'll see if Inspector Pews is still up. Come along, miss. No need to be scared. I tell you, sir, we could do with a bit of help. We tried the landlord of his flat in London. No good. No, nothing. It's through here, miss, if you don't mind. All right. Fine. Just a bit cold. And there's a light switch just inside the door. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of. I'll go first. Don't worry, miss. He's the only one in here. He's on a table and there's a sheet over him. So when you want me to draw it back, just you... Uh, you uh, right. Now. Oh, my God! He's gone! He's gone! What's happened to him? You, you told me he'd be here. I was going to look at him. And now he's gone! Perhaps it would be best if the young lady went home. Oh! by myself. I won't. I won't. I'll drive you down. The situation had all the unreality and acute discomfort of a nightmare. The fields and walls and hedges on either side of the road were ghostly in the false light. It was hot and there wasn't a breath of wind anywhere. Effie, beside me in the Lagonda, was shivering so much I thought she might pass out. I've had a shock. I steeled myself, and it wasn't necessary. That was one thing. Then I realised Rowley got out by himself. That sheet, it was just thrown back like someone had got out of bed. You didn't know Rowley Peters like I did, Mr Campion. He was clever. He was clever and cruel. And he's about somewhere. He's hiding. He was dead this afternoon. Since miracles don't happen much nowadays, he's probably dead still. I'm not an imaginative girl, Mr. Campion, but you read of funny things, don't you? Suppose he was to rise up behind one of those banks by the side of the road and come out towards Shut us. Shut up. There's some perfectly reasonable explanation. When you get back, have a stiff drink and go to bed. You'll find it's all been cleared up by the morning. Oh, you're hard. I like hard men. I do, really. Well, we're here. Mm. Stay by the car. Which door is it? It's the one marked club room. Expect it'll be locked. The one round here? Yes, it's that one. So you're fearfully late. Do you know what the time... Good ah. God! Whip it! Oh, uh, Campion. Hello. Terribly late, isn't it? Uh, I, I'm just off. Hey, whip it. Where are you going? Well, bed. Where else? It is past midnight, you know. What are you doing here? Well, I heard you knock, so I... Not I... here at the door. In keepsake. Oh, well, I'm staying here for a day or two. Mr. Whippet, it's gone. It's disappeared. What should we do? Ah, Miss Rowlandson... <laughs> It's very late. It's gone. Rowley Peter's body. Oh, awkward. Holds things up so. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, glad to have seen you, Campion. I'll look you up sometime. Uh, you'd better go in, Miss Rowlandson. It's terribly late. Good night, Mr. Campion. Good night. Yes, good night. Oh! Um, 
Y your foot. Y you seem to have left it in the door. I can't... Um... Look here. If you know anything about this business, you better tell me. What do you know about Peters? Nothing. I'm just staying here. Oh, I've heard the talk, of course. Uh, close the door. Wait. You, you had one of those letters. Have you had any more? Uh, about the mole? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. I've got it somewhere. But I say it's terribly awkward, you losing the body. Have you looked in the river? The river? Do you know anything? Um, do, do you mind, Campion? You're, you're creasing my dressing gown. Well, it's the obvious place, isn't it? Now. Oh. Look, it's fearfully late. Way past my bedtime. I, I'll look you up tomorrow, if I may. I don't mean to be rude, but... <gasps> What's that? Well. Good night, Campion. See you tomorrow. Good luck with the body. As I drove back to the police station, I tried to reconcile Whippet's appearance with the whole mysterious business. And why the river? Why should he think the body would turn up there? I covered the half mile in a little under a minute and pulled up outside at the same moment that another car arrived from the opposite direction. As I climbed out, I recognised Leo's respectable humber. Hey, there you, Campion. Most extraordinary business. Pusey told me over the phone. I don't like monkey business with a corpse. Not a bit like my district, indecent. Ah, oh, Pusey, anything to report? Ah, come round and look, sir. Yeah. Ah, all these windows were bolted on the inside. Yeah, yeah. I checked round at about 11 o'clock. Mm. Well, the body was here then. I was thinking about bed when Mr Campion arrived with the young lady and Mr Lug. Oh, he's inside, sir, drinking tea. Yes, he would be. Well, that's when we made the discovery, sir. Well, did the key leave your possession? No, sir. Pusey, I've always found you an efficient officer, but yes. you're asking me to believe a fairy no, story. No, sir, you see... If the body didn't go through the windows, it must have gone through the door. And if you had the only... Excuse key... me, sir, but Mr Lug and me, we made a discovery. <clears throat> you see, all the buildings in this yard were put up by a local builder. And, well, they've, they've all got the same lock. I see. Any keys missing? Well, no. But, well, we've had the builder in doing a bit of work recently. There's been a lot of toing and froing. Oh, consequently... Damned inefficient. Yes. Well, there's something else we found. Look, over here. Eh? Now, this fence was perfect this afternoon. These boards have been kicked out tonight. So this was where he was brought through. Mm -hmm. Look so, sir. Have you looked in the lane behind? Yeah, me and Mr Lug had a good look round, sir. There's nothing. The ground's too hard for there to be any marks. He was a heavy fellow. Seems very likely it was done with a car or a cart. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, sir. I think the best thing is if we wait till morning and question all those as live nearby. In the end, we left it at that. Leo drove back to High Waters and Lug followed in the Lagonda. Pusey went to bed and I walked off down the lane at the back of the shed with the moon already sinking and faint streaks of light in the east. It was colder, and I was in the mood to walk home. The lane went on for some distance between high hedges, and I sauntered on, my mind on the business. After a while, I passed through into a field that rose up to form a considerable hill, black against the sky. It was very dark at the bottom of the hill, and as I plodded on, lost in thought, there came down to me suddenly a sound at once so human and so terrifying I felt the hair on my scalp rise. <coughs> For a moment I stood still, prey to all the irrational fears of childhood. Then I set off up the hill at the double. <sighs> Suddenly, as I reached the brow, I saw something silhouetted against the grey sky. A tripod with something on it that I at first took to be a machine gun. It was a telescope. A very good day to you. Yes. Good day. Perhaps I have the advantage of you, sir. You are Mr. Campion. And you're Mr. Hayhoe. <laughs> it'll do, it'll do. We met at a funeral. This is a most unexpected pleasure. I was hoping for an interview. I didn't expect to find you wandering about in the dawn. Most young men nowadays prefer to spend the best part of the day in bed. You're up early yourself. Waiting to see the dawn? That and other things... I take it you are investigating the death of that unfortunate fellow, Harris. Do you? Well, you needn't be coy, Mr. Campion. I can be very useful to you. Oh, yes? Yes, for a reasonable sum, I will undertake to give you certain information. 
information that it would take you a long time to collect alone, and which should lead you to a very successful conclusion of the case. Your professional reputation will be enhanced, and I shall, of course, take none of the kudos. Uh, now, the terms... Harris was a relation of uh, yours, I suppose. My nephew. Not a very dutiful one. He was quite wealthy, you see, and, well, not very generous. Nephew. Well, that explains the mystery of the cough. What? And Peters. The gentleman whose funeral you attended, was he a nephew? Well, I have several nephews, Mr. Campion. Look, I hate to press the point, but uh, shall we say 500 guineas for a complete and private explanation of the whole affair? Or, of course, we might split it up into lots, as it were. If you do know anything, it's your duty to go to the police. Oh, dear me. Is this your last word? I'm afraid so. Oh, well, uh, I gave you the chance. You can't deny that. Well, if that's all... Uh, my dear young man, don't be hasty. I can help you. Why should we quarrel? If you knew anything of importance, you'd hardly dare talk about it. Look, you don't understand. My position is simple. Safe and simple. I have an asset that I intend to realise. There are two likely purchasers. You and another party. I shall simply dispose of the goods to the highest bidder. Fine. Well, I'll offer half a crown. Let me know if I'm outbid. Wait, wait. You've a lot to lose, Mr. Campion. Suppose we meet here tomorrow morning, seven o'clock. If I can't get satisfaction in other quarters, well, I may bait my price a little. What do you say? Perhaps. Here then, seven. Good morning, Mr. Campion. And I went off down the hill. At the time, I thought I was quite justified in letting him stew for 24 hours. At the time, I didn't know the kind of person I was up against. Whenever I'm apt to get over-pleased with myself, I remember that little chat on the early morning hillside. As I came wearily up the drive at high waters, it was full dawn. The air was magnificent, the sky a translucent blue, and the birds were roaring at one another in undisturbed abandon. I had a tepid bath and slept for a couple of hours, but I was waiting for Leo when he appeared around eight. We went for a stroll round the garden before breakfast, and I put my request to him. Had a fellow watch? Yes. Good idea, a ring beauty. Hey, extraordinary name, hey-ho. Any reason above general suspicion? He tried to sell me information. Oh. In fact, he tried to sell me the solution to the whole business. What? Bring him in, bring him in. I mean, this is no time for pussyfooting, my boy. We want to get him down to the station and tell him where he stands. I don't think I would, sir. Leave him loose and see what he leads us to. Well, I don't know, but... Well, as you like. Prefer the more straightforward method myself. Oh, well, let's go in. I'll get on to Pusey. As it happened, of course, he was perfectly right, but none of us knew that then. I breakfasted alone, and Janet drifted in, tossed me a glance of faint contempt, and drifted out without speaking, two bright spots of colour burning on her cheeks. I decided, for want of anything better to do, to drive over to Halt Nights to see Poppy. I found her in the lounge. It was early, and so we were alone. She seemed delighted to see me, and, as usual, insisted on getting me a drink at once. Scotch on the rocks, as the Americans say. It's a bit early. Oh, Albert, don't be a fuddy-duddy. Here, more rocks than scotch. How's that? Thanks. Did you have any um, visitors yesterday morning? Someone who popped in and then left, perhaps? Well, yes, I suppose I did. I'm afraid I haven't told Leo about it. It's rather awkward. People down here are terrible snobs. I don't quite follow. It was hey-ho. He's an awful little bounder, but he's got to live like anyone else. Hey-ho is a friend of yours. Oh, no, not a friend. But he came to me for help yesterday morning. He wanted to borrow money? Oh, no. I mean, I might have lent him a pound or two, but you wouldn't say he borrowed money. You see... He came to me and told me the whole story. Harris was his nephew, apparently, and there'd been a lot of jiggery-pokery going on. This little tick Harris had done hey-ho out of all his money. Well, I mean, I knew what Harris was like, so I could quite believe him. I let him into Harris's room. You what? Oh, Harris was in there at the time. Hey-ho wanted to see him privately. There was an awful row, and Harris sent him away with the flea in his ear. I never told Leo. And that was on the morning that Harris was killed? Well, yes, of course. Yesterday. Well, how do you know Hey-Ho wasn't here when the urn toppled off so conveniently? 
It wasn't convenient, Albert. My God, look at the mess. It certainly wasn't convenient. Poppy. He wasn't here. He left a long time before that. I know what goes on in my own house, I hope. I know it's the fashion around here to think I'm a dear, silly old fool, but I'm not completely demented. Here, let me freshen up your glass. Thanks. And so why was Hayhoe here yesterday evening? Well, it's difficult to explain. He came to offer me his help as a man of the world. Thanks. I think he really came to scrounge a drink. I looked down at the glass in my hand and twirled the little blocks of ice round and round in the pale amber liquid. It was then that I had the whole case under my nose. Unfortunately, I only saw half of it. I hadn't had time to consider this for very long when I heard the sound of a car on the gravel outside and thinking it might be Leo, Poppy and I strolled out to meet him. But it was Lug in the Lagonda. And as I hurried up, I saw that his great moon of a face betrayed unusual excitement. Hop in. The general wants you down at the station. Got something for you. They found the body. Oh, got your second side outfit working again, I see. Oh, morning, ma'am. I'm sorry, Poppy. Leo's waiting for me down at the police station. I'll send him along when the excitement's over. Do, do. He's a pet, Albert. One of the best. Tell him I'm silly and sorry, mm. all right? <clears throat> Where was it? In the river. The river? Calm as you please. Bloke in a fishing boat picked it up. But... Dear me. Funny place we come to. First they bang a chap on the head, then they sling him in the river. Some persons are never satisfied, really. But why the river? It's bound to be found sooner or later. It's an outrage. Disgraceful. In my own village, it, it shocked me, Campion. No, there was no point in it. I mean, it's wanton mischief. Do you think so? What do you mean? I think there should be a post-mortem. What? Someone good, but someone discreet as well. <laughs> Not Kingston, for heaven's sake. Uh, anyone else locally do? Well, yes, uh, there's old Professor Farrington. He did something of the sort for us some time ago. But you can see for yourself the cause of death. Are we justified in having a post-mortem? It's always justified in the case of a violent death. Yeah. When you saw the body yesterday, did you notice anything that put such an idea into your head? No, I didn't. But this makes all the difference. Water has a peculiar property, doesn't it? What do you mean? It washes things. As I walked out of the police station, I was thinking of Whippet. Whippet and the anonymous letters. Whippet and Effie Rowlandson. Whippet and his extraordinary guess about the river, if it was a guess. I decided to look for Whippet. He wasn't at his hotel and in the end I had to go back to high waters unsatisfied. After lunch, I decided to take a turn about the garden to try to get a few things straight. It was one of those vivid summer days that are hot without being uncomfortable. As I walked down the grass path between the lavender hedges, I heard the sound of voices, and something familiar about one of them caught my attention. Two deck chairs were placed side by side on the rose lawn with their backs to me, and I heard Janet laugh. <laughs> At the sound of my approach, her companion rose, neat and cool, in his white flannels. I experienced an odd sensation, half relief and half exasperation. Whip it! Campion, found you at last. I I've been searching for you all over the place, my dear fellow. Oh, yes, where? Oh, here and there, roundabout. I've been busy. Hello, Janet. Now, this is a nice friend of yours, Albert. Oh, uh, do sit down. Mm, th there's a deck chair over there. <laughs> <laughs> Complicated things. It's been found, you know, in the river. Yes, I heard in the village. You've got a lot to explain. Yes, yes, I know. Well, that's why I've been looking for you. There's Miss Rowlandson, for one thing. And, um, ah, this. Uh, came this morning. Have you had one? Although the Skinner is at hand, his ease is in the earth. Peace and hope are in his warm heart. He foldeth his hand upon his belly. Faith is his that can remove the mountain or his little hill. Same postmark as the rest. Funny, isn't it? Do you make anything of it? No. He foldeth his hands upon his belly. Who's the he? Well, I took it to be the mole. 
his little hill, you know. Well, I suppose you both know what you're talking about. Uh, I think I'd better go now. <laughs> now that I've found Campion and cleared all this up, you've been most kind to put up with me, Miss Persuivant. My pleasure, Mr. Whippet. Goodbye. <clears throat> I'll walk with you to the gate. Look, Whippet, you'll have to explain. What are you doing in this business in the first place? Who's that girl, Effie? She's got a strong personality, Campion. Uh, I met her at Pig's funeral, and she sort of, well, <laughs> collected me. When she asked me to drive her down here yesterday, well... What about the letters? Well, you're not supposed to take them seriously, are you? Anonymous letters. Well, and yet, well, I wonder who's writing them. It's very disturbing, Campion. I'll be at the Feathers. Look me up when you can spare the time, and we'll go into it. Goodbye. I don't want to interfere, Albert. No. Mr. Whippet told me a bit about Effie Rowlandson. He did? Well, thank goodness for that. I don't think you should let her annoy him. What? It's bad enough to bring her down here in the first place without letting her get her claws into other people. I hate to have to talk to you like this, Albert, but really, you know, it is rather disgusting of you. Before I could stop her, she turned on her heel and stalked back into the house. I followed her, of course, but she had shut herself in her bedroom and once more I was given furiously to think. I went into the library, a large, old-fashioned room, cool and with the aromatic smell of paper. I sat down in a big leather armchair to think things out, but my lack of sleep was too much for me. I dozed off. I was awoken by... <clears throat> sir? Uh, sir? What? 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 what is it, Pepper? Uh, sir, the, the telephone, sir. Uh, Miss Poppy Ballou ringing from Halt Night, sir. Perhaps you'd like to take it in here, sir? Oh... Uh... Thank you, Pepper, yes. Poppy. Oh, Albert. I've got an awful confession to make. Oh, yes? I'm afraid you're going to think I'm rather stupid. It seems Hayho did come back that morning, the morning Harris was killed. One of the girls saw him. It was a long time after his row with Harris. I thought he'd gone. But the girl knew I'd given him permission earlier, so she thought it... Oh, oh Albert... Have to tell Leo. Arrest hey who? Why, well, I don't think we can arrest him, don't you know? Uh, bring him in and question him. Wanted to do that all along, but we can't hold him. But you must hold him. That's the point. We're not a tittle of solid evidence. Pull him in for something else. Trump up a charge? Well, a fellow's a blackguard, I know, but monstrous. At least keep him for 24 hours. Well, what's on your mind, my boy? You sound apprehensive. Anything in the wind? I don't know. Look. You think about the question of arrest. I'll go down to his lodgings with Pusey and pick him up. There's a constable on the place, isn't there? It's all under control, sir. He's been in all day. Good, good. Uh, that's his room, where the light is. You can see him if you look. Where? Oh, there he is, Inspector. That shadow on the curtains. He hasn't moved for an hour. Oh, no. I'm sorry, Constable. What, sir? I'm afraid you're going to be dealing with dog licenses for quite a long time to come. It was a coat and bolster over a chair, of course. Pusey stood looking at it when we got into the stuffy little attic bedroom, and he kept his temper remarkably well. From the constable's evidence, Hayho could have had an hour's start at the most. Pusey mobilised his small force with speed and efficiency. He reported on his progress to Leo at the police station around about 11 o'clock. He didn't leave by bus, and he hasn't got a car. If he went on foot by any of the main roads, he moves a deal faster than any ordinary animal. Can't understand it. Unless he took to the fields. Seems to pin it, though, this bolting. Extraordinary thing. I took a dislike to the fellow the first time I saw him. Must have been hiding in hall nights all the time. We'll get him, sir. The whole village is on the lookout and none of us here will rest tonight. You go back to your bed, sir. You can leave him to us. You've searched the hilltop. Uh, every inch. His telescope's up there, but nothing else. Besides, he couldn't get up there without being seen. Not unless he was a mole. What? <laughs> Travel underground, you see, sir. Leo drove me back to high waters and I climbed into bed for the first time in 48 hours. I was in dreamland, as the books say, the minute my little golden head touched the pillow. I only seemed to have been asleep for about a quarter of an hour when... Mr. Albert! Mr. Albert! Mm. Uh. Oh, Stroop, wake up! Mm. Mr. Albert! What? Six o'clock, he told me to wake you. Oh, God. Now, why are you bothered? I was running away from a pack of rozzers all set to jug him for murder, but he's not going to pass up his little appointment with you. Oh, dear me, no. Uh, have you rung Inspector Pusey? Yeah, not a sign. Searching all night, he said. Not a whisker. 
Oh, dear. I'll come with you if you like. Nothing like a long country walk before the dew's off the grass. Cools the feet. I sent him back to bed, dressed and went out. It was a fine, clear morning with a promise of great heat in the day to come. The sky was opal, the ground was soft and it was a pleasant morning for walking. But I found my feet lagging and I entered the hill meadow with the deepest foreboding. When I reached the summit I felt relieved. I disturbed no more than a brace of larks and the hilltop was bare but for Hayhoe's old brass telescope mounted on its tripod. I wiped the dew from the lenses with my handkerchief. The view was stupendous. Halt nights was rose red and gracious in the grey saltings. The river mouth sparkled in the morning sun and around it lay the pocket handkerchief fields. The corn high and green, the pasture browned a little in the hot weather. I stood there for a long time looking at the scene. So peaceful, so quiet and so charming. There was nothing out of place, nothing frightening or remarkable. And then I saw it. About half a mile away, in the midst of a field waist-high in green corn, there was a dilapidated scarecrow. A grotesque, unnatural creature set up to terrify the not-quite-so-clever rooks. But the rooks were swarming upon it. Mr. Hayhoe had been found. Just one, you think, sir? It looks that way. One thrust, strong and deep, over the collarbone and into the jugular. Uh, gun here, do you think? Uh, the road's just over there. The murderer wouldn't have had far to carry him. It might have been done here. There's enough blood. What was he doing in the middle of a field with a murderer, anyway? A bit of private business. I'd like an opinion on the wound. Well, Professor Farrington will be along later this morning to see the, the other body. We can get Kingston to have a look in the meantime. Ah, are we going to leave him up here? Well, we should. At least until Farrington arrives. But we can't leave the fellow hitched up out in the sun like this. It isn't decent. Pusey and I took Hayhoe's body off the piece of broken paling and laid it down among the green whispering corn. The police then brought it on a tumbrel to the little mortuary behind the station. Leo and I stood alone in the mortuary shed between the two white-covered things that had come to upset so violently the time-honoured piece of keepsake. This is what you were afraid of. Something like this. He had definite information, you see. He talked about it. But who... who's done it, Campion? Don't you see, my boy? A terrible thing is happening. It's the strangers who are being killed off. The fields narrowing down to our own people. God, what's to be done now? Come. Ah, uh, I've got Dr. Kingston outside, sir. Very anxious to help. Oh, well, better have him in. And I've sent a constable down to fetch Miss Rowlandson to have a look at... Well, the other gentleman. She'll be back any time. Good, good, good. Right. Well, if you'd like to go in, Dr. Kingston. It's, uh, this one here. Oh, dear. Oh, dear me. Quite a mess, isn't it? Well, it looks like it was done with something uh, narrow and sharp. A dagger. A trophy, perhaps. Something like, uh, like, uh, you know, the ones on the wall of the billiard room at Halt Nights. That kind of shape. Now, there's nothing to worry about, Miss Rollinson. No more nasty shocks. Are you ready? Yes. Oh. Yes. Yes, that's Rowley Peters. Are you sure? Oh, yes. I wasn't in love with him. But I'm, I'm sorry he's dead. Now, come on. Let's go back to the station and have a cup of tea. Hmm? We'd better get a statement down on paper. He used to take me out a lot. We got engaged, or, or nearly engaged. And then... Oh, Mr Campion, you know the rest. Yes. Can I go now? I'd like to be by myself for a while. Yes, of course, my dear. <coughs> Life's outside. He'll drive you home. And so it's really Peters we've got in there, isn't it? Mm. I'm not sure anymore. I thought I recognised the corpse. I thought it was Peters, but now... You can't really identify a man after 25 years, and the two brothers are obviously alive. Does it matter? They're both dead. Whereas the murderer, on the other hand, is still roaming around somewhere. Mm. Hmm? Very 
Good morning, Inspector. Ah, Professor Farrington. Uh, you've got a remarkable amount of bodies uh, here. I heard from Sir Leo what you were suggesting. It's diabolical, a diabolical thing. Then you think I'm right? Uh, not so fast. I uh, wouldn't uh, give an opinion without a careful autopsy. No, uh, of course. But she may be right. I wouldn't be at all surprised. We'll, we'll know before long. Have this sent round to me. I'll let you know for certain in a day or two. Oh, I thought... But I think I dare express an opinion. A very tentative one, you understand. That he met his death sometime before he had that crack on his head. Poison? Chloral hydrate, most likely. The bang on the head was in the nature of a blind. You've got a clever man working against you, Mr. Campion. Now, let's have a look at the other poor fellow. For two days, things hung fire, and Pusey and I collected what useful scraps of information we could. Janet developed a strained expression, Poppy took to her bed, and even Whippet was more solicitous than I'd supposed possible. I packed him off to talk to Janet, who was kind enough to put up with him. Kingston, of course, was very much in the foreground, and I even found him useful. He was an inveterate gossip with a cavalier regard for the laws of libel. Leo was perhaps the worst affected of us all. He sat in his gun room staring mournfully at his magnificent collection of sporting trophies. A mass of papers lay disregarded on his desk. We've got ten days. The inquest have been adjourned to give us a breathing space, but that means we've got to get results. Every morning I wake up wondering what the day's going to bring forth. We've got a killer at large in the village. God knows where he's going to strike next. And what have we got? Nothing. Oh, Leo, come on. It's not as bad as all that. <sighs> Kingston's put me on to Peters and solicitors. Peters, Peters. We've got two Peters. We don't know which is which. The first Peters, the one who died in Kingston's nursing home. Apparently, he was insured with mutual ordered life endowment for £20,000. Yeah, so it all went to Harris. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Interesting. But what does it mean? Oh, uh, look. Campion, I've known you since you were a child. And I know when there's something on your mind. If you know anything, you must tell me. I think I could bear anything rather than this uncertainty. Oh, Leo. I'm not sure. Well, it doesn't matter. I must know. I know how the first murder was done, and I think I know who did it, but I'm not sure. Uh, At this stage, proof is impossible. Give me another day or two. Well, I'd rather you told me now. We can't do anything without evidence. Forty-eight hours. Very well. There is something, though. Can you get a Home Office order for the exhumation of R.I. Peters, buried over at Tethering last January? Well, I could try. But, my dear fellow, no. our identification after all this time... I've got an idea about that. And it's important? I don't know. I think so. Well, I'll see what I can do. Can I use the phone? Yes, of course. Anyone interested? Dr. Kingston. Oh. Been making a bit of a nuisance of himself lately. A bit too much like a schoolboy. He should enjoy this, then. I'm going to ask him to show me round his graveyard. No, no, really. I'm glad of something different to do. It's been a quiet day. You said you were interested in the soil. That's right. Well, yes, I think there might be some kind of preservative. About a year ago, a grave digger dragged me out to see a most odd thing. He opened up a grave to put in a relation of the dead woman, and the coffin lid had come off. She'd been in the ground for uh, three years, but the body was almost perfect. How did you guess? Cow parsley. Uh, you often find it growing in soil like that. Oh. Wait a minute. You're not thinking of an exhumation, are you? Perhaps. I say. It'll be rather jolly. Uh, exciting. <laughs> I've never been present at an exhumation. Nothing fixed, so you'd better keep quiet about it. Gossip could be fatal. A question of identification, I suppose. What a stroke of luck he was buried here. In 99 cemeteries out of 100. Yes, no, but do keep quiet about it, for heaven's sake. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Besides, I don't see a soul to talk to. The following day, the third since Hayhoe had been found, I woke up with a sensation of apprehension, a premonition that things were going to move, although if I'd known in what direction, I don't think I'd have got out of bed. It began with Professor Farringdon's report. He came over to make it verbally while I was at the station with Pusey. Uh, it was chloral hydrate. So he was poisoned. Uh, well, it's difficult to decide how much the man had taken before his death. There's no way of knowing, you see. Whether when the stone crashed down on his head, he was already dead, 
or just drugged. Mm. What would the chloral hydrate have done exactly? <laughs> Made him sleepy. If you came on a man suffering from a small dose of the poison, you'd think he was in a deep, natural sleep. Mm. What about hey-ho? Oh, there's no funny business there. Very brutal. One quick thrust. Yes. It was an interesting wound. Remarkably lucky or delivered by someone who was no fool. Caught him just over the collarbone and went straight down into the neck. He died at once. And the knife? Uh, I can draw it for you. Oh. Or, or at least the blade. Long and thin, you see. Uh, like this. I left them together and went off to find Whippet. Neither he nor Effie Rowlandson were at the feathers when I arrived, but presently he came up alone in his baby Austin. I've been house hunting. There's a little villa down the road that interests me. I like empty houses, don't you? Whenever I'm in a district, I look at empty houses. We must look together sometime. Yes, well, I really haven't got time at the moment. Look, I wanted to ask you, did you ever talk to Hayho? Oh, yes. Yes, I had several conversations with him. Not a nice fellow. Tried to borrow money. Very likely. What else did you talk about? Mm, natural history, I think, mostly. Flora and fauna, you know. <laughs> some are born blind, some achieve blindness, some have blindness thrust upon them. Moles come into the first category, don't they? I went back to high waters. There, the thing I had not foreseen, the thing for which I shall never forgive myself, awaited me. Lug had gone. There may be men servants who go off without a moment's notice, but Lug's not one of them. We searched and searched, but there was no sign of him. He disappeared as mysteriously as Hayho had done, wandered into the fields and vanished in precisely the same way. I didn't know what to do. In the end, I rang Kingston. I'm glad you called me. I came over right away. There's obviously no time to lose. So what's your idea? That chap Whippet. I've been keeping an eye on him. But that's... Oh, I know. Old school friend and all that. But you don't really know him, do you? And someone must be behind all this. Well, go on. There's a house, an empty villa all by itself at the end of a partly made-up road. Whippet's been down there once or twice, poking around. I think he actually got the key from the agents. Didn't it occur to you that Hayho probably wasn't killed in that open field? It's a lonely little place, just right for a spot of bother. I think we should take a look. Well, uh, I suppose anything's better than hanging around here. All right, come on. We'd better take your car, it's faster. Straight down the hill, then left. Oh, it's all right. Pull over. No time. You haven't been sleeping. Pull in there. I've got a hip flask no. in my bag. Pull in or I won't be responsible. Here, have a drop of this. You're right. That is better. I think I'll have another. Just what I needed. <laughs> uh, can I hang on to the flask for a while? Of course. Oh, dear me. Are you all right? Yes. I, I think so. What's the matter? Feeling tired? Uh, brandy, I... I haven't eaten for some time. Perhaps I'd better drive. Thanks. <sighs> Got to get out of luck. Oh, I'm tired, terribly tired. I was aware of him pulling up and through my half-closed eyes I saw a dilapidated little villa, its white stucco streaked with many rains. At the side of the house there was a garage with a badly made drive leading up to it. I was aware of Kingston unlocking the door of the garage, and then I was down at the bottom of the car, my eyes closed and my breath coming at regular intervals. Well, there you are, my dear Mr. Campion. Sleep sound. There. Me wipe the wheel, press your hands onto it. Carbon monoxide, easy death. That's why suicides choose it so often. So simple. 
I just leave you in the car, start the engine and close the doors. The neurotic Mr Campion has done the inexplicable once again. Suicide of distinguished London criminologist. <laughs> I was too clever for you. Too damned clever. By half. That business with the hip flask was poor stuff. I smelled the chloral as I raised it to my lips. I simply didn't drink. But I hadn't realised the fellow's strength. When we came to grips, there was muscle there, and weight to back it up. Besides, he was demented. He fought like a fiend. I no longer had any doubts about the identity of the hand that put the knife into Hayhoe's neck. His great shoulders hunched against the light. He leapt on me and we fell to the ground. I nearly escaped him once. I'd nearly reached the doors when something like a vice seized me round the throat. I was lifted bodily and my head crashed down onto the concrete floor. It was like going down very suddenly in a lift. It went on and on and at the end there was darkness. I came up slowly in little jerks. I was aware that my arms were moving up and down in a slow rhythmic movement I couldn't control. And then I was gasping, fighting for breath. Look out. Look out, you're doing nice enough. Don't get excited. Steady yourself. The voice came to me like a dream, and I saw through the fog a ridiculous small boy with ink smeared all over his face looking down at my bed in the sicker. Then the ink disappeared, but I still saw the same face. Take it God. easy. Whip it. What are you... Take it easy. Lark, for God's sake, we've got to get Lark. I know. Here, here let me help you up. <sighs> oh, positively dangerous, isn't he? I, I let Kingston get away before I got you out. I, I didn't want two of you on my hands. He took your car. Come on. We've got to get to him before it's too late. A, a fellow came by on a bicycle a moment ago. I I've sent him off to tell the others. He's going to send the whole crowd up to the nursing home. I, I thought that was best. I I've got my car in the meadow around the back. Let's go to Tethering straight away, shall we? How do you feel now? Right. Now I've got a terrible vision of luck hoist up on a scarecrow stake as high as Nelson's column. Doesn't this thing go any faster? like a barracks. Where do we begin? Upstairs, quick. Five doors on the landing were open, so we concentrated on the one that wasn't. It was unlocked, but someone held it on the other side. We could hear him snarling and panting as he fought with it. Now. Wait, be careful. Through the open door, I could see a bed, and on it was a large, familiar form. The face was uncovered, and as far as I could see, the colour was natural. But as I stared at it, I saw the thing that sent the blood racing to my face and turned my body cold. Lark! His hair! It's been dyed red! What colour was Peter's? And so I saw the truth. The body of one fat man is much like the body of another when the hair is dyed and the features obliterated. Kingston was going to have a body for his exhumation after all. Campion! <laughs> It's all right, Whippet. You can come in now. Oh. I think I heard Lear's car pull up outside. It took three policemen to get Kingston into the car, and when he came up before the magistrate, there was an unprecedented scene in court. At the Assizes, the council pleaded insanity, a defence which failed, and I think justifiably. But that was later. My own concern at the time was lug. For a long time, it was touch and go. It was chloral hydrate again. Kingston didn't want any wound showing on his exhibition corpse. What the finishing process was going to be, I can only guess. I don't like to think of it even now. Lug told us his story as soon as we got him round. It was elementary. He just rang me up. Suppose he made sure you was out first. Uh, what did he say? Give me a message that was supposed to be from you. Work in town or something. Said you wanted to see me at his place first. And he picked you up? That's right. Well, that's why no one saw a car. If it was Kingston's car, no one would notice it. It's too well known. Well, anyway, he drove me to his place and he told me to wait for a while. Got me a beer. I thought he was a real gentleman. And you drank it? Well, of course I drank it. How was I to know you was leading this bloke up the garden with you? Come and hold me hand every five minutes. You stuffed him full of this exhumation, thinking he'd go for you, I suppose. 
Never thought of me. Isn't that you all over? Let's be thankful you're alive to tell the tale. Oh, I am. But what about this orange barnet? I've got to shave me head now. What me London friend's going to say? Holiday in the country? Oh, yes, very likely. Little place called Wormwood, was it? Or, or maybe Dartmoor or Brixton? During the next 24 hours, we worked incessantly, and at the end of it, the case against Kingston was complete. It was on the evening of the day on which the exhumation had taken place that Leo, Janet and I went down to Halt Nights. Leo was still seething. Bricks! Yellow bricks wrapped in a blanket and nailed in a coffin. Even now I don't see how he did it alone. He wasn't alone. He had Peters to help him. You're terribly confusing. How many brothers were there? None. Only the one inimitable pig. But why go to all that trouble of pretending he died in January? Insurance. Twenty thousand pounds, my poppet. He and Kingston were going to do a deal. Tie up with a medical man and let mutual ordered life in Darwin solve your money problems. Pig invented the brother and they killed him off together. Yellow bricks. Neat. Very. So why didn't it work? Because Pig was a crook, basically. He wouldn't pay up. Once the deed had been done, Pig had Kingston by the short and curlies. I think he kept his doctor pal on a string, promising, promising, and then laughing at him. He didn't reckon with the sort of man he was dealing with. Mad? Well, not quite. And, and what about Hayho? Wicked uncle finds wicked nephew in clover and wants to browse too. Another danger for Kingston. Yeah, I think we had him to dinner. Terrible fella. Hey-ho, blackmailed him, I suppose, after guessing the truth, huh? Hey-ho was certainly selling discretion, but I don't think he even guessed Kingston killed Pig. He made an appointment with Kingston to talk it over, and they chose the empty house. Kingston killed him there, and later on carried him to the cornfield where we found him. Oh, he deceived us all very well. I never dreamed... Utterly deceived. <laughs> Seemed a decent enough fellow. Yes, he was amazing. My arrival must have shaken him up, but he trotted out that brother story immediately and made it sound convincing. The only mistake he made was in dumping the body in the river when I said I was going to examine it. He acted on impulse. He saw his way and went straight for it every time. You ought not to have walked into that last trap he set for you. I had to. We had no proof. He'd have got clean away with the first two efforts. All the same, I don't think I'd have been so foolhardy if it hadn't been for luck. All the same? You'd have looked pretty green if it hadn't been for Gilbert. Gilbert? Whip it. Oh, yeah. We had a word or two on the phone before Kingston picked me up. We guessed that if Kingston was going to try anything, he'd take me to that empty house. But still, I shouldn't have been so brave without him. Then you know about Gilbert. How much do you know? A little. Tell me. Leo was on the point of demanding an explanation when we pulled up at the nights. We found Poppy, Pusey and Whippet waiting for us in the lounge... And when we were all sitting round with the ice cubes clinking in our tall glasses, Poppy suddenly turned on me. You've made a mistake, Albert. Mm. I don't want to be unkind, dear, and I do think you're very clever. But how could Dr Kingston have killed Harris or Peters or whatever his name was when he was in this room playing poker with Leo? Yes. Yes, that's right. Quite forgot. Just cashing in his queen pot when bang, down came the urn. You said yourself it couldn't have been an accident. It had occurred to me, sir, too. I was going to mention it. Well... I think the time has come for me to do my parlour trick. What? Uh, Poppy, when Dr Kingston called that morning, you gave him a drink, didn't you? Of course. What was it? Oh, scotch on the rocks, highball, something like that. With ice? Oh, yes. It was a blazing day. And do you know where he was all morning? Well, no, not really. Did he go upstairs? Yes. He went to have a look at one of the girls. She had a touch of flu. Uh, was he up there long? Well, yes, he was. Quite a while now, I come to think of it. But I don't see. This was a long time before that vase fell on, you know, Harris. While he was upstairs, Kingston went in to see Harris, alias Pig. Pig had a shocking hangover, and he asked Kingston for something for it. Kingston had some chloral in his bag. It's a reputable narcotic used in small quantities. He gave Pig a tidy dose, and Pig staggered out and settled down in the deck chair. Yeah, but even so, Wait a minute. I don't... Kingston was just going to let Pig die of the chloral, but that was risky. He noticed the position of the deck chair and the vase right above it. He sipped his drink and he saw his chance. But, but, but dear fellow, I keep telling you, he was with me. It was the drink that did it. He had two or three solid cubes of ice in his glass. He slipped upstairs. The rest was easy. He took the urn out of the socket that kept it in place and balanced it on its peg half over the ledge. 
He propped it up on the ice cubes and went down and played poker. Good God. Amazing. Oh, there was a risk that someone would notice, but, well, it was small. No one did. He just had to wait. Until the ice melted and the urn fell. Oh, it's horrible. Powerful smart. If I might ask you, sir, how did you come to think of that? The moss on the ledge was damp when I first arrived. It didn't dawn on me at first, but uh, when I had a drink here the other day and I saw the ice, it just slotted into place. Wonderful. <laughs> I, I was after the same fellow, of course, but the alibi put me out. Uh, yeah, Mr. Um, Whippet. Uh, Whippet, uh, very pleased to have you here, of course, but where do you fit into this extraordinary story? I mean, what are you doing here? Well, um... <laughs> <laughs> his little hands are sore and his snout bleedeth. Eh? This is Gilbert Whippet, Jr., son of Q. Gilbert Whippet, chairman of the Mutual Ordered Life Endowment Company, sometimes called the M-O-L-E. Uh, mole. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you always were a lazy little beast, Whippet. <laughs> I, I prefer writing to action. Well, I, I'm sorry to have dragged you into all this, but we had nothing to go on except a sort of uneasy suspicion. I couldn't approach you direct because, well, there was nothing direct about it. Lug and I appreciated your style. Well, it seemed the best way to ensure your interest. Whenever I thought you might be flagging, I wrote again. And you just followed the mole. When Lug and I set off for London the next day, Poppy, who had come to High Waters for lunch, stood with Leo and waved goodbye to us from the lawn. The sky was dappled blue and white, the birds sang, and the air smelled of hay. Janet, with Whippet in tow, came running out to us just before we started off. Her eyes were dancing, and she looked adorable. Congratulate us, Albert. We're engaged. Isn't it wonderful? What? Uh, oh, uh, yes. Congratulations. I hope you'll be very happy. I'm indebted to you, Campion. We drove for some time in silence. I was thoughtful, and Lug, who was as bald as an egg, seemed depressed. As we reached the main road, he nudged me. Oh, what a performance! Who's? That bloke whipping. Come down to a place with Miss Abby Rowlandson and go off with Miss Jenny Persuaven. That took a bit of doing. Lug, how would you like to walk home? <laughs> The Case of the Late Pig by Marjorie Allingham was dramatised for radio by Gregory Evans. The cast, Albert Campion, James Snell. Lug, Cyril Shapps. Whippet, Hayden Wood. Janet, Diana Bishop. Leo, Garrard Green. Kingston, David McAllister. Poppy, Judy Franklin. Effie, Amanda Murray. Inspector Pusey, Christopher Scott. Hayho, Philip Menicum. Parson and Pepper, Michael Drew. Farringdon, Paul Nicholson, and the police constable, Nicholas Orchard. The programme was directed in Bristol by Brian Miller. Now there's a bit of time in hand before ten o'clock, the weather forecast and the news. So let's have a look at the remainder of some of our programmes this evening. Offering a drink is a traditional sign of hospitality and welcome, and yet it's thought that three-quarters of a million people in Britain have a serious drinking problem. Treatment for that problem can vary widely. Some drinkers, for example, want to abstain completely, while others prefer to learn to drink at a safer level. Tonight, at a quarter past ten, Peter Evans considers some of the treatments available, as well as the reasons for their wide variation of aims. In Breaking the Bottle... Loneliness, like alcoholism, is on the increase, paradoxically, when in this age of communication it's becoming increasingly difficult to be alone. Later this evening, in A Word in Edgeways, loneliness is the subject for discussion. Here's Brown Redhead. There used to be a particularly soppy song which asked the question, Are you lonely tonight? It was really a come on for the last waltz, but it is a real question. Loneliness, or so they say, is a growing malady. 
And tonight on A Word in Edgeways, I want to ask David Benedictus, Jean McFarlane and Frank Wright if they believe that loneliness is widespread, and if so, why? What is this unwanted solitude? Well, that's A Word in Edgeways tonight at a quarter past eleven. And that's followed by another episode of Ray Gosling's On the Train to New Zealand. And speaking of trains, now from our motoring and travel unit, here's some motoring information. With temperatures dropping rapidly, driving conditions are becoming treacherous in most areas tonight. In South Wales, there's no improvement so far, as the roads are concerned. All roads are virtually impassable, including the M4 motorway and the A48, the main London to Fishguard road. A similar situation applies in the Gwent area, where the roads are blocked by deep snow. Drivers heading for the West Country will find the M4 motorway closed in both directions, from Junction 17 near Chippenham in Wilshire to Newport in Gwent, and that includes the Severn Bridge. It's expected that the M4 will remain closed all day tomorrow. Drivers making for Devon and Cornwall will find the A303 and A30 passable with care to Exeter. But after that, the A30 is blocked to Bodmin. The alternative route is the A38 via Plymouth, although conditions are bad, with the road reduced to single alternative lanes and places. Drivers using the A40 to enter Wales will also find conditions hard going, and police don't advise travelling into that part of the country at all. In Wiltshire, the A4 is closed between Marlborough and Carn, and all roads north to south are closed over Salisbury Plain. The M50 motorway is closed in Herefordshire, and the M5 is only passable with care. Well, that's our motoring information, and now here's a quick look at the weather forecast. Most districts will have bright periods, although patches of freezing fog may persist in a few areas. There will be scattered snow showers, mainly over eastern and northern Scotland. Southwest England will have outbreaks of snow, possibly giving heavy falls in places, although rain is likely at times in the extreme southwest. The snow may extend to the extreme south of Wales and some other southern coastal counties of England for a time. It will continue very cold and frosty. And the outlook for Monday and Tuesday, continuing very cold with severe overnight frost. There will be sunny intervals, but also snow in places and patches of freezing fog. That's the forecast. Radio 4. And now this afternoon, a chance to hear this week's Saturday Night Theatre from Manchester. Taxi! Taxi! Hardman Crescent, Victoria Park, please. If we can get through the floods. The rubber dinghy and oars will be better in some parts today. Oh, that bad, is it? Even worse in the south, according to the evening news. Here, see for yourself. Right. Bought it, really, on account of that Manchester copper. You know, the uh, police inspector. Oh, yeah. No wonder he was suspended, pending his trial. Working on a drugs case, he was. He'd just come back from Germany when he stopped in the street by one of his superiors. And surprise, surprise, in his briefcase, if I find 8,000 in German marks. <laughs> you don't need to be a genius to find the right answer. We find the defendant, John Christopher Rourke, not guilty. We present Brian Truman, Jane Knowles and Geoffrey Banks in The Dark Windows of a Room by William Keenan. A first production from the drama suite of New Broadcasting House, Manchester. Among those making guest appearances for the occasion are Violet Carson, Nigel Davenport, Brian Forbes, Wilfred Pickles, Philip Jenkinson and Billy Whitelaw. The Dark Windows of a Room. I said you don't have to be a genius to find the right answer, do you? Uh, no. No, but he claims the money was planted. A backhander? A bribe? That's what it was. It's the old, old story. The police stop a thief, find the boot of his car full of loot, and what does the thief say? What does the thief say? He says, I don't understand it. That isn't mine. I just don't know how it got there, officer. I think the inspector was telling the truth. Well, you're on your own there, mate. You hear a lot when you're driving a taxi, and I've been told that this inspector fellow... Rourke? Rourke, that's him. His divisional officers didn't lose much time in suspending him from the force pending further inquiries. Johnny Rourke was a bit too clever by half. Clever? 
What do you mean, clever? Oh, one of these bright young ones, straight from university. They walk up beat for a few nights and then they promote them up to inspector. <laughs> I say walk. You better, when did you last see a copper on a beat? All hiding around corners in cars. The other night in Piccadilly Gardens, a gang of six yobbos set on a bloke, put the boot in, not a copper in sight. A few of us on the rank went in with tire levers or else the fellow would have been dead. Up comes a panda car when it's all over. Well, I'd agree with you about needing more men on the beat. Aye, but some real big beefy lads. Brawn, not university brains. Here, and I'll tell you something more about Inspector John Rook. He studied history. Henry VIII. <laughs> what do you make of that? Broadens the mind. So does driving a taxi, but that doesn't make me a policeman. Ah, oh, but Elizabethan England was a police state, and the Tudors had one of the finest spy systems in the world. You seem a bit of an historian yourself. Oh, I studied the period for 14 years. You're a teacher, then? No. Oh, do you see that bloody fool come right across me? Oh, I might have known. Woman driver. Oh, I agree with the fact that women don't have many accidents. They just cause them. You know, you belt it along a straight road, then a woman suddenly appears from a side street. You swerve, miss her, and hit a bleeding lamppost. You can drop me at the next corner. Right. In the news, uh, early edition, it said the jury was out considering the verdict. What have they got to consider? Whether the money was planted or not. Well, that shouldn't take them long to decide. Well, they say we've got the finest justice in the world. <laughs> That's what the lawyers say. Wasn't always without fear or favour, though. Well, this do you? Yeah, sure. I'd wait till it eases up a bit. Look at that. Like someone's thrown a bucket of water on the windscreen. You were saying about uh, British justice in the old days, hmm? Oh, well, Tudor judges hanged and quartered many a man just because he wanted to worship the same way his father did. And all those secret panels and priest hiding holes in the stately homes of England. Well, they just got to show that Tudor justice was hardly the finest or the fairest. <laughs> you should have been a history teacher. Yeah, maybe you're right. By the way, didn't I pick you up near the Crown Court? Yes. You weren't at the trial by any chance? I was. You're a lawyer then? No, I'm not a lawyer. Now, wait a minute. You know a lot about history. You're... Yes, yes, I'm John Rourke. And just for the record, the jury gave me the benefit of the doubt. I don't care what you heard. Inspector Rourke isn't a crook. And he's going to prove it. How? Well, first by finding a phone and going back to the beginning. Here, what do I owe you? Oh, nothing. It'll teach me to button up my big mouth. Station. Extension 350, please. One moment, sir. Norris. Chief Inspector, this is John Rourke. Rourke? The jury found me not guilty. Uh, so we just heard. You seem disappointed. Why should I be disappointed? Oh, some people are, I understand. Very disappointed. Just hope you're not one of them. If I had been, I would have slammed the phone down on you. Oh, that's true. Well, what can I do for you? Meet me in a quiet pub. You must be joking. Our faces are too well known. All right, then. What time would you be passing the Central Library on your way home? In about half an hour. Well, if you see a rather bedraggled individual standing in the rain, you might give him a lift. Soaked to the skin. Mm. Sorry, I'm ten minutes later than planned. It's good of you to stick your neck out, Frank. Even though I arrested you with the money in your briefcase, I don't think you were being bribed. Well, now the court bit's over, you want to tell me how the money came to be there? <laughs> well, it was planted. In my years in the force, John, I've rarely met a more dedicated detective. You came straight from university, plunged into police work, and every spare minute you were studying police procedure, law books, or researching Tudor history. Yeah. Just before you were arrested, I was planning to send you on an ATW course. A what? Attitudes to work course. <laughs> now, in the modern world, everyone is so busy and immersed in what he's doing that he's hardly time to sit down and think. Many are too involved in their work and may have their priorities wrong. 
the course makes them think things out. Whether they're giving off time to their families, their hobbies, everything has to be balanced. And you thought with me something was a little bit uh, out of balance? I thought you could do with a girlfriend, a hobby, or both, yes. What I'm also trying to say is that somebody who was conscientious enough to be working too hard would scarcely take 8,000 marks to hush something up. Well, uh, thanks for your confidence in me. What are your plans? Well, four months waiting for trial gave me time for a personal attitude to work course. I obviously stumbled on something that somebody thought was worth that amount of gout to keep the lid on. And it worked beautifully. I'm out of the force, off the case, and four months have passed placidly by. But you're going to try to pick up the scent? Smell would be a better word. The whole thing stinks. Yep. I'm going to clear my name if it takes me from now to eternity. Take care. Remember, you're not reinstated. Once suspended, it takes time. And there are a lot of villains who'd love to get their hands on you in a dark alley. Well, then I'll just have to take that risk. Look, why not emigrate to Australia and start a new life in the sun? Because I'm innocent. If I emigrate, everyone will assume I'm running away. Be the final proof for some people that I was guilty. Got off scot-free. We only live once. I want to be able to walk around with my head up and my chin out. I want proof of innocence that's so conclusive, Frank, I can get back on the force. Well, it's up to you. You could try sounding a little more encouraging. You said yourself we only live once. And I think a lifetime's too short for what you're trying to do. You mean there isn't much hope of ever getting back on the force? I mean just that. Now, what would you do if you were me? I'd go to Australia and teach history. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I'll do that after I've cleared my name. What the hell's up with him? It's the bus driver's way of telling you he'd like us to move off, I think. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the Club Crazy Horse. Oh, Mr. Rock. Surprised to see me, Harry. I saw the verdict in the late editions. <clears throat> well, then, what do you have, Mr. Rock? Same I was having the last time I was here, the night they picked me up outside. Do you remember what I was drinking? Police asked me the same question. Uh, you were drinking red wine. It was a new bottle we were trying, a French claret. You liked it. How many did I have? Uh, three glasses, Mr. Rock. Hmm. Oh, pour me a glass of red wine, then, Harry. One red wine, sir. Oh, you know, at lunchtime, this is getting more popular than the scotch. One for yourself? Oh, thanks, Mr. Rourke. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Well, I'll have mine later, if you don't mind, sir. <laughs> Tell me, Harry, where did I put my briefcase when I came in that night? You stood at the bar and put it by your feet. On your left, I think. Correct. I went to the gents once. Left the briefcase, as you say. Four months now, I've been remembering who was at the bar. There was a slim blonde, about mid-twenties, Big Irishman over the other side there. A the fellow with a bowler and a rolled umbrella. Oh, yes. Uh, that be Hilda Paddy Dooley and Mr. Charles Vickers, the accountant. Uh, Mr. Vickers comes in every night for a quick one and then goes for his train. Mm. Well, in fact, he leaves at exactly seven minutes past six in order to get his 23 minutes past train. Mm. Well, I was picked up just before 6.30. I visited the gents just before leaving, so Mr. Vickers must already have left. Unless he was late that night. Oh, Mr. Vickers has never been late, Mr. Rourke. Not in all the time he's been coming here. Yeah, that leaves Paddy Dooley and Hilda. Did either of them go near my briefcase? Not that I can remember, Mr. Rourke. Uh, Hilda was stood nearest to it. She was just on your left. In fact, I thought at first she might be trying to pick you up. <laughs> Couldn't help wondering what her reaction would be if she found out you were a detective inspector. Mm. Where can I find Hilda? Don't know much about her. She's German, I know that much. And from bits of conversation I overheard, I gather she was a student here. Studying what, Harry? Club life in England? <laughs> oh, good question, sir. She came in quite a bit. It seems strange, that, if she were studying over here. You said came in quite a bit. You mean she hasn't been in lately? Well, that's the funny thing about it, Mr. Rourke. I don't recollect her coming in here since that night. And now, at ten to six, here is the Northern News, read by Geoffrey Wheeler. At Manchester Crown Court today, John Rook, an inspector with Manchester Police C Division, was found not guilty on a charge of bribery and corruption. Inspector Rook, who resides in Victoria Park, has stated on several occasions since his arrest that Mrs. Lee of number 37 Victoria Park does the best casserole of braised neck with carrots and onions known to her lodger. <laughs> By far the best. Well, even without such compliments, it's glad to have you back, John. Even after all the publicity, Mrs. Lee, 
I make up my own mind about folk. Oh. Most people still seem to think I'm guilty. Well, they don't think what they choose to think. The Summers is never content unless they can think the worst. And I didn't need that jury to tell me you'd never do out that's wrong, John Rook. Oh, I'm glad I heard it's all the same. Now, are you ready for a trifle or a mite more of that casserole before you get down to trifle? Oh, Mrs Lee, I couldn't eat another second helping. There's nothing gives a woman who fancies herself as a cook greater pleasure than seeing somebody with a good appetite wolf it down. Oh, did I wolf it down, then? Well, let me put it this way. You get it as though you were in need of a good meal. You seem to have lost a bit of weight. Well, prison remand food wasn't up to your standards, Mrs Lee. Ah, well, it'll put a bit of the weight back and keep out the cold. Oh, by the way, while you were, uh, while you weren't here... You mean while I was inside? No, oh, I was trying to avoid that unpleasant word. Oh, I don't mind. Well, while you were, uh, waiting trial, that book you sent for came. Uh, oh, uh, Professor Scarsbrick's biography of Henry VIII. Yes, that's him. His face was on the cover. Oh, God. You see, it's been opened. Postman rang the bell. He seemed a bit embarrassed. Yeah, must have thought I was smuggling more marks in. Yes, well, they had a cheek to open it all the same. But I, I sent for another book, too. Um, R.H. Benson, Come Rack, Come Rope. Yes, there is another parcel in your room, John. That was intact. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Lee. You're a treasure. Next time I get bribed, I'll cut you in for 50%. <laughs> That'll be the day. You're as likely to take a bribe as to go and hit old ladies over the head to steal their handbags. I think I'll nominate you as the best... Most trusting landlady in the world, Mrs. Lee. Hey. You know what I'm thinking? Hmm? I think we ought to have a little celebration. <laughs> Why not? Let's see what's on at the pictures. Well, we can do that later, but first we'll have a glass of wine. I got a bottle of hot for Christmas, and this is as good a time as any to open it. You'll find it in the sideboard there, together with the bottle oh, opener. Okay. Not too much now. Oh, all right. <laughs> there we are. One for you and one for me. There you are. You've filled my glass more than you have your own. Well, you put more food on my plate than you do on your own. Cheers. To your future, love. Mm. Bleak as it may seem. Oh, sorry to ring you at home, Chief Inspector. Like hell you are. But I'd prefer you to ring here, Rourke, than the office. What can I do for you? I'm anxious to catch up with a German girl called Hilda. She was next to me in the bar the night I was arrested. You're telling me nothing new, Rourke. Do you know where I could find her? No. I've been looking for her for four months. Her full name is Hilda Schiller. Sure. How do you spell that? S-C-H-I-L-L-E-R. What have you got on her? Well, she's been here about 18 months, supposedly studying English literature at Manchester University. Why supposedly? Because for the last nine months she hardly attended one lecture, but she frequented most of the night spots of the city. Mm. Any in particular? The one you've just visited, the Crazy Horse. Mm. And then there's uh, Champ's Delight mm. and Mr. Pips. She painted the town red, sometimes in the company of an American. And don't ask me which American. We've been trying to trace him for the last four months, also without success. You don't mind if I go over the same ground? Mm. Be careful. Oh, thanks for the concern. Oh, and there was one other spot she often used to go in, uh, the junction. That's that place that, like an old railway station with lamp signals, the lots of even steam trains. Oh, it's a long time since I had a ride on a steam train. Aye, well, don't get too nostalgic. And, John, keep your eyes open. <laughs> Welcome to the Junction Club, sir. Have your companion? I'm on my own. Oh, very good, sir. You seem quiet tonight. Apart from the silly sound effects. <laughs> well, it's a little early. In about two hours, it'll be bursting at the seams. Ah, you can cross the track to the bar. Now the gate is open, sir. Oh. Don't I need a signalling lamp? <laughs> no signalling lamp, sir. But we do have flags on the bar, like the train guards used to wave. Uh, what'll it be, sir? Glass of red wine. Would, uh, would you be taking it to the dining car? What? The dining car, sir. It's the main floor space, sir. God. What's this supposed to be? The water tower? Well, it, uh, it does tend to be a little overdone, <laughs> the railway thing. Do you know, the waiters have to serve the food as if they were swaying about on a moving train. <laughs> well, all the more reason to stay here. Swaying waiters might turn my stomach over. 
French or Spanish red wine, sir? What else is on the label? Well, nothing. It's, uh, it's all plonk from the barrel. Rough. I'd recommend the white. I'll take your recommendation, then. Are you uh, having one with me? Yeah, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll make it a beer. One white plonk, not as rough. Cheers. I was uh, wondering who this place appeals to. Oh, younger set mostly. Uh, we also get some Americans from the base at Burwell. Oh. Do you ever have an American coming in with a German girl called Hilda? So that was her name, Hilda. Some kind of student she was supposed to be. Hilda Schiller. Yes, yes. I, I think I do remember him calling her Hilda. Why did you say that was her name? I don't know. She hasn't been here for a long time. And uh, she and her American boyfriend were regulars? Yes. How regular? Hey, uh, are you a policeman or something? Oh, I'm looking for her, if that's what you mean. Three times a week. They used to go on from here to another club, Mr. Pitts. Why don't you try there? Over to the right, up the fire escape. First door on the right as you turn the corner. Thanks. Nobody else can come in. Take it away. Make it a day of tea. I mean. My name's John Rourke. Ah, uh, yes, the couple who got off scot free. The jury found me not guilty. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't intend to sound so blunt. That's okay. Half the city's convinced I'm guilty. To be candid, I was one of them. Yes. Well, for your information, I'm still trying to find how those marks got into my briefcase. For your information, Rock, I didn't put them there. I never thought you did. I'm looking for one of your customers, a German girl, Hilda Schiller. A German girl used to come in regularly, yes. With an American? That's right, the flyer from the U.S. base in Burwell. Do you know his name? Your police colleagues have already asked for the same questions. I tell you what I told them. Neither have been in for months. I'm glad. I didn't let the look of them. I was on the verge of banning them from the club anyway. Why? I got that feeling they were looking the place over. That they were about to start something. Don't ask me what, because I don't know. Well, just something I felt in my war turn. What did you say the girl's name was? <laughs> you too. I don't get it. What about me? You're the second person tonight to use the past tense talking about the girl. The name's Hilda. Hilda Schiller. Is that the guy walking down the side street? That's him. He was asking about Hilda Schiller? That's the name, all right. Good day, Stan. Let's go. What's the total damage? Oh, I'm afraid you'll have to ask the doctor, Mr. Rourke. But I can say you've been very fortunate. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, at this moment, with uh, every bit of me coming apart from every other bit, it's difficult to imagine my good fortune, sister. There's someone to see you, so I'll give you a sedative afterwards. Uh -huh. Good evening, John. How are you feeling? Oh, could be worse, so they say. Yeah. The doctor's orders is that Mr. Rourke must be kept quiet, so it would be better if he didn't stay too long, please. Right, very good, sister. Ah, ward to myself, I see. Aye, and the uniformed policeman outside the door. What? Calm down. Remember the doctor's orders. Look, am I right in thinking that policeman isn't there <coughs> entirely for my protection? You are. I see, he's trying to be kept quiet. And then you waltz in and tell me I'm virtually under arrest after somebody's tried to kill me. Well... Frankly, it's enough to upset a saint. I'm talking to you now as a <coughs> friend, John. I thought it would be better coming from me. Oh, uh -huh. speak friend. Look, let's skip the irony, shall we? <sighs> there are some people who think that this attempt on your life could have been faked. Oh, yeah. All right, all right. So I hired somebody to try and run over me with a car. Even that doesn't warrant a policeman outside the ward door. It isn't only that. Isn't it? 
Well, for a person who's supposed to be kept quiet, it's more than enough for me. John, they'll leave you alone until the doctor says you're fit to be questioned. <coughs> Maybe tomorrow, the day after, or a week hence. But whenever it is, do you want to be questioned officially by whoever's given the case? Or would you like me to put you in the picture right now? Yeah, well, I'm still suffering from shock and it's easy to take advantage of me. Oh, well, of course, if that's what you think, there's no more to be said. I'll leave you in peace. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That was no fake accident. Strengthens my faith in guardian angels. Aye. Well, you were inches from eternity, all right. A woman said you moved at the very last second. The car caught you right side, sent you spinning onto the bonnet of a parked car and sideways onto its windscreen. The doctor tells me you've escaped with a broken arm, dislocated shoulder, and that you have severe bruising on buttock and shoulder of right side, together with scalp lacerations from broken windscreen. I remember walking between cars parked on each side of that narrow road by Richard Street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the engine. There wasn't even time to turn round. Still don't know what made me jump out the way. John, most of the night you'd been going round the clubs asking about a German girl called Hilda Schiller. Right, ever since you gave me a name. In fact, I went straight out looking for her. I said I would. Don't you remember warning me to be careful? Hmm. I, uh, I'd be grateful if you didn't tell them you got a name from me, John. What's going on? Exactly 11 minutes before someone tried to run you down, a body was found floating in the ship canal. Whose body? The body of the girl you'd spent most of the night asking about. A German student called Hilda Schiller. Good morning, Mr. Rourke. And did you sleep well? Oh. <coughs> I think you gave me enough to put eight elephants to sleep, sister. Oh, you were very upset when your friend left. He said so himself. Oh, <laughs> He said I was upset, did he? Yes, and suggested you needed extra sedation. I think a good nightcap is the word he used. Is he a very close friend? I don't have many close friends. He's a colleague. Oh, oh, I see. I, uh, I graduated and went straight into the police force. There's a lot to study. Every few months I seem to be learning a new job with different responsibilities. I see from your notes that you aren't married. But haven't you a girlfriend? No. A handsome fellow like you, now why not? Oh, uh, marriage doesn't appeal to me, or perhaps the right person hasn't come along. <laughs> perhaps I spent far too much time trying to be the perfect policeman. <laughs> Look where that's landed me. Oh, what the hell am I going on about? I'm sorry for being so maudlin. Ah, now don't apologise. It's the effect of being in hospital. Patients often talk like that. They feel better afterwards. <laughs> like confession. As a wee girl in Ireland, I was taught the expression, confession is good for the soul. <coughs> now, let me have a look at those bruises before you get dressed. Get dressed? Well, your friend is here again. Colleague, not friend, sister. An ex-colleague at that. Good morning, John. Yeah. I understand you're feeling a little better this morning. Oh, yeah? Who told you that? Well, the doctor thinks that if you wanted to, it would be all right to have a short journey by car. To the cells, you mean? No, no, John. Just a matter of routine identification. Why? You caught the driver of the car that hit me? No. Have you found the car? Not yet. Well, where does this uh, routine identification fit in? We want you to identify the body of Hilda Schiller. Why me? You saw her in the club just before your arrest. Oh, great. Great. I'm still suffering physically from being hit by a car and still in a state of shock. You show me a dead body that's been in the water for some time, another setback. And then while I'm still disturbed, you start throwing questions, hoping I'll eventually make a statement that incriminates me. Oh, nothing of the kind. Oh, no. yeah, yeah, sure. I've just seen the doctor, Chief Inspector Norris. I understand he told you that Mr. Rourke should not get out of bed today. Huh. In fact, in his opinion, Mr. Rourke should not move from this bed for the next three days. Well, uh, he did agree that if Mr. Rourke wanted to get up... Uh... At your insistence, the doctor reluctantly said that if Mr. Rourke insisted on discharging himself, we, the hospital, can do nothing about it. And by getting out of bed and going with you, Mr. Rourke would be discharging himself. Did you tell Mr. Rourke just that, Chief Inspector? Uh, not exactly. I merely asked if he would accompany us to help us with the matter of an identification, sister. Mr. Rourke, you don't need to go. You're not fit to go. Now, Chief Inspector, if you put any further pressure on my patient, 
I will make an official complaint to the Home Office. Now, there's no need to take such drastic steps, Sister. I'll uh, leave your patient in now, peace. everyone hold their horses. Thanks, Sister, for getting your Irish paddy up and putting Chief Inspector Norris in his place, but I'm quite prepared to go along with him. I want to show my willingness to cooperate. Uh, make a note of how uh, cooperative I'm being while the Sister helps me to get dressed, Norris. Helps you, indeed. I'll do no such thing. If you're going to discharge yourself, then you'll dress yourself as well. And what's so important that it can't wait a few more days? A specially conducted tour of a mortuary. Is that the woman you saw in the bar just before your arrest? Oh, God. How long has she been in the water? Is that the woman? Well, from what's left of her, it looks like it. But you're not sure? How could anybody be? It looks like her, you said? Yes. All right, you can put it back. We're getting further identification, and we're sent for a dental record. Well, now I've cooperated with your request, Chief Inspector, I'm going to refuse to accompany you anywhere else. In other words, you can go to blazes or arrest me. And if you do arrest me, when your case falls apart, as it will, I'll sue for false arrest. Good morning and goodbye. Now, wait a minute, John. I'm only doing my duty. Yes, that's what the axeman sent to the Queen he was executing. I was also about to say that having brought you here, the least I can do is buy you a coffee and take you back to your flat. <laughs> Beware Greeks bearing gifts. Don't you trust me? No. I had to convince myself you were innocent, John. Uh -huh. And are you convinced? Oh, come on. Let's have that coffee. Yours is milk, but no sugar. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, there's a quiet table over here. Well, I should give up sugar, too. What they say, dairy produce is even worse. Butter and eggs, I read, were the killers. Look, I'm sure you didn't invite me for a coffee so you could discuss the merits of the English breakfast. No, I, I didn't. As a matter of fact, there were one or two things I wanted to discuss with you. And uh, thanks for cooperating in the identifying the late Miss Schiller. Uh -huh. You were right. I was trying shock tactics to see how you reacted. Quite sure you're satisfied? Yes, I'm satisfied. Mm. You ought to be. But one of the points I want to talk to you about is what happened in Hamburg. What do you mean? Well, I read your report, but was there anything you left out? Such as? You should know better than me, John. Well, I don't. And if you're trying to imply I deliberately covered something up, you're way out. Chief Inspector. I just want you to tell me all you remember about it, starting at the very beginning. Well, I went over to Hamburg to pick up a merchant navy officer on a grievous bodily harm charge, Ben Hallett. Case mm -hmm. comes up in the Crown Court in a few weeks' time. What happened? Oh, nothing happened. It's just routine. I went and collected him from the Hamburg police. When we got back here, I told him about the allegations made against him by the victim. Was he surprised? Well, not surprised. Seemed relieved. As much as admitted it by saying it was nothing more than a barroom brawl. I told him the injuries to the man he'd attacked were more than a barroom brawl. He said he had it coming to him. I remember the exact words because I tried to find out why he had it coming to him, but uh, Hallett wasn't giving any more away. So I formally charged him. Mm -hmm. When we searched him, we found he was in possession of cannabis. So we added another charge. Hmm. And two days later, you were found with the German marks in your briefcase. Could be just a coincidence. You think so? No. No, I don't. I think there is some connection, but... I've racked my brains to find it. But what happened the following day, the one before you were arrested? Nothing. It was my day off. What did you do on your day off? Uh, oh, I read a book written by an Elizabethan, John Gerard. Mm -hmm. That was in the morning. And uh, in the afternoon, I went to visit an Elizabethan manor house, Brambourne, uh, doing a report on it for a preservation society. Brambourne Manor? Yeah. You seem surprised. Yeah. Isn't that near the American air base at Burwald? Well, it's about five miles away, but what's the connection? We think it was an American who hit you. The woman witness said it was a big American car, and one of the passengers seemed to be in uniform. We're checking all the cars at Burwell Base. I still don't see the tie-up between the air base and the manor. Who owns the manor now? Mm. No one. Last owner was Ralph Fitzhugh. He was hanged outside his own front door for having a mass said in the house. Hmm. How long ago was that? All of 360 years ago. No one's lived at Brambourne since 1939. The place has gradually crumbled. No, I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, the War Department took the place over together with the airbase. Yeah, that's right. They let the uh, they let the Americans have it. I think they used it as an officer's mess for a while. Mm -hmm. They did plan to repair and restore it. Uh, the Americans, that is. And then the squadron moved to another base and the new commander found a mess nearer the airfield. There's something about the place that started my copper six cents working overtime. 
Cranbourne Manor. You know, John, the name cropped up too many times. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, I don't know. I was hoping your historical researches could have enlightened me. Do you, uh, you want another coffee? Uh, no, thanks. And gazing into your cup like it was a crystal ball. I was just thinking, it is, uh, strange that the manor was the last place I visited before those marks were found in my briefcase. And I'll tell you something else. I searched that manor and its grounds with a squad of policemen and dogs for three days. There's nothing there. What makes you smile? So did Persuivance. Well, who are they? Persuivance, so, uh, sort of private enterprise policeman, bounty hunter, and freebooter roll into one. Never heard of them. Ah, well, for the solution to most problems, it's necessary to go back into history. What, like Northern Ireland, you mean? Well, like most political problems. Well, how can it help us in this case? Well, something you said gave me an idea. Started me thinking along very strange lines. Could lead nowhere. First of all, I'd like to get back to my flat and see if Weston can give me any clues. Who? William Weston. He was an Elizabethan. What is? You have a visitor, a lady. What the hell can that be? Oh, he gets hard at coming these stairs every day. <laughs> Mr. Rook, I see you've been keeping a secret. A secret? Well, and who might this foreign girl be who's come round to see you that you haven't been letting on about? But... Go put a tie on, look your best, eh? I haven't got a foreign girlfriend. I haven't got a girlfriend. Full stop. Well, she seemed to know you. Is Mr. Rook in, she asked? Knew you? Knew you lived here? Mm. Can't wait to know who my mysterious foreign female visitor is. I'm not putting a tie on, Mrs. Lee. Have it your own way, then. I think she must be German. German? Well, she speaks very good English with just a slight accent. And then her name? What name? Schiller, she said. Miss Schiller. Constable Harris. Yes, Chief Inspector. You're quite literate, aren't you? How do you mean? You spend a great deal of your time sitting on your backside doing crosswords, don't you? I do the occasional crossword. Then it must take you a hell of a long time to complete it. That occasional crossword for all occasions. Well, it's not as bad as that, Chief Inspector. Yes, well, this is what I want you to find out. Learn all you can about poor Sweevents. And find out if any of them had any connection with the American Air Base and Burwald. Eh? You heard. Just pretend you're doing your crossword. But I... I don't, don't tell me you don't know what a poor Sweevent is. Well, I would say its root is pro, forth and sequi follow. Uh, onwards follow or something like that. Wait a minute, I just remembered there's an inferior officer of the College of Heralds. He's a poor Sweevent. I don't think it's that one. Well, it could also be connected with the verb pursue. Aye, well, go and pursue the matter then. And don't come back until you can tell me all about it, Harris. I'll start by talking to the head librarian at the Central Library. Uh, before you go, you can let me have the list of items we found on the dead Schiller girl. Oh, very good, sir. It's right here on my desk. Where on your desk? It was under my paper. I'd folded it in half to do the crossword. Miss Schiller, did you say? That is correct, Mr. Rourke. You have the advantage of me, Miss Schiller. I don't remember having met you before. I understand you knew my sister. My sister Hilda, who was recently found murdered. You have been asking about her. Now, just you come and sit down, love. Push a chair near the fire, Father Mr. Rose. She yes. looks like a drowned rat. I've been walking around since late last night. You take your coat off and I'll hang it up by the kitchen radiator. And I'll bring you a towel to dry your hair. Oh, thank you. You flew into Manchester? Yes. The German police broke the news to us in the early hours of the morning. I dressed and took the first plane here. I just cannot believe it. A good hot cup of tea. That's what you need. <laughs> Your English and your tea. <laughs> I, I think you want to know why I was looking for your sister. Please, yes. Well, I used to be a police detective inspector in this city. Till one night German money was found in my briefcase and I was accused of corruption. The other day a jury found me not guilty but the smear is still there. I want to clear my name by finding out why those marks were planted on me. I understand. But what has this to do with my sister, Hilda? I suspect it was your sister who put the marks in my briefcase. Oh, it seems to get worse and worse. The more I learn, the more terrible this thing seems to be. What can you tell me about your sister? What do you want to know? Everything you can remember. I can see her face as a little girl. 
She was always mischievous, always busy, always so happy. When did things start going wrong? Not until she went to the university. She wanted to take a degree and teach backward children. At first she was doing quite well. But then she mixes with bad people. How did you know they were bad? By their way of life. To use an old-fashioned phrase, their lack of morals. I found Hilda was living with one of them. That was the beginning of it all. At first she argued it was love and idealized her relationship. For him it was a convenient, temporary satisfaction. Mm. Inevitably, he moved into another casual relationship and left Hilda's flat. She was shattered. I suspect my sister turned to drugs. Sir. About this time, she started an affair with an American airman who had served in Vietnam and other areas in Southeast Asia. He frightened me. You met him? Twice only. I tried to keep in regular contact with Hilda, yet I had the feeling she didn't want me to meet him. But once he came to her flat while I was there. What was he like, this American? A short man. His eyes seemed to rove all over you. He made you feel uncomfortable. Hilda made excuses for him. She said he'd flown many missions in Vietnam and had been living on his nerves. It could have been that. But I think it was something much deeper. Was he a pilot? I'm not quite sure. I think so. Do you know why your sister came to England? No. I don't know why or how she managed to get into an English university with her poor results. Mm. But one thing I am sure about, he was behind it. He wanted her over here. The exchange scheme she came under was incidental. Ah, uh, here's your cup of tea, love. Oh. You'll take milk and sugar. Oh, black peas. You don't have black tea in England. That's for coffee. <laughs> You've had a shop, love, and something hot and sweet is what you get for shop. Here now. Oh, thank you. And here's yours, Mr. Rourke. Oh, thanks. You, young lady, you look fair done in. I still cannot believe she was murdered. Do you know, I came here with the idea of avenging her death. I thought it was you, Mr. Rock. Oh. But you have too kind a face for a killer. The way people live is written on their faces. Now, drink up your tea, love. Oh, please call me Anna. Well, Anna, you can get your feet up and have a rest, love, and I'll stay with you. Mr. Rock can be doing some reading in his own room. Oh, uh... Message understood, Mrs. Lee. And we'll have steak, dumplings and chips for tea. I'll call you when it's ready, Mr. Rowe. Can I help you at all, Mrs. Lee? Oh, you've wakened up. How are you feeling? Oh, much better, thank you, Mrs. Lee. Good. Yes, you can be warming these plates, if you will. The chips are nearly ready, and then you can call Mr. Rook. Well, these plates? Yes, those are the ones, and I put them on this plate rack above the grill. Is Mr. Rook upstairs? Yes, his room is first left at the top of the stairs. Always best to knock on his door, because sometimes he gets so burst in the book he wouldn't be in the bone door. Coming. I'm famished. Oh, sorry. I thought it was Mrs. Lee. She asked me to tell you that the meal is almost ready. Thank you. Oh, what a lot of books you have. Aha. Uh -huh. Come and see my etchings. Oh. <laughs> You're quite safe with me and my arm in a sling. Uh, not to mention the tightly bound rib cage. Your etchings. I understand that English joke. <laughs> You're very attractive when you smile, Anna. Please, Mr. Rock. I know you mean to be kind. I also know I have a plain face and I feel very spinsterish and schoolteacherish at times. Well, you said yourself the way people live's written on their faces. Yours is a kind, dedicated face. Thank you. I'm very happy with my work. Teaching handicapped children? Yes. I think the secret of happiness is giving yourself to others without expecting any thanks. <laughs> Strange that two sisters should seem to be so different. I am to blame as much as anyone for Hilda. Our father died seven months after Hilda was born. Our mother died four years ago, being ill for many months. Uh. I wondered all the way here in the plane how much more time I should have given to Hilda instead of to my studies. It must have been a very bad time for her. Perhaps it might have been better to... To have what? Oh, to have married and stayed on the farm. There was a young man who wanted to marry me, but I am sure he proposed out of sympathy. He was a good person with a very strong sense of duty. And you turned him down? He is now happily married to a very attractive girl who has turned out to be a good wife and mother. Why are you looking at me like that? I was wondering why you have your hair swept back so severely. I don't understand your question, Mr. Rock. 
It is obviously so much neater and tidier this way. Oh, of course. I tell you all this about me, but you say nothing. Oh, well, like you, I've been busy studying, and like you, I had someone in my hometown I might have married. But you didn't? No. Now, she's a good wife and mother, too. She married the local doctor. Policeman's lot is not a happy one. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rock, for your efforts to cheer me up and get me out of my sadness. My motive was purely selfish, Anna. I asked you questions about your sister to get all the information I could to help clear my name and to find your sister's killer. I see you read poetry. I browse. Ah, oh, Wordsworth. I once had to copy a poem of his when I was learning English. Ah, oh, this is it. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, so is it now I am a man, so be it when I shall grow old, or let me die. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. Your English verse is so beautiful, the rhythm so regular that it flows like a stream. How do you call unstressed followed by stress? Um. Iambic. Ah, oh, yes. It is the rhythm, not the rhyme, that matters most. Quite right. You see, I try to learn my English well, especially the poetry. <laughs> Back in history, some of your great adventurers and swordsmen were poets, were they not? Uh, they were. You have a bookmark in what now? Ah, a northern vigil. Uh, read me a short verse, please. Oh, well, reading aloud is hardly my forte. I will close my eyes, draw a circle in the air with my finger, and then point to some verse, yes? Uh, Mrs. Lee doesn't like to keep a meal waiting, Anna, and you'll oh, be ready. You are embarrassed. No. Then half a minute's delay while you read a short verse will not upset Mrs. Lee. Please. All right. I close my eyes, turn my finger in the air like so. There. Let me see what you've chosen. The windows of my room are dark with bitter frost. The stillness aches with doom of something loved and lost. I was thinking of choosing something light and happy. But I feel the dark windows of a room are more fitting, more appropriate. I should be in mourning for Hilda, of something loved and lost. You can't blame yourself for her death. But I was her sister. If I had given her more time, if, if I had talked to her more, listened to her problems, who knows? Oh, if I had my time with her over again, how different it would be. Anna, I'll find who killed her if it takes ten years. Isn't that a form of revenge? Wanting her murderer caught and punished? Justice is a better word. A bleak consolation, I know. Oh, forgive me. I'm too concerned with myself and my own feelings. I think of Hilda, not of you, and how, because of all this, you lose your job, your good name. You're almost killed, and... Oh. I have a drawer full of men's large white handkerchiefs. Ideal for wiping away tears. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's it, Anna. Put your head on my poor bandaged shoulder and have a good cry. <laughs> But Mrs. Lee will have a meal going cold. Mrs. Lee would be the first to agree that you'll feel a lot better after a good cry. Is it better with those cups, love? Oh, here you are, Mrs. Lee. Thank you. Oh, dear. I'll answer it. Do you manage another sandwich, Rob? 224-2987. in the Central Library all afternoon looking up for Sweevens. Oh, congratulations, Inspector. I never realised you were so concerned with improving the minds of your detectives. I've been waiting for Harris to return, and I'm still no wiser, Rourke. In fact, I think you've been leading me up the garden path, or into a medieval maze. I also think you know more than you've been telling me, so I'll get your coat and hat on. I'm sending Harris round to collect you. Then you can explain to me just where Persuivens fit in. You'd better get yourself a warrant. I'll do just that if you like. Because I won't be coming in voluntarily. As you wish, Rourke. Look, you know you can't arrest me. All right. 
jury finds you not guilty of taking a backhander in marks, but then the girl connected with it dies, and now... What now? After visiting me the other night, you went to the junction. Well, I said I did. You had a nice long chat with the bar. I asked him about Hilda Schiller, and he told me they got quite a few Americans from the base at Burwold, and that she sometimes came in with one of them. What else did he say? He recommended the white wine. Did you threaten him? Threaten him? Why should I? That's what we'd like to know, Rock. You see... After you'd had your glass of wine and bought him a beer, you did buy him a beer, didn't you? Your information is correct. I did buy him a beer, and I did have a glass of wine, white as recommended. And afterwards you left? Yes. He did too. He followed you out. He's never been seen since. Harris is on his way to collect you, Rourke. Damn. Damn the lot of them. What is in the matter? I'm going out. Not in the car, John, and you with an arm in a sling. Oh, I know. I wonder if Anna can drive me. I have no English license and insurance, but I drive. Well, I'm insured for any driver, and what's driving without a license anyway at this stage of the game? I want to find your sister's American friend. This very minute, Mr. Roy? Yes, there's someone coming I don't particularly want to see. My car may be difficult to start. It's been in the garage several months while I was... While Mr. Roke was away on business. No, that I can see to the pots, and I'll tell the gentleman what's coming that you just pop round the corner. In fact, I'll make him a cup of tea while he sits and waits for you to come back. <laughs> That'd be most helpful. Come on, then, Anna. I saw the sign, Bervolt. We'll stop at the first pub and ask there. Keep to the left. I'll look out for it. Here's a table. What do you have, Anna? I don't know. I drink very little. Anything will do for me. I'll get you a sherry. Yes, sir? Uh, medium sherry and a pint of best mild. It's lovely tonight, the beer. Wonderful condition. There's your sherry. Uh -huh. Still use the old pumps, I see. Oh, yes. Gives a better top to the pint. You, uh... You seem to get plenty of Americans here from the base. Oh, they like the beer, too. Did one of them, uh, Used to come in with a German girl? You don't mean the... The girl was found murdered. Yes. You a cop, eh? Yes. Oh, Looks like one to me. I can usually spot one a mile off. We're looking for the American. Aye. Saw a lot of people, including some other Americans. Seems to have done a disappearing act two days ago. Had something on the slate with me, too. Old money all round, did Max Venner. Yeah. So did his co-pilot. He's vanished, too. Oh, have you nothing small, Miss Barnote, sir? I'm, I'm a bit short of change tonight. Sorry, I haven't. Just manage it, I think. Thank you, sir. Oh, want a tray for that? Oh, thanks. I can manage. There we are. One sherry, medium dry. Thank you. <clears throat> Something behind me seems to be fascinating you. It's the barman. I was watching him as he was serving you. He kept glancing to his left. Now he's gone over to speak to the two alert-looking men whose attention he was trying to catch. I, I think the two men are coming over to us. Good evening. Uh, do you mind if we sit at this table with you? You're already sitting at this table. To what do we owe the pleasure? Uh, my name is Marshall Dean, and this is my partner, Dick Cohen. Mm -hmm. We hear you were asking for Maxi and his co-pilot, Stan. Can you tell us why? Well, to use a, an English police phrase, I want them to help me in my inquiries. Oh, likewise. Uh, we're Air Force Police. Mm. You look uh, very well groomed for Air Force Police. I'd say more like a pair of FBI men. <laughs> and I'd say you look like the English cop who was accused of corruption. Oh, for Air Force Police, you're very well informed. And this is Hilda Schiller's sister. I've had a tale on her ever since she got off the plane. My word, you have done your homework. If you do find anything of interest, uh, call us, huh? Here's the number. It's manned day and night. We have a big organization behind us and taxpayers' money to spend. You didn't, by any chance, convert any of that taxpayers' money into German marks, say, 8,000 pounds worth. We like your English sense of humor, John. But don't try it on Max or Stan. 
In their off-duty moments, they've been involved in at least six killings. Well, if you'll excuse us, gentlemen, we must be on our way. Well, we'll be around. A comforting thought. Good night, Marshal. Good night, Dick. Good night to you, Anna, John. There was something disconcerting about those two Americans. Well, they're meant to be disconcerting. They don't seem to have followed us out. Most probably they've got radio cars all around the area, complete with submachine guns. Who do you think they are? <laughs> Not Air Force police. That's for sure. Oh. Glad to meet you, dear old lady. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Rock. <laughs> I'm flattered you remember me. Well, anyone as interested in old buildings as you, and I can never forget them. Let me introduce a friend of mine, Miss Anna Schiller. How do you do? Oh, now, please do come inside. Oh, what a lovely old world room. Yes, I was born in this cottage, you know. I've got a ghost upstairs. Really? I've often woken to see strange lights above my bed, and then a figure nine. Sometimes I see a man's face. <laughs> <laughs> what I came to see you about, Mrs. Hughes, was the manor. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I read your article on its preservation. I thought it admirable. Oh, good. I wondered if you knew anything about its recent history. You know, since it was taken over by the Americans. Oh, during the war, you mean? Yes. Well, there used to be a most charming commander. Unfortunately, he was planning to put cocktail bars in it for the officers' mess. And then he and his squadron moved on, and the other commander decided against it. In some ways, it was a good thing, and in other ways, bad. How do you mean? Well, if the Americans had gone ahead with their cocktail bar, etc., they would also have restored the hall at the same time. You know how thorough these Americans are. And it would virtually have been as good as new. Most people were happy when the scheme was dropped. Most local people, that is. Now... One American who was very keen on completing the scheme was a most charming and cultured man. I think he was in their Air Force intelligence section. He, too, was an historian, a uh, professor at one of the Midwestern universities, as I recall it. Now, he wrote a pamphlet about the manor, which really should have been made into a book. You know how difficult things were during the war, and it was finally stenciled or something like that. There used to be a copy of it at the base, though, I understand it's been lost. Um, though I did hear there was another... You can't remember the name of this, Professor. Oh, yes, I can. Um, Martindale. James Martindale. Martindale. I'll make a note. Well, if you've no objections, I think I'll take Miss Schiller up to the manor house. What, at this time of night? Oh, there's a moon. Well, if you can follow the overgrown path opposite my front door, that'll take you right to it. But nobody uses it at night, you know, not even courting couples. Thank you once again for your help, Mrs. Hughes. Always a pleasure to see you, Mr. Rock. I do hope you'll find time to address our society one day. As soon as I've cleared up one or two things, I'd be delighted. Well, you know where I am. Call in any time. And a friend of Mr. Rock's is always welcome here, Anna. Thank you. I am fascinated by your old English houses and ghost stories. Do you think you'll be all right going up to the manor in the dark? Is there a ghost there as well? <laughs> well, none that is recorded. But the last male member of the family was hanged outside the front door. Yeri, I think, is the English word. I am quite nervous. Oh, what was that, Mr. Rock? Some animal. Mrs. Hughes was right. This path's quite overgrown. We should be coming into a clearing soon. It was the tilting green. Look, on this branch. Yes. How beautiful the moonlight. Just look at the roof. It must be freezing. Hamlet could appear at one of those black staring windows and give a tortured soliloquy. Yeah, well, I want to take a look inside. Oh, dear. Frightened again? Scared to death, but enjoying every minute of it. Will you take the torch? Yes, please. Oh, there's something over there. I'll point the torch at it. There, there's something glistened in that undergrowth. Hmm. Branches have been broken down as if a tractor's been through. <clears throat> That's better. Now, shine the torch on the ground. That's it. Hey. 
These are tracks. Car tracks. Keep close to me. You don't need to tell me that, Mr. Rock. But suppose there is someone in there. With your injuries, you have only one arm. Ah, but you've got a stiletto in your handbag. How do you know that? I looked in while you were asleep this afternoon. You have no business to go in my handbag. It is, how do you say, bad form, bad manners. So is carrying a dagger, Anna. I bought it in an antique shop here in England. What for? To revenge my sister. Yeah. I thought as much. There is something ahead of us. I think you'd better let me have the torch and stay here. I'd rather face whatever it is with you than stay here on my own. All right. It's like someone's been making ready for a big fire. We call it a bonfire. They've certainly stacked a lot of large branches. Oh, with your injuries, you should not be doing this. I just keep the light still. I'm not lifting, I'm just dragging them to one side. We have an expression about not being able to see the wood for the trees. That's better. With the gap you've made, there's the reflection again. Dark. Car bodywork. That's what's reflecting. I think I can squeeze through the gap I've made. Have you hurt yourself? Uh, it's just the ribs the car dented. This car, in fact. Pass me the torch. There's something in the front seat. Oh. Is he dead? He's dead, all right. Stay there. Half the back of his head's blown off. Do you know him? The barman at the junction. He went missing after I spoke to him the other night. Oh, I thought I saw something move. Well, it wouldn't be him. Behind the car. Okay, please. You have 60 seconds to come up with your arms above your head. 16, 15, 15. Behind you, Mr. Rock! Oh. What have you done to him? Grab the woman. Okay, ladies, stop struggling. You two carry him out. You killed him. You killed hey, him. Hey, she's got a dagger. Well, grab hold of her, one of you. Oh, oh she stopped. After Cohen hits you, if she didn't try running him through with a dagger. Yeah, serves you right for playing gangsters in an English wood. Use an antique English stiletto for that special occasion. Well, fortunately, Cohen was wearing a thick coat. He'll be fine. Well... In that case, perhaps you'll carry on. I can't say I'm entirely convinced by her explanations. Well, we were staking out the wood. We found the car earlier today. You walked in. Now, it isn't easy to flush people out of a wood at night. So we used the tannoy to distract you and moved in. We hoped you'd still be listening to it, wondering how much time you had left. Yeah, it was. Where am I now? The Air Force Base. Oh, you're not going to tell me you're Air Force Police again. <laughs> no, John. And not FBI. We're from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Uh, another for you? No, oh, thanks. Now, drugs is the name of the game. How did I get into it? Oh, we've been watching Max and his friends for three years. He'd been smuggling in heroin from Southeast Asia. We put a stop to that by getting him posted to Germany. Or we thought we did. Max's syndicate had other plans. They worked out another route across Europe with Turkish grown poppies. It was processed in Marseille, moved to the Germany. thousand pounds in German marks, which puts you out of circulation for a time. But a jury finds you not guilty, and you start asking questions. But uh, they'd already prepared for that. Oh, sure. By killing Miss Schiller's sister. They reckoned, and rightly, that you'd work it out, that she had dropped the money in your briefcase. So, with two million dollars at stake, they decided not to take any chances. Two million dollars? Oh, it could be more. That's the minimum value we put in the package they've got into England, ready to ship or fly out to the States. Uh, we want to get our hands on that heroin. And to knock out the number one man in England. I, uh, I think I might be able to find it. Hmm? Say that again? I think I can help. But first, I need your organization. Name it. I need an open line, 
and equipment to take wire pictures. Oh, we have them already. And then you need a professor of history called James Martindale, who was at a, a Midwestern university. Well, how long ago? Can't say, but he was over here during the war. Well, then he could be dead or retired. Uh, could be. But I know he wrote a pamphlet about the manor while he was over here. So? So we need to find out where he is now, get his pamphlet and wire it over. I'll put agents onto it right away. Fine. Sir, it's Agent Wright reporting from New York. Uh, thank you. I'll take it. Uh, yeah, is that you, Wright? Yeah, we traced Professor Martindale. He's uh -huh. living in San Francisco doing research on the early settlers. Uh. Uh, Agent Inkerman of our West Coast Bureau has made telephone contact with the professor, and he's on his way to meet him. Oh, he has a copy of the pamphlet he wrote on Bramborn Manor while he was at Burwood Air Base. Uh -huh. We should be wiring it to you inside the... Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Oh, we should have your information for you very shortly. Now, John, can you tell me what it's all about? It's about an act of parliament made in the 27th year of Queen Elizabeth I in the year 1585. It uh, made it high treason for a priest ordained after the Queen's accession to be in England. And the same act made it a felony punishable by death to harbour a priest. So... If any Catholic wanted his sacraments, he had to have a good place in which to hide a priest and the utensils for saying mass, which yeah. is how the secret panels and the priest's hiding holes came to be in some of the stately homes of England. John, are you trying to say that we're looking for a secret panel? Yes, Marshal. We are, Marshal. Well, for God's sake, let's get on with it. <laughs> so easily done. Various people have been searching for them for nearly 400 years. But with modern equipment... Ah, I've tried it. No two hiding holes are the same. They were made by night, and the workman and the owner knew the secret. When the owner was driven out, or imprisoned or hanged, the secret usually died with him. Sometimes today they come to light when extensive alterations are being carried out, like I suspect the base commander was doing at Burwold Manor during the war. Uh. You see, I think that Professor Martindale realised the discovery and wrote about it. The pamphlet, or anyway, one of them, was kept in the base library. Max or someone read it, decided it to be the ideal place for the drugs, and destroyed the pamphlet so that no one else would see it. So we sit back and wait for the pamphlet to be transmitted. Oh, it's coming now. thought I'd be looking for secret hiding holes in the damp and cold of first light. Mm. Underneath the fireplace. At least that's what Martindale says here. Yeah, sure. Uh, the stone on the inside of the fireplace on the left-hand side can be pushed in. Uh -huh. It's not big enough to allow anyone through, but it releases a stone at the base that can be pulled forward. The hole made is just big enough for a man to get through. Oh. Okay, fellas, let's try it. Oh. Now, that's the first one. But where's the second stone? Yeah. Uh, this one. Sure, but it can't possibly move the way it says. Oh, come on, let's try it. Genius. The other moves, too. <laughs> the guy designed this would have been a million-dollar architect in the States today. <laughs> hey, there is a hole. Finally, see what's down there. Okay. Here we go. Uh, these guys must have been there in the olden days. Oh. Oh. Pass me a torch. It's quite dark inside. Yes. How big? It's big enough to hold a couple of men. Could they stand up in there? Easily. And is there room to sleep? Yeah, but there's nobody here. You'd be disappointed, Rook. Yeah. Did you expect to find Max and his buddy in there? Uh, call it more than a possibility. Well, without that information, we would never have gotten this far. Hey, I found something. Well, what is it? A package in waterproof covering. Hand it 
Okay, I've got it. Now, let's take a look. Uh, anyone got uh, anything sharp? Uh, your antique stiletto, Anna. Oh, I have it in my bag. Now, may I borrow it, Miss Schiller? Certainly. Great heroin. The best. Okay, finally, put it back. Put it back? A fortune in heroin? Well, suppose something happens to it. We found heroin before, only for it to vanish again. Yeah, I want Max as well. But maybe I shouldn't be risking so much heroin. So we'll make up a package. But you've got to have a good bait for the really big fish. What big fish? The number one guy in Britain who's causing us so many headaches. For two million dollars, someone is going to try and get other stuff. Mm. Do you have any suspects? Yeah. Everyone Max has ever spoken to. I suspect the publican had talked to you and then tipped us off. He used to give Max credit. I suspect the lady president of the local historical society you saw last night. Oh. Max had tea and cakes with her last week. He was obviously after something. I suspect every man, woman, or child who ever passed the time of day with Max. These drug syndicates have a fantastic network of operators. The pay is great, but once you become redundant, they bury you. Like Hilda. Yeah, like Hilda, like the barman, like a few thousand more who are no longer useful and might be able to point a finger at someone else in the organization. A quick assassination and the leak is sealed. It hasn't even become a leak. Not very nice people. People I don't mind waiting about to catch, no matter how long it takes. So let's take it out. Cohen, how is it your end? It's all quiet since the, uh, the pub closed. How long ago? About an hour. Uh, wait a minute. The front door is opening. Yeah, it's difficult picking up radio transmission in a wood. You can hear those damn receivers a mile away. Who's going to walk into a wood when it's crackling with more two-way radios than twigs? Yeah, to spread out more, maybe keep out of the wood altogether. It's the publican who's coming out the front door. He is walking his dog. What direction is he taking? He's going towards the path. If he's got a dog, I'd better get my men out of the wood. Finally, move back. We'll take our positions outside, out of hearing distance. The publican is now turning away from path. It looks as if he's returning to the pub. All right, Cohen. Stay in position. I'll be coming to move you out in a few minutes. All you need is artillery, and you can have a full-scale battle. Look, you've got too many men, and you're making too much noise. Oh, I can't take any chances. That's exactly what you are doing. Get rid of all the radios and have one man at a time lying low. That damn radio receiver of yours is as good as a loudspeaker. Suspect has oh. crossed road to cottage of woman Hughes. She is a door. Both suspects are now engaged in conversation. Yeah, most probably about the weather. Talking about the weather, it's starting to rain again. Yeah. As soon as it's opening time, you'll be one stakeout man less. He'll be having a hot rum. On one condition only. You tell no one, absolutely no one, about finding the heroin. Oh, yes. Not a soul. Oh, see what I mean about the rain? Do turn your collar up, Marshal. You American agents always look the part with upturned collars. I wonder what Anna's doing now. Anna, yeah. We have her room at the inn bugged, if you what? really want to know. What do you suspect her? She's Hilda's sister. She's met Oh, Max. come on, you can't... English police car has drawn up with the Burwold Arms. Uh, no. No, it's not stopping. It's going on towards the base. Police car has halted not far from me. Occupant now approaching through wood. Yeah. I can see him for myself. Hey! It's Chief Inspector Norris. He's probably looking for me to tell me I'm back in the force. Don't go out to him. Oh, come on. Surely you don't suspect a Chief Inspector. Hey. He's going towards the manor right enough. 
to the east wing. To the fireplace. He's hit him over the head. Taking no chances. Hope he's good at unarmed combat. Norris was a marine commando. <laughs> See what I mean? Okay. Hold it. Freeze. We're federal agents. Show me your authority for going round in this country with guns. Oh. And for attacking police officers in the course of their duty. You were going towards the fireplace. Do you deny it? Of course I was. Call off these bloodthirsty Apaches. You haven't said why you were going towards the fireplace, Frank. Because I wanted to take a good look at it, that's why. I've had Constable Harris off crosswords. He hasn't put pen to one for 24 hours. He's been finding out about priests' hiding holes. He tells me they were often under the fireplace. Oh. Are you okay, Violet? Oh, I feel I want to double up again. He caught me high and low like an axe. When someone hits me on the head and knocks me flat on my face in the mud, what does he expect? Yeah. I saw a pub up the road. I think I'll go there and get cleaned up. Rook? Yes? I want a word with you. You better come along, too. Ah, that's better. Very kind of you to let me use your room, Miss Shiver. How did you get so... so muddied? Well, I met some American Indians in the wood doing a war dance. I wouldn't say too much about them at the moment. Oh, no, why not? And what precisely are you doing up there oh. on a chair? Got it. Looking for a bug. An electronic one. Yeah, seems to have killed it off. They got the room bugged, in case Anna was involved. But they cannot think I killed my own sister. Oh, they're nothing if not thorough. Over-conscientious. <laughs> like ants all over the place with radios. They'll be suspecting the residents of Buckingham Palace next. Though they're damned efficient, I'll give them that, these Federals. One of their brass hats has been in contact with the Home Office, who in turn have been in communication with the Chief. You're reinstated, John. Uh. But uh, I'm in trouble. You? I. It's that forthright Irish sister whose motherly instincts you brought out. She's complained to the Home Office about me bringing pressure to bear on a sick patient in order to make him leave hospital against medical advice. <laughs> I've to go before the Chief Constable. Oh, quite right, too. Disgusting tactics. Anybody who didn't know what you were up to would have been confessing to all sorts of crimes they hadn't committed. Well, you'd better be my chief witness and say you volunteered, or else your life as a detective under me will be a misery. <laughs> now then, to get back to business. They found the heroine... But Max and his pal are still running around loose, and so is the top man in England. I suppose they'll be staying up all night watching for someone to claim the heroine. Mm. Another storm brewing by the sound of it. We'll uh, make ourselves comfortable down in the bar, I think. That's, uh, two pints and a sherry. Nasty night out. Ah, uh, it is. Good, cosy enough in here. I'll, uh, I'll bring them over. Thanks. Ah. You're looking thoughtful, Rock. Am I? What happened to you this afternoon? Oh, I went to the local library and then to a local resident for a pamphlet. Oh, what about secret panels? Yep. And what did you find? Nothing. Just had some kind of nagging suspicion at the back of my mind. Uh, the sherry is uh, for the lady, is it? That's right. Uh, and uh, a bitter for you. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, uh, and some nuts too, please. <clears throat> Look, I'll come back with you and uh, I'll get them. I think the chief inspector wants to ask a few questions in private. Yes, it is the general impression. Cheers. Cheers. The chief <coughs> inspector was right. You are, how do you say, the mind thinking of something else? Oh, uh, far away. Uh, distant. Distant, yes. I keep thinking about Gerard. Gerard? John Gerard. He's a priest who escaped from the Tower of London. Was he hid in a hiding hole for several days or even weeks? The who built them was Nicholas Owen. Nicholas? Saint Nicholas? Named after him. Saint himself, no. It was Father Gerard's companion. What did Gerard said about him? I made a note of it this afternoon. Oh, here it is. Here. Uh, Gerard said of Nicholas, who was also known as Little John because of his small stature, he was the immediate occasion saving the lives of many hundreds of persons. You made a lot of notes. Quite neat. I can read them nearly all. He, that is Nicholas, is it? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Never made two same, so if one discovered, did not endanger others. Cecil had him tortured. Cecil? Robert Cecil, the Queen's Minister. Cecil had him tortured. Died without revealing secrets of hiding holes. Poor man. Oh, no. Happy to die, Martin. 
Well, on the other side of the page, you have written something else that I cannot read. B O T. It looks like boats. Say that again. Boats. That's it. Well, where are we going? Back to Burwell Manor. <laughs> okay, okay. So all I said was, I find your English police method sort of. Quaint. He kicked me when it hurt, Seth. What? He kicked me. Sure, Max. You just keep talking. Well, of course I kicked him. He had a gun. I hadn't. And he was about to use it on Rourke. Well, this beer's gone a bit flat in the meantime, but uh, thanks for your help, Chief Inspector. Your health. Well, when I saw your boat out of here, followed by Miss Shiver... Ooh, and... boat. That was the missing word I wanted. I remembered another technique the Elizabethan builders used. They made the priest hole, as it's called, but not only that. When a priest hole was discovered, the searchers generally found it empty. And why? Because there was often another hiding place behind it, or, or even under it. Right. A bolt hole. So, Max, Venner, and Stan here, they were inside that bolt hole all the time we were searching? Even when I was inside of that fireplace? Yep. They were holed up there, thinking all they had to do was to sit it out until you and your uh, posse rode away. But the package? Two millions worth. Now, why leave all that heroin behind? Well, Maxie, Why? It took us by surprise, that's why. We was in the priest hole when we heard someone come. We put out our torch. It's dark. And Stan here, he fumbles. It's just time to get ourselves in the bolt hole. But not your precious package of drugs. Quite a game of <laughs> cat and mouse, eh, Marshal? You, Dick Coyne, and Mr. Vinely waiting on the outside while your quarry are holed up on the inside. Ah, too true. Only we didn't know, John, and so about an hour ago, I called my men back from the stake out. Not too far back, though, I'm glad to say. Manchester C Division isn't used to dealing with the Max Venners of this world. Still, we're learning. Ah, which reminds me, I want names from you, Maxie boy. Don't we all? Ah, but I have a way with me, Chief Inspector, for all our wild Apache games. But uh, words this time, rather than deeds. Uh, Max, how would you like it if I cabled stateside and have it put around that you've been sitting here, English pub style with us, and have been cooperating with the Bureau, and that I'm sending you back to be released. You'll be dead before I arrive, and you know it. Yeah, so it found. Better start naming names. The manager's office is this way. Come in. Just stay as you are, please, sir. He's going to his draw. Oh, I'll take him. You all right, Chief Inspector? I got winged on the top of my right arm. Take him down to the patrol car and then drive me to hospital. Well, well. If it isn't my old friend, Chief Inspector of Police who makes my patients leave hospital when they should be in bed. Ah, he's all right now. In fact, he brought me here. And because of you, I have to appear in front of the chief constable. Oh, so, my tough detective, you're ready to apologise. Who told you that? Um, the doctor says you're first to have an anti-tetanus injection before he looks at your wound. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Rourke. How hello. are you? A lot better, it seems. Ah, it's all cleared up, sister. Uh, and he'd have been just as happy to pin it on you. Oh, I don't think so. Well, now. Will you turn over for your injection, Chief Inspector? Now, the sight of a needle has always made me feel a bit off, sister, so go oh, easy. Oh, now, I always find the biggest and the toughest of them faint away at the sight of a little tiny needle. Oh! Oh! <laughs> All over. Well, I hope they keep you in. I've got to give you a few more injections. Now, Mr. Rourke. Would you like a nice cup of tea? Well, thanks all the same, sister, but I want to catch a girl before she boards a plane. Oh, I see. Just a moment, Rourke. First of all, will you now, kindly... Now, Chief Inspector, we can't have shouting in this hospital, or you'll get another jab. So just compose yourself until the doctor comes, and forget about giving orders. No. And you, John Rourke, outside. I don't want you disturbing the patient. Off you go, or she'll have flown away. Will Mr. Sean Keenas, a passenger from London, please go to the information desk. And will Miss Anna Schiller, passenger from Dusseldorf, go to the information desk? My 
heart leaps up when I behold... John! You haven't finished the verse. A rainbow in the sky. And I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. The dark windows of my room seem much more cheerful when you're about. Mine too. Have you got to take this plane? I have a seat booked, but... Mrs. Lee may have a meal waiting. In that case, I cannot let Mrs. Lee down. She doesn't like good food going cold. I'm, uh, I'm due for some leave. I am fascinated by your stately homes. We could tour them together. You look shocked. Together? I'm afraid... <sighs> that you wouldn't go touring with a fellow unless there'd been the blessings of nuptials and he'd taken you for better or worse until death do his part. Well, you know, having a touring honeymoon of England used to be the done thing. You're teasing me now. No. We have an English expression. What expression? And many a true word is spoken in jest. It's the only way to overcome that terrible English reserve that foreigners don't like. But you can have a formal proposal if you like. What girl doesn't deep down want a formal proposal? But that... ...is currently appearing in alphabetical order at the Mayfair Theatre London. It's half past eight. Tonight's Saturday Night Theatre is a play by Frederick Bradnam called Creepers, with Ian Holm, Jack May, Elizabeth Bell, and Philip Bond. All right, over here, Minlight. Yes, sir. Last week, yes. Shut up, Charlie. She fell from where? You shine your torch out that wall, please, Constable. Uh, yeah. uh, th there you are. Now, that window, which is open. What window is that, sir? Mm, one of the attic rooms. Mm -hmm. I thank you, Constable. Would she have been there in the normal course of events, sir? I have no idea. With Julia, there wasn't any normal course of events, Inspector. What did you say her name was? Butler. Detective Chief Inspector Butler, sir. Excuse me. Well, can you tell me anything, Doc? Drink. Only that the injuries I can see are consistent with falling head first from 50 feet odd onto a hard surface, like this patio. She died immediately. Broke her neck, fractured her skull, came down like a diver. And gravity didn't obtain long enough to turn her. Can my chaps take the pictures now? Uh, do. There's nothing more I can do here. They found her dead at 11. Kent says she was alive at 7 when they left for their dinner party. Mm. At a guess, I'd say she died about 9. I'll do the post-mortem in the morning, let you know about drink or drugs or anything. Fine, thanks, Doc. All right, lads, you can take your pictures. Right, sir. Do, do, do you want us out here any more, Butler? It's turning nippy. No, sir. Do take Mr and Mrs Cookham in, will you? And I'll join you in a jiffy. Hello. Who's this lady for? Me, sir. She's my detective sergeant. Good grief. Detective sergeant, I never would get. No, sir, she is prettier than most detective sergeants, but late. Uh, do bring her with you when you come inside, won't you? Come on, you two, in we go and finish our drinks. Well, D.S. Rogers, don't tell me you were with a boyfriend or in the bath. Or both, sir? I was sent to the wrong address. Keepers, five miles away. Phew. A small cottage inhabited by two very sweet middle-aged theatrical gents. They thought it was a terrific giggle. So I called up and I was told the right place, Creepers. Yeah, well, it's a good beginning. It's a good name for it, isn't it? Mm, covered in it. Mm. Somehow it's sinister in the moonlight, I always think. Dead lady, I see, sir. Yep. Julia Kent. Wife of Captain William Kent, RN, retired. Uh, the big bloke who, after... Patting your bottom has just gone in. Cut up about it, isn't he? Oh, his wife? Mm. Well, I've seen him around, sir, behaving like a punter. Well, it's the effect of your charm, lovey. Well, a few facts, all I have. Julia Kent was 40. Stayed home this evening when Kent and his house guests, the Cookhams, Charles and Mary, well-heeled, 30-odd, and either they're dim or they can't be bothered or they're scared, and they... Uh, where, where was I? Kent and the Cookhams went. Right. Uh, to dinner. Up the road, the Lawsons, leaving about seven. Oh, we must check that they were there. Well, I mean, I'm sure they were. And they arrived back here about eleven, poured themselves some drinks, 
And then Kent went into the conservatory and out onto the patio. Why, I didn't ask him. It being a fine moonlit night, he saw the lady at once, naturally. And rang us at 11.22. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, sorry, 23.22. Why did Mrs Kent stay behind, sir? No idea. No living in servants. She was alone. So she must have fallen. Yeah, the local PC tells me she was a, an unwise drinker. Lost her driving licence last month for two years. Oh, yes, and there was some lurid stories about her sex life going round locally. I've seen her with a horsey gent called Julian Marchbanks at Point to Point more than once. Oh, yeah. Good. Well, uh, let's go in and get it straight. <coughs> when they've finished uh, whatever they're doing, Sergeant, you can uh, take the body off and all go home, right? Uh, right, sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. This is the conservatory. So I see. Somebody goes in for creeping plants, don't they? Yes, they do. In here, no on your left. All right, Captain. You first, Raylene. Keep his attention. What a lovely room. Oh, glad you like it. What do you have to drink? Butler? Oh, I have a scotch, sir, thank you. Uh, Detective Sergeant Rogers. Damn silly, that sounds. Looking at you, you know. What'll you have? Oh, the same, sir, thank you. Can I have soda with it, please? Uh, why not? Anything for a lady. S sit down, Miss Rogers. Thank you. Just because the Chief Inspector prefers to prowl. This is a terrible business, Mrs. Cookham. Oh, uh, yes, I, I suppose it is. Uh, shocking. You any idea how it happened? Anything? Uh, don't ask damn four questions, oh. Charles. Uh, scotch and soda, Mr. Detective. Thank you. Scotch and water, Governor. That's what they call you, isn't it? I don't encourage you, sir. No, all I meant, Bill, was has Butler here find anything? I have a clue. Have you, Butler? Are you, Rogers? Only an open window. And a wall covered in creeper. Parthenocissus and Campsis. Virginia and Trumpet. Holds the place up. Julia loved growing creeping plants. I find them rather sinister and spidery. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see that attic room tonight, Captain Kent. The mystery is, I mean, what was Julia doing up there? Uh, finish your drink and I'll show you up. Thank you, sir. Uh, when you arrived back this evening, Mrs. Cook and Mr. Cook, did, did you notice anything at all out of place in the house? Mm. I can't say what sort of thing, but I mean anything that sort of, sort of struck you as odd or unusual. No, I'm, I didn't see or, or feel anything. Did, did you, Charlie? No, good Lord, no. Oh, you know, I wouldn't notice anything if someone moved the blooming door. <laughs> 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 and you, sir? No, I wasn't looking for anything except the drinks. Is the television set always at that angle? Uh, it is when Julia watches, then she can sit in that chair by the cabinet in which resides the booze and not have to get up. Mm -hmm. The set wasn't on when you came in, was it, sir? No, and I didn't test it to see if it was still warm. Right, well, uh, the attic room, I think, sir. And then we can all get some shut-eye. Right, you are. Uh, you don't want us up there, do you? No, sir, thank you very much. Thank God for that. And uh, thank you both for being so cooperative. Oh, jolly good. Uh, don't you think, Mary? Oh, yes, rather. Of course. <laughs> Go on, then, Chief Inspector. And you, girl. <laughs> up you go. Oh, bloody stairs. Door on the right. All right, sir. Yeah. Uh, you said you uh, looked in, sir, after you found your wife. Did, did you expect to find anything? I don't know what I thought of time. Signs of a struggle, maybe. Mm. What else? Oh, there's been no struggling in here, I'd say. Pristine tidy, don't you think, Rayleigh? Hmm. Mrs. Kent must have gone through it like a ghost. Hmm. Single bed, two tables, two chairs, one easy. Wardrobe. You got a cold coming on, dears? I was trying not to sneeze, sir. If somebody comes to stay and brings a personal servant, we bung the menial up here in the attics. This room first has a view which is considered stunning by those who are stunnable. Oh, yes. With this moon, you can see miles. Perhaps Mrs. Kent came up to see the view, would she? The landscapes by moonlight didn't turn Julia off, I'm sure. <laughs> oh. My Lord, yes, it is quite a view, isn't it? Like a parlour painting and not a fake. What did turn her on, sir? <laughs> You're too young to understand, aren't you? Try me, sir. I was in the Metropolitan for seven years. Uh, did you have experience of Julia's sort of woman? I have no idea what sort of woman she was, sir. And you would like me to tell you? Well, for instance, she didn't leave a note, did she, sir? 
A note? Uh, well, uh, no, 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 Julia wasn't a suicide, the last thing she was. I've known all sorts of wishes to emanate from the lady in all sorts of ways, but never the wish for her own death. May I make an observation about you, Captain Kent? The seeing it's from you, it's my pleasure. I know the English are good at concealing their feelings, but you can't really be so cold-blooded about your wife's death as you seem, can you, sir? I grew to hate the bitch. Although, as God's my judge, I can't dance a jig on her death. Going down like that from that window, bloody awful. But if you want to know, now she's dead, I can't feel anything except the knowledge she's no longer with us. And that's not so much a feeling as a knowing thought. That's all. Thank you, sir, for being so honest. She uh, didn't go with you to the Lawson's this evening because she didn't want to. There's no other reason. She may have had other reasons beyond not liking my friends. I don't know. I didn't ask. I was only too pleased she wasn't coming, and so was everybody else. Because if she ever did turn out with me, she was sure to get so boozed up she'd be a public disgrace. She drank quite heavily, did she, sir? <laughs> I thought every copper in the district knew that. Most of the time she drank casually and the rest of the time heavily. It's a syndrome not entirely unheard of in her sort of woman. Rich and spoilt. They're like some ships. They look top hole, but they, they need one hell of a lot of fuel to keep them afloat. Could anybody have called in to see her this evening, sir? Did you mean the ladies of the Women's Institute? I was thinking more of personal friends, sir. I thought you would be. Jesus, how I loathe this dirty linen stuff. However, somebody could have been in. Not the current boyfriend. He's in Ireland right in the GGs, and I hope he breaks his blasted neck. Anybody else in particular, sir? I don't know, Butler. She could have staggered down to the local boozer and picked up a farm boy. It depends on how she felt. And the attics would have been uh, the place to take a farmer's boy. Uh, shall I look at the other rooms, sir? Yes, do that, yes. You will, uh, you will have to look around outside, in the village and so on, I think. I'll do it gently, sir. It's snug and rustic around here, and everybody knows everybody else's business, I'm sure. It shouldn't be too difficult. I suppose things could have got out of hand for once. Uh, and there was the window. Perhaps it was open. Oh, can I ask you to see to it that nothing's touched in here, sir, until the fingerprint chaps give it a going over in the morning? By all means. Ah. Yes, our beauty back. Nothing, sir. It's all ship shape. And Bristol fashion, I'm sure. All right, sir. No more tonight. I'll ring you in the morning and tell you when I'm coming in. All right, come on, Rogers. You've had enough flattering attention for one night. Good night, Captain Kent. Do you mind driving, Raylene? I want to think. Something's not quite right, is it, sir? Oh, say that again. That attic room. Somebody besides the dead woman was in it. It was so very tidy, wasn't it? I mean, do you dive out of a window and not leave a mark? It's like a ghost, you said. I did, sir. My second sight, or what have you, felt some ex-presence, male and not at all nice. <laughs> well, what did you smell? <laughs> a terrible nose for smells, you know. <laughs> Heavy aftershave or a hair oil. I can't quite place it, but I will. She made a go at hanging onto the creeper just below the window, so she didn't shoot out, but slid. Oh, well, we'd better drive on. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> And the Cookhams? Uh, not at ease, were they? Now, what sort of clues did he expect us to have, for God's sake? And, and why, how did it happen? Oh, just making conversation, sir. And watching the captain. Yeah, they were, weren't they? I'll tell you something, Raylene. The Cookhams were up the creek without a paddle. Lost in a situation they had no previous experience of. And what sort of experience did their sort ever get? <laughs> I'll tell you one day. And if Julia drank like a fish, did she swig it from the bottle? I saw no dirty glass. Well, she could have put it tidily in the kitchen before she went upstairs with the lover uh, boy. Uh, tidy, again, you see. I should have looked at her bedroom. Well, probably that would have been tidy as well, anyway. Now, can your second sight tell us what they're up to in creepers at this very moment? Sorry, sir, no. It doesn't travel well out on its own. No, oh, well. I don't imagine they'll be back tonight. Do you? Well, do you? There's no sign of a return. Probably not. The 
they took their time leaving, must they? If I was butler, I know the first thing I'd do once I got that young woman into the car beside me. Really, Billy, <laughs> will you ever grow up so far as women are concerned? I doubt it. I seem to grow randier as I grow older. Oh, no, they've gone. They'll come away from the window, Charlie. You'll look like something out of a Hitchcock film. Hmm? Oh. Now, listen. Before we let friend Jenkins out... Let him out? I thought he'd done a bunk. You think he's responsible for Julia's death? Oh, oh. Uh, no, let's face that fence when we come to it. No, he's safely stashed away. I'll show you where in a minute. Oh. I thought they'd find him under a bed or somewhere. I was almost speechless with fright. He used to be an upstairs ducky in his room. Butler was x-raying everything with his eyes and the girl trying to smell things out. Uh, which reminds me, they're going to try for fingerprints in the morning. I wiped everything when I tied it up. That's when we noticed Jimmy's things had gone. So we thought he had to. <laughs> then we have a drill. Uh, he shoves everything in a box and takes it with him and we keep it all to the minimum. So it takes ten seconds. Thanks for doing the room, Mary. All they'll find is Butler and Rogers and my own prints. Good. I haven't had time until now <sighs> to think about it. It's a shocking, terrible mess, isn't it? Poor, wretched Julia. Yeah, the ghastly way to die. I mean, seeing the patio come up at you. Uh, don't let's go on about it. What I want to say is this. We must ask Jimmy what happened, but for the future's sake, we must mind how we go. Well, we've suffered from Jimmy's temper too, you know, Bill. That is the common link among the man's friends. But there's more to it than bad temper now. There must be, of course, ever since... if it was him. You've only been here 24 hours, and he's been on his best behaviour, pleased to see old pals' different faces. But believe me, there have been times these last six months when I... And Julia also have wondered if he wasn't a far-gone mental case. He always did have a bit of a screw loose, of course. Mm -hmm. He was an eccentric from a long line of eccentrics. But now he's something else. And being shut away for six months hasn't helped. It wouldn't help anybody, would it? So I beg of you, whatever he does, keep it cool. All right? All right. Well, where is he? Uh, just give the desk a push, will you, Charlie? Hmm? Like that? Oh. <laughs> Don't know my own strength. <laughs> it's on cunning little wheels. The carpet comes up. Why, Joe? Have you done all this yourself? This house is 400 years old. This is a priest's hole. Ah, I'd like a fiver for every poor sod who's been under this trap door <laughs> and a few girls, I'm sure. Now, there we are. Up it comes. Hmm. Magician's thread, does it, you know? See for yourself. A passage of steps goes down to a secret room in the cellars. Small and comfy. And we've improved the ventilation. There's a door at the other end, so it's all very soundproof. Did you know they used to find priests out by listening? <laughs> Evidently priests were very farty lot. I've <clears throat> I fitted a little buzzer. Three buzzes and the coast is clear. Once he goes dying, he can't put the desk back, can he? No, only close the trap door. And once the desk is in position, he can't get out, which is the one big hold I have over our gym. Once I found Julia tonight, I belted in here and put the desk back. I thought it safer. Shall we have him out? One, two, three. The coast is clear at last, old lad. Are you by yourself? No, Charlie and Mary are with me. Are they? I thought we agreed the less you know about this hole, the better. Ah, oh, things are not what they were, old scout. Charles and Mary need to know what to do. Oh, uh, so you've found Julia, have you? Well, it wasn't my fault. Help me out, will you? Otherwise, I have to shake... Hold up. on! Up we come! Oh. Oh, hello, Charles. Hello, Mary. Jimmy. Oh, boy. Tell us what happened, Jimmy. Where is she? In the morgue by now, I imagine. Oh, holy cow, you called in the authorities? I'm afraid so, old boy. What else could one do? A loser somewhere, dig a hole, drop her in the sea, anything. She would be missed sooner than later. She did have friends, you know, many friends. Not my friends, nor yours, were they? She's not the sort of woman you can sink without trace. That's all I'm trying to say, old scout. We're going to have the law all over us, crawling everywhere. For a week or so, yes. But it'll be nothing to what they would do if they decided she'd been done in. Then they don't leave a corner unexplored, believe me. <laughs> By the time they'd have cottoned on to anything, I'd be away, wouldn't I? 
It's been six blasted months now. It can't be much longer, can it? Whether you're here or not, I don't relish being suspected of killing my wife. I can't imagine why you didn't throttle her years ago. You know, Jimmy, bodies do have a nasty way of turning up when least expected. It always happens. Even from the depths of the sea, that man, the other day. Yes. So, uh, what can you tell the blue bottles? What have you told them? Have a drink. Hmm. The usual? I'll make it a stiff one. I ran out of the hard stuff down there. Now, Holmes Scout, before I tell you what I told the two police persons, you tell us what happened. Well, I... I was down here looking at the telly with the sound very low, you know. I like to keep an ear on the outside world when I'm alone. When I... I heard a, a scream and a, a thump, so... So I waited and then I sneaked out and saw her. She was dead all right, so I I thought, I thought I'd, I, I'd better go to ground just in case an unexpected visitor turned up and found her. It, 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 it put me in a bit of a tizzy, if you want to know. A foul moment. What time was it? Oh, the BBC News was on nine or so. I, I went upstairs to get my things and saw the window was wide open, so I guess she'd jump. Earlier, after we had left, what was she like? She left me alone at first, then she had a few. Then she became spiteful drunk, the way she can be. Told me I was a, I was a damn nuisance, and she'd a good mind to hand me over to the Rosses there and then. I say, that wasn't very nice of her, was it? Oh, she'd said it before when she was cut. Bill knows. That and lots more. Only Julia never remembered when sober what the hell she'd been up to when drunk. Anything else, Jimmy? Oh, I was given the usual spiel about me and my friends and your friends. The, the Mayfair Mafia, as she calls us. Did call us, isn't it, now? And the usual stuff about us and her and how we only put up with her because she has oodles in the piggy bank and how we reckon we're a law unto ourselves and we don't care a cuss for anybody not like us. All I did was to agree with her and put the telly on. And then she went upstairs and threw herself out of your window. Of course, she could have gone up to do some damage. Throw your things out of the window or something, sort of <laughs> gesture, and, and went out herself by mistake. Fine, <laughs> go, of course. That's it, brilliant. Oh, girl. Oh, clever that, Mary. I bet you're dead right. Bill? It's a perfectly good explanation. I can think of no other. So, there we are. What explanation did you give the police? I gave no explanation. I only suggested she may have had a... A lover boy in and things got out of hand. Well, the hell didn't you say she just had had enough and jumped? It wasn't on. I won't be as unfair as that to Julia. <laughs> and I needed to keep to the truth as far as possible. Have the Rosers swallowed it? I've no idea. The man Butter doesn't give anything away. He'll check out the village lads, probably find nothing. What does one do if they will find somebody? Well, say a funeral. All being well, we should get a verdict of accidental death. And I'll grant you that alcoholics have been known to fall for the hell of it. I'll, I'll, I'll have to keep a very low profile, won't I? You will, Jimmy. But we'll do our best to keep you free from going down the mine. We'll just have to be quick on the draw, that's all. I, 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 I should have kept an eye on Julia, you know. I, I, I can't forgive myself easily, you know. Uh, after all you've done for me... Could easily hand me over, but pick pick up the phone and say I've got Jonah Jenkins here. But you, but you don't because you're a real old pal, Bill. Yes, yes, old oh boy. Real... I'm in the mood for love. <clears throat> oh dear. A policeman's lot is not a happy one. Do you know, dear Sir Rogers, that the expression "pig" is 19th century? Second half, sir. Ooh. In particular, the plain clothes men, I believe. Hmm. I think we'll have to start being fairly piggy if we're ever going to discover who shoved Mrs. Julia Kent out of that window, don't you? <sighs> yes, sir. But piggy with whom? <laughs> Damn it, Moriarty, you've seen through to what I don't know. So, let's see what it is that we do know, shall we? Now, autopsy. Ignoring her fatal injuries, uh, starting to go to sea, but nothing serious. Inebriated up to the gills. Now, one thing oddish, a sort of wheel, reddish mark at the base of her back. Now, mm. give it thought. Fingerprints. <coughs> Yours, mine, Kent's, and some smudge ones. Now, if I had a suspicious mind, I think somebody had wiped the paintwork. 
Well, the lover boy would only have handled Julia, sir, so it could be natural. Natural? Hmm. Now, what about lover boy? Well, the horsey boyfriend March Banks is and was in Ireland. Anyway, why would a lover push her out of the window? Uh, what sort of lover's tiff would come to that? Oh, Mr Butler. Mm -hmm. That perfume I could smell in the attic room. Yes. I had a sniff round the mail counter in that expensive store in town, and I'm sure it was honey and flowers hair oil. Honey and flowers. Very much Captain Kent and company, isn't it? <laughs> well, the inquest is tomorrow. I suppose we could have one last chat with Kent about Julia's friends. I suppose one of them could have driven down and done it. And the Cookhams still worry me, you know. Uh, is uh, Captain Kent at home, Mrs Cookham? Uh, no, he's stepped out for a breath of fresh air. He, he, he won't be long. Or all this rain, you know. Oh. Do you mind if we wait? No, 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 of course not. Um, do come into the drawing room. You look cold, Miss Roger. Oh. Well, Mr Butler, we'll drive with the windows open. We'll go into the drawing room. I'll get some coffee. Thank you. Oh, Charlie. Uh, Mr Butler and Miss Rogers, they're going to wait for Bill. There he is, of course. Come in and sit down. Thank you. I'll put the old uh, electric fire on. We've had the windows open in here, airing it out, oh. you know. <laughs> it's nasty weather for the time of year. Yes, isn't it? Uh, soon warm up. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cookham. Yeah. Smoked a few cigars in here last night. Now, Bill and myself. <laughs> Not your wife, I'm glad to hear. Oh. No, women have been known to. Anyway, you've got rid of the smell, Mr. Cookham. There's not a trace. Yes, my DS has a very highly developed olfactory sensor. Which is mostly a damn nuisance. Yes, I bet. Besides the airing, have you dusted and hoovered, Mr. Cookham? No, actually, I... <laughs> I see what you mean. No, no, the captain keeps a couple of domestics who uh, come in. Mm -hmm. Local people, are they? I don't know. I suppose they're local. Ah, oh, here's Mary. Oh. Uh, the coffee was hot. Uh, milk, Miss Rogers? Oh, please, and black for the DCI. Where do the domestics come from, Mary? Do you know? Oh, from the village, I gather. I think Bill really needs to find somebody younger if he's going to stay, that is. Mrs Batty and her sister are very ancient. <laughs> oh, that coffee smells good. I shouldn't think they're much good at moving this furniture around. Each piece must weigh a ton. Oh, or am I being rather rude? <laughs> no, you're quite right. Um, Thank you. I thought Thanks. the old lady said that you'd seen them and asked them questions, Mr Butler. Uh, oh, no, 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 not me, no, the village PC, but I'll tell him he's been promoted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody's left that desk over there a bit askew, haven't they? <laughs> oh, dear, it's coming on to rain again, I see. Yes, there it is. The doll. I the desk off like that, I mean. Uh, mm. Bill was moving it around looking for something that had fallen apart. Oh, I shouldn't him. worry, Mrs Cookham. Mr Butler has an awful talent for spotting things out of place. Quite <laughs> <laughs> useful in the detective, what? Well, most things out of place, as Raylene puts it, are so by chance and disappointingly unimportant to a detective. Oh, <laughs> yes. Captain Morning, Captain. Butler. I see you brought the desirable detective sergeant with you. Couldn't keep her away, sir. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Just having my morning constitutional between the cats and dogs. <laughs> what can I do for you? I wish I knew, sir. But tell me who was in the attic room with your wife, because I can't tell you. I thought you two were the detectives. Uh, we can't detect a single culpable fact. Not a sniff in the village. What about outside the village, Captain Kent? I gave you a list of the people we were on visiting terms with as part of the county. No good at all, sir. A more innocent collection of non-clandestine visitors I have yet to meet. Uh, Dallas Ditchwater, most of them. I was thinking of London. One can drive from the south of the river to here in a couple of hours. I think all Julia's friends live south of the river. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you wouldn't know if any one of them would have caused to come here on that evening. Sir. My dear fellow, I gave you her address book. You can check them out. The inquest tomorrow, are you going to ask for an adjournment? Oh, well, we check out 200 names. No, I think not, sir. No coroner would stand for it, and certainly not ours. I think she must have fallen. It's accidental death. Well, that's what I came to say. Um, well, and to ask for the last time if you've remembered anybody who could have been a violent enemy of the dead woman? Uh, no, no, but uh, the answer is as previously. My friends didn't like her, but they didn't hate her. Mm. Her friends seemed to like her, but I knew none of them very well. Yes, well, I'm afraid, sir, that uh, there's no rational or logical explanation for Mrs Kent's death, but then death is sometimes like that. Well, uh, we must be away. I'll see you at the inquest. Thank you for your help, sir. Uh, come on, my girl. I'll see the mic, Bill. No, thanks. 
See you tomorrow, Butler. Roger. Thank you for the coffee, Mrs. Cooker. Not at all. Oh, <sighs> you and your wife are going to return home tomorrow is coming. What the devil happened, Mary? He wouldn't go to ground. He opened the windows and went out. Why didn't he get on with it? I'd go upstairs and see they depart properly. Right. Bill, did you find him outside? I did. He thought it was funny, he did. He's in the greenhouse. It wasn't funny. I thought he was going to brain Charlie with the door stop. The idiot. I'm beginning to lose patience. We must get him out of the country. Hold everything. They're coming back. Oh, what? no. Oh, that girl. Mm. She's left her bag. I'll take it. Come here, Charlie. I'll cope with it. Did she do it on purpose, you think? Wait for them to ring. Where the hell is Jimmy? In the greenhouse. Now, I know who oh. that is. Oh, stop fidgeting, Charlie. I guess it was you. Yes. Enjoyed this afternoon, though. Thank you. So sorry. Must rush. Bye. Bye. <sighs> no. I wonder... Alarms and excursions, and did she leave it on purpose? Aren't we being all too suspicious? Do you think they have any idea? Might someone in the house, I mean. Oh, that'd be altogether too far-fetched, surely. And are they still looking for Ginny officially, Bill? Surely not. No, officially they aren't. Unofficially, they reckon he's dead by his own hand. There are times, like now, when I wish the idiot was. What did he think? Because two coppers come to the front door, there won't be two at the back. What were they on to you about? Domestic star situation, and oddly enough, the size and weight of the furniture in here. Huh? And Master Butler noticed the desk was askew. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'd moved it to put Jimmy down the hill, and I didn't put it back squarely. Sorry. Mm, there's something bugging Butler about this place. I'm not sure about the girl, but Butler is a sort of instinctive bloke. I get the impression that he's aware something's not quite straight here, don't you? He always makes me feel bloody uneasy, like my housemaster used to. Now, I think the girl is quite as sensitive to things as he is, only she doesn't show it. They're really rather a good team, you know. Now Julia's gone, I think I shall sell this house. So we'll have to get James away, or somebody else hide him. Shall I get him in? Where's Mrs. Batty and Sister Hilda? I sent them up to do the bedrooms. Hmm. Let the beggar stay out for a moment. It'll cool his ardour and my temper. That's another problem that's getting worse, dodging Batty and Hilda. Well, I'm going to be thankful that they're so decrepit and short-sighted. <laughs> Only one is short-sighted. I can't remember which. The other's just stupid. <laughs> the trouble is that our James is becoming careless with them. And I wonder if they've seen anything and made anything of it. And I've had to put up with Julia's cooking, so there's always enough for Jimmy. Well, we, sh we should go, go, go back after the inquest. So what, what can you do? Give me a few days to organise Adrian and Sarah. They did promise. Of course, Bill. Oh, I shall be happy when the inquest is over, and I think we all will be. Yeah, yeah, old girl. Good morning, Mr. Butler. Good morning. The first day of summer. Is it? I thought the inquest went smoothly yesterday. Did you? Well, the lecturer's captain and the cookums didn't actually cheer when the accidental death was given, but only just not. So I thought... I can see you have a lot on your desk, sir, and on your mind, so shall I get on with something else? Uh, no. You'll sit down and listen. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, have you ever read Simonon's Maygray stories, Rayleigh? Chief Inspector Maygray. Hmm. Some years ago. One of the things Simonon makes him good at is getting at the centre of the puzzle, and that centre is as often a person or a place as it's a situation. So Maigret works his way inside a person's skin or prowls around a place until it reveals something to... You see what I mean? Creepers, you mean? Yes. Creepers. Now, from the very first moment I entered that place, I felt it was the actual house that held the secret of how Julia Kent died. Oh, I know, it sounds melodramatic, doesn't it? No, not really. I felt things about that house myself. Hmm. It's there, isn't it? Among those smooth, cool, rich people. The outward manifestations are obvious. I mean, furniture out of line, windows open, Cookham looking out from the landing window to see us leave, Kent out for a constitutional in smart town shoes in the pouring rain. No outward signs of Julia's drinking that night, but in her stomach. Mm, honey and flowers in the attic, no cigars in the drawing yes. room. Yes. 
And after the inquest yesterday, I called in at the county archives room. Now, all, look, all this on my desk is the result. It's a very old village, full of antiquities, including creepers, <clears throat> which is a 14th century foundation and up to 20 years ago had one of the finest authentic priest's holes in England. Up to 20 years ago? Well, that's the last time that its existence was recorded. Now, there's more than a good chance that it's still there, the priest hole, and the present owners know about it. I've got some plans of the house here somewhere. Wait a minute. It's under all this lot somewhere. Yeah, look, here we are. You see these? Look, see for yourself. You are trapdoor at spot mark T. Three feet from the south wall of the drawing, w drawing room, where the desk was askew, remember? Beneath it is a passage down to a secret room in the cellars, eight by eight. That's it. So who are they hiding? Something Kent is ashamed of, do you think? It can be this in these cases. I mean, a, a monstrous child, a lunatic brother, the, the sort of thing gothic novels were full of. Or is it something criminal? It could be criminal, sir. Do you have a reason for that statement? The other day I remembered where and how I knew about the Kents. It had been worrying what? me for some time. They'd been in the press all over the front pages of the popular press six months or so ago. So I dug up the newspaper file on them. Only after I'd read it, it didn't seem to have any bearing on our problem. But I'm perhaps wrong. The Kents and the Cookhams come to that were members of the set to which one James Jonah Jenkins belonged. Uh, my dear girl, how very clever of you. Now, we, we've got a file on Jenkins um, somewhere next door. I'll get it, sir. Here we are. Oh, hell, bulky. I should have remembered. <laughs> the Met kept it strictly to themselves, otherwise I might have. 14th of November last. Uh, Mrs Jenkins found dead in her Cadogan Place flat, strangled after being knocked around. Tenants of flat below heard banging and smashing, rang 999, went out to see and saw Jenkins coming down the stairs. He ran out, was picked up by a passing cabbie who noticed from his face that his, he was bleeding and from scratches and his shirt torn, took him to the 500 Club in Curzon Street. Dorman confirmed he looked as if he'd been in a fight, went into the club and has never been positively seen again. He must have had very good friends. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, it seems Mrs Jenkins wasn't of her husband's set and, like Mrs Kent, was disliked by them. Um, what else? Yeah, Jenkins. Two previous. Assault on person. Fined. Fights with wife on three occasions, reported by name as the police. <laughs> Jimmy Jenkins would have been quite at home in some of the nastier parts of Glasgow. Hmm. Wealthy, Eton and household cavalry, social, horse racing set. Mayfair, new market and so on. Uh, well, 40, look, I quote. Jenkins has some 20 close friends who stick together like toffee. Not a word out of place, not a word too much. Mayfair Iron Curtain. The law, something that's no concern of theirs. May I see, sir? Yes, do. Thanks. Mm, a warrant out on Jenkins for murder still. Not surprising, no. eh? Do you think if he pushed Julia out of the window, Kent would still protect him? Kent's stuck with him, isn't he? Mm. He can't hand him over now without being charged himself. Can't get rid of him. Probably that's proving very tricky. And like us, he could assume she fell. The Kents were seen, I see, for the last time three months ago. I say, sir, did you what? know they had creepers under surveillance up until that last interview? I didn't. I bet the village did, though. The chaps from the Met didn't get very far with W. Kent. He was very uppity. You did a lot better. I had something on him, and he wanted to impress you. Yes. He's invited me round for a drink. Oh. Well, put on your tin knickers and go, then. Well, that's what I thought. <laughs> I see they reckon Jenkins has done himself in. No idea where. Somebody thinks his pals would bury him. But they have it away, haven't they? We must be right, you know, sir. Mm. Well, only no by flushing him out. Well, we could get a search warrant, surely. Oh, not to look for Jenkins, I couldn't. Not without the Met backing it up. And I've no other reason to search the house, have I? Anyway, I might still find Jenkins elusive. I mean, the wretched house is probably a warren of hiding holes not in the archives. And it'd be more fun flushing him out, squaring up to Kent. Yes, sir. Well, what next, sir? Well, let's see. Yes, I'm going to talk to the two old biddies who clean creepers. You go and talk to Kent. Gin in the private bar for me and champers in the drawing room for you. Huh? <laughs> Come on, Jimmy, off your bed and on your feet. Our radiant will be here in 15 minutes, and I want you right out of the way. I don't feel like going down the mine tonight, Bill. Oh, no? What do you feel like? A night out somewhere? Oh, why not? 
Nobody remembers me. I've grown a beard. Nobody's looking for me. So you keep telling me. There's a warrant out for your arrest on charge of murder. So come on, old scout. Now isn't the time for argument. Now's the time for action, I grant you. I've never had it off with a policewoman, nor have you, I'd say. It is always a first time. Have you got the things you want? Book and booze are down there. Oh, come on, then. She's not staying for supper. This is just a preliminary skirmish, is it? Has to be, isn't it? With Charles and Mary here. When are they being relieved? God alone knows. Adrian and Sarah have problems. The poor cuckoos are getting twitchy, and I don't blame them. Come along, boy. Oh, sorry, I... I was just thinking how nice it would be... Uh, what? What would be nice? To escape. Oh! You silly bloody oaf! Charles, Mary, stop the idiot! Blast and damnation! My knee's gone! Charles, Jimmy, on his way out! Oh, Charlie, quick! Oh, Jimmy, please, Mary, but the fool! Oh, keep away from me, Mary. I'm going to have a little drive. Back later! I was, uh, what, what's going on? Jimmy go right. Let's hope he breaks his bloody neck ten miles away. What did he do? Shove me down the stairs, cunning bastard. This knee goes easily. It's our car he's taken, Charlie. I suppose he will come back. Oh, where can he go? I doubt if he's got more than a fiver on him. Hell, it's It's a night nightmare, isn't it? Ah, police girl will be here in a moment. I twisted my knee in the garden this afternoon, right? Yes. What? She can't stay long, so she said. So she'll be given a couple of snorters and shown the door. But what if he comes back while she's here? I'll go out. If we hear the car, you two stay here. Good on you. Bloody Jimmy. I'm going to carry my service revolver on me in the future. And if there's any argument, he goes down the mine at gunpoint. And if I shoot him dead, who's to know except his poor blighters of friends? And we won't shed tears, will we? Come on. We'd better try to seem normal for Miss Rogers and thank our lucky stars that that gimlet-eyed butler bloke is elsewhere this fine summer evening. Oh, well, what do you both have? Uh, uh, Mrs. I, I, Spatty, Miss... Uh, no, she's never called anything else but Hilda, Mr. Butler. Oh, right. Hilda. Uh, what is it to be? Well, uh, Hilda will have a stout. I, I always have a stout. And if you don't mind, I'll have a gin and it. Right. <laughs> right, thank you, lady. All the stout, uh, gin and it, uh, quite a proper... Uh, a young policeman came and talked to us. Had a cup of tea, he did. Had a uniform. Where's yours? Oh, Mr. Butler's plain clothes, Hilda. I used to have a uniform once, you know. Uh, did they take it away because it was bad? Ha, 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 ha. I think that's right, landlord. Uh, something for yourself, huh? You, sir. Here we are, ladies. Ah, you lovely. Thank you. Uh, and you're very good health. And you, sir. And a terrible thing, poor Mrs. Kent out of the window like oh, that. Oh, we don't never go up there. They've got spooks. Mm. But the attics, you mean, uh, do you, Hilda? Oh, the attics. Ghost of a young girl, so they say. And a fella. I see the fella. No, no, he's not a ghost. Oh. He's the unfortunate creature left behind. Oh. Ah. Uh, how long have you worked there at Creepers? Oh, only five months now, and Hilda, too. Uh, Mrs. Kent had living in servants what went, they uh, did. Uh, there, there was a row, was there? We heard there was all sorts of things. They had one living in first, been with them for years. Nice, respectable lady, only only she had a son out of wedlock, so it was said who was funny in the head. Not all that. Oh, he oh. were a bit balmy, yeah. Ah, oh, he's the unfortunate creature, is he? He's still there in the house. There's no knowing. He could be. Hmm. What was this housekeeper's name? Uh, Mrs. Cobbler. A uh, cook general more than housekeeper. Oh. I didn't know there were such things left. Oh, yes, yes. She left, did she? Yeah, and the captain got in a, a piece of stuff from the continent. Mm -hmm. What's known as an au pair, I believe. Oh, yes. From Denmark, mm -hmm. she was. Very handsome girl. Oh, she had flat all down her back and, and tight trousers all over her, you know what. Uh, she and Mrs. Cobbley <laughs> didn't knit it off, not at all. I mean, Mrs. C, she'd sit here in this very seat and she'd tell of the goings on at the house. Shocked she was. Well, very respectable she was, but for a lapse. So one day she packed her bags and she went. And and you think that she left her lapse behind? Uh, it's like they say, Mr. Butler. Nobody saw him leave. Uh, I, I do like me drop a stout, I do. <laughs> oh. Oh, you'll have another, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure <laughs> too, yes. And you, Mrs. Butler? Oh, very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, All right, uh, Thank you, landlord. Uh, same again, please. That was a stout uh, uh, gin in it and a pint of So Mrs. Cobley left, and then you joined the staff, oh. yeah? Poor Mrs. Kent. 
Oh, she asked us to come and work there. The girl did nothing, so it seemed just lay around on her bed all day up in the attics. Oh, and that captain would go up a lot. That girl? She was just a cucumber in for his pleasure. Oh, here we are, ladies. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think you. But she, she didn't last long, this Danish girl. Oh, no? bottoms up. <laughs> oh, that was one of the captain's expressions. No, no, the captain went up to Scotland for the shooting, yeah. so Mrs. Kent, she jumped at her chance, and <clears throat> out she went overnight, belongings and oh, all. Nobody saw the going of her, but, but gone she was. Uh -huh, but that, that left the pair of you to run the house. You do everything, do you? Oh, not the top rooms. We don't go up there. We, we've heard No, so things. we said, begging your pardon, madam, but we'd rather not do out <laughs> those old rooms. And she said it didn't matter, not at all. Nice as anything she was. Uh -huh. Do you do the cooking, too? Never allowed to, Mr. Butler. And she said when she engaged, you can cook, Mrs. Batty. <laughs> oh, Hilda prepares. Uh, yeah, uh, vegetables in delight. Uh -huh. Do you reckon that Mrs. Kent was uh, cooking for an extra man? Well, I seed a man up the top of the stairs looking down, and I seed him once in the garden with the captain, hurrying like to the greenhouse. What was he like to look at, Hilda? Oh, uh, shorter than the captain, broad though, a long hair and a big beard. Was he fair or dark? Oh, fair to yellow, white skin, but what could be shaved. Uh huh. Have you ever seen this man, Mrs. Butler? No, can't say I have, Mr. Butler. But then I'm as blind as a bat, no, but but I heard things from the attic. Oh, yeah, such as? Bad language, shouting, uh, uh, yeah. and, and the poor thing had a shocking cough when we was first there, and, and that's when I asked Mrs. Kent... To, did did to, you? To, yes. was, well, what did she tell you? Well, that's when she said Mrs. Cobbley left her trouble who was weak in the head behind, but we weren't to say anything. Not even the captain was to know we'd been told. I heard her on the phone going on about him, who had a screw yes. loose. <sighs> I'm told there's um, a secret hiding place in the house. Oh, I once looked through the windy and got a fright. There I see the captain coming up through the floorboards. First the top of his head, then his head and shoulders... Then half of him. Then I couldn't stand no more and run off. Oh, we tried to find where he came up, but we couldn't. Oh. I thought Elva had an illusion, but, but she swears. I see them coming up through the floor, like a jack-in-the-box, only slower. I'm sure you did, Hilda. Uh, there, yeah, you see? He knows. And where is our Mr. Butler, this fine evening, ready? Oh, we may call you really, may we? You may, Captain Kent. Mm. And I'm Bill, and she's Mary, and <laughs> that's Charlie daydreaming at the window. Oh, sorry. Awfully rude of me. That's uh, Mr. Butler's uh, having a nice, quiet evening with his family. No, he hasn't a family. Oh. He's not that villain catching and such like, I hope. I hope he's having a quiet pint in a pleasant pub, but you can never be sure. I suppose you're never really off duty, are you? There isn't exactly Chicago around here, Charlie. No, I don't often work much after six any evening, and I do keep my weekends free, mostly. Uh, but with Butler, you could never be sure, eh? I meant not only with Mr. Butler, with any of us. But you're not on duty now, are you, what? No, I've left my handcuffs at home. <laughs> I've brought your handbag instead. <laughs> uh, Mary, fix us all another drink here. Yes, of course, Bill. Uh, same as before, really. Thank you. I'll give you a hand. Oh, thank you, darling. How did you do your knee in, Bill? Hmm? Uh, in the garden. Don't tell me you garden. Oh, I do a bit. Why the hell shouldn't I? Naval men hardly ever do. Don't grow things. And you've had an extensive knowledge of naval men? I once knew a chap who was a commander in the Irish Navy. Uh, did he command the big growing boat or the small one? <laughs> Here we are, Amy. Uh, thank you. Bill? Oh, thanks so I've been told that the Irish make excellent sailors. You try saying harder stone to a paddy and see what becomes of you. <laughs> I say, I've suddenly thought. Are you Irish, Raylene? My father comes from Cork. <laughs> I, I, I think Bill Kent has dropped out of his better clatter. <laughs> My dad owes a Patrick, but he'd forgive you. How did you do that knee, though? I stumbled. Dead sober, too. And it went. It's a week and I ruined it playing polo years back. Oh, yes, of course. What does, oh, yes, of course, and that look mean? I remember once reading about some of your pursuits in a paper. At oh, that time... We're all of us plastered all over the papers. Awful it was. 
Do you know, somebody actually wrote a whole column about our new bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and I suggest that they ought to do something about the loo. <laughs> <laughs> Seems years ago, but it can't be. About six months ago, wasn't it? Yes. Six months, or just over. I suppose you know all about Jonah Jenkins. Oh, only what I read up. Like every other copper, I was meant to be looking for him. Ah, oh, poor old Jimmy. He seemed a bit of a thug to me. Oh, he was. But he was a friend. Must stick by your friends. As a copper, you should know that. I know I thought at the time that Jenkins was a pretty dangerous sort of chap to stick by. Mm, you never easy. You mean, really, that he wasn't to be trusted? More or less, yes. Oh, it doesn't matter. I really didn't mean to bring the subject up. I say, are you still looking for him? Not very actively, but officially he's still wanted. Well, his body will turn up someday, I dare say. Uh, uh, car. Mary. Yes, dear. Uh, do excuse me, Raylene. It's the garage. They very kindly brought my car back. No, no, it's all uh, right, Charlie. I have some cash. Oh, uh, jolly good. Um, uh, decent garage they are. Around here, you are lucky. Which one is it? Oh, uh, uh, uh what, what's it called, Bill? Uh, the Mayflower. Bloody awful, usually, but Mary's charmed them. Well, I must be off in a minute. Oh, uh, do have another drink. No. No, thank you all the same. I'm driving, and if I get caught over the top, I'll be sent as a filing clerk to somewhere like the Outer Hebrides. Oh, do wait for Mary to return. She won't be a moment. I, I think I will go and see if, if she's all right. I mean, I mean if, if, if the car's all right. I shan't be Jeff. Oh, Charlie. Does he always go on as if he's just committed the crime of the century? Come to think of it, yes, he does. He probably was bullied no end at school. He's a natural fag, is Charlie. She's nice, Mary. Ah, oh, bright girl. But you'd have to be, wouldn't you, with poor Charlie? No, I can't see myself putting up with him. <laughs> no, nor can I. You would need a man who's about as independent as yourself, I dare say. Possibly. And one who doesn't mind jokes about detective sergeants in nighties. Try me. Thank you. Well, what are you going to do now? Um, at this very moment, you mean? Uh, remember your knee, my man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, are you going to stay on here? It's such a wonderful house. Oh, it's not my business. Uh, why shouldn't it be? Uh, to be honest, for once, I don't know. I need a moment of time to make up my mind. You should take a holiday, perhaps. Get away from it all. I know I'd want to. Would you now? Where should we go? Uh, oh, somewhere. Lots of sea. Only I'd need a little notice so that the great crime wave can be attended to while I'm away. Oh, that's easy. There's quite a bit of unfinished business to clear up here before I can get away, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. The Cookhams will stay to help. Mm, for the moment. Very decent of them. I hope the garage isn't being difficult, or Charlie isn't checking on their handiwork. The longer, the better to have you on my own. <laughs> I think you're the first ex-customer who's ever made a pass. Good grief, am I an ex-customer? In a way, yes. Yes. Bloody odd, I never thought of it like that. Did you reckon I'd given the little woman the fatal shove? A dead wife suddenly dead always makes a copper glance at the living husband. Glance as much as you like, as long as I can glance back. Of course, you weren't seen running from the house in a dishevelled state. Your eyes are what's called cornflower blue, do you know? Like one Jenkins. Cornflower blue? It goes with the hair. Corn blonde. Do you believe, even as an old pal, that Jenkins did it? My family say straw blonde, Dolly with straw plaits. Oh, you've known Dollies with plaits, straw plaits. You're not them. Oh, of course he did, it was only a matter of time. Dolls aren't dark. Takes a bit of living down in a blonde, the doll image. If he's alive, do you think he's racked by remorse? Oh, good old our James, remorseless type. How could you be a doll with such a skin? Peaches and cream, or spotted pig. Terrible in the sun, freckles appear. But you reckon he's dead? Just tell me, and I'll take you to where the freckles will appear. <laughs> oh, yes, he's as dead as mutton. Go on. Oh. All settled. Ah, I, I am so glad. And the car really goes? Yes, yeah, like a bomb. Doesn't it, Mary, old thing? Doesn't it what? Car. Go like a bomb. I don't think that's a very tactful way of putting things these days, do you? Oh. Well, I must go also. Unlike a bomb, I hope. Uh, do, do come again. You've... You've done my near power of good. I never touched it, believe it or not. Of course not. It's a psychosomatic knee injury. Kindness cures. Can't get up to show you out there. No, I'm housemaid for today. Well, I'll say goodbye. And, uh, 
Thank you for the drink. Has she gone? Really gone? I watched and waved as she drove off. Ah. My hair turned white. I swear Jimmy will send me to an early death. I feel quite done in. I really fancy that girl, you know. I know. But I still don't entirely trust her. She would keep hammering on about Jimmy in between being sexy. Well, it could be just a normal police person's curiosity, couldn't it? Mm. Got to get rid of Jenkins. Charlie, you go to London tomorrow and pay a visit to our old pals. Tell them I'm being buzzed by the blue bottles much too closely and I must have out. Yes, right, there. I'll do my best. Out of the country with him. Out of this house. Somebody else must do the minding. Tell them that, Charlie. I've had six months and I don't want another six days even. Enough. He's upstairs. Shall, shall I... Uh... Did he go quietly? Oh, yes. He was positively contrite. That's the usual pattern. After he'd killed that poor, bloody wife of his, he was a bag of blubber for days. And a fat lot of good it does any of us. <clears throat> Shall I, uh... Get him down, please. Better to have our eyes on him. Uh, y yes, I couldn't agree more. I suppose you have tried reasoning with him. Oh, yes, no end. So did Julia. He listens and agrees, or won't listen and he's sulk. Go to the chair, Jimmy. Come Depending on, how the mood him. takes him... Either way, it makes no difference. He can't change his spots, He's a dyed-in-the-wall leopard, and the spots go beneath the skin. Give us another drink, old thing. Oh, yeah, I don't think I've ever drunk so much as here are. recently. Hello, good chap. That's a nice and bloody twerk. I say, look here. We've changed our mood to one of bravado, I hear. Come in, Jimmy. Oh, you won't... I'd like a brandy and... Holy cow! Yes, Jimmy. It's my service revolver in my hand. And it's loaded. And I do know how to use it, and I have used it in anger. And unless you stop this farting about, I will use it in anger again to shoot you down like a mad dog. Give him his drink, Mary. Yes, I'll just pour it. Sit down, Jimmy. Over there. Oh, all no right. It's a rotten thing to say to anyone, but I'm going to say it to you. You're not sane, you know. You should be in a place where you can be given proper attention. Somewhere like Broadmoor would be ideal, but not possible. Here's your brandy and soda, Jimmy. Uh, what about you, Charlie? Large scotch, please. What, what are you going to do, Bill? I don't know, Jimmy, because I'm going to behave just as I feel at any given moment. Indulge my every mood, as you do, old scout. So if I just happen to feel like pressing the trigger when you're not looking, then I shall. Or if I don't want to see you for a few days, I'll put you down the hole and not move the desk away. How's that? Well, uh, not the hole. It's, it's bad enough after a couple of hours. I, I, I'd go mad. You are mad. So all you do will be to exhibit your madness to an audience of one. Shriek and scream to yourself. Mary, don't let him do it. Charles! Does it jolly well right the way you behave? I quite agree. It may teach you a lesson. I, 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 I'm sorry, Bill. Really, I am. I'll, I'll try to take a whiff of myself. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> not possible, is it? You don't know yourself. You think you're one person one moment, another the next. You have no real self. Nothing to take a grip on. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I wish I did. I do well. Really. Oh, don't start blubbering. We won't take any notice anyway. You posed the question when you lost your cool and murdered roof. The answer so far has been a sort of agony for your poor blooming friends who hide you, put up with you, indulge your moods and make ourselves part of a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. And whatever we think of those laws and that justice, it's by them that we'll be tried and sentenced. So we can't hand you over now. Even if we pretended you had only just arrived on our doorstep and like decent citizens, etc., etc., none of us could trust you not to say the first accusing stupid thing to come into your mad head. Why can't you get me out of the country? Oh, let us hope we can very soon. Otherwise... If you shot me... Nobody would know, would they? Charles and Mary would. I don't want to shoot you, Jimmy. For one thing, I don't want you on my conscience for the rest of my natural. You're, you're, <laughs> you're not worth it, old son. But if you don't do as you're told in future, if you put us at risk, as you've done today, once more, then I'll put a bullet into your heart. Savvy? Savvy. Uh, Charlie is going up to town tomorrow to try to get you off our trembling hand. Is it still Switzerland? I don't know. Timbuktu, for all I care. Now you must go down the hole, just in case our friendly police persons decide to pop in again. 
I'm hungry. Can't I, can't I stay and eat? No, you can have something later, when I know there's not the buzz of a brew bottle for miles. Uh, go on. Down you go. I'll move the desk. Uh, don't let him keep me down there too long, Mary. I beg of you. Until we're sure the police aren't around. I can't think why they should be around suddenly. Because you've been travelling the country, old scout, and the female fuzz was here when you decided to return. I swear nobody saw me. They know it wasn't me driving the bally old car. And they all know the bally old car, it being the only one of its sort in the district for sure. Where did you go, by the way? I don't know. How could I bally well know? I just drove it in a sort of circle. Luckily, I remember the name of the village, otherwise I should have been totally at sea. I say, that's a thought. You could have driven off without the first idea of where you were going. Indeed you could. So we are lucky to have you back, aren't we? And without a police escort. Fool. Down the hole, fool. And when I'm quite certain that the coast is clear, I'll bring you up. I wish you'd use the gun. I'm better off, dead. Stop the amateur dramatics, Jimmy, and go down the mine. I'll blast you, Bill. May you rot in hell one day. Join your lovely Julia there. All right, Charlie, let him get to the bottom. He's a monster. A monster. Don't be surprised if I decide to hang myself. Shut the chap door, Charlie. Put the desk back so it can't be moved. I say, he's wearing a belt. He could... If I thought he would, I'd supply the rope. But Jimmy is not one of those. No more than Julia was. We must get him away. We can't go on keeping him like a prisoner, can we? And us as well. Prisoners keeping a prisoner. I know. This could only ever work with his cooperation. He did cooperate before, before Julia died, which makes me wonder, as it must make you wonder. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Good morning, Mr Butler, sir. Mm. Everything about this business, if it is creep, as you're wondering about, makes me wonder. What in particular? Oh. Yes, you don't know, of course. Mrs Batty and Hilda... Batty, by the way, is as sane as we are. <laughs> no comment. Only a bit slow. Hilda is a bit batty. <laughs> but she's seed a man. And Batty has heard one up in the attics. Oh, Batty's a bit blind. Could she describe him? Bearded, but it fits. Oh, uh, there is a pre soul by the way. Hilda peeped through the window one day and she seed Bill Kent coming up through the floor like the demon king. He gave her quite a turn. Yeah, it would me. Oh, yes. Well, how are we today, Raylene? Very well, thank you, sir. Mm. Slept like a top. Go on, then. Tell me. You make a pass? As best he could. He was rather restricted. What did you do? Put the bracelets on him? <gasps> he twisted a knee gardening. What? An old polo knee that's weakened. Kent, gardening. Don't believe a word of it. Did he talk of his polo friends and others? He did. And they included Jimmy Jenkins. Kent wouldn't give much away, I'm sure. Well, was there anything? Not a sausage. One must admire him for his nerve. And you do? Oh, yes. He's quite a chap. What about the other two, then? Well, she was as calm as the goddess of calms. He gave a terrible performance. Jumped up like stung, rolled his eyes, <laughs> was furtive, had kittens, found a silver lining, thought the ceiling was about to fall, and had certainly robbed the bank that afternoon. What? All this at the mere mention of the name Jenkins? No, actually, it was to do with the garage. Or rather, his car being returned from the garage. Well, on Sunday evening. So they said. Mary Cookham charmed them. That Cookham car, that fancy foreign job? Italian, sir. It wasn't in the drive when I arrived, but it was there when I left. Well, did you hear it being returned from the garage? I did, sir. It hooted. The Cookhams went out to deal with whatever situation there was to deal with. They said to pay. Kent, remember, was incapacitated. So we were left alone to have a sexy five minutes until Charlie came in, looking as if he'd been successful in the lavatory for the first time in weeks. Well, it all could be true. I called at the garage, the one they said it was, on my way in this morning. Do you work on Sunday? They suggest that was balmy. Not yesterday, not ever. Sacrilege in the trade. Somebody borrowed the Italian job and took it for a drive when they shouldn't have and got back at the wrong time. I suggested I should go at that time. Kent and Cookham wouldn't hear of it. Mrs. Batty and Batty Hilda were told that the previous housekeeper left her illegitimate idiot grown-up son behind the creepers when she left. Oh, we wondered, didn't we, about an idiot kept out yeah. of sight? No, not even Batty and Hilda believed the idiot man's story. Must be Jenkins, mustn't it? Hilda's actually seen him. And Mrs. Batty has heard him, coughing, swearing. We should tell the Met our tale, shouldn't we, uh, sir? I, I want the glory, girl. They missed him. He was there. He must have had something to do with Julia's fall to death. He's killed one woman. Why not another? I wonder if Bill Kent knows the score. I wonder if Kent got Jenkins to do it. Oh, that's a nasty thought I hadn't had. 
Probably Kent is none the wiser than we are. But he must at least suspect Jenkins. And if he knows that Jenkins did it, on Jenkins' admission, then he's right slap between the devil and the deep blue sea, isn't he? Oh, the poor wicked old sailor. Don't sound sorry for him. He's had a good run before the consequences snapped at his heels. Perhaps Jenkins will never come out of that house alive. I had thought of that. If he becomes a bad liability, then I can imagine he'd be for the chop. So what do we do, sir? I need to put a mouse in that house. What about Mrs Batty and Hilda? Well, I've asked them to report on anything out of the ordinary, only what that means to them is another matter. Well, who could we get into the house? Who, oh, indeed. For long enough to bug the whole place. Um... I suppose we could flush him out? Well, a discreet surveillance for starters, but not too discreet. Let them see enough to make them worry. Oh, yes, and some terror tactics. The front doorbell, Hilda. Yes, Mum. Do you want him in? You want him in? Well, who is it? Him, watch outside. Do open the door, Hilda. Yes, Mum. Morning. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, flowers, Mum. Sign, please. Thank you, Hilda. I looked as if it, if it was for a funeral. Lilies. What is this? Reese madam. Name of Jenkins. I think you're mistaken. There's no one of that name here. Oh, it's in the book, madam. Creepers. Jenkins, deceased. Well, what's on the card? Uh, here we are. To Jimmy Jenkins from those who know where he is. <laughs> Heaven, I suppose they mean. It's been paid for, madam. I'm so glad. I'm afraid this is a joke in bad taste, although not your fault. There is no funeral and no Mr. Jenkins here. to do five. Hello. Yes. I said two to five. Uh, Cookham's my name. Yes, Cook and Ham. Who are you? Are you? Uh, Captain Kent's not here. He'll be back later. Yes, for lunch. Yes. Can I what? I uh, take a message. Oh, of course. Yeah, let me get pencil and paper. Oh, that's all right. I don't know, far away. Tell him of the world outside. Waiting for Jenkins. Hey, what the hell? Hey, look here, who are you? No longer a bally joke. Captain Kent! Captain Kent! Oh. Mrs. Batty, what's up? Oh, he'll dread me. We have to run, yes. sir. Run? What was somebody chasing you on the premises? There's oh. men out there. They stared at you, so we run. Men out <laughs> where? They're behind the hedge, sir. Opposite the drive. Lurking. Like. Lurking they yes. were. And their heads in the. They're in, in the, the hedge. hedge. Yes. Lurking, that's right. They never took their eyes off us as we came up the road from the old bus. Muggers, that's what they were. Muggers from London. How many of them? Oh, three, I think, sir. Big men. I don't think much of this post. And all me mine. Even a ballet bookmaker wants his pint of flesh. It's a letter for Julia, Bill. Typed. Open it, please, Mary. I abominate the job. Hmm. Something else awful. What? What was Jenkins up to on the night you fell from the attic window? What a pity you can't say. Hmm. I'd better let me go, Mary. It looks like a taxi. It is a taxi. Yes. You've probably got the wrong house. Creeper, sir. And a phone call saying to come up here and pick up a Mr. Jenkins. Take him to the police station. Mm, sorry. Wrong house. Where's Jimmy? Having some sun on the terrace. I see he doesn't move, will you? What is it this time? At the end wood, a chappy up a tree with binoculars. Very well hidden, and just caught a glimpse of it. Well, hadn't Jimmy better go in? No, no, he's got the highs between him and the tree creature, but don't let him get around in the garden. I'm off to tell Bill. How much longer can we stand this, Charlie? I don't know, old. I don't know. 
So what else are you going to do to them? What else hey, can hey, you do hey, to them? Hey, 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 not so loud. Please, Raylene. If any of this gets out, I'll be scrubbing floors in the local nick faster than next week. Mr. Butler, you deserve to. I didn't <laughs> think you could be so <laughs> awful. Awful? Is that all? Only awful? Oh, it's not difficult. Oh. You just let the imagination flow free. Directing it at the same time with malicious glee towards a particular object or target. A free-flowing imagination is a load of cobblers unless there's a point of flow. You really don't like that crowd, do you? Kentonese chums. No, I don't. Without a doubt, I don't. I mean, I don't actively dislike real villains, do I? With a few exceptions. Oh, there'll always be a game of cops and robbers going on somewhere. Some of us drift to one side, some to the other. And most stay in the middle. But Kent and his chums are different. I mean, those we don't know. Oh, Charlie's pathetic, and she's, well, better than most. But the crowd Kent stands for who've tried to keep Jenkins beyond the law. They're a right lot of... Toffee-nosed bastards. Oh, I've had dealings with their kind when I was a young copper, and I discovered they were real rubbish, dressed up to resemble people. Things went deep, didn't they? Were you hurt? Probably. Deep? Oh, well, deeper than most experience, because it was unique. I mean, just think, Raylene. What it would have been like if Jenkins was a small-time common villain, wife murdered, he wanted for the crime. First off, I doubt if any of his pals would have touched him with a barge ball. Not through any altruistic motive, but because they'd have known it was a dead loss in the end. Second, they and everybody near Jenkins Mark II would have been turned over until it hurt. And there wouldn't have been any of the Mayfair man outwits police stuff in the press. None of the spurious glamour of the Mayfair Scarlet Pimpernel headline. Probably only something like, what, scrap metal dealer wanted for wife murder. Bleak stuff. <laughs> and the Jenkins set get the soft hand in the velvet glove treatment, don't they? I mean, the Met didn't even see fit to tell me they were interested in Kent. And if I let it out now that I think that Jenkins is there at Creepers, you know what would happen as well as I do. They'd knock on the door, cap in hand, and ask nicely, and while they wipe their big feet on the doormat, Jenkins would be off on the way to another chummy's lair. Do you think they'll try to get him away, sir? Yes, I do. So I have to play this dirty. Not the dirty way they play it, but the way it hurts them most. How do you see it ending, sir? Well, they'll be forced to try and get Jenkins away. And if they can't quickly, Jenkins and Kent will fall out badly enough for one or other of them to run out screaming. By tomorrow, I'll know what's happening anyway, as if I was there. How are you going to get this bug inside, sir? Down the chimneys at dead of night. Have you seen these things they use to listen with? Small microphones and such like. Yeah, listening devices. Superb technological toys. Fiend's ears, I call them. Place a device the size of a lead pencil down a chimney, and we have four. And there's hardly a word in the house you won't hear clearly. Yeah, gives me the shivers. Now, where do we listen? In a van, 500 yards away, with some very beautiful equipment, which an expert works for us. Tomorrow. I don't suppose they'd bother to light a fire at Creepers this time of year, would they? I was 13 hours down that hellhole yesterday. 13 hours. Well, you're in the garden now, old scout, so count your blessings, however small. Oh, I won't be allowed out here very much longer. You wait and see. Some idiot will ring the alarm bell and it'll be Jenkins. Perhaps. Uh, let's hope Mrs. Batty and Hilda have time to clean the drawing room before it rings. My cellar cell needs cleaning. I have to do it yourself. Can't Mary? Why should she? Oh, my God. I could do with a woman. And I don't mean only to clean my lair. Yes, six months nearly for you, isn't it? Six bally months, as Charlie keeps stressing. Unless Julia obliged you. Charlie at the mowing? He is. Didn't he have any luck at all in town? I told you very little, so I have to force their hand. And how the hell are you going to do that? Dump you on a doorstep and kiss my hand goodbye. Just like that? More or less. <laughs> well, then you may as well turn me over, give me up. God, I, 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 I'll, I'll do it for you myself, if you like. Here and now. Here I am. Here I am. Come and get me. Jimmy the Jank is here. Oh, Jonah Jenkins. Oh, shut up. Shut up, you bloody fool. They seek me here. What the, they seek what the me hell's there. going on? Poppers seek me oh, we should have had a mic in the garden. Am I in tonight, heaven like or am I uh, in Try the drawing hell. room mic now, will you? That damn deluded... Uh, uh, <laughs> sounds drunk. What was he babbling on about? I hope they've Stop got him for now, sir. Some poor lost soul, but they ought to put him in a corner. Lose the drawing room, Gibbs. Try the study now, will you? 
Nice empty room noise. That's a door. Hold mm -hmm. it. Footsteps. Going upstairs. A lot of them. Master bedroom, sir? Yeah. Good. Thank you very much for that, Jimmy. For you to have one of your blasted freak houses was all we needed. Mrs. Batty and Hilda must have heard you. And all the gents lurking in the shrubbery with their notebooks. I wish you'd stop waving that blooming revolver around, Bill. Where's Shooter. Mary? Shooter. Hadn't Why thought of that. Shopping? When Where she comes Mary? back, we'll have a conflab on you, old lad. Nothing to talk about, is there? In the meantime, you will stay in here, Savvy. Not all alone, I take it. All alone. But I'll turn the key. Have a sleep. You said you were ever so tired. Uh, look, let me sit in the garden. I'll be good this time, I promise. Uh, no, Jimmy, and I'm not even sorry. This afternoon, yes, when we keep an eye on you and on the snoopers. Come on, Charlie. What in sod? I'll get my own back on you one day. You wait. You're sounding off like some snivelling schoolboy. That's what I thought. Hey, it won't be long. Up we go. Don't point that toy pistol at me, do you hear? shoots himself with it. You want to stay with him, sir? Yes, uh, but I'd like to hear what Kent and Cookham have to say. I have to put the other receiver on. There's no way that I can take any more of this, Charlie. You don't have to tell me. Well, what to do, then? Drive him out somewhere and leave him. Leave him hell to get there. Absolute valley hell. Uh, tell him we arrange to pick up. It could work. Is, is that Jenkins whistling? Yeah. What will Big Bill do? Put me out somewhere? Like you throw a dog you don't want out of a car? You haven't had any funny things happen for a couple of days. Well, I should imagine bloody butlers run out of ideas. No, he bloody hasn't. Playing? That would be his idea of a joke. I won't go. I won't. We're not actually hearing I Jenkins' won't. thoughts, are we? <laughs> Bless you, no. He thinks aloud well, though, doesn't he? It comes from being locked up a lot. I don't understand why he hasn't walked in and said, hand him over. Because he's not Go on, sure Big Bill, he tell him. And he's <laughs> not sure he'll be able to grab him if he was. True enough. What? Jenkins? Laughing? Oh, uh, like a child crying. Uh, Mary's right, I suppose. Uh, All of nerves. Indubitably. Until we get him up and ourselves. I never considered it. <laughs> Myself, brother, who was very out in a different camp. Oh, that's true. No, because I, I lost my temper. I didn't mean to kill a silly cow, but she shouldn't have done it. What a silly cow. Which silly cow? She would struggle with it. Oh, nothing's true. None of it, none of it's true. It's all... It's all a nightmare, and Nanny will come and, and, and wake me up from it soon. It, my good old nanny. Oh, it's awful. Listening. <laughs> Round the twist. L lose him for a moment, will you, Gibbs? Car arriving. Have you got a mic near the front door? Yes. Hello. There's Mary back. Good. When she's part of the shopping, bring her out to the garden. Yes, all right. Oh, why the hell did I forget the garden? Because you were too enthusiastic about the chimneys. All sir. right, all right, all right. Charlie, anything happened? Not much. Jimmy's up to his usual silly buggers. Oh, I'm so tired of it. What this time? Oh, shiting and so on in the garden. We've locked him in the bedroom. Batty's with doing. I'd be drawing them. Well, it could be worse, just. Bill wants to talk. He's in the garden. I think he's going to take some bally tough action today. Oh, thank God. Well, let me put the shopping in the kitchen, have a pee, and I'll join you. Hey, why the garden? It's full of biting insects. Does he think the house is bugged? Hello. Hello. Ah. <clears throat> I say, don't give me the creeps, old darling. Creepers for the creeps. I was only joking. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be with Bill. Try Jenkins again, please, Gibbs. All right, Mr. Butler. Good. He's asleep. I think there could be a showdown, sir, soon. I think you're right, Raylene. Let's warn the boyos, shall we? Uh, this is Butler to the pantry. Pantry one, move forward carefully now and take up position. Understood? Understood. And have the fireman's net ready for use? Will do, sir. Uh, pantry two and three, stand by to move in on the signal knives and forks. Butler, out. Fire drill, sir? Do you think they'll set the place on fire? 
A net for catching bodies. Somebody might throw somebody out of a high window. It's like having second sight. Mine's worked out that. Oh, some of it's rubbed off on me. But it could happen. Put your second sight to work and tell me how. Julia. Julia. Jenkins. Somebody called Julia. Oh. I can't hear her presence. Holy oh, smoke, I should hope not. Well, Shh, listen. Uh, comes a bad good girl. Talking in his sleep, isn't he? Oh, that's it, of course. Uh, uh, don't say that. Don't say that, you bitch. Uh, laugh at me, would you? Uh, I'll teach you a lesson, my fine lady. Come here. Is this the night in question? Uh, 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 the more you wriggle, the more I'll hurt you. They must have heard the screams. Which they wouldn't if he'd been down the hole. down that hole. It, uh, it's on my conscience. I can't forget it. What can't you forget? <laughs> As Julia, that night... When she fell from the attic, you mean? Yes. Uh, I don't remember what happened with Ruth. Ruth is his wife. It's gone. But... But with... Julia, it was a mistake, Bill. Uh, it was all a mistake. Tell us, can you? Try, Jimmy. You were all out. She... She said yes. All right, but... She wanted to go up to my room, not hers. She... She was a bit tiddly, but... That was all to the better. Got up there and she started to play hard to get. I... I said, stop it, you old tart, and get on the bed, but she wouldn't. Turn thoroughly nasty, said I was a murdering pig and other things. Told me to clear off there and then, and if I didn't, she'd dial 999 and get the wazers in and tell them who I was. I wasn't going to let her do that, was I? So I grabbed her, opened the window, and shoved her head out to cool off. She started to shout. She called out for help, and she shouted, Jenkins, the murder is here, over and over. So I... Bought the window down across her back, so only her behind was in the room. I, I, I thought I'd teach her a lesson, so I got behind her and took up her skirt when she kicked me. It's like a horse kick right in the ghoulies. I, I, I went over, let go of the window, and she shot out. It just shot out. I, I was on the floor holding where she'd kicked me. I, I couldn't stop her, Bill. It, it was all an accident. Get on your feet, Jimmy. Oh, right, right away, Bill. What are you going to do? He's coming upstairs with me, and he's going to look out of that attic window like Julia did. No, you can't, Bill, you can't. Right, that's it. <clears throat> Butler to pantry, knives and forks. Come on, Rayleigh. Thank, Thank you, Gibbs. It, Bill. I, I can't move. I'm mad, you know. Shut up, houses always look so sad. Well, I think so. No, don't be so defensive. They do. Even Creepers does. Well, now it's finished. I wanted to see the place, didn't I? Like some sentimental old lout. Come on, let's walk around. And that poor garden. That's sad, too. Gardens have a way of returning to life. Once they're given a helping hand. Do you mean anything by that? Only what I meant. 
Oh, there's the attic window. This is where we found Jenkins snared in our net, alive and kicking. And this is where we found Julia Kent dead. Would have been clean if Jenkins had pitched up and died here on the same spot. <laughs> Poetic justice out of some ancient Greek play. Does it ever happen, sir? Oh, I'm sure it used to, if in another land. Instead, Jenkins will live out the rest of his natural, probably, in one institution for the criminally insane or another, costing, what, 3000 odd a year? Will they accept he's insane, do you think? Nah, he's unfit to plead. I suspect he always was. Only the smart suit, the expensive shirt, the correct tie, the handmade shoes, the barber's attentions, the stand-up straight background and the paper stuff he could flash around, stop most people from looking at him objectively. Well, you can't blame them. Madmen are supposed to look mad. Wild of dress and eye. Kent got to know Jenkins was beyond redemption. What will Kent get, do you reckon? <laughs> well, they can't prove he tried to kill Jenkins, and I gather they're not going to try to do so. So, for harbouring concealing... He'll go down well with the jury, won't he? He went down well with you, didn't he? <laughs> yes. The jury will be impressed by the loyalty to a poor, mad friend he's shown. There's the dead Julia. Hasn't he paid the price, suffered enough? Eighteen months suspended. Will you be cross at not nailing him to the doorpost? I'm no longer cross, as you call it. I, I mean, I beat him inside the distance. I took the champ down a peg or two. I still don't like what he stands for, but uh, that's another matter. He's laughing at the system, really, isn't he? The Bill Kents always have. They don't belong to it, which helps them when it doesn't help the ordinary villain. Ah, it's unfair. Something to do with society's packing order, I imagine. When Kent discovered that Jenkins was raving and what he'd done to Julia, why he didn't put a bullet through the chap's brain, I can't imagine. A villain would have done, or had it done. But not Kent. His kind may well laugh at our system, but they go in for one of their own making, which is pretty difficult for us to understand. Well, it's over. I'll miss the game. Yes. Back to a comparatively quiet life, girl. Still, we annoyed the Met no end. <laughs> Fancy not finding him when he was under their feet. Hey. What is it? Huh? Well, look. What? Well, somebody's opened the curtains. <gasps> so they have. My God, it's Mrs. Batty and Hilda. They come in to keep the place aired. <laughs> if they see us, we'll be here all day. <laughs> I look forward to hearing Hilda tell the court what she seed. <laughs> I do hope she gets some new teeth before then. <clears throat> come on, Raylene. Let's tiptoe through the trapoleum <laughs> and get back to the beach. <laughs> In Creepers by Frederick Bradnam, the part of Detective Chief Inspector Butler was played by Ian Holm and Detective Sergeant Rogers by Elizabeth Bell. Bill Kent by Jack May, Jimmy Jenkins by Philip Bond. Charles Cookham, David Savile, Mary Cookham, Francis Jeter. Mrs. Batty, Catherine Parr, and Hilda, Gladys Spencer. With Neville Jason and Alaric Cotter. Technical presentation by David Greenwood, assisted by Penny Lester, and Richard Beadsmore. The play was produced and directed by Jane Morgan. And now, with a look forward to next Saturday, here's Harriet Cass. Easter Saturday on Radio 4. And as usual in the morning, Margaret Howard looks back over the week's broadcasting to make her selections for Pick of the Week while science now looks forward to what's new in the world of science and technology. Then at lunchtime you can listen to an hour of music in the company of Robin Ray. A seasonal edition of Weekend in the afternoon takes us to Jerusalem for the Easter celebrations. Joining in the festivities is Shushu, the loquacious camel. May I speak to him? Good morning, Shushu. He didn't talk to anyone except his master. Right, will you make Shushu say good morning okay. to me? Okay, Shushu, say hi. <laughs> well, there's no answer to that, but there'll be lots more colourful conversation, human or otherwise, when Weekend visits Jerusalem and Rome. And we're still travelling in the afternoon theatre play. I'm not certain one can get into the Gobi Desert. Oh, I think so. 
Things are loosening up everywhere. You don't hear of many people going there. All the more reason we should. That's true, very true. <laughs> we like being pioneers. In the evening, comedian, scriptwriter and emu owner Rod Hull is Roy Plumley's castaway in Desert Island Discs. And later, the Saturday night theatre play turns back the clock to the Elizabethan period and centres around the Queen's favourite, Sir Walter Raleigh. Some of your Easter Saturday programmes here on Radio 4. And now, here's the weather forecast for tomorrow. Southern districts of England and Wales were bright and dry at first, apart from showers near western coasts. Rather cloudy weather with showers or longer outbreaks of rain, sleet or snow over Scotland, Northern Ireland and northern districts of England will spread southwards. Northern districts becoming brighter, though with further wintry showers. It'll feel cold with a strong northerly wind. Central areas of England and East Wales may have a frost at first. And the outlook for Monday and Tuesday, bright in the south at first, rain preceded by sleet or snow will spread south to all areas. Mostly rather cold with night frost. Radio 4. After Big Ben, the news read by John Marsh. BBC Radio News at 10 o'clock. Red Rum has made racing history by winning the Grand National for the third time. The first woman rider in the National gave up after her horse refused at the fourth fence from last. It's now clear the Liberals will not vote against the government on Monday over the budget increase in petrol tax. Instead, they'll try to get the increase taken off by the summer. Nearly all British Airways domestic flights from Heathrow to Morrow have been cancelled because of industrial action by maintenance engineers. The opposition spokesman on Northern Ireland has called for a special anti-terrorist brigade to be set up in the province to catch what he calls the big fish. There's been more trouble with football hooligans. 36 people, including two policemen, were injured during and after Manchester United's match at Norwich. Red Rum has become the first horse to win the Grand National three times. His victory at Aintree this afternoon is the culmination of five extraordinary years in the National. He won in 1973 and 74 and came second in 1975 and last year. Written today by Tommy Stack, he came in at 9 to 1, 25 lengths ahead of Churchtown Boy at 20 to 1, with Eyecatcher third at 18 to 1. Pill Garlic was fourth at 40 to 1. Peter Bromley describes the final stages of the race. It's the local hero, Red Rum, with one more fence to be jumped in this Grand National. Here he comes into it. He's risen. He's over safely. He's on the run in this two riderless horses coming at him. The riderless horses are going to run away from him, I think. And Tommy Stack sets his heart for home. In behind him, about eight lengths away, is Churchtown Boy. He's not going to catch Red Rum. Here comes the greatest horse of Aintree. Red Rum has 200 yards to run to make history. Two riderless horses are there in front of him. Tommy Stack is pushing Red Rum. The excitement here is tremendous. Red Rum has done it for a third time. And there's jubilation after the race as the Liverpool crowd acclaimed Red Rum. His trainer, Ginger McCain, was almost overcome by the 12-year-old horse's victory. I think it's bloody marvellous. <laughs> Super. Brilliant on both the horse's part and Tommy's part. Absolutely. Never in doubt the way I saw it. He's a very, very exceptional horse. You know, I came here today and I was thinking I was probably one... I thought I was a week short of peak fitness. I really did. Um, I want to cry for it. I'm sorry. And another piece of history was made at Aintree by Charlotte Brew, who became the first woman ever to enter the Grand National. Riding Barony Fort, she got as far as the fourth from last fence when her horse refused. How did she feel about the race? Fantastic, you know. I mean, I just wish we completed, which would have been the sort of ultimate, but um, he went superly, really did, and, and we didn't cause any trouble, which is what everybody was worried about, I think. I mean, what a thrill it is. It's the most fantastic race to ride in. I mean, I hope I'll be back next year. On a more sombre note, two horses were killed during the race. They were Winter Rain and Zeta's Sun. It now seems virtually certain that the Liberals will not oppose the government in Monday's vote on the higher petrol tax. 
However, they're still opposed to the five and a half pence a gallon rise announced in the budget. They say it will cause hardship to people in rural areas without adequate public transport. Christopher Jones reports on how they now plan to express this opposition. The Liberals have come down instead on the side of getting the government to make some sort of concessions later on when the finance bill, and that's the bill that actually brings the budget into law, when the finance bill goes through the House of Commons. There had at one time appeared to be a real possibility that the government might suffer the major embarrassment of losing the petrol increases because all the opposition parties are strongly opposed to them. But Mr John Pardo, the Liberal economic spokesman, has been talking privately with Mr Joel Barnett, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and this compromise seems to have been worked out. Mr David Steele, the Liberal leader who's in Lancaster today, explained their present attitude to me when I phoned him this afternoon. Well, we certainly, certainly will not be voting in support of it. Uh, whether we uh, abstain or vote against this is a matter, of course, for the parliamentary party as a whole. Saturday Night Theatre. We present Malice at Autumn's End by John Hyatt with John Bentley, Margot Boyd and John Gabriel. Malice at Autumn's End. Well done, Sister Alice. Oh, thank you, Father. Uh, have you finished hearing confessions? Yes, we'd better get a move on or we miss the opening of the fete. You know what the traffic's like on a Saturday afternoon. Oh, a late comer. Oh, today of all days. Why, it's that woman. Hmm? What woman? I saw her early this morning in the park. She was behaving very oddly, almost as though she was being hunted. Oh. Poor thing. Oh, dear, what a dreadful black eye. Uh, she does seem to be looking round rather nervously. See if you can help her, will you, sister? I'll wait in the confession, or in case she wants me. Good afternoon. Oh. Are you... Oh, you startled me. Is it... The... I've seen you somewhere before. Early this morning in Highfield Park. I was going to speak to you, but when you saw me, you ran away. Is there anything I can do? I want to see a priest. It's urgent. Is there one here? There's Father Nicholson. He's hearing confessions at the moment, uh, just over there. Oh, thank you. You're, you're just in time to catch him. He's due at the church fete at 2.15. We've got an important celebrity opening it. George Catesby, yes, I know. Excuse me, I mustn't keep the priest waiting. George Catesby? I wonder why she called him that. Father, I have sinned. Name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. How long is it since your last confession? I don't... I haven't come to confess. I just wanted to tell someone. Someone who can help. I thought you'd be the best person. Would you rather see me in the sacristy? It would be more comfortable. No, no. I, it's better like this, private. I, I said I didn't want to confess, but I do. I must. There may not be another chance. People, Father, I must betray them. They're evil, wicked. I didn't think so at first. I didn't believe it. Uh, just a minute. You want to tell me about something wicked. Is it also criminal? Yes, yes, criminal. And are you guilty of this crime? I've, I've stolen something. I, I see. But that's only part of it. There's much more, much worse. Well, tell me. It's my husband. They're going to kill him. Did you hear what I said? It's true. Well, I heard you. Are you quite sure? Of course I'm sure. I was there when they planned it. Last night I walked in in the middle of it. He knows all about them, you see, and he's making his knowledge public. They're frightened to death of him. You say they? The witches, Father. The witches in this town. They meet every week in an organised coven. You'd never know it. It's so secret. They don't want to be found out. They're serious, dedicated. They worship Apollyon. Apollyon. Oh, it's another name for it. The devil. I see. My husband and I never got on. We never saw eye to eye. I tried to make alliances, but he was so full of his own importance. You are not here to criticise others. Let's take things one at a time, shall we? You say these people have uttered threats. They mean them. They do. They mean murder. If you'd seen them last night, I, I could feel the hate. They turned and looked at me. I could see the malice in their eyes. Keep calm. I ran, but they started to chase me. They knew I'd never agree to that, to, to murder. Now listen to me. I've been hiding in the park all night. Oh, Father, you must believe me. I'm not that bad. Father, I, I don't know what to do. I will tell you what to do. 
This is not a matter I can deal with effectively. Surely you can see that. The police can help you. Oh, no. No, no, the police. Not in this case. Oh, no. Oh, no. Father, the witches, they'll kill me too now. I'm as dangerous as my husband. Please, please. Here's my rosary. I want you to take it. I want you to see that it's buried with me. Promise no, me. No, this has gone far enough. Now, listen to me. Be quiet and listen. <gasps> What's that? Listen. Oh, there's someone out there in the church. They followed me. Oh, God. Sounds as though the opening ceremony is well underway, sister. We're nearly 15 minutes late. It wasn't your fault, Father. The traffic at Harper's Corner. Ah, uh, Mr. Kappa won't accept that as an excuse. He'll say we should have started earlier. Well, if we had, you wouldn't have been able to help that poor woman in the church. Mr. Kappa should have learned by now he can't always take priority, even if he did have a distinguished career in the police force. Yeah, well, this is hardly the moment to tell him that. For the next three hours or so, he's selling his autograph at sixpence a time. <laughs> Well, I'd better make my apologies before he gets into his stride. But who's that over there? Uh, where? There's a man prowling around those parked cars. He's seen us. It seems we've disturbed a car thief. He didn't look that time. No, he didn't. And I'm sure I've seen him before. Oh, look at that car, Father. That's Mr. Kappa's car. Really? Well, well, well. Perhaps we've done the old man a favor by being late. Right, let's see. Everything ready? Pen, ink, blotting paper. Oh, good afternoon, Lady Norton. In look with the weather, eh? Mm, cash box. I'll keep that under the eye. Good afternoon, Mr. Kappa. Oh, Father Nicholson. Glad to see you could make it at last. I really must apologize before you're all besieged with autograph hunters. Think nothing of it, Father. I know you're a busy man. I've already apologized to Lord Catesby on your behalf. He's a busy man, too. And an important one besides. And he only agreed to open this fate as a personal favor to me. Oh, yes, yes, I, I know. But as one of the leading Anglo-Catholics in this country and the owner of the Sunday record, he's entitled to a bit more than common courtesy. I'm telling you, sir. You'll have I to was... excuse me now, Father. We're all busy this afternoon. And this looks like my first customer. Yes, well, let's, uh, let's hope you have a successful afternoon. I'll, I'll see you later. Aye. Right. Good afternoon, sir. Nice to have you with us. I don't have to ask what I can do for you, eh? I'd rather not, Mr. Kappa. I promised my youngster I'd get your autograph. She's an avid reader of the Sunday Record. Oh, reading my memoirs, is she? We all are, sir. I'm finding them of particular interest. Oh? My name's Hagel, Detective Inspector, Whitchurch Crime Squad. Well, 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 we must have a drink sometime. You must come along to the section house, sir. An ex-copper with your reputation would do wonders for morale. Oh, that's very pleasant of you, Mr. Hagel. I will. There. Ah, uh, there's the autograph. Thank you. I hope your daughter approves. I should be thrilled to bits. Uh, sixpence, if you please. In the box. Oh, that's very, very generous. All in a good cause. I mustn't hold out the queue. Uh, see you soon, Mr. Kappa. I look forward. Good afternoon, young lady. Got your autograph book with you? Good. Oh! That's terrible, sorry. You nearly knocked me over. This half me cup of tea gone, huh? Oh, well. It's quite a chapter of accidents you're getting through lately, Mrs. What uh, do you mean? I take it that black eye was as much an accident as me knocking into you. Or did Tom give it to you in one of his more affectionate moments? Who are you? I've seen you. My name's Hagel. You've seen me at the club, I expect. That's why I've seen you. Mrs. Doyle, they say your name is, but I know Tom better than that. Is he here this afternoon? No. I didn't think it was quite his line of country. I didn't think it was yours, come to that. You never can tell, can you? Excuse me, I'm... Would you like a cup of tea? No, no, I'm in a hurry. Oh, nice gratitude. She's in more than a hurry, she's in a panic. Yeah. Heading for old Kappa's stall. It's funny. She's no autograph hunter. Nearly four o'clock. Everything seems to be going well. All right in here, sister? Yes, father. Even in spite of the heat. Oh, these tea urns are the nearest I've been yet to hellfire. <laughs> uh, D 
did you make your peace with Mr. Capper? Uh, well, I opened negotiations. Uh, sister, I can't get that woman out of my mind, the one in the church. I wondered if she might be somewhere in this crowd. I haven't seen her, but I've just remembered something odd that she said. Oh? When I mentioned that we got a celebrity opening the fete, she said, George Catesby, yes, I know. But, but how is that odd? She called him George. Well? Well, most people would have said Lord Catesby. They wouldn't have known his Christian name. Ah, yes, you've got a point there. And I've got another one. Who is the only person we know who's on intimate terms with Lord Catesby? Barnard Capper. Exactly. Well, I, I think I'll start circulating with a tea tray. I've earned a break from this furnace. Yes. Uh, if that frightened woman knows Lord Catesby, then it's perfectly possible she knows Mr. Capper as well. Indeed. I, I, I'll keep my eyes open, Father, and let you know if I see her. For that tray, sister, I saw so you'll spill the lot. <laughs> Why are you roaming round the field, Mr. Capper? What's happened to your public? I've been sitting on a hard chair signing my name for nearly two hours, and I think I've earned a break. Oh, don't worry about the takings. Father Ward's got his eye on them. Uh, is one of those cups of tea going begging? You will help yourself. Right. Oh, my, that's hot. <laughs> but that's what a cup of tea should be. I gather, Mr. Capper, that you find it hard to forgive Father Nicholson for missing Lord Catesby's opening address. Well, can you blame me, sister? I went to a lot of personal trouble. Well, the traffic was really very congested. And if Father Nicholson had been here on time, he would have been on the platform and not in the car park at half past two. And if he'd been on the platform, he wouldn't have disturbed the man prowling round your car. Man? What man? Actually, it was Mr. Doyle. I couldn't put a name to him at the time, but I... Doyle? He runs a club down on the docks. I've seen him once or twice when I've been visiting in the area. Well, well, well. You know him, Mr. Capper? I know about him. Any copper could smell Tom Doyle a mile off. Interfering with my car, eh? Oh, I didn't say that. I'd better look into this. Uh, but it was two hours ago and he ran off. Yes, sister. Put that tray down and come with me to the car park. If there's anything missing, I'll want you as witness. Oh, but I... Excuse uh, me, Mrs. Harris. We're going to leave this tray on your stall a minute. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Right. Come on, sister. I, uh, I, I don't suppose you know a woman with chestnut hair aged about 35, do you, Mr. Capper? She's wearing a, a floral print dress, and she has an, an unfortunate black eye. I'm rather anxious she to... She was around earlier this afternoon. Why? Who is she? I hoped you might be able to tell me. What makes you think that? Something she said. Uh, what is it, Mr. Capper? What's wrong? Oh, oh, that poor woman. Look, the lid of the boot must have fallen on her neck. Don't touch her. Get the St. John's ambulance. There's a crime squad man somewhere in the field. Crime? That boot didn't fall. It's been slammed down on her neck. Mr. Capper, was I right? Did you know her? I, I knew her sister. She was my wife. I'm sorry we've had to meet again under these circumstances, Mr. Capper. I'd hoped for a much happier occasion. So would I, Agro. So would I. And I'm sorry we've had to curtail your fate, Vicar, but you do see... Yeah, of course, of course. Well, I suppose we might take advantage of being in the refreshment tent and have a cup of tea. I, uh, I understand from that sensible lady, the nun, I uh, called her sister, is that right? That's quite right, but Sister Alice is a deaconess, not a nun. Oh, is she? Well, Sister Alice tells me you saw Mrs. Capper earlier this afternoon, Vicar. Yes, she came to St. Matthew's in a very distraught state. I can't tell you what was said because she came to confession. But she seemed frightened out of her wits. She was crying, hysterical. Ah, she was always hysterical. Always dramatizing the slightest thing. I suppose you feel I owe you an explanation, Father. No, not unless... Ah, oh, come off it. I've been living in this town six months. You must think it peculiar. I never said I was married. Well, I took it for granted you were a widower. Ah, no, just what you were meant to do, you and everybody else. I'd always planned to retire to Midport. During my last months of service, Vera used to come here looking for a likely house. That was 
how she met the man she left me for. Some man, I must say. String of convictions as long as your arm. Assault, robbery with violence. Yeah, he trades on that. It's part of his appeal. And he's 20 years younger than I am. You wonder I wanted to keep it secret? <laughs> right, silly fool I'd have looped if that story had got out. Fine scandal for a man in my position. Well, surely it was bound to leak out eventually. Not bound to, no. There was always the hope that she might come back. <laughs> Pretty poor hope that turned out. She cared for you, I can assure you of that. Had a funny way of showing it. Well, it's done now. I've not a hope in hell of keeping this quiet. Just have to get used to the sneers and the sympathy. Oh, I don't think many people will sneer. Soon find out, won't we? Mm, we'll soon find out a lot of things. Now, my impression when I saw Mrs. Capper this afternoon was that she was frightened. Now, you bear that out, Vicar. Do you also confirm my suspicion that she was frightened of Tom Doyle? I thought I made it clear she came to confession, even under these circumstances. She told I... you, though, didn't she? You should know better than to ask that, Mr. Capper. Must have. Look, she Witches. came to me... That's what she was scared of. The witches operate in that club. Doyle's club? Down on the docks it is in Gus Street, a place called the Devil's Kitchen. You know it, Father? No, I don't. But you say it's in Dockland. That's another parish, St. Mary's. Oh, you're not serious about this, Mr. Capper. Why, this witchcraft thing is just a gimmick of Doyle, something to interest the customers. No one's meant to take it seriously. You've never come across a case of witchcraft before, have you? Take it from me. It's the filthiest thing a copper ever has to soil his hands on. You'll find out, Eagle. <laughs> People laugh at witchcraft now or think it's something long dead that was nasty. Well, it's nasty, all right. You know, ritualistic murder isn't that uncommon today. Mr. Capper, you mustn't get this tragedy out of perspective. You think it's just a gimmick too, don't you? I tell you, Father, I know about witches. I just lost my wife through those devils. I can't see the logic of that, I'm afraid. I'm not yet convinced your wife wasn't the victim of a ghastly accident. Accident? Look... The lid of that boot was slammed down. It didn't fall. There was nothing wrong with the mechanism. If it had just fallen, then it might have knocked her out. But her neck was broken. It was slammed down on the back of her neck. And you call that a ritual murder by witches? The ritual induces the murder. Do I have to spell it out for you? Vera wanted to spell it out for you. Vera wanted to get out of that coven, but the witches thought otherwise. Oh, that's just guesswork. I'm afraid so. It's informed guesswork based on professional experience. They held one of their obscene ceremonies. And under the guise of that ritual, they conceived her death. Oh, for heaven's sake. It's an absurd idea. I agree. Well, why should they want to kill her anyway? This isn't the Middle Ages. Nothing to stop anyone being a witch nowadays, if that's what they want. There's a social stigma, man. That's why they need to keep their identity secret. Suppose you were one of them. Someone threatened to tell your wife you had been indulging in orgies and sacrificing to Satan. You wouldn't like it, would you? Oh, I'd feel a damn fool. Ah, but you'd do something about it, which is more to the point. We're not dealing with rational, sensible people here, Hegel. We're up against a gang of sick, perverted dropouts with a lot to lose. You know, I can't understand why you haven't done something before this. Both of you I'm talking to, this bestiality's been under your noses for at least six months. And neither of you has done a damn thing to stop it. You say to yourself the whole thing's secret. Certainly, I didn't but know But it's what... your duty to find out. The witches are anti-everything you stand for. They always have been down the long, dark centuries, but they're not vindictive today any more than the Christians they oppose. Not vindictive? They put a spell on my Vera. Lord help Mr. us. Mr. Capper, you're distressed. Ah, oh, come you're on. You're under it. a strain, so you blame other people for your loss. The witches. I blame the witches. Well, no one else will. Look, I've lived in this town for nine years. I know how these people behave. If you put around a story like this, you'll be looked on as a crack. We'll see about that. In a fortnight's time, the Sunday Record is due to publish an episode of my memoirs, dealing with a case of witchcraft I handled in 1950. Well, I'm scrubbing that. As from now, there'll be a brand new article setting out the facts of this case. Hold on, Mr. Capper. You've got a fortnight, Inspector Hagel, to get those facts. Less than a fortnight. Now, just a minute. I know what I'm doing. You'll do untold harm if you don't stop to think. I warn you. The harm has been done, man. I know how you feel, believe me. I do know how you feel. But that's why I ask you to take my advice. Forget this vendetta. Concentrate on your work, your book. First things first. Before I write another word, I'll smash these people. Flush them out. Finish them. But the witches killed my wife.
Well, this is the place Kappa mentioned, Gas Street. There must be a sign hanging somewhere. Uh, here we are. The Devil's Kitchen Members Only. Mm -hmm. A selective Satan. I wonder if the Devil's abroad at 10 in the morning. Hello there. Can I help you? Uh, good morning. I'm, uh, I'm looking for Mr. Tom Doyle. You found him first go, Father. Come on in. The door's open. Here we go. That's right, Father. Come on in. Thank well, you. Takes me back, it does, to see the priest calling around this hour of the day. You'll be getting me a good name, Father. A priest now. Wouldn't be anything to do with this terrible business of Mrs. Kappa, would it? Exactly that, I'm afraid, Mr. Doyle. I might have known. I've had a copper swarming all over the place since last Saturday, to say nothing of reporters. Too much publicity can give me a bad name. And now you, Father. No offence, but I don't see what your interest is. It's not as though Vera ever went to church. She came to see me at St. Matthew's just before she died. Oh, did she now? Well, I'm glad to hear it. I really am, Father. She'd have had a hell of a time if she'd died without the blessing of the church. Look, I don't... Oh, I to... beg your pardon. That wasn't meant in a frivolous manner. Not at all. I find it very reassuring that Vera should have gone back to the church. Makes a man feel there's always hope. Sort of a reflex action at the last. Do you think that's possible, Father? I think it's perfectly possible. But in Mrs. Kappa's case, it's even more interesting to reflect on the cause of that reflex. She turned back to her faith so suddenly, almost as though she were driven. Oh, you're right. That is interesting. Uh, look, I'll be honest with you, Father. Six months ago, Vera left her husband and she's been living here with me ever since. Now, I know there's only one attitude you can take over a situation like that and I'll not hold it against you. But it was what she wanted. She came of her own free will, Father, and she stayed. She was happy here. Hmm. Why did she leave? Leave, did you say? It's news to me she left. Look, Mr. Doyle, when I saw her, she was anything but happy. She was scared out of her wits. Something had terrified her beyond her reason. Did she tell you what it was? No, you know what it was. It happened here in the club late on Friday night when the customers had gone and only Vera Capo was left. Vera and a select handful of others, including you, Doyle. Don't hedge with me, man. You know what it was. You're very forceful, Father. And there's an awful lot you seem to know. I still don't see, though, what your interest is. I'd like to see your partner. Well, you're lucky to be seeing me at this hour of the morning. Your partner's still in bed, I shouldn't wonder. Would you like to see the premises instead? Huh? Come on. I'll show you around. Doesn't look so good by day. No atmosphere, but I think you'll be impressed. Here we are. I'll draw the curtains. Lights. There. You're placed right in the heart of the devil's kitchen. Oh, you were wrong when you said there'd be no atmosphere. I can feel it. Evil malice seeping out of the walls. You and Vera had a lot in common, Father. Your imagination is a touch of the Gaelic, to be sure. Have you is this where she stood on Friday night? If she'd come through that door, she'd have had a clear view of the altar. You do use this as an altar, don't you? What filth did she see, Doyle? What horror drove her to her death? That's enough of the demonstration. You're getting carried away, Father. Who's behind me, Doyle? Not you. You haven't got the flair for this. You put up the money and organized the club, but the ruling spirit isn't yours. I never claimed it was. Tom? Tom? Talk with the devil. Then here, laddie. This is a busy morning, and no mistake. Here comes my partner now. There you are, Tom. I thought I... Aggie, we've got a visitation from the church. Let me introduce you. Miss Agnes Craft, my partner. Oh, uh, sorry, Father. I, I don't even know your name. This is Father Nicholson, Tom. It's been a long time. How are you, Nick, my dear? Good morning, Sister Alice. Airing one of your charges? Yes, Mr. Kappa. Rosemary here has to have her walk. But you were certainly the last person I expected to see in the park. I thought you were busy with your memoirs, aren't you? Writing them and they're coming out in book form soon? They are. 
It's uh, partly that. That's I good. found last week's instalment in the record fascinating. You're a lucky man, Mr. Capper, being able to fill your leisure hours in retirement. <laughs> You've been in the police force 25 years. You know what damage idle hands can do. I've seen it in this town. Here? Here in Midport. I'm talking about the witches, sister. Witches? You'll be saying next, like Hegel and Father Nicholson, that you had no idea of their existence. It was the witches who killed my wife. You've been a policeman a long time, Mr. Capper, so I suppose you must have evidence for what you're saying. I've got more than that. I've got the power to make those creatures sorry they were ever born. That's why I've come to see you. I need your help, Sister Alice. In what way? As you know, Lord Catesby, apart from being the owner of the Sunday record, is a personal friend of mine. I believe you have mentioned it. Well, I expect I have. It's a friendship I'm proud of. Now, Lord Catesby agrees with me that I should waive a forthcoming episode in the paper and publish instead an account of the witches in Midport. But how do you expect me to help you? I want you to type out the article. But why not use an agency? It's more than I dare do to risk an agency. This must be done in the utmost secrecy, sister. These people are dangerous. I'm sorry, Mr. Capper. I really don't have the time. The parish needs me. Ah, you pamper the parish, sister. Let them stand on their own feet for a bit. I'm sorry, but I really don't have the time. I thought, as a Christian woman, you'd only be too glad to strike your blow against the evil in this town. Uh, this evil... You say you've mentioned it to Father Nicholson. What was his reaction? <laughs> Try to make out I was imagining things. Told me my experience didn't count. But he'll learn. He'll find out. There's evil in our midst, sister. There's always that. We fight it every day. Ah, but this is one fight when I'm on my own. Well, that's nothing new. I can fight again. And I don't expect me thanks for it, neither. No, that's very wise. People will laugh, you know. Have you thought of that? And some will be angry. You may take witchcraft seriously, but to the majority of people... I know a damn will... sight more about witches than you do, Sister Alice. I've dealt with them. They're not wicked old women in storybooks. They're devils. I'm sure you could make the details very convincing, Mr. Capper. Why do you resent Father Nicholson's advice so strongly? Because I've got a feeling he's not to be trusted. That's absurd. Maybe... But it's a feeling that's been growing on me since Vera died. I can't ignore it, sister. I've had this feeling too often to ignore it. I hope to God I'm wrong. I know you are wrong. No. You just hope it, same as I do. If Nicholson's got some connection with this coven, then I'm done for. Really, Mr. I Cameron, told him, I don't you see? I told him I'm out to smash these people. If the witches get to know that, I'm finished. I'll end up dead like Vera. Yes, it's been a long time, Nick. Fifteen years this autumn. And now you're in a spot again. We both are the same spot, Aggie. Another woman has died. Died of witches. Serve her right. Serve her... <coughs> you're not well. Here, come sit down. No. No, it's, it's the altitude. You should never have climbed that hill. And missed this magnificent view... Oh, the hell with it. There are too many things one should never have done. It's just a cough. You won't cure it in Midport. Doctors doubt that. I was sent here to recover. How long have you been here? Poor Nick. You can't get over the shock of seeing me, can you? Nearly a year. I hate this dirty, sprawling town. The sea air stinks. If you hate it that much, why stay? Why move? Nothing would change. Now even Oxford is a dead world. We had our good times there, Aggie. There are happy memories, too. Oh, our memories. Our dreams we cherished 15 years ago. I can do without those memories. They just accuse me now. As you'll have gathered, I didn't carve out the niche I dreamed of at Oxford. I've roamed and drifted for 15 years. And I end up in this huge, sordid town telling fortunes in Tom Doyle's club. Tom's making money, which is all he wants. And the appeal of the occult brings me the disciples that I want. Women like Vera Kappa? No, not women like Vera Kappa. I warned Tom at the time that woman would cause trouble. But you can't argue with a man like Tom. Well, he knows now I was right. 
Aggie, Doyle's a dangerous man with a record of criminal violence. It's more than likely that he killed Vera. I told you just now, she died of witches. She found out something and... She found out that you meant to kill her husband. You're well informed, my dear. Then it's true. But why? What harm's he done? Harm? You know his reputation and you ask what harm is done? For years, Barnard Cap has persecuted those who practice witchcraft. The Bradford witches, the Covenant Leeds, John Gordon, Wilkie. But they were criminals. Wilkie killed three women. And they weren't just criminals to Chief Inspector Capper. To him, they were victims because they abhorred his god. He hunted them down in hatred. And now he intends to mock them in his memoirs, to hold them up to ridicule in the Sunday record. Last Friday, we prayed to Apollyon and sacrificed in his name. We invoked the wrath of the devil and brought down death on that old man's head. On the Feast of All Hallows, Nick, Barnard Kappa will fall prey to his own victims. Vera knew what you'd done, didn't she? She walked right in and saw the doll we'd made in her husband's likeness torn to shreds before her eyes. And you killed her because she tried to warn him? She died because she was willing to betray us. Don't waste your tears on her. She wasn't worth it. How long have you known I was here? Since Saturday. I heard the name Apollyon. I I could hardly believe my ears. No one has ever used that name but you. And then the memories came flooding back. Hmm? But not the happy ones. Aggie, you've got to get out of this town. You're right to believe that Kappa hates you. He's written with hatred. He's not concerned now with the witches of the past, but with you and the coven here in Midport. If he ever checks back on you... How close the past has come. You and I, Nick, threatened by a ghost that has been buried for 15 years. Don't worry, it'll come no closer. Barnard Kappa may glimpse it in the days that are left to him, but he'll not have time to lay the ghost. Aggie, don't be a fool. Kappa's watching you like a hawk, and so are the police. You've got to get out of Midport. I've got to get out of nowhere. All my life I've been hounded and chased. Now you try it for a change. You feel what it's like. Fifteen years ago, you were my most ardent supporter. You practiced the arts of magic then as fervently as I do now. What was it the Sunday Record headline said at the time? Classic students sacked for devil worship? It was the classics you were reading, wasn't it, before you wiped the slate clean and joined the Christian soldiers? Aggie, we both have a lot to lose. I have a lot, you have everything. If Kappa publishes that scandal, you're done for. You won't pick yourself up so easily this time. It wasn't easy last time. <laughs> well, there's a sight to behold. Look, down there by the azalea beds. I know your nuns have been emancipated, but I never expected to see one pushing a pram. Well, that's Sister Alice, one of our parish workers. Oh, that's done it. She's seen you. Poor old Nick. In an hour's time, the news will be all over Gas Street. The priest of St. Matthew's has been seen out walking with a witch. <laughs> Why, Sister Alice, this is a pleasant surprise. Not every day I come back to the office and find a deaconess waiting. I only called You'll have in... have a cup of tea with me? Oh, thank you. Now, the usual, Sergeant. Quick as you can. Bring an extra cup. I half expected to find Sir John waiting for me. He's been on my back all week, wanting to know when I'm going to find his wife's pearls for her. The Norton pearls? They've not been stolen. They have, you know. But when? She was wearing them at the fete on Saturday. Yeah, you were taken in the same as everyone else, sister. The pearls she was wearing on Saturday were a fake. Oh. The real Norton pearls disappeared a fortnight ago. Still, you've not come here to talk about missing jewels, have you? No. A, a missing person, actually. Inspector, have you seen Mr. Capper lately? No, I've been counting his absence as one of my blessings. What do you mean by missing? Simply that no one's seen him since Monday. Oh? I've made several inquiries, but for the last three days he's not been seen or heard of in Midport. And his wife is being buried this morning. It will look most you odd. You can't have forgotten that. Well, one would think not, certainly, but his behaviour has been so unaccountable since she died that nothing would surprise me. Normally, of course, I'd say it was the effect of his wife's death, but I, I really don't think he was all that fond of her. She's not only left him, she'd turned her back on the church as well, and he'd find that very hard to forgive. He's a deeply devout man and a terribly proud one. Oh, dear, I'm sorry I'm talking too much and taking up your time. You're worried, aren't you? Oh, thanks, Sergeant. Well, sit down, sister. Thank you. Nothing like tea for calming the nerves. 
Has Mr. Capper been telling you some of his tales of witchcraft? He told you too. I... I don't understand that man. Such loose, irresponsible talk. Such nonsense. And I've got the feeling he's looking for an ally. Someone who'll take his side for once. Very probably. But he won't find it easy. He's not a likeable man. But he's... he's brave. One has to acknowledge that. Brave, did you say? Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Capper believes in the malignant power of these witches. He believes that it may soon be directed against him. If... If only this dreadful murder could be solved... You think that would shut him up? Inspector, if you could prove that Mrs. Capper was killed for a perfectly understandable reason, though, of course, a very dreadful one, then Mr. Capper could hardly persist in his theory that she died of witches. You think I've been a bit slow over this case, don't you? Oh, I, I wouldn't dream of criticising. Well, Mr. Capper will when he turns up. Well, it was a perfectly simple case at the beginning, and just that it's been complicated by that old man and his witches. And my fault, really. I should have backed my own judgment and ignored Mr. Capper's rantings. It's not easy to ignore Mr. Capper. You can say that again. Plus, of course, the fact that this is my first murder case since promotion, and I've got to watch my P's and Q's more than ever. Well, it's full steam ahead now. I'm applying for a warrant this afternoon. Oh, uh, congratulations. Now I feel I've justified my promotion. Uh, biscuits, sir? Uh, no, thank you, no. The tea is quite sufficient. Oh. May I ask, the witches, had they anything to do with it? Now, sister, what do you think? You come in. Oh, Mr. Capper. You've just sold a missing persons case for me. I've sold more than that. Oh. Morning, sister. Good morning, Mr. Capper. Well, sister Alice has been worried about you. Did you know that nobody's seen you for three days? Nobody in Midport's seen me because I've been away. You're coming to the funeral, I hope, sister. If you'd like to wait in my car, I'll give you a lift. We shan't be a few minutes. Sister Alice is coming in my car. Please yourself, sister. You might wish later that you had waited in the car. Right now, Hagel, what progress have you made since Monday? It's all over by the shouting. I'm applying for a warrant this afternoon. Glad to hear it. Who for? Tom Doyle, of course. Who else? We've got witnesses who saw him at the fete on Saturday, Sister Alice being one of them. And there's a set of his prints on the boot of your car. The only thing that's holding me up is the motive. But we've had the motive all along. Your motive, Mr. Capper, which didn't satisfy me. A hard nut like Tom Doyle doesn't waste his time on witchcraft. Why else should he kill her? I'll tell you. There's a barman at the Devil's Kitchen called Clark who overheard a row between Doyle and your wife two nights before she died. Now, according to Clark, it was the mother and father of a row with blows struck on both sides. I know. That's where she got her black eye. More than likely. Now, the row was over a necklace which Doyle accused Mrs. Capper of stealing. What? Oh, I beg your pardon. Yes, naturally, I thought he'd got that bit the wrong way round, but Clark insists that he hasn't. Doyle wanted the necklace, but Mrs. Capper refused to give it to him and said he'd never find it. Doyle said he'd kill her if she didn't hand it over. But what good would that have done him? Oh, I agree, it was just his temper talking. A very nasty temper which has led him into trouble before. Is this all? The interesting thing to my mind is the necklace itself. They wouldn't have a stand-up fight over a string of beads. This could be the Norton Pearls. If Doyle stole them and your good lady took a fancy to them... What's all this got to do with my wife's death? I'm not interested in the Norton jewellery. Look, if you're trying to impress me with this story, Eagle, you're wasting your time. I got it out of Clark myself before I went to London. London? Yes. Why have you been there, Mr. Capper? When I joined the police force 25 years ago, I was taught to be thorough. Check... Check and double check was my motto. I don't need to check on Tom Doyle. I know him backwards. But you don't know Agnes Craft. And you've not checked on her. If you had, you wouldn't be sat there making a fool of yourself about stolen pearls. I told you right at the start, the witches are behind this. Oh, Mr. Capper, not again. You won't listen, will you? You won't be guided by my experience. I'll listen, but you don't make sense. Don't I? Don't I, just. Do I make sense to you, sister? Would you have checked on Miss Craft? It's hardly my place. You chose to sit in on this conversation. Now, come on. Mr. Caffer, we haven't got all day. If you know anything about Miss Craft, then tell me. I'm listening. Right. Now, these are photostat copies of reports of a case of witchcraft published by the Sunday Record in November 1954. The existence of this particular coven was brought to light by the death of a young girl. Her name was... Jennifer Preedy. 
He was 22. A student at Oxford, intelligent, full of promise. And a member of the witch's cover. They were all students. What do you expect? No sense of responsibility. Uh, how did the girl die? There's nothing here. Fell well, under a car. Killed outright. Bottom of the page there, look. Uh. It was established that only a few hours before her death, she had threatened to betray the coven to the college authorities. And that those damn witches had prayed and plotted for her death. I'll lay you any odds you like. It's the same pattern. That's exactly what happened to Vera. There's another picture here. A man covering his face. Oh. No. And that caption's clear enough too, isn't it? G.K. Nicholson leaving the coroner's court. Now, may I see that? All along I've had a feeling about Father Nicholson. I know a guilty man when I see one. When he wasn't trying to persuade me that the witches are harmless, he was trying to warn me to leave them alone and not interfere. What happened to these people, Mr. Capper, the students in the coven? Expelled a lot of them, sent down in disgrace. And Agnes Craft still crowed in triumph. Made no secret of what she'd done. Claimed the girl's death as proof of her own supernatural powers. You've really set the cat among the pigeons, haven't you? I've done my duty. And you're as pleased as punch. Don't be childish, man. These are facts. Somebody had to dig them up. But just how relevant are they? Exactly. Let's keep a sense of proportion. Your wife, Mr. Capper, was murdered. This pretty girl died by accident. Accident, my eye. Death by misadventure was the coroner's verdict. It's here in black and white. No mention of the supernatural. Accident. So that's it. You two are going to cover up for this ruddy priest. That's enough, Mr. Capper. Please, please, both of you. We must use our common sense. Sister, I don't doubt your loyalty to your parish priest, but... I hope I don't leave here doubting yours, Mr. Capper. There's something, surely, that you overlooked. If Father Nicholson were really a member of Miss Craft's coven, would your poor wife have made her confession to him? Well, would she? Come on, Mr. Capper. Well, she... she went in a panic. She... she didn't know what she was doing. She knew perfectly well. It was I who told her Father Nicholson was in the confession. But you can't deny this evidence of Oxford. No, but it's all a long time ago. Students grow up in 15 years. Not Miss Craft. You can't defend her. She's in it deeper than ever. Hagel, if you don't get these witches... Well, what do you expect me to do? Charge her up with conspiracy? Well, there was a conspiracy between 13 misfits in this town to kill my wife. And they succeeded. Now they're drunk with that success, there's no holding them. Already they're planning some new devilment. You know what tomorrow is, don't you? Tomorrow? Friday. It's the Feast of All Hallows, the most important festival in the witch's calendar. Tomorrow's your chance. Oh, uh, we mustn't forget the time. Eh? Oh, Lord, the funeral. Where are those photos? Right. Are you all right, sister? You look pale. It's a shock. I, I warned her. I'm perfectly all right, thank you. Certainly, Mr. Capper's revelations have been a shock, but there are always two sides to be considered. When we've heard Father Nicholson's explanation... <laughs> I hope you'll have the courtesy to listen to him, Mr. Capper. In all fairness, you owe him that. You've not only condemned him unheard, you've taken pleasure in doing so. You've made a mockery of Christian duty. I knew I shouldn't be popular. You told me that yourself. But I didn't think you'd be the first to... I'll see you there. Oh, dear. Basically, he's right. It was his duty. No, it was mine. If I'd done it, I could have softened the blow. At last, Mr. Capper. Now, sister, after the service, would you be good enough to stay behind? I'll have to have words with your father, Nicholson. It might be easier for us both if you're there, too. chilly, isn't it, sister? It is, Inspector. Oh, funerals have a very humbling effect. There's so little one can do for those who grieve. You implied earlier on that Mr. Capper wasn't grieving. I said he was difficult to understand. His face never gives anything away. I suppose 25 years in the police force would make anyone look implacable. Mm. Not many people here, are there? Reporters, mostly. Why are you here, Inspector, apart uh, from... Vera the... Kappa had some undesirable friends. I thought some of them might turn up today. If they were truly undesirable, they're not likely to come to her funeral. Yeah, you're wrong there, sister. One of them has. Excuse me. Here, 
showed me respect. You're not showing much respect for Mr. Kaffer's feelings. You didn't show much for his car either, did you? His car? What are you on about? I don't even know his car. Then how come your prints are all over the boot? Look, there's a poor lady going to her rest, and all you can talk about is cars. That's very ill-bred of you, Now, Harry. listen to me. There now, there now. Our troubles are over. The good die young, they say, though touching 40, she left it a bit late. Old Kappa's bearing up well for a man full of grief. Doyle, that woman there was murdered. For the last six months of her life, she was closer to you than anyone, and on the Wednesday before she died, you threatened to kill her. Harry, if that's a joke, it's in very bad taste. Why should I do that? She's the joker, chum, not me. She never gave you back the necklace, did she? Inspector, aren't you exceeding You've yourself? You've moved heaven and earth to find the Norton Pearls. You even searched the old man's car boot. Oh, so we're back there, are we? Hey, now, did you see that? He's dropped something in the grave. A rosary. She asked for that to be done. Her church meant more to her than you ever did. Isn't that a touching thing? And just like Vera, the big dramatic exit. The time you were making yours. Get back to the club and stop there. You're going to answer some awkward questions later. I've had a lifetime of practice. Oh, go on. Or... What's up? Nothing. Nothing at all. Uh, emotion, Harry. I was very fond of that woman in my way. I'll be seeing you. Yeah. Fond of my Aunt Fanny. It wasn't grief for that glint in his eye. There's something I said. Oh, blast it. There must have been something. That was very moving, Father. I hope Mr. Capper was able to draw some comfort from it. I was relieved to see him. Disappearing for three days without explanation. He'll explain all too soon, I'm afraid. I don't understand him, sister. That's the truth. He's gone racing away now without so much as a thank you. For some reason, he's come to resent me. He resents you very bitterly, Father. He makes no secret of it. He makes no secret either of the connection between you and Agnes Craft. Sister. Uh, here's Inspector Hagel. You can trust him, Father. Right. Now that's over, Vicar. I'd like a word with you. Now let's walk over this way. We don't want those reporters interrupting us. You look very grim, Inspector. I feel very grim. You've deliberately withheld information in a criminal case. A fine thing for a clergyman. You've also made me look an abject fool in Kappa's eyes. Not that I care what he thinks, but he's hell-bent on making trouble. Yes, he's made that clear. And your behaviour hasn't helped. Kappa's provided evidence of an association between you and Miss Craft. An old association. It's quite... Old or new, it's nothing to do with it. Now, why didn't you tell me? Tell you that Miss Craft and I practised witchcraft at Oxford? How would that have helped? <laughs> I'm not proud of the fact. I should think not. And I'll be the one to say what's helpful and what isn't. You've got a lot to answer for, Vicar. Another woman has died, and this time... This time, as before, Miss Craft and I had nothing to do with it. Now, you have a right to be angry. But... I have every no, no, right please, to be... have the decency to hear me out. I will tell you what happened 15 years ago. And when I've told you, I'll have to make Kappa understand it, too. You'll have a job. He must be made to understand. Otherwise, there's no knowing what harm he may do. For once in his life... That stubborn old man must see reason. Dumb. What splendid chrysanthemums against that wall. They look just like a Van Gogh. You have an excellent eye, Mr. Kappa. I'm not blessed with green fingers myself. I'm afraid the vicarage garden is a disgrace. I thought this morning you needed a bit of attention. Well, sit down. You've not come here to talk about gardening. No, I haven't. Hegel tells me you've looked up the details of that affair at Oxford. You don't deny what happened. Well, of course I don't. I've never attempted to. But I've tried to forget it. Well, I'm trying to remind you, because the same thing's happened again. Only this time it's my wife that's dead. So don't ask me to be impartial. You're very quick to condemn what we did that night, and you're right, of course. But can you imagine how we felt when we learned that that poor girl had died? Aye, drunk with power. But that power was part of the illusion. With one exception, we were all shocked into our senses. The exception being Agnes Croft. Well, she's a very remarkable woman, you know, with undoubted spiritual gifts. She's a prime example of what I would call a, a person apart. <laughs> she has to be. That's what witches breed on. But faith and fear weren't enough for her. Oh, no. As maiden of the coven, she puts herself above such things. But to keep that faith and fear alive in her followers, she 
she was ready to do murder. And is your attitude going to change her? Certainly her creed is vicious and absurd. I'm with you all the way on that, but you're not going to defeat it by persecuting her. What then? Turn me back on it. Ignore her. Can't you get it into your head? Miss Craft had nothing to do with Jennifer Preda's death. I know she claims she had, but no one in their right mind is going to believe her. Aren't they? Now, look, I know Miss Craft a good deal better than you do. Once she was a fine woman with a keen intellect and a great sense of humor. But for 15 years, simply because of her beliefs, she's been hounded by ignorant, bullying, frightened men. Meaning me? Meaning all men like you who can't control their prejudice or superstition. Will you mention that in your article for the record? Ah, now we're coming. We have to have this out, Mr. Cather. Have you considered what's at stake if you revive this scam? <laughs> You're lively, Lord Preston. Oh, no, much more than that. The reputation of the church itself. Church? You talk about the church. You! If the bishop were ordained, you had known what I know now. Great heavens, man. Of course he knew. You don't think I'd conceal the facts from him? You conceal them from everybody else. And there's one fact now sticking out for all of us to see. My wife and Jennifer Preedy were murdered. Behind their death stand you and Agnes Craft. You can't conceal that. By God, you'll be begging for charity by the time I've done. Well, there's no point in arguing further. I've got the names. Eight names out of 13 I've got. I'm not bluffing. I swore I'd identify the creatures in your coven, and I have. Mrs. Harris from the Station Hotel. <laughs> Joyce Pritchard. Dr. Rowley. Lady Norton. Lady Norton? You thought I didn't know. Oh, Kappa, you're going to land yourself in serious trouble. I've got proof, man. Well, if it's the same caliber proof you have against me. Someone's got to take a stand against all this rottenness. Already it's breeding on itself. I'm not the only one putting pressure on... What are you talking about? Blackmail. Someone's blackmailing these creatures. Ask Lady Norton if you don't believe me. She's living in terror. Is this another of your fantasies? You'll not dismiss it like that when our blackmailing pal gets round to you. And when he's done, don't talk charity to him. You'll want more than that. Uh, are you quite sure of this? Taking me seriously at last, are you? Think the old fool might know what he's on about, after all. I didn't think it possible. You two right you didn't. You and Agle and others like you. Witches. <laughs> They're good for a laugh, and so is anyone who says otherwise. But I know Nicholson. I know better. You were priest, and only 15 years ago, you were one of them. You and Agnes Croft up to your ears in depravity. I wonder, you know, if you'd feel so vindictive if you hadn't a grudge against these witches. Grudge? What are you on about? I've got no grudge. But your wife. Oh. <laughs> you know, I'd... I'd almost forgotten. Want a scotch? No, thanks. Only buried her this morning, and already I've forgotten. Of course, I'd, I'd have seen her for six months. Married her on my own. It was like she was dead all that time. Does that shock you? No. It's sad, but... You didn't have to live with her. My fault, I suppose. Old enough to be a father. We never had a thing in common. She had a lot of courage. Courage? Vera. Mm, and concern for you. Look, I don't know what she told you in the confessional, What but... she told me was dreadful. But her anxiety for you was clear. For me? Anxiety? She desperately wanted to talk to you. Scream at me, you mean? She came to my stall at the fate, hysterical, humiliating me. Then she told you about the witches. She didn't tell me anything. I got shot of her quick as I could. Tell me what about the witches? That they were going to kill her, you mean? No. No, I said she was concerned for you. It's you the witches want to kill. It's your likeness they made and sacrificed you. They've willed you dead tomorrow night. No. I, th I thought you knew that. Here, here. Come and sit down. You. You sure? Quite sure. I asked Miss Croft. I thought you knew. I did. I felt it days ago. Malice, hate, creeping to me. Oh, now, hold on, Mr. Capper. Don't tell me you believe that deeply in witchcraft. You can't afford to treat it lightly. I know I've seen. You've seen, too. You believed yourself once. I thought I did. Look, I... I'm sorry for what I said earlier. I'm sorry. I... don't want to be alone, I... 
must have someone with me. Yes, of course. I, I'll tell you what I'll do. I have a confirmation class at eight, and I can't cut that. But if I go now, I can look in at the mother house and ask Sister Alice if she'll come and sit with you. How will that do? I, I don't want to be a bother. No, it's not the least bother. You know Sister Alice. She'll only be too pleased. I've got this feeling, sense of danger. I'm afraid I've been tactless. I never thought you'd mind so much. It's only mumbo-jumbo. Truly it is. It's not pleasant. But... Look, it's still light. Why don't you get in some gardening before Sister arrives? What we were discussing earlier can wait, can't it? You mean... The article. Will you postpone any decision for the moment? And try not to brood about Miss Craft. Really, she's not the ogre you imagine. She has her problems, too. Shut that door and don't walk Get out on me. Get a hold on yourself. The whole place can hear you. The club's packed to the roof. Shut the door. I could kill you. God help me, I could. I underestimated your driving force, didn't I? Disgusting, unbridled greed. God knows I'd never trust you with a penny piece. But I didn't think you'd betray me. Betray you? What sort of talk is that? In a matter of months, preying on her treasured respectability, you've had a thousand pounds and a pearl necklace out of Lady Norton alone. And how did you She find told out? me herself less than an hour ago. And she's not the only one, is she? Which of the others are you blackmailing? Who else have you battened on? No need for others. Sarah Norton's got more money than wrinkles. The pearls alone Is are... that the truth? Now, Aggie... It never struck you, did it, that she'd blame me? That she'd think I'd failed her? She trusted me, they all do, to preserve their anonymity, and I do protect them from dangerous fanatics like Barnard Kappa. I can cope with people like him, but you... You've ruined everything I've built up in this lousy town. What's ruined? What's spoiled for you? The woman's putting on an act. You don't want to take any notice don't of her. Don't be a fool. I'm talking sense to you. That old Harridan's as sly as Barney Kappa when it comes to making a show. You should have seen him at the funeral this morning. Face as solid as a wardrobe, mourning fit to break your heart. Righteous, vicious fool. I'll squash him like a fly. You'll do nothing of the kind. It's already done. Then undo it, Aggie, I'm telling you. There's been enough coppers in the devil's kitchen this last week. The coven is my concern. I said undo it! You hit me, Tom, I'll hit you back. I'm not Vera Kappa. You don't ride roughshod over me. <coughs> now see what you've done upsetting yourself. Aggie, let's be done with harsh words and unpleasantness. Put it behind us and start again. It's the best time there could be for a new beginning. Don't tell me I've won a convert in you. Aggie, I know the powers that are given to you. Haven't I seen them working? Don't I know what you're capable of? What are you getting at, Tom? That's my girl. Now, listen, listen. Tom Doyle's got it all worked out. Come tomorrow night, they'll have cause to remember the witches of Midport. Oh, damn his eyes. Pound to a penny, that's Hegel. I'm getting tired of that fella. Well, now, here's a surprise. I'd never have guessed it. Come on in. This is a great army you do us, Father. I was directed out here by your doorman. I know it's a busy time of evening for you, but I must see Miss Craft urgently. Well, she'll be delighted. Won't you, Aggie? It really is important. I don't imagine you walk dog collared into a dubious club as the matter were trivial. I can give you five minutes, Nick, and then I have to entertain these people. We'll stay and watch you, won't you, Father? Well, Aggie's a great marvel at fortune-telling. You've no idea. Funny how superstitious people can be, isn't it, Father? Superstition dies hard. Uh, you've not been able to upset it much, have you? I'll see you downstairs, Aggie. You were right about him. He is a dangerous man. Less than five minutes, Nick. Sit down. Aggie, earlier tonight I was at Kappa's house. I told him of your elaborate threat. I thought Vera had done that. So did I, but we were wrong. Aggie, that old man is abject with fear. He's not putting on an act. He's convinced you mean him harm. I told you before, I mean him the ultimate harm. What is this? Have you come here to plead for Barnard Kappa? Partly. Save your breath. And partly to warn you. Don't you see? If you persist in this, Kappa will point to your malice as proof that you killed Vera. He'll say you're unhinged. Nick, you know the power of Apollyon as well as I do. You've not forgotten it in 15 years. Tried to, perhaps, taken refuge in a fool's paradise. What are you getting at? You never could accept that I killed Jennifer, could you? You refuted the testimony of your senses, and you've done so ever since. You didn't think it possible. Well, it wasn't possible. Anyone else? Maybe I would have believed it. But... The great dramatic. Poor Nick, you're still going through hell. Even hell can change in 15 years. But the wheel comes full circle. It has now, hasn't it? These last few days since you and I came face to face again. 
The past has been brilliant in your mind. I've relived it, yes. Oh, what a lot we had in common once in those old days. The things we shared and loved and gloried in. Now you call it hell. <laughs> and me, what do you call me, Nick? For 15 years I've been the wandering Jew in your life, haven't I? The lurking threat to your peace of mind. That peace is going, Nick, and this time you'll not regain it. This time you'll not be able to fool yourself. In a few hours from now, when the light comes creeping over the harbour, the burden of death will have been laid on Barnard Capper. It will have been carried under the wings of the dark angel and nailed to the old man's door. Oh, keep this can't for your customers downstairs. I look at you. You! I despise you. You who oppose me with the blessing of the church. You who once stood with me at the altar of Apollyon and defiled that god, that church. Even when Vera Kappa died, Vera, who once had followed me, you usurped my place and laid her in a Christian grave. But what else could I do? She wasn't yours to bury! All my life I've tried to build my faith, to create something for others to believe in. And I end up in this stinking town with nothing, nothing at all. Every night in my dreams I see your face and Vera's and Jennifer Preedy's swimming in my mind and smiling, smiling. <laughs> Aggie. The last thing I want is their pity. My poor Aggie. <laughs> Don't touch me. That's all we need now, isn't it? To rebuild the past completely. That's all we need to recreate the memory. Go home, Nick. There's nothing you can do. Maybe soon the hate will be burned out. I'm heating the milk for the cocoa, Mr. Capper. I suggest you take some aspirin and try to get some sleep. It won't be much of an early night for you, sister. Quarter past twelve already. I'm blessed with an iron constitution, though I must admit my legs are aging fast. <laughs> oh, oh, that's better. Now, why don't you sit down? You'll do no good peering through the curtains every few minutes. Forewarned is forearmed. I like to be prepared. Oh, damn it! They switched off the street lights. I can't see a thing. There's nothing to see. There won't be either. I think I've brought you out in a wild goose chase, eh? Mr. Capper, you've shown some sense this evening in agreeing not to write your article. I never said that. Well, in having second thoughts, then, why not show a little more and admit that you're frightened of your own imagination? Are you telling me I've imagined the deaths of two women? You've invested them with a spurious, melodramatic... Oh, I give up. You see the devil everywhere. Quiet. Turn that wireless off. Oh, the milk. Excuse me. 12.20. Well, if she's coming, she must come soon. Ah, she's bound to come. She's laid the curse. What's that? Sister! Sister! Oh, what a mess. A milk stain, sir. Sister, she's here. She... She's outside in the garden. I saw her through the window. Miss Crow? I saw her. Oh, she hasn't rung the bell. She's not paying a social call. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Mr. Capper, we, we can't stand out here holding our breath while Miss Croft does whatever she's supposed to do. I'm not going out there. Well, I am. If I stay here doing nothing, I'll get as jittery as you, and then where will we be? That sounds like a fire. It is. I told you they prayed my death on Friday. Now on the eve of all hallows, they're bringing it home. We'll see about that. Mind, please. It's no use. Mind. Don't open that door. You'll kill us both. What? Good oh, gracious. Mr. Capper, get something to beat with. There, there's something burning on the door. It, it's been nailed there. And set alight. Don't just stand there. It, it might take a hold. No. No. Oh, impossible. Pass me that old coat. Where? Where is she? M Miss Craft, you mean? There's no one here. Whoever it was nailed this... What? 
A doll. You see it? I, a homemade doll. Whew. Soaked in petrol. A wizened old man nailed to the door and burning... Ah! Oh, Mr. Capper. Mr. Capper. <laughs> Morning, Vicar. Uh, that looks hot work. Uh, morning, Inspector. Yes, I felt I ought to make some effort after seeing Mr. Capper's garden yesterday. Things won't grow for me, but any fool can mow a lawn. You sound a bit depressed, sir. I take it you know what's happened to Mr. Capper. Yes, Sister Alice phoned me last night. I gather he fell and hit his head. That's about it. And not recovered consciousness, apparently. Mm. Rather annoying. There were some questions I wanted to ask him. You're ignoring the part Miss Craft played in the business, are you? Well, it, it seems hardly worth consideration. I wouldn't go so far as that. A silly childish trick, of course. From all I've been hearing lately, I expected the old fool to be turned into a donkey, at least. Not that that'd be very difficult. Uh, Inspector, you mustn't think... No, that... no, I mustn't. Of course I mustn't. Irritating old buzzard, though. I thank the Lord I never had him as my chief. It, uh... Doesn't strike you as odd, then, that uh, Miss Craft should be content with nailing a burning effigy of Capper to his front door? I don't know about odd. It was um, effective, Inspector. Not half as effective as slamming the lid of a car boot on someone's neck. It might be, in the long run. And you don't really believe that. Look, Inspector, to you and me, that burning effigy might be silly and childish, but to Capper, it appeared as a manifestation of the malice he's aroused in this town. It wasn't a crude, rough doll he saw nailed to that door, but himself. Oh, come now. He's a hard Look, He believes. Old... He accepts the inevitable. He sees this action of the witches as a death wish laid upon him. Oh, he's a nutter, then. Well, I've said so all along. This case is full of them. He has a blind faith in the power of evil. Certainly, that's unusual today. Well, there's one good thing come out of it. He'll be out of commission tonight. Tonight? It's all Hallow's Eve, Vicar. Don't say you've forgotten. Ah. The witches will be coming into their own tonight. Yes, you, uh, you think Miss Craft will hold a Sabbath? I'm not thinking so much of Miss Craft, actually. No, there's another hand in this. Has been all along. A Doyle. Oh, but he's a law unto himself. He couldn't care less about the witches. I can't agree with you there, either. But didn't you know? He's been blackmailing people in the coven. Uh, yes. Uh, Kappa hinted as much last night. He doesn't miss much, does he? Um, Vicar, with your permission and that of the bishop and whoever else, I want to station men in the churchyard tonight. It's a situation I'll have to play by ear, but with all the signs, it should pay off. What signs? Oh, signs. Now, I'm not talking about omens and not talking about witchcraft at all. I'm ignoring the supernatural for once. And much easier when you do that, as I'm sure Sister Alice would agree. I... I don't know what you're on about. You will, sir. Well, have I your permission, then? Hegel, you put me in a very awkward position. I want to help, but I, I... I don't see how I can. If you're right, these people will desecrate the churchyard. How can I allow that? If I had men stationed there, any damage would be prevented. It's up to you, of course, and I wouldn't dream of asking if I didn't think it was worthwhile, but uh, it's either that or get an exhumation order. Exhumation? Yes, and everything will be that bit more unpleasant. But exhume whom? I... Mrs. Capper? I think that's what people have in mind. What people? Oh. That's right. The witches. It always comes back to them. Why are they doing this? A week ago, we hadn't even heard of them. We'd no idea of their existence. Not till Mr. Capper started shouting it from the rooftops. He's a real stirrer, isn't he? Yes, and there's no knowing where it might all end. No. It could end tonight, you know. It depends on you. All right, Hagel. Station your men. Jolly good. We'll meet in the churchyard then, all being well. And all being well, we'll finish this evil business. And keep your fingers crossed. Ah, it's a half past eleven. I wonder if Mr. Capper's with us yet. I really must have words with him. Doctor's just left, Inspector. He suggested taking him to hospital, but I thought it would be better if I stayed with him here. I'll arrange relief duties with one of the other sisters. That's very good of you. Not at all. I'm, I'm qualified to nurse people, and the hospitals carry a big enough burden already. True. 
I'm afraid he's still unconscious. Did you want to talk to him urgently? Uh, just as soon as I can. Uh, would you mind if I got a constable to sit with him? To take notes, you mean? Not at all. It seems an excellent idea. Well, he's moving. Uh, sister, look at his eyes. Sh quiet. Uh, relax, Mr. Capper. You're safe and comfortable. How do you feel? Fire. Uh, Mr. Capper. No, please, let me. The fire's out, Mr. Capper. It's out, and there's been no damage. A curse brought in the fire. Warned you. Dangerous. There's no danger anymore. You fell and hit your head. Don't fall. Vera, she saw. She knew. Came to warn me. I couldn't. The priest have told me. I told him what? Is he delirious? His temperature's high, certainly, and his pulse none too steady. Shall I get a doctor? No. No doctor. Don't fall. I... Now, now, you'll soon be all right. Never understood. Never believed any of you. Now you try believing this, Mr. Capper. The coven won't be meeting after tonight. The witches are finished in Midport. In a matter of hours... He can't hear you. He's lost consciousness again. I'll see you out, Inspector. Was that true, what you just told him? Hmm? You weren't deceiving him. About the witches? Rather not. I've laid it all on with your father, Nicholson. Between us, we'll settle these witches... Nights are really getting cold now, aren't they? Yeah. There's a frost, I think. Well, if we are cold, think what it'll be like for the Glee Club. They can't be going to perform in their birthday suits this weather, can they? It's customary. Part of the ceremony. And rather them than me. There are ointments, herbal mixtures. You can rub them into the skin for warmth. Mm, old wives' remedy, eh? And drugs. Uh, yes, but not the kind you'd be interested in. Yeah, I never thought I'd be interested in a witch's Sabbath. You never can tell, can you? What time do they start? Midnight. Uh-huh. Curtain up. Well, I mean, it should be. Oh. You know, I'm rather glad Kappa's still out of the way. He was bound to interfere. He'll be furious. He's missed it. I'm a bit worried about him. He's got worse since I saw him this morning. You know he's in a coma. Sister Alice still with him? Ah, uh, yes. She's a marvel. Yes, she's in good hands. Couldn't be better. Hey, up. Where? By the south wall. Good Lord. It looks as though the procession's coming up out of the ground. Ah, they're using the old crypt. Mm -hmm. Thank heavens for the moon. I can see Miss Craft and Doyle behind her. And what's he carrying? Mm, looks like a shovel. Well, they're dressed too, most of them. It's mainly the men. The men with the shovels. That's Frank Proctor. And who's that woman? Oh, no. Yes, Sarah Norton. Mr. Capper has proved right again. You wonder if he's ever wrong. I'm surprised they risk the music. Oh, it's necessary. We're on the outskirts of the town, small risk of being heard. Ah, they're forming a circle. Look, around the grave. Is that usual? Yes. But the summoning. I'll get a surprise when we answer it. Hold up, Vicar. Not long to go now. and protect our proud Apollyon. Behold thy servants on the threshold of the circle. By Lucifer, Zetanthus, and Beelzebub, I conjure, bind, and charge thee to send thy servant without horror or deformity to penetrate this circle and give power to thy earthly servants. By the triple crown of Cerberus, I charge thee, O most powerful and princely lord, that thou shalt... What's she on about? She's summoning the spirit of the dead. She intends to convey Mrs. Capper's soul to hell. Strong to stuff, eh? Half-baked rubbish. Hegel, he was simply doing, violating the grave. Mrs. Capper's grave, what I tell you. Well, now they're lighting a fire. What's that in aid of? 
So the spirit of the dead went ahead for? The ineffable name of Apollyon. By the great sea of glass, by the four beasts which lodge before the throne, by the fire which is about the throne, answer me and perform all that I desire. By Apollyon, do I... I can't allow this. Sit down. It'll do no good. Just a few minutes more. I want that coffin raised. going on? Doyle's jumped in the grave. That's no part of the ritual. I think the party's about to break up, Vicar. Miss Kraft's putting on a bold front, though, trying to keep order in the ranks. I'll bet she could murder Doyle for this. Through spirit Arev since deceased to appear before me. Over by the gate, Parker. There's one trying to climb the wall. Sergeant, I want all these people in the vans in two minutes. Sir, if they've got any questions, they can ask them at the station. Rose, put that fire out. Climb out of that grave, Doyle. You're under arrest. Get things in perspective, copper. Bowden, Landry, get him out. Yes, sir. Give us your hand. Don't be petty, lad. Give us your hand or I'll hold you up by the collar. Get your hands off me, Hegel. You're too fat. Get out of my pockets. Hold him, you two. I want to know what Mr. Doyle carries around at night. Well, well, well. Isn't that a pretty sight? I put him in the van with the others. Bowden, get down to the crypt and fetch their clothes. Yes, sir. They may like dancing in the all together, but we can't put them in the charge room like that. Ah, oh, there you are, Vicar. Well, I, I hope you're satisfied, Hegel. Satisfied? I'm delighted. Sorry about the grave. Nasty, but at least the coffin's not disturbed. Yeah. Hey, what about this? Hmm? Why, it's a rosary. Where did you get this? It's not a rosary. Look carefully. Uh, it's not easy in this light. Well, they're beads. Poorly strung. Done in a panic. She said they were hidden where he'd never find them. These are the Norton Pearls, sir. What? In Mrs. Capper's grave? A bit macabre, I grant you, but a damn good hiding place. She disguised them as a rosary to keep them hidden from Doyle. Then when she knew the witches meant to kill her... She passed them over to you, yeah. asking that they should be buried with her. Tortuous minds, some women. And, and when did Doyle guess what she'd done? At the funeral. He tumbled to it just before I did. And this fiasco tonight was his doing, not oh, Miss Crouch's. I've no doubt he suggested it. It seemed the only way of getting the jewels back in a hurry. Well, there they go. If you want to see Miss Craft at all... Thank you. That's thoughtful. What, um, what do you intend to charge her with? Willful damage seems a likely start. She's made a right miss of your churchyard. And then you'll charge Doyle with the murder. Doyle? Oh, no. I was all set to do so, as you know, but Mr. Capper persuaded me otherwise. He was quite right, as usual. He's convinced Miss Craft is the killer. But I don't understand. You, you just said... Uh, Vicar, what's your opinion of witchcraft? Is it all Mr. Capper cracks it up to be? Inspector, you should know by now you shouldn't listen to Capper. He's steeped in superstition. Ah, now you've put your finger on it there. Let's go and tell him what's happened. The car's over here. Come on. Be there at this rate. Mm. Someone's had a hard day. You don't know who Mr. Capper's doctor is, do you? Mm. Uh, I think it's Dr. Barton in the old town. Why? It might be an idea to have him with us. You know what a stickler the old man is for procedure. Oh, Lord, excuse me, I can't think straight. It's just that I don't want Mr. Capper having cause for complaint. Complaint? About what? way I carry out an arrest, of course. He might say that as a sick man... But you mean you're going to arrest Mr. Capper? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I thought you'd worked it out for yourself. Sister Alice has. At least I think she has. He came into my office yesterday saying what a proud man he was, how difficult it was for him to forgive his wife. And she's spot on, of course. That old man's not the type to tolerate a scandal. But he was the one who threatened the scandal. Oh, I don't mean about you and the witches. No, Capper saw a juicy scandal looming up at the fate when his wife put in an appearance. He kept her very nicely out of everyone's way for six months. And while she'd been reveling in obscurity with Tom Doyle, he'd been making a name for himself with his memoirs and the record. 
She was the last person he wanted to see at the fete. Everything was going fine for him. Crowds of people wanting his autograph, he among them. Proud as a peacock he was that afternoon. His personal friend, Lord Catesby, opening the fete, and then his wife turns up screaming hysterics. And she was trying to warn him. Warn him of the danger. He never gave her a chance. I saw that myself. He said something to her that shut her up, and she went from his stall to the car park. It's a pity I didn't follow her. I was feeling a bit thirsty. Bagel, surely you can't prove any of this. I have a job proving anything against that cocky devil. But he's the only person with a motive for killing the woman. Doyle might have done it in a black rage, but the Norton Pearls were at stake, and where big money's concerned, our Tom can control his temper. And you'll rule out Miss Kraut? Well, of course. She tried to kill Capper. Yes, the way she's always tried. By getting the devil to do her dirty work. She's convinced that because she asked him, the devil snuffed out Mrs. Capper and Jennifer Preedy, and Lord knows who else. I bet it never crossed her mind to lay a finger on Capper herself. She'd regard that as usurping the devil's prerogative. Hello, here we are. We get ourselves a bad name waking up the neighbours. Are you, uh, going to charge him now? I'm going to play it by ear. I told you, he's a tricky bird. Well, you're quick off the mark, sister. I heard the car. I was expecting Dr. Barton. I called him 20 minutes ago. Oh, it's wrong. Is he deeper in the coma? He's dead. What? what? I'm afraid he's dead, Inspector. Just 20 minutes ago it was, without regaining consciousness. But it was just a blow on the head. Not that bad. Well, that couldn't kill him. Perhaps not. But he died just the same as to Hegel. I think of his fear of the witches. I'm determined to be in perfect form for Monday, Father. Monday? What's happening then? It's the feast of St. Hilda of Whitby. She's a great favourite of mine. Ah, St. Hilda. One of the virgin martyrs, wasn't she? Well, rather more than that, Father. She was an intelligent virgin, and that's all too rare today. Ah. Have you finished hearing confessions? Yes, we'd better get a move on. It's nearly seven. We don't want to be late for the harvest supper. I'd rather not. The bishop would never forgive us. Come on, then. The car's in Church Street. Oh, no. Afraid so. Another latecomer. Father, the bishop is waiting. I think this is one of those rare occasions when the clergy must take precedence over the laity. <laughs> In Malice at Autumn's End by John Hyatt, the part of the Reverend G.K. Nicholson was played by John Bentley. Sister Alice by Margot Boyd, Barnard Kappa by John Gabriel, Inspector Hegel, Wilfred Carter, Miss Craft, Maddie Head, Tom Doyle, Alan Barry, and Vera Kappa, Margaret Wolfitt. The play was produced by Norman Wright. This drama, set in the 1970s, is all about the investigation of a murder. Um, uh, yes, madam? Well, do you think I could see somebody in charge? Well, uh, depends what the problem is. It's my daughter. She didn't come home last night. Oh, yes. How old is she? Nearly 21. Hmm. Does she have a boyfriend? Yes, and he's very concerned as well. Hmm. She isn't with him? Oh, no. I see. What's her name? Julia. Surname? Marsden. And when did you last see your daughter, Mrs. Marsden? Well, I suppose it was the day before yesterday. Well, that'll be Wednesday. Yes. So she hasn't been home for two nights? No, 
You see, she's a student nurse, yeah. and this week she's on the early shift. She starts work at seven o'clock, so I don't see her in the mornings. So she was home on Wednesday night? Yes. And she didn't say anything that might suggest she wouldn't be coming home last night? Oh, no, of course not. Didn't have an argument, did you? No. Uh, nor with Mr. Marsden? My husband's dead. Uh, you see, the problem is your daughter's of age. Unless she breaks the law, there's nothing we can do to bring her back. Uh, not if she doesn't want to come. But she hasn't left home. She hasn't taken any of her clothes. And we haven't had an argument. We get on well together. Mm. She's happy in her job. She's happy with her boyfriend. Uh, look, Mrs. Martin, you, you see, even in a small town like this, lots of young people go missing. <laughs> Uh, most of them turn up again safe and sound. Believe me, there's nothing to worry about. But Julia wouldn't run off. She doesn't have reason to. Look, um, have you phoned the hospital? What? The hospital where Julia works. Have you phoned to see if she's turned up for work oh, this morning? Well, no. Uh... <laughs> well, I think you should do that, don't you? I mean, she could be trying to phone you at this very moment with some sort of explanation. Here, yeah. you ring the hospital. Did I tell you it's my birthday today? No. I'm 43. Happy birthday. Thanks. Doing anything special tonight, then? No. I might go down to the social club for a few beers. That'll be about it. Do you want to come? No, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> How long have you been in the force? Nearly 20 years. Ten as Detective Sergeant. I'm still dreaming of making D.I. Uh, why not? I've been passed over too many times, that's why not. It would require an act of considerable merit on my part for my name ever to be taken seriously again at a promotion board. <sighs> oh, I don't know. Been blokes waiting longer than you who've made it. Yeah, but my face doesn't fit anymore. It certainly doesn't fit with people like Armstrong. No, what I want now is... He's a job as an advisor with some security firm. You know, sort of thing. Something at twice my present salary, plus expenses, and a firm's car. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't? Burgess. Yeah? What? Well, I don't want to see her. How old is she? Yeah, and how long has she been missing? One night. Does she know there's nothing we can do to bring her back? Yeah. Oh, all right, I'll have a word with her. Put her in one of the interview rooms with a cup of tea and a policewoman. OK, you better bring it in. What's up? A distraught mother who's mislaid her daughter. She's having a nervous breakdown all over the duty, Sergeant. What are you going to do? Have a word with her. Reassure her. You know, the usual cobblers. Oh, there's a photograph. Perhaps you'd like to file it when the sergeant brings it in. Well, it seems she came prepared for the worst. Well, they always do, don't they? Mrs. Marsden? Uh, yes? I'm Detective Sergeant Burgess. Oh? I've just had a word with the duty sergeant, and, uh, well, whereas I fully appreciate how you must be feeling, there's very little we can do at the moment. But why not? Well, I'm sure the sergeant has already explained most of the reasons to you. Yes, but my daughter hasn't run away. She hasn't taken any of her things with her. Have you checked thoroughly? Well, of course I have. I mean really thoroughly. It's not unknown for someone to leave home and not take their clothes with them. I mean, they're bulky things. Difficult to get out of the house undetected if you want to leave quietly. The sort of thing you want to check on are articles like bank deposit, passbook, valuable jewellery, checkbook, <laughs> things you wouldn't immediately notice were missing. No, no, look, Sergeant, I know you probably think I'm just being an hysterical mother, but I know Julia hasn't run away from home. We get on very well together. She's studying to be a nurse. It's a job she loves, and her final exams are in a few weeks' time. Now, she just wouldn't run away with that about to happen, whatever else was going on in her life. I gather she hasn't gone into work today. No. And I tell you that something awful has happened to her. Please, 
Mrs. Marsden. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. That's all right. Did your daughter go into work yesterday? Yes. Her ward sister said she went off duty at three yesterday afternoon, just as usual. Were you expecting her to come straight home? No, she, she was to meet her boyfriend. I think they were going shopping and then on to the cinema. Only she wasn't there when they went to collect her. Where were they supposed to meet? Oh, I don't know. You'll have to ask him. OK. What's his name? Uh, Raymond Taylor. I, I gave his address to the sergeant. Right. Now, Mrs Marsden, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll have a word with Mr Taylor and see if he can shed any light on where your daughter might have gone. It's possible she may have confided in him. I'll also see our patrol cars are given her a photograph. And if she's spotted, we'll ask her to get in touch with you. But I'm afraid after that it's her decision. You do understand that? Yes. But I've got this terrible feeling that she's dead. Now that's silly. Is it? I don't think so. Aren't you still looking for that man? Who? Oh, you know. That man, the murderer. Oh, you mean the one they call Slippery Sam? Yes. You can forget about him. Well, you never caught him. I know. But we have every reason to believe the man responsible has left the area. Well, how can you know? Because I'm part of the team still working on the case. And let me tell you that via reports, interviews, forensic information, I know as much about that bloke as it's possible to know without actually meeting him. Believe me, Mrs Marsden, he's gone. But he's already killed three women. The last one was five months ago. You have no need to worry about Slippery Sam. Well, why do you call him that? Well, that was the press. You know them, they like to put handle on everything. And much to our embarrassment, we nearly grabbed him a couple of times. But he was lucky. He managed to slip away. I see. I don't worry about it, Mrs Marsden. I'm sure Julia will turn up. All right? Thank you. I'll get a car to take you home. A policewoman can stay with you for a bit if you want. OK. Yes. Well, don't worry. We'll be in touch soon. How did it go? I can't stand women crying. Were you able to reassure her? Oh, I doubt it. I think she's convinced Slippery Sam's got hold of her. Hello? Carpool. This is Sergeant Burgess. Can you arrange for a vehicle to take a Mrs. Marsden home? Yeah. She's in interview room two. OK. Uh, try and be quick about it. She's in a bit of a state. Cheers. Is this the uh, daughter? Yeah. Not a bad looker. A sort of slippery salmon like. Don't you start. Sorry. Do you want any action taken on this girl? Why not? We haven't got much else to do. Right. I'll get the photograph distributed then. Yeah. Might as well have a word with the boyfriend too. Shall I come along? Well, if you fancy the exercise. Mm. Oh, hello, Mum. Yes, yes, I'm afraid we're still in bed. Mm. Pardon? Are you all right? Are you sure? Yes, yeah, what's the matter? Oh, come on, Mum, tell me. Please. All right, let me talk to Malcolm. I'll ring you back in a few minutes. Are you on your own? Why not ask Mrs. Fletcher to come in and keep you company? I'll call back in a little while. What was that about? Oh, I don't know. Well, what did she say? Nothing very much. She was crying. She's always bloody crying. Oh, don't start, Malcolm, please. It's true, though. All right, I know it's true, but this time she sounded really unhappy. She wants me to go up there. Oh, no. This happens nearly every bloody school holiday. You don't have to come. Well, I know, but it would be nice to spend the remainder of half term with you. I'm sorry. I suppose the reason for the tears was your bloody father again. Isn't it always? Why does he always have to go off on the razzle during school well, holidays? Why don't you ask him? Perhaps I might. Hmm. 
But she sounded... She really sounded unhappy. Yes. Oh, I suppose you'd better go. I think I should. I'll ring the station and see what time the trains are. Don't you want me to come with you? Of course I do. You know I don't cope very well with her on my own. But you don't have to come if you don't want to. Yeah, well, we'll take the car. I think it should be able to wheeze its way up there one more time. I never liked this new estate much. Why not? I don't know. It's sort of missing. Seems sort of bare. Not quite finished. How do you mean? I don't know. Perhaps it's because there aren't any trees. My wife spent nearly two years trying to persuade me to buy a house up here. I reckon you were wise not to. I sometimes wonder. She'd no sooner stop pestering me about the house than she up and left. Good morning, sir. Raymond Taylor? Yes. I'm Detective Sergeant Burgess. This is Detective Constable Bailey. We did phone, sir. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Come in. Sorry about the mess. Uh, if you throw that stuff on the floor, you can sit down there. Well, I don't know whether you've spoken to Mrs Marsden this morning, but I've already explained to her that there's very little we can do about her daughter's disappearance. Yes, she told me. The only reason I'm here now is to try and get a better picture of what might have happened. I gather you were planning to meet Julia yesterday afternoon. That's right. And what time was that? Well, it was supposed to be about half past three, but I had trouble with my car. I couldn't get it started. So what time did you turn up? Not until about ten past four. Where were you planning to meet? I was collecting her from the hospital. Were you surprised she hadn't waited? Well, very surprised. I mean, the car I've got is an old dagger. I'm always having trouble with it. <laughs> Nowadays, I'm more often late than early. Her mother said you were going shopping together. Yes, that's right. Well, there's no chance she might have gone off by herself. You know, frightened the shops might close or something. Oh, I doubt it. We're supposed to be going over to Birmingham. Well, perhaps she just got fed up waiting. She's not like that. She knows if I'm late, there's a good reason. We've been going out for two years now. She knows I never keep her hanging around on purpose. When you found she'd gone, did you go into the hospital and see if she left a message? Well, no. You see, I didn't actually go to the hospital itself. Sir? I haven't explained this very well. You know there's a new one-way system just been introduced around the hospital? Yes. Well, I've not really sorted it out yet. And if you miss the turn-off to Birmingham, you have to go all the way around before you can turn off again. So where did you arrange to meet her? On the corner of Fitzgerald Road. Which end? Um, at the junction with Chandos Road. That's a fair old walk, in it? Well, I suppose it is. Well, it's just that it's easier for me. What would Julia have been wearing? Sorry? What was she likely to be wearing yesterday afternoon? I mean, would she have changed or would she have met you in her uniform? Well, she usually changes if we're going out somewhere. So she would have taken clothes into work with her? I suppose so. Well, have you really thought about it? Hmm. Oh. I suppose you've no idea where she is. No. I'd tell her mother if I did. And you didn't have an argument with her yesterday afternoon? Well, of course I didn't. I didn't see her. Not even when you got to Birmingham? You didn't leave her there, did you? No. OK. Don't look so worried. You don't think I've done anything to her? I doubt it. How did she get on with her mother? Fine. Argue much? Well, Julia never mentioned it if she did. And she has not said anything to you in the recent past that might suggest she wanted to leave home? No. Even if it was only to go off for a few days by herself. She just isn't the sort of person who would do that. Not without saying something first. She's too considerate. And why should she want to leave home anyway? Well, ask her when we find her. Until then, thanks very much for your help. Well, what happens now? We'll keep an eye open for her. Don't worry. We'll let you know as soon as we learn something. Well, isn't there anything else you can do? I'm afraid not, sir. Do you want to stop for lunch? I don't think so. I'd rather keep going. You know, it amazes me how that marriage manages to stagger on. Well, this time I'm going to find out why it does. I mean, this must be the fourth time in a year this has happened. Mum can't go on like this. Neither can we. Mm. I wonder why he stays. What do you mean? Well, if he can still pull the birds with the easy seems to, why doesn't he shove off altogether? I don't know. I can't believe he even likes her very much now. He always comes back. Not only because she's stupid enough to forgive him. I don't know why she doesn't kick him out of it. She could hardly be worse off than she is now. Burgess. Oh, Mrs Marsden. Have you? 
Was there anything missing? I see. Hang on, I'll just make a note. Jeans, navy blue polo neck sweater, twin soles, and what? A black duffel coat. Nothing else. None of her personal effect. I see. What about her uniform? Yeah. Okay. Well, many thanks, Miss... Sure, don't worry. We'll be in touch as soon as we learn anything. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Marsden. Yeah. Goodbye. God, that woman does go on. Well, you can't blame her. That still doesn't make it any easier to put up with. Is, uh, this what you might be wearing? Yeah. Black duffel coat, navy blue pullover, jeans and plimsolls. That'll make her really conspicuous. Especially the jeans and plimsolls. No personal effects missing. No. So let's hope she hurries up back. Well, if this is accurate, I think it unlikely Sam's got hold of her. What is it? Sighting of the said villain. Where? Madrid. <laughs> Where did that come from? It's <laughs> with the Interpol stuffer coming this morning. He gets around, doesn't he? The last place was Geneva. Do you, uh, think the super will let us check it out? You must be joking. He wouldn't sanction a trip for you to put flowers on your mother's grave on your day off. Yeah, it could be right. Come on, let's go and have something to eat. I'll treat you to lunch down at the Swan. Oh, birthday lunch. Why not? We could try their real ale. It's supposed to be quite good. Oh, bugger it. If it's the D.I. complaining about you were spelling again, you'll be buying the lunch. Burgess. Yeah? Where? Walton Woods. Have you told the heavy brigade? What about Mr. Armstrong? Right. No, I'm going straight up there. Now what? Someone's found a body at Walton Woods. It's cold. Why do these sort of things always happen just when you're about to go to lunch? If this is Sam's handiwork, you'll be bloody glad you missed it. <sighs> Sutton? Yes, Kick? Is the dock here yet? Yeah, he's up at the site. What's he like? As usual. Well, that's something to look forward to. The control van's been quick in getting here. Then our Lord and Master is in residence. We need not fear anything, except his breath. I don't think I've ever got that close to Armstrong. You're very wise. His breath's so bad, you wish he had a simple case of halitosis. Why does Armstrong cause you so much needle? He just gets up my nose. Do you know, he once called me an incompetent snotbag. He calls everybody that. It's part of his childish charm. I know, but when he said it to me, he meant it. You're too sensitive. I'm not. It's not without reason he keeps blocking my promotion. He meant it all right. And it wasn't until he started doing that I realised how bloody ambitious I was. Uh, well, collar Sam, they'll probably make you chief superintendent. Collar him and I'll expect to be made bloody king. Hello, Doc. You don't look too cheerful. Neither will you be when you see the state the body's in. That bad, eh? That bad. Have you finished with it? Yes. Do you mind if we have a look? If you want. Oh. You were right. It is bad. Is it a sham killing? Without considerably more work, I can't tell you anything for certain. But I think so. Head bashed in, badly mutilated face and chest, plus strangulation. That's my boy. She been raped. Yes. How long she been dead? Difficult to tell at the moment. It's such a cold night, it's affected the decomposition. But I think between 24 and 36 hours. Any ID? Not yet. Could it be her? You saw the face. How can I possibly tell? Have a good look. If it is her, we can get things moving much faster. I realise that, but I can't help you. Who is she? Julia Marsden. She went missing yesterday. I can't say if it's the same person. OK, Doc. Thanks. Oh, one thing. Any of her clothing left? The remains of a pair of jeans, blue pullover, not much else. What about a black duffel coat? Not that I've seen. OK. Perhaps you'd care to tell Superintendent Armstrong that I finished. Sure. That the sooner he gets the body to the lab, the sooner he'll have my report. I'll do that. And thanks for your help, Doc. That's all right. She were in a mess, would not she? They all are. Is this the first of Sam's work you've seen? Yeah. Let's hope it's the last. Hello, Mum. Jenny. Oh, it's really nice to see you, love. I'm so glad you could come. 
Hello, Maureen. Hello, Malcolm. Oh, you don't know how pleased I am you could both come. Come in, come in. Come into the sitting room. Uh, would you like some tea? That would be nice. Shall I make it? No, you sit down. I'd rather make it. It gives me something to do. Well, all right, then. Do you know where everything is? I should do. I've been here often enough. Is he all right? Of course. Only he seemed a bit strange. <laughs> oh, Malcolm's fine. You know what he's like. Don't worry about him. He's just a bit tired after the drive. Anyway, we're not here to discuss him. I know. And I'm sorry the way I phoned up this morning. Oh, it's all right, Mum. Don't you worry about it. I felt so unhappy. What's happened? The usual. Dad? Yes. I haven't seen him since Thursday evening. Do you know where he is? I've no idea. That's what's so worrying. I usually know what he's up to. How do you mean? Well, you know what he's like when he meets someone he takes a fancy to. Starts taking extra trouble about the way he looks, always changing his underwear. Shaves twice a day, that sort of thing. That's usually followed by him staying out half the night, having to entertain clients, as he calls it. <sighs> then the inevitable trip that necessitates him having to go away for the weekend. <laughs> I mean, it's pathetic to see him at work. It sounds bloody insulting. You're probably right. But anyway, this time there hasn't been anything. No hints, nothing. I've not got the faintest idea where he is. Have you tried to phone him at work? Well, that's the first thing I did, but he isn't there. The person I spoke to said he was on leave. And they didn't know where he'd gone? No. Have you spoken to the police? <laughs> what could I say? My husband's gone on holiday and hasn't bothered to tell me where. <laughs> they just laughed. It's possible he's had an accident. The police could at least check the hospitals for you. Oh, don't say that, Jenny. I think you should consider it. Kettle's on. Thank you. Well, this time that bastard of a father of mine has gone off without saying anything. That's nothing new. But Mum's got absolutely no idea where he's gone. I think we should phone the police. Why? He might have had an accident. Forget about it. He'll turn up when he's good and ready. He always does. I don't think we should bother the police, Jenny. I'll phone the hospital in a little while. Anyway, from the amount of police activity we saw as we drove into town, I doubt whether they'd give much consideration to looking for some overgrown schoolboy on the razzle. Oh, shut up, Malcolm. What do you mean? It's nothing. It's just that we saw a lot of police cars in a field as we came off the motorway. What were they doing? Oh, I don't know. It was probably nothing important. Well, it's nice to get a bit of warm. Any tea going? You must be joking. This is Armstrong's control van. Vitriol's the only thing that's brewed here. Where have you two been? I told you. I beg your pardon, sir. We took your bloody time getting here. Oh, sorry. We were having a word with the doctor. Has he finished? Yes. He said you could move the body as soon as you like. I wish that quack would report directly to me. Oh, tell him for future references. Don't you bother. I'll tell him yourself. Anyway, what do you have to say? Nothing much. Although he did reluctantly say he thought Sam was responsible. Ah. So, he's back. And with a vengeance, it seems. Yeah, only this time we're going to collar him, and before he needs to kill again. It's possible we might have a slight edge on him this time. Yeah? How come? Well, this could be his victim. What makes you think that? Well, it's as much a feeling as anything. Well, this girl was reported missing this morning. She's a student nurse at the local hospital. So? Well, she doesn't fit in the usual pattern of girls that have scummed. She's got a fairly stable home, very much involved in her job, got a regular boyfriend, all that sort of thing. Yeah. In fact, on the surface of it, she's got no reason to leave home at all. Neither has she taken any personal possessions with her. You've checked this out? As far as I can. Uh, have you seen the body? Yeah, but the face is too bashed to bear to identify her. Yeah. All right. We'll mark her up as a possibility. Talk to the parents again. There's only a mother. Well, then talk to her. You, Bailey, find out who a doctor and dentist are and get on to the hospital where she worked. It's likely they'll at least know the colour of her blood, if nothing else. Right, sir. Burgess, go careful when you talk to the mother. We've had enough trouble with the bloody press without them accusing us of terrifying respectable old ladies into believing their daughters are dead. There's still every possibility she's alive and well and making her way straight towards Piccadilly Circus. Where is she? She'll be all right, although she's a bit exhausted. I don't think she slept at all last night. Do you want a hand? I've nearly finished. There's no need to dry up. Just let the stuff drain. I thought I might ring the doctor. At least he can give her something to help her sleep. Yeah. Oh, I hate that man. My bloody father. If only he knew the pain he caused. 
must admit I'm a bit surprised she still reacts like this. I mean, this must be the fourth time he's gone off for a dirty weekend in a year. I know. But it's a bit different this time. There was none of the usual build-up. He's just upped and gone. Do you think he's left her? Oh, I don't know. Mum's convinced herself he hasn't. It amazes me how I can still pull the birds at his age. He may be 52, but as you well know, he looks ten years younger. And he could charm the knickers off a nun if he wanted. I'm going to phone the doctor. All right, hey, and when he gets here, I suggest you ask him for something for yourself. Mm. Oh? Mm. oh, I'm tired. Mm. Yes? Mr. Armstrong gone? About an hour ago. I think he said he was going back to the Nick. Oh, I'm hungry. Right. Oh, I could do with something as well. I think yes. we're still wanted here. Well, I'm certainly not. Perhaps we could slip out for a bit. Pubs are open. That's not a bad idea. I'll have a word with the DI. I reckon he heard you. Vegas? Yes, yeah, it's cool. Just have Mr. Armstrong on the phone. He wants you back at the Nick at once. What's so? up? You've just identified the victim. Who is it? Seems you are right. It's Julia Marsden. So get your ass back there quick and take Bailey with you. You wanted to see me, sir? Yes, come in. I suppose you've heard. I have. Here's a pathologist's report. Makes much the same reading as the other Sam murders. Have you told the girl's mother yet? Not yet. I've sent a car to fetch her. When I spoke to Mrs. Marsden this morning, I asked her to check to see whether any of Julia's clothes were missing. And? Well, apart from jeans and a pullover, there was a black duffel coat. I wondered if it had been found. Hmm. Hang on. Hello. This is Armstrong. Did you find a black duffel coat this afternoon? Yeah. Can you check the list, then? I suppose it could be at the hospital. Well, it isn't. This is the contents of a locker. Uniform, shoes, towel, a couple of magazines. Yeah? Ah, are you sure? Tar. No duffel coat. Hardly something you miss. <laughs> you don't know the snot bags are up there this afternoon. Some of them wouldn't notice a steamroller parked in Westminster Abbey. Look, Burgess... I know we've not got on too well in the past, but I'm prepared to forget about that. You responded well when Julia Marsden was reported missing. He looks good in a report when it's seen we've taken action from the very beginning. Keeps the press happy. Helps remove some of the tarnish from our somewhat green image. Right? Yes, sir. I gather you've already had a word with a boyfriend. I don't think we've anything to worry about there. Good. Now, look. I want you to lead one of the teams on this case. Select your own men if you want. But I want results. If Sam's on our patch, this time I want him. I don't want the press rechristening him Slippery Slippery Sam. Understood? Yes. But don't you let me down, Burgess. I'm putting my faith in you. You screw up on me and there'll be trouble. You work well and I'll make sure the right people hear about it. Because if we grab Sam, there'll be a lot of promotion handed out. You may well see Detective Inspector yet. I'll look forward to it. Good. And one more thing, don't forget I'm in charge of this case. As if I would. You're only leading your team. You get your nose stuck into something, you let me know. You try and rush off on your own glory hunting, and I'll crush you. The glory's to be spread around on this case, not hogged. Understood? Of course. Good. Then we'll get on fine. Right, you let me know who you want in your team and I'll OK it. Right? Sure. There's a briefing tomorrow morning at nine. Should you have any bright thoughts during the night, let me hear them then. What are you looking at? There's a police car pulled up along the road. They're not coming here, are they? No. Oh, thank God for that. I don't think I could stand any more today. Where have they gone? Go over there. See where the whole light's just gone up. Oh. They have a lot of police activity for such a piddling little town. You're not worried about the car, are you? Well, as long as they don't look too close. And do you know who lives over there? I think it's Mrs. Marsden's house. Well, you seem pleased with yourself. I am. I've just been having words with Armstrong. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He wants me to lead one of the teams on this Sam killing. You're joking. I'm not. Suddenly, he loves me. But why the change of heart on his part? This morning you were saying he hated your guts. He still does. But he liked the way I followed things up on Julia Marsden. I mean, I could have just shoved the report into a drawer. Everybody else would have. Hey, but you only went to see the boyfriend to get out of the office. He doesn't know that, does he? You jammy beggar. Yeah, well... 
All right, it was a bit of luck, but that's how most things happen, isn't it? And it's certainly a bit of luck I intend to take advantage of, especially as Armstrong reckons there could be a lot of promotion handed out to the team of breaks this case. I must admit it would be very nice to be a D.I. But, uh, I thought you were going into the, uh, Bogart business. I'm serious. This could be our big chance. Yeah, it could be. Aren't you getting a bit carried away? Why? Well, we'd just be one team among many. What if Armstrong gives us the bum end of the case? There's not much chance for us if we spend all our time sweeping up after everyone else. Armstrong's desperate to break this case. It's been hanging over him for a year. So? So we'll be open to all suggestions. So what are you planning to wow him with? Remember the interview with the boyfriend? Yeah. Do you remember he was supposed to be meeting her on the corner of Fitzgerald and Chandler's Road, and that he was late? So? Well, he gave the impression that Julia was the sort of woman who would have waited patiently for him. But she didn't. She went off. Yes, but after waiting how long? He was 40 minutes late. She could have waited anything up to a couple of minutes before he arrived. And you're hoping someone might have seen her? That's it. But more important, that someone might have seen Sam pick her up on that corner. After all, she got into the car somewhere. Yeah, that's true. So what I'm going to suggest to Armstrong in the morning is that my team knocks on the door of every house in the Fitzgerald Chandler's Road area. Some nosy Parker might have seen what went on. You reckon Armstrong will let you handle it? Why not? Someone will have to. Why not the bloke who suggested it? Uh, what time's the briefing tomorrow? Nine o'clock. God, it's been a long day. Mm. How long do you think we'll have to stay? I don't know. I suppose we can't stay longer than Sunday. Hmm. Depends what happens. Hey, just think. At this very moment, your dad is probably shacked up in some hotel, humping his current bird without a care in the world. Mm. Well, let's hope he stays with her this time. Do you think your mum will take him back? I don't know. She's pretty hurt. I think she realises things can't go on like this. Mm. Let's just hope he writes soon so we can all get on with our lives again. Mm. I'm going to sleep. You feel all right? Mm. Gin and Valium are certainly a very good mix. Good night. Bridget? Sir? How many men will you need for this house-to-house -house thing of yours? As many men as you can spare. Ah, uh, the way things are going, you might be working alone. I need every man I can get hold of to search those woods again. The duffel coat's definitely missing. Mrs. Marsden's convinced it is, so I suppose we've got to do something about it. <laughs> Did I have a session with her? It's all about crying. She went on and on. I had to get a bloody doctor to her in the end. Where is she now? They've taken her into hospital, women's medical. <laughs> There's a bloody irony. Mm. It's the ward her daughter was working on. I hope to God nobody tells her. The coat into the hospital, is it? No. I had a team in there this morning taking the locker room to pieces and another lot interviewing this stuff. Are you going to get any outside helping? You must be joking. This is a local affair. I want it kept that way. So every man's going to have to work twice as hard as usual. Oh, that's something to look forward to. Should you work three times as hard as usual, Bailey, you should just about turn in a reasonable day's work. All right? Give me five minutes, Burgess. I'll come back to you on how many men you can have. Right, sir. What did I say? Too much. Armstrong doesn't like silly remarks. I should have thought you'd learn that by now. Obviously not. Well, there's one thing I have. What? You were right about his breath. Oh, shut up. Find me a road map. I want to work out how we're going to approach this house to house thing. What's the matter? I feel rather strange. How do you mean? Sort of light-headed. Oh, that's probably the side effects of the drugs you took. Oh. Would you like some more tea? Uh, no, I don't think so. Has the postman been? Um, I don't know. Yeah, he passed a few minutes ago. Oh, perhaps there'll be something in the second post. Yes. Actually... I think I'll go and lie down. Can you manage? Of course I can. I'm not an invalid. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, if she's going to behave like that, I hope we hear something soon. So do I. I assume we're not going back tonight. I certainly can't. Well, I'm not leaving you here alone. I'll give Charlie a ring, say we can't make it. I'm sorry. Oh, it doesn't matter. Here, see what's on at the local flea pit. 
Perhaps you can persuade your mother to go out for the evening. I doubt it. Oh, no. What's the matter? Have you seen the headlines? No. There's been a murder. Come on, love. What? Why are you... It's Julia. She's been murdered. Who's she? Mrs Marsden's daughter. Across the road? Yes. Julia's dead and I knew her. I knew her. Oh. <sighs> what a tone. Bloody hell. It's brass monkey weather out there. How's it going? We're on both sides of Chandis Road. Move the lads into Merritt Street. Good. Any houses you didn't get an answer from? No, there was someone in all of them. The other good thing about that road is that the houses are all owner-occupied. So the people who aren't at home will get to hear about what we're after. Might get a call later on. Let's hope so. How's it going along here? Not so good. Sixteen houses with no one at home, which include the two on the corner. If anyone saw Julia hanging about, it would be someone in either of those houses. Well, let's hope the occupiers haven't gone away. I don't think so. There's milk on both doorsteps. What sort of reaction are you getting? Quite strong. A lot of people are very angry. I suppose it's not surprising. It is Sam's fault. And they're bloody scared. I've actually had three women open the doors on the chain. <laughs> New York-style living comes to this great little town of Wallingbridge. Who knows? They'll be issuing us with guns next. Who would give a burke like you a gun? Why not? I've been on the gun course. I've got a distinction, as a matter of fact. You've done the gun course? Yeah, about 18 months ago. I haven't. There you are, then. There you are what? They realise my potential. Potential what? I reckon they want to get rid of you. How come? The only time you'll get a gun is when they send you up against a raving psycho, and he'll probably blow your bloody head off before you can get it out of your pocket. Now, that's not a very nice thing to say. Well, what do you expect? I'm jealous. I want to know why I haven't been on a gun course. Perhaps because you didn't apply. You could be right. <laughs> now, but seriously, do you think they'll issue guns? What, for Sam? No, he only strangles women. They'll get Armstrong to breathe on him if it comes to the showdown. <laughs> hey, up. What? Woman, just got into number three. Come on. Yes? Good morning, madam. I'm Detective Sergeant Burgess. This is Detective Constable Bailey. <clears throat> We're making inquiries concerning the death of Julia Marsden. Julia Marsden? Do I know her? That's what we're hoping to find out. Oh, you'd better come in. Thank you. Oh, would you mind wiping your feet thoroughly? I've just had the whole carpet shampooed. Oh. Thank you. If you'd like to come this way. Now, Julia Marsden. Uh, this is a photograph of her. No, I don't know her. Now think carefully. You didn't by any chance see this person standing on the corner of Fitzgerald Road on Wednesday afternoon? No. You're quite sure? Positive. Although, now you come to mention it, I do recall a young woman. But it wasn't the girl in the photograph. What time was that? Oh, about a quarter to four. In fact, I remember her quite distinctly. And why is that? Oh, she looked so cold, as though she'd been waiting some time. I felt quite sorry for her. In fact, I must have stared because she noticed me looking and smiled. It was quite a charming smile. But you don't recognise the photograph as being the same girl you saw waiting? Oh, no. The girl in the photograph is far less attractive. Do you remember what she was wearing? No. Oh, yes. I recall she was wearing plimsolls. I remember that quite distinctly as I consider them totally unsuitable footwear for such a cold day. That's all? You can't remember anything else she was wearing? Yes, I can. A duffel coat. I recall a duffel coat. I remember that because I thought the duffel coat so sensible and the plimsoll so foolish. Can you remember the colour? No. I, I think it was dark. Possibly dark blue or black. I can't remember for certain. But you're sure about the time you saw her? Oh, yes. Uh, how can you be so certain? Well, when I got in, I unpacked my shopping and made myself a cup of tea. I then took the tea upstairs to my bedroom and switched my radio on. And? 
Listen to the four o'clock news. Did you see the girl again? As a matter of fact, I did. When I was closing my curtains. When was that? It was after the news. Why is the time so important? The young lady in the photograph and the girl you saw waiting outside could well be the same person. Oh, I don't think so. The photographs can be deceptive. Why are you so interested in this person? Because she's been murdered. Good heavens. That's absolutely dreadful. When you saw her from the bedroom window, was she still alone? Yes. No, as a matter of fact, a car pulled up. I remember now. She walked over to the car, smiling. It was the same smile she'd given me. Such a pretty smile. But then she looked surprised and uh, spoke for a minute or two to the driver. Did she get into the car? Yes, she did. And can you remember anything about the car? Oh, yes. It was a dark blue Cortina estate. You're that sure? Without a doubt. How come? My son-in-law has exactly the same make of car. I see. Look, uh, Mrs... Uh, Meadows. Yeah, Mrs Meadows. I think we should start getting some of this down on paper. Would you have any objection to coming down to the station to make a statement? Well, um, I don't think so. Mrs Meadows, I'm Superintendent Armstrong. How do you do? Sorry I've kept you waiting so long, but I've been studying your statement. It's a very interesting document. You're a very observant woman. Thank you. Uh, there are just one or two things I'd like to go over with you again. Now, you still maintain that the girl you saw getting into the car and the young lady in the photograph are not the same person? Without a doubt. Then perhaps you'd like to look at these. Story them carefully. Now, do any of these photographs look like the girl you saw? Um, yes, that one. Hmm. Any of the others? Um, uh, that one too. Thank you. And what about these other photographs? They're not of the same person, are they? No. Fortunately for us, you've recognised the two photographs we wanted you to. They're Julia Marsden. The others are just there to confuse. But the two I've chosen are nothing like the first photograph that was shown to me. Ah, that was a studio portrait. They tend to flatter. But uh, there's no doubt in your mind that these two photographs are of the person you saw getting into the car. None. Good. Now, there's your identification of the car. You were so sure it was a blue Cortina estate. There's no doubt in my mind at all. Do you know much about cars? Absolutely nothing. If I were to show you some photographs of current popular cars, would you be able to name them? I very much doubt it. <laughs> then why are you so sure it was a blue Cortina estate? As I explained to your sergeant, my son-in-law drives one. Perhaps you'd like to have a look at these. Is there a Cortina estate amongst those photographs? Oh dear. That one and that one. Thank you. It's a great pity you seem to doubt my word. <laughs> Not at all. It's just that we must confirm that you're not mistaken. I really am mistaken. I'm beginning to believe it, Mrs. Matters. Would you like to test my ability as to whether I can recognise the colour blue? I don't think so. Now, you say in your statement that you noticed a sticker in the back window of the car. That is correct. What did the sticker say? Oh, really, this is becoming ridiculous, Superintendent. I've already told the sergeant all this. I realise that, and I, I must ask you to bear with me for just a little longer. <laughs> You're a very important witness. Uh, but before we can act on your information, we must make doubly sure we have everything crystal clear. Hmm? Now, what did the sticker say? Well, I don't actually remember it verbatim, but the gist of it was that the owner of the car thought that the local grammar school should not go comprehensive. Are you sure about that? I certainly am, as it's a statement I'm in total agreement with. I see. Only a fool would want such a fine school to go comprehensive. Did you notice anything else about the car? Were there any dents or scratches? No. Mm, and you didn't notice any part of the registration number? No. Not even the year letter? I would have told you if I had. Right. One last question, Mrs Meadows. The driver of the car, did you see him? Not really. I caught a glimpse of his profile. Do you think you'd recognise him again? I can't really say. It was just a glimpse. Well, it's possible if I were to see him in similar circumstances, I might just recognise him. But I'm not certain. OK, Mrs Meadows, thank you very much. There's just one more thing I'd like you to do before we take you home. 
In the next room, we have some photographs that I'd like you to look at. It's just possible you might recognise one of them as the driver, if you wouldn't mind. Of course not. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you think I could telephone my husband? Uh, of course. There's a phone next door. Oh, I've met some self-opinionated old bitches in my time, but she takes bloody first prize. What is she right? Mm, I think so. But at least I'm confident enough to act on it. You've done well, Burgess. Bloody well. Thank you, sir. Now, I want one of you to get on to DVLC at Swansea and get them to provide me with a list of all blue Ford Cortinas registered in this area. How uh, can you be certain it's a local car, sir? The sticker. The grammar school issue is totally a local matter. The chances of an out-of-town car carrying such a thing are almost nil. It also seems from the way Julia reacted to the car, she must have known the driver. Mm. Anyway, get onto that list immediately. I want it today, if possible. Right, sir. Uh, what about the team searching for the duffel coat? Have they found anything yet? No. And I'm almost hoping they don't now, because if it's not in the wood, there's a good chance it'll be in the murderer's car. Are you awake, Mum? Yes. I've made some tea. Oh, that's nice. How do you feel now? Much better. Good. Did I hear you crying? That was this morning. You've been asleep all day. Have I? Oh, dear. And there's nothing to worry about. That was me just being silly. What was the matter? It was just something I read in the paper. You and Malcolm are all right, aren't you? Of course. There's nothing to worry about, nothing at all. Oh, it's just that I find Malcolm a bit difficult to understand. He's a bit brusque at times, but he's very caring in his own way. Does he love you? I think so. But you don't want to worry about us. Oh, you know me, I always worry too much. What does Malcolm think about your dad? Well... He's not very pleased about the way he behaves. But that's only because it upsets me so much. And he certainly doesn't understand why you put up with it. Come to that, neither do I. Your dad's a strange man. He's like a little boy in many ways. How long has he been carrying on like this? Oh, I suppose for about five years. As long as that? It is a long time, isn't it? Although he wasn't as bad as this to begin with. Why do you think he started? Lots of reasons, I suppose. I think he realised he was beginning to get old. He wanted some sort of fling before he was past it. I didn't blame him. I often felt like that myself. Did you do anything about it? Well, once. I'm pleased to hear it. The thing is that when your dad started, he found there were far more women available than he'd ever dreamed possible. I think it must have gone to his head. Did you consider leaving him? Not then. Because in the early days, he was discreet. Oddly enough, I wasn't even jealous. I didn't feel threatened because he was having a little bit on the side. Then about 18 months ago, he took up steady with someone. We even talked about a divorce. And then she chucked him over. I think it upset him a good deal. Because that's when he started behaving really badly. Oh, I suppose I should have told him to go. Why didn't you? I don't know. I think I was scared of being alone. Do you still love him? Not really. But we've been married for nearly 30 years. It's a long time. A lot of habit to throw away. But surely you realise it's getting out of hand now. I know. This is the fourth time in 12 months he's gone off like this. I realise that. But this is the first time he's actually gone without letting me know what was happening. And I'm worried about him. Do you think he's left you? I'm sure he would have said. 
I can't believe he'd go off without a word. If he comes back, are you going to let him stay? Yes. Why? Because he can't go on like this for much longer. The years are beginning to catch up with him. He'll have to stop soon. And then we'll be back together. I'd much rather enter old age with him than by myself. I'm so scared of being alone, Jenny. But that's pathetic, Mum. Don't you think I realise that? How do you spell necessity? You must ask me that twice a week. I keep forgetting, you know I've got no head for words. Just write need instead. I can't put that. My bloody reports are short enough as it is. I mean, necessity has a certain ring about it. Needs a nothing word. I thought you said you had O-level English. I didn't say that. Then what have you got? Well, sort of doubtful CSE. Here you are. Necessity. Don't lose it. Any sign of that list from Swansea? No, sir. I doubt if it'll come tonight. Lazy bastards probably knock off at five. You might as well push off home as well. Right. Do they find the duffel coat, sir? No. It'll be a new development if Sam started nicking things from his victims. Hmm. I see. I'm off, then. Good night. Good night, sir. Cheerless bastard. For God's sake, Malcolm, stop staring out of the window. People are still leaving floral tributes at Mrs Marsden's place. So what? It's the only way they've got of showing they care. They should save on the weeds and just leave them money. When Mrs. Marsden comes home from hospital and sees her front garden full of flowers, it will say considerably more than a pile of little envelopes containing money. Hmm? Oh, you're so cynical at times. The woman has just had her only daughter murdered. If you can only make snide remarks about it, I suggest you shut up. I'm sorry. Oh, so am I. It's not only Mum being so unhappy that's depressing me. It's the whole atmosphere of this town. Yeah, having a murderer on the loose doesn't help much. It's not even that. I never liked the place, not even when I was a child. I think we should get Mum away from here for a while. Hmm? If I can persuade her, how would you feel about letting her come to stay with us? Ah. Well, I wouldn't mind. Well... As long as she's prepared to share the spare bedroom with the junk. I don't think that'll bother her. But more important, are you up to coping with her? I'll certainly be able to cope with her much better at home. Right. Invite her. Ask her tomorrow and see what she says. All right. Sorry I'm late. I overslept. Yeah, well, you weren't the only one. Oh, well, this is just the right. Oh, good. Let's hope it contains what we want. Have you seen Mr Armstrong this morning? Uh, he passed by muttering something about a press conference. Oh, that'll set him up nicely for the day. Why does he hate the press so much? Because he's a good, honest, no-nonsense fascist. He thinks there's only one way to run the world, his way, with no questions asked. Journalists sometimes spoil that illusion. Ah. Oh, on computer, readouts, neat. Well, I'm more concerned about the work that thing means. How many Cortina estates are there in this area? I don't know. Though it doesn't seem to be as many as I thought to be. Is there a briefing this morning? Yeah, the DI's taken it. Well, I think we can give that a miss. We've got enough to do sorting this thing out. How are you going to divide it up? By area is the most obvious way. Get a couple of the... Hang on. What's up? What's Mrs Marsden's address? Um, 29 Bridge Road. Well, well, well. There's a bit of luck. What? One of the characters listed here lives in Bridge Road. And what was it Mrs Meadows said? Julia approached the car as though she knew the driver. Dear. Ah, oh, it's not going to be that easy, is it? It could be. It just could be. Oh, I know there was a reason why I woke up smiling this morning. I think that is definitely an address we'll check out ourselves. Right. Let's get the rest of this list divided up, collect ourselves a couple of uniform lads, and we'll be off. This is it. Bridge Road. Drive past the house. I want to have a look first. Right. 
You two in the back, take your helmets off. I don't want to advertise the fact with you. Well, there's the car. The house looks quiet. Well, we'll be expecting a mad axeman dancing naked on the lawn. Pull over. Right. We have a neat little semi-detached house. While the detective constable and myself are knocking on the front door, I want you two to slip quietly around the back, just in case this is Sam's address and he tries to make a bolt for it. OK? Well, the stick is where it's supposed to be. Mm. That's a good beginning. Yes? Is John Arnold Maitland in the house? No. Are you sure? Of course I am. He's my husband. May we come in? Who are you? Police. This is Detective Constable Bailey. Do you mind if he has a look upstairs? What for? Don't worry, he isn't going to steal anything. Go careful. Right. What is it you want? Just a word with your husband. I've told you, he isn't at home. What's in here? But it's the sitting room, but... Have a look. If you must. And that uh, room? The kitchen. Do you mind if I let a couple of my friends in? Tell me what it is you want, please. Did you check the shed? Yes, sir. Good. You wait here. But you have the right to charge into my house like this. I was under the impression you invited him. Not to rampage around it. Don't worry, we won't do any damage. Perhaps we could go into the sitting room. <laughs> I shall see that your superior hears about this. What's your name? Burgess. Can you prove that? Certainly. What is it you want? Where's your husband, Mrs. Maitland? He isn't here. I know that, so where is he? Away. Where? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not sure. He, he travels around so much. Is he usually away over weekends? Oh, sometimes. He's a very busy man. And you don't know where he's gone? Not for certain. Well, he, he usually rings me to say where he's staying. But he hasn't let you know this time. Not yet. Well, it's already Sunday. He can't think much of That's you. That's none of your business. Possibly not. How long's he been away? He, he went up on Thursday. Do you know when he's coming back? I'm not sure. Next week sometime. There's no one upstairs, Skip. OK. What's all this about? I'm sure you're not allowed to come into people's homes and behave the way you have. You invited but us. why do you want to see my husband? Has he done something wrong? We're not sure. We're conducting certain inquiries, and we would just like to talk to him. Why won't you tell me what it's about? Because we feel we should discuss the matter with him first. <sighs> then I've nothing more to say to you. Is the blue court in an estate parked outside your husband's? What of it? Does he own the car, or is it his firm's? I'm not saying anything else to you unless you prove you have the right to behave in the way you have. All right, I'll get a warrant. So please leave now. As you wish. And I tell you here and now, Detective Sergeant Burgess, I have every intention of reporting your behaviour. You have that right, madam. Go on, Bailey. Well, I screwed that up, didn't I? Armstrong will have my guts when he hears about this. Well, I suppose it was a bit rash charging in like that. I was so sure Sam would be there, you know what I mean? Had this very strong feeling. Well, you were wrong. That still remains to be seen. Did you look around when you were upstairs? Yeah. No duffel coat? Uh, I didn't see one. Well, there's got to be something I can give to Armstrong before that woman puts her foot in it. Well, what about the car? Perhaps there's someone there. How do you suggest we get inside it? Or well, we could take it down the car pound. What is it? Four years old. There's bound to be something wrong with it. Oh, it's parked round the wrong way for a start. Oh, I bet they really missed you when you left traffic division. Come on, let's get back to the nick and see what the others have come up with. Mum, we're home. Oh, thank God for that. What's the matter? I'm so glad you're back. What's happened? The police have been here. What did they want? To John. It was awful. They stormed in here like a gang of hooligans. Did they say why they wanted to talk to Dad? Well, they wouldn't tell me anything. They just wanted to know where he was and when he'd be back. What did you tell them? They said he was away on business. <sighs> that wasn't very sensible. Well, what else could I tell them? I don't know where he is. Should have told them the truth. They weren't here. The sergeant in charge was like a stormtrooper. He didn't give me a chance to think. Well, you shouldn't have lied to him, though. I don't care. I'm going to report that man. He had no right to behave the way he did. It was awful. Oh, oh, try and, try and oh, calm why down, did please, you have to go Mom. Out this morning? I'm sorry. We didn't know this would happen. L look, uh, how long ago were the police here? Oh, I don't know. An hour, perhaps two. Did they say they were coming back? They didn't say anything. What shall we do? Don't know. I suppose the best thing to do is just sit tight, oh. see if they come back again. Oh, well, that's very useful. What else can we do? I, I don't see any point in ringing them. If they wouldn't tell Mum what this is about, they're hardly going to tell me. I want to report that, Sergeant Burgess. Oh, I think we should wait. It's pointless aggravating them till we know what it's about. I shall remember this the next time you lecture me on personal freedom and civil oh, liberties. Can't you see the effect this has had on them? I know, but I still think we should wait.
Кто здесь? Где? Ты еще? Окей, cheers. Records have got nothing on Maitland. What were you hoping for? Anything to justify what I did this morning. Mind you, the way the reports are going on these other cars, you may not need to. That's what I'm hoping for. We've been bloody lucky, you know. How many cars have they found with stickers? Just two. Well, that doesn't matter anymore. All the drivers interviewed so far have good, checkable alibis, and that's how I like it. Maitland is still suspect number one. Mm. With only one more car to clear, I'm hoping it'll remain that way. Burgess. Yeah? You're absolutely sure? Great stuff. Let me have your report as soon as possible. That's it. Our man. This is Burgess, sir. Do you think I could have a word with you? Yes, very important. Thank you, sir. So you reckon this bloke is Sam? I think there's a good chance he is. And you think his wife doesn't know where he is? She says he's away on business, but I think it's just bluff. Mm-hmm. So what do you want to do? Well, I think we should find out what his car can tell us. Right. We'll also need a warrant. She wasn't any too cooperative when I saw her this morning. Well, I'll arrange that. I think I'd also like to have a word with him myself. A bit of rank might add some weight to the occasion. It might also soften her up a bit. Oh, dear. Come on, Mum. It could be anybody. You can't live in fear of the doorbell for the rest of your life. It is the police. <laughs> Seem to have come in force this time. Three cars out there. Just stay where you are. I'll let them in. Try not to get too upset, Mum. It might not be anything. I can't believe he's done anything wrong. Certainly nothing that would justify all this. Let's hope it's all a mistake. This <laughs> way. It's Detective Superintendent Armstrong and uh, Sergeant Burgess. Good afternoon, madam. You are Mrs. Maitland? Yes. I'm the officer in charge of the investigation into the death of Julia Marsden. Oh, no. And I have reason to believe your husband, John Arnold Maitland, is involved. Right. Well, that's it for the moment. I told you I didn't know anything. But now we've got that fact on paper. Are you the sergeant who came this morning? Yes. I hope you realise you terrified my mother half to death. I'm sorry about that, but it was necessary that I gain quick access to the house. However much you may dislike the idea, your father is the main suspect in a murder inquiry. I can't believe it. Until we find evidence to the contrary, I'm afraid it's true. Do you realise Mum has no idea where Dad is? So I gather. And did you also hear he's probably gone off for a dirty weekend? For the umpteenth time this I year? I believe it's the fourth time in twelve months. Dad doesn't have time to be slippery, Sam. Not with the sort of life he leads. He may well combine business with pleasure. Sam has killed four times in the last twelve months. I hope for your sake that the dates of his absences don't match the dates of the murders. Can I have a word, Skip? Excuse me. Well, fingerprint boys think they've got a match. Julia Marsden? Yes. They're positive? Oh, yes. Their smugness confirms it. Careful with that car! Forensic have still got to examine it. Burgess. See? I've got one more job for you here. Now what? The state Mrs. Maitland's and I didn't get much sense out of her, which means you two are going to have to go through Maitland's things. Diaries, papers, anything that might establish where he was at the time of the other Sam killings. Right. Anything that looks at all interesting, bring it down to the nick. We'll sort it out there. <laughs> Look at the street. Neighbours hanging out of the windows. Right mess they made of getting Dad's car onto the transporter. Ridiculous. I wish I could smile. Are those two policemen still in Mum's room? Yes. They said they'd be there for a while. Where's she gone? She's lying down in our room. I don't think she'll ever recover from this. Well, we'll take her home with us as soon as possible. Get her away from this house. Oh, Malcolm. You don't think Dad's a murderer? I find it difficult to believe. Surely, when you're as disturbed as the murderer must be, you... You can't just hide it like that. Oh, God, I'm so unhappy. Well, let's hope they find him soon. Get things sorted out.
It's amazing how much junk you can pile into one of these little writing desks. Yeah, well, at least he's neat. Let's hope he's methodical as well. Are you listing the stuff you're dumping in that sack? Of course I am. What's that supposed to be? One diary. Then why have you written one dairy? Can't you spell at all? Oh, don't start. I'm tired. It's been a bloody long day. For all of us, mate. Yeah, but you enjoy this sort of thing. I mean, going through a bloke's personal papers is hardly a bundle of laughs, is it? It's part of the job. But it's a part of the job I don't like. Just as I don't like looking at the bashed-in face of the young women. You'll get used to it. But I don't want to. Come in. I can't sleep. Come in, Mum. We can't either. Keep wondering where he might be. Trying to remember whether he mentioned anywhere before he went off. When did you last see him? Thursday evening. He popped in for a little while, fiddled about in the bedroom, then went out again. And didn't come back? No. Didn't you say he started his leave Wednesday evening? Yes. And he was out all day Thursday? That's right. You've no idea where? I thought he'd gone to work. He left at his usual time. Did he take the car on Thursday? Yes. Uh, and when he was here, did he seem himself? Well, what do you mean? Well, did he seem excited or agitated? I don't know. I, I didn't say much to him. What are you getting at? Well, nothing, really. I was just wondering where he was on Thursday, that's all. You don't think he killed that girl? Of course I don't. Then why are you asking me all these questions? I've had questions all afternoon from the police. I'm sick to death of being interrogated. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it to sound like that. John hasn't done anything wrong. He's just gone away for a little while. Of course he has, Mum. And why have you started calling me Mum? You've always called me Maureen before. It just came up. I suppose it's just a feeling of solidarity. Well, stop it. I don't want your support if you think my husband's a murderer. I don't think that. Come on, Mum. We're on your side. You don't need to fight us. How do I know? How can I tell what you're really thinking? Look... I think you should get away from this house. I'll phone the police tomorrow morning and see if you can come home with us. Mm. I don't want it to. It would be better for you. It would get you right away from everything, give you a chance to rest. I'm staying here. This is my home. And I'm not running away from it. No one's asking you to run away. Just come home with us for a few days' rest. I don't want to. And if you think my husband's a murderer, I don't want you here either. Yeah, yeah, sure, I understand, Mr. Freeman. Sure. Well, there's no doubt. Okay. Many thanks for your help. Goodbye. Bloody hell. Now yeah, what? That was Maitland's employer. He confirms the diary entries is correct. The week of the first killing, Maitland was in Edinburgh on some course. The week of the third killing, he was in Spain on holiday with his wife. Oh. And to cap it all, Maitland hasn't run off. He's only on bloody leave. Due back a week today. Seems we've boobed again. <laughs> we've boobed? What was Armstrong doing, Mrs. Maitland, for two hours? These are the sort of questions he should have been asking her. Well, he said she couldn't remember anything. God, am I fed up with this. Bloody fed up. So we can't nail him for the other murders, so what? He murdered Julia Marsden. We found her fingerprints in his car, and we have an independent witness to say she saw Julia getting into the car half an hour before she was murdered. What more do we want? Continuity, mate. The one consistent factor that's come out of this case, as the pathologist will remind you, is that all four women have been murdered by the same hand. If Maitland didn't kill the first one, he didn't kill any of them. He couldn't have. Then how did her fingerprints get into his car? I don't know. Anyway, let's continue sorting through this lot. We might discover some delightful morsel of information. Mother. Look at our car. What's the matter with it? It doesn't look right, does it? It certainly doesn't. Oh, no. Who the... Who the who could have done that? It's not bloody fair. They were four new tyres. Hardly. Well, they certainly had a fair bit of wear left in them. Oh, do you know how much they're going to cost to replace? I know. More than we can afford. Exactly. Well, to be honest, Malcolm, I half expected it. But why our car? Oh, don't be so naive. The relations of men who are suspected of strangling women are as unpopular as the men themselves. 
I hope you're as philosophical when the bank manager asks us why we're overdrawn at the end of the month. We'll see. I hope so. But there's one thing I do know. What's that? Don't replace those tyres until we're ready to leave. Yeah, what do you make of this? What? Look at the last four check stubs. Passport, Swan and Edgar, foils, Selfridges. Look at the date. Last Thursday. Maitland must have been in London on Thursday. And if he was in London, he couldn't have been here murdering Julia Marsden, could he? Well, yeah, would be rather difficult. That's it, then. Conclusive proof. Oh, I suppose I'd better go and see Armstrong. Tell him the good news. I knew my becoming a D.I. was only a bloody dream. But uh, while I'm in with him, you better get on to the passport office. Make sure Maitland renewed his passport personally, not be post. Right. Well, Burgess... Seems you've got yourself a bum suspect. What are you going to do about it? There are still the fingerprints in the car. You've got to find out how they got there. I don't think you're going to do that until you find Maitland, old son. There's no news of him. Not a whisper. God. Now you've landed me with the unpleasant task of telling the Chief Constable that Maitland's in the clear. Can't you wait? What for? You seem to have conclusive proof Maitland couldn't possibly have committed any of the murders. No point in sticking my neck out by delaying things, is there? After all, nationwide murder hunt, very expensive. I see no point in continuing to waste the taxpayers' money and looking for an innocent man. Look, I want to have another word with Mrs Maitland. I'm sure there's something she hasn't I'm told sure us. I'm sure many things she hasn't told us. But it doesn't seem to matter now, does it? Well, there are still the fingerprints, plus the fact that someone had tried to wipe the passenger side of Maitland's car clean. There must have been a reason for that. You're a desperate man, Burgess. Well, what do you want? Well, can't she give me a couple of hours? Just let me talk to his wife again. I don't know. Your early promise is somewhat withered. Two hours. That's all I'm asking for. All right, then, two hours. Not a second more. And you let me know of any developments. Any little thing at all. I promise. Hi, oh, it's you again. Good morning, sir. Is Mrs. Maitland in? Yes. Have you seen what some job's done to my car? I did notice. I suppose you're going to say there's nothing you can do about it? Oh, there's a great deal I can do about it. But I'll just give you a friendly warning and tell you to put your car in order as soon as possible. I'm sure you realise four defective tyres means four separate endorsements. Thanks a lot. I'll mention it, sir. Now, if I might come in and speak to your mother-in-law. Good morning, Mrs Maitland. I'm happy to say I've uh, got some good news. You found John? Not yet. But you'll be pleased to hear we've established that he couldn't have killed Julia Marsden or any of the other women. Oh, thank you. God for that. We've discovered he was in London on Thursday. There's no way he could have got back here in time. You don't know how relieved I am. But we still have one problem. Oh? Julia Marsden's fingerprints were found in your husband's car. Well, that's not surprising. He knew her. He could have given her a lift any time. We know she travelled in the car the day she died. How can you possibly know that? Because our forensic department says so, and they're not often wrong. They also say there's no doubt your husband's car was used by the murderer. The thing we now have to establish is, who was the driver? But how would they have got hold of the car? Well, it's possible Mr Maitland might have lent his car to a friend on Thursday. Well, I don't know, he could have. Hang on, though. If he did that, how would he have got to London? John wouldn't have taken the car to London. How do you know? He hated driving, and he certainly wouldn't use the car if there was a good train service. So where was the car on Thursday? No, I suppose he took it to the station and left it there. Oh, I wish you told me this at our first meeting. I didn't know where he was on Thursday. Did he have anywhere specially parked his car? How do you mean? Well, it's all double yellow lines round there. He couldn't just park it outside the station. It would have got towed away. Well, well he probably put it in the car park. That waste piece of ground near the station? Mm, I suppose so. He's certainly parked it there before. You sure? Of course I am. Thank you. Shouldn't you tell Armstrong what we're up to? He can get stuffed. I want to see what we turn up at the car park before I say anything to him. He won't like it. Then he'll have to lump it. When I told him the Maitland thing had collapsed, his whole manner changed. The bastard's only had for himself. He's not interested in supporting his officers. He only wants the glory they earn for him. He's still the super. So what? I'm only a fragile detective constable. Then you've got nothing to lose. But I can still be crushed from a great height. Certainly stacked the cars in this place. Do you notice they've all got their ignition keys in? I did. What do you two want? Police. Oh, yeah. You find any nicked cars here that got nothing to do with me? 
We only park them. Who are you? The manager. What's your name? Lynn Woods. Are you here all the time? Usually. Were you here last Thursday? I should think so. You better know so, mate. Yeah, I was here. So what? I'm interested in a blue Cortina estate that was parked here all day Thursday. <laughs> How am I supposed to remember a car as common as that? This one was special. It got borrowed during the day. Oh, not from my side. This one did. And the bloke that borrowed it took a girl for a ride. So? And then he killed her. Remember anything now? No one took a car from this site. Have it your own way. Perhaps we should take you down the nick. You might remember better there. Uh, there's no need for that. I want to help. I'm pleased to hear it. All these cars have got their ignition keys in. Why? Well, look around you. There's no other way we get 100 cars on this side. We've got to pack them in as tight as we can. If the first car in wants to be first out, we've got to move a few to get at it. How close an eye do you keep on them? I noticed you too, didn't I? So how did the car I'm interested in get off? Well, I know the car left the site, and I know it was brought back. Who bought it? Look, uh, you put me in a bit of a spot. I'll kick your bloody face in if you don't tell me. Well, I don't want to drop me, mate. Isn't Look, it? jerk, this is murder. It's not a case of nicking tyres or swapping engines. It's the big one. So if you don't open your gob and tell me who bought the car, I'll book you for obstruction, OK? All right, all right. Good. Look... This job doesn't pay very much. I mean, I'm all right, but the blokes who actually park the cars don't do well at all. So, to earn a bit extra cash, they clean customers' cars. So? Well, there's no water on the site. You've got to wash the car before you can polish it, you know. So where do you take them? The car wash in Craig Street. I, I mean, it's all legit, nothing on hand. The customers are grateful. Who took the Cortina out on Thursday? I'm not sure. I'll ask you one more time. Well, I think it was Charlie. What's his surname? Brown. Oh. The honest, straight up Charlie Brown. And which one is Charlie Brown? He's not here today. Where is he? Uh, I suppose he's at home. He's sick. He hasn't been in since Friday. All right, Len. Where does he live? Uh, I don't know offhand. Uh, but I think I've got his address in the hut. You better have. Lead on, Len. We're right behind you. Cool, it's a miserable hole. I don't reckon this staircase has seen a paintbrush this century. We'll complain to the landlord later. This is his room. OK. Ready when you are. We'll take it nice and gently this time. What do you want? Are you Charles Brown? Yes. Do you mind if we have a word with you? Who are you? Police. Oh. <coughs> do you work at the car park near the station? <coughs> well, I'm up to it, but it's... But it's too cold for me at the moment. The wind fair whips across there, please. This can't be him, can it? He's a bloody good actor if it is. How old are you, Pop? Sixty-eight. With Bernard. Look, wh what's all this about? Were you at work last Thursday? I think so. Did you by any chance take a blue Cortina estate to the car wash in Craig Street that day? <laughs> no, sir. Leon doesn't let me do things like that. He doesn't trust me, you see. Did you see such a car being taken off the site? No, well, well, I... I wasn't feeling too good, you see, and I... I spent the day trying to keep warm. <laughs> do you ever do any car cleaning? Not really. There isn't much this time of the year anyway, and... Well, Len hugs what bit there is. That doesn't surprise me. Come on, let's go and get him. Now you get back to bed, Pop. What the hell is all this about? This is Alpha One to control. Over. Control, over. This is Sergeant Burgess. Priority. I want the nearest cars to go to the station car park and apprehend the manager, Leonard Woods. Repeat, Leonard Woods. Arresting officers are to approach with extreme caution, man believed to be highly dangerous. I am proceeding to car park myself and will prefer charges on arrival. Over and out. But don't just sit there, Bailey. Get a bloody move on. Control to Alpha One. Over. Alpha One, over. Leonard Woods has absconded driving a dark maroon Jaguar. Registration number as yet unknown. Alpha 5 and Delta 3 are in pursuit. Last report states Jaguar joined M1 at junction 15 and is heading south. Over. Put out a general call and alert the motorway police. If you need clearance, see Superintendent Armstrong. I'm coming in. Over and out. Well, that's it. They won't get him now till he reaches London. What a bloody shambles. 
back to the nick. Yeah, only nice and slowly. I think I can wait a little while before I have to see Armstrong's face. Bailey. Yeah, just a moment. It's for you. Who is it? Radio room. Burgess? Yeah? Where? Oh, that's something. OK, keep me in touch. Cheers. Our cars have had to drop out of the chase. They couldn't keep up with him. The motorway police have had to take over surveillance. Well, that'll please our boys. Well, at least he won't get away this time. Burgess? Yes, sir. Right away. Armstrong. Come in, Burgess. Sit down. So you found Slippery Sam? I hope so. So do I, lad. Why didn't you tell me what you were up to? Well, there wasn't time. Things move quickly. I would say from what I've heard, they moved a bit too quickly for you. I don't think so. Well, if you proceeded with a little more care, this character wouldn't be driving 7,000 quids with a stolen car and being chased by police from three counties. So I slipped up, made a mistake. But don't you forget, I found Sam. And you wanted to keep all the credit for yourself. I did warn you about that at the very beginning. The glory was to be shared. But you decided to be greedy. You wanted to make the arrest personally. But instead, we have to sit back and wait for this car to run out of petrol. All motorway. There's no way you can stop a car that's travelling at 130 miles an hour. Our lads are blowing cylinder heads all over the place just trying to keep up with him. The way things are going, they won't get him till he reaches London. Well, that doesn't matter. They'll bring him back. It's not the same, is it? If you remember, I also said that I didn't want help. I wanted the arrest on my patch. I wanted a quiet case. That's because I wanted the glory for our division. You wanted the glory for your bloody self. Yes, you blow your top, lad. You've nothing to lose. You're finished, anyway. What do you mean, finished? It was my bloody brainwork that identified the bastard. Oh, that'll go in your report, don't worry. In fact, you get glowing words all the way, but you won't get any promotion. Detective Sergeant, you're finished. That's not fair. Now, look, lad. You can't take orders. You don't fit in. It's always been your trouble. You've always robbed everybody up the wrong way. Robbed you up the bloody wrong way, you mean? If you're not prepared to kiss you a stinking feet, you don't get anywhere in this division. If you don't compromise, you don't get anywhere in life. I'm top boy. You're nothing. The basic facts that you've never learnt is that my whims are more important than your desires. Armstrong. Yes? When? I see. Thanks. They've got him. At least, what's left of him is crashed. Is he dead? Yes. Should you wish to transfer to another division, I won't block or comment on your application. This would be a good time to do it, lad. I suggest you take my advice, because I don't want you around me. Have you finished? You can go. Oh, two things that might interest you. What? We found the remains of the duffel coat. Woods had tried to burn it behind the shed he used as an office. I wonder why he took it. Well, we'll never know. Thanks to you, will we? And uh, this has just come through from the Rome police. It's about Maitland. Apparently he's on holiday there with a girlfriend. He had no idea what was going on until he saw an English newspaper a couple of hours ago. So he went and saw the local police to try and find out what was happening. Is he coming back? Yeah. When he's completed his holiday. There's no rush. Does his wife know where he is? No. I thought you could pop in and tell her. Thank you. Make it your last duty on this case. Nice city, Rome. So I'm told. When's he coming back? Next week. Apparently he isn't alone. He wants to finish his holiday. You're not going to sit around waiting for him, are you? No. Even I realise it's all over. He doesn't care anything about me. Come back with us, Mum. All right. For a little while. As long as you like. Can we leave today? Of course. I'll go and pack. 
Will she be all right? Who knows? I'd better hurry those new tires along. You do that. Do you realise the only person who hasn't been touched by any of this is Dad? I know. Even that policeman seemed a bit cut up about something. But good old Dad just drifts along unhindered. Oh, my father. In the investigation of a murder by Eric Saywood, Detective Sergeant Burgess was played by Roger Hume, Detective Constable Bailey by Terry Malloy, Detective Superintendent Armstrong by Geoffrey Matthews, Jenny by Elizabeth Cassidy, Malcolm by Sean Barrett, and Mum by Isan Churchman. With Hilda Schroeder as Mrs Marsden, Peggy Ashby as Mrs Meadows, Michael Irwin as Raymond, Leonard Dixon as the Doctor, Earl Cameron as Charlie, Arnold Peters as Len Woods, and Hedley Necklaus as the desk sergeant Ralph Lawton and the radio operator. The investigation of a murder was directed by Roger Pine. Three Days of Frost by R.D. Wingfield, starring Leslie Sands as Detective Inspector Frost with Steve Hodson as Detective Constable Barnard. Three Days of Frost. Uh, prepare him for immediate surgery, nurse. Yes, Doctor. Oh, and, and warn the others. Uh, are you Mr. Barnard? Detective Constable Barnard. How is he? Well, he's got a bullet in his brain. How do you expect him to be? Oh, well, I'm sorry, but I've been working all night. He, he really needs a specialist, but it, it's two o'clock Christmas morning. I can't even scrape together a full operating team. Now, um, are there any relatives? I don't know. Oh. I don't think so. I've only known him a few days, you see. Oh. Well, he's got very little chance. You realise that, don't you? I mean, we'll do our best, but uh, well, it, it couldn't have happened at a worse time. But that was typical of you, Detective Inspector Jack Frost, wasn't it? Typical. Getting yourself shot on Christmas Day a second-best surgeon and half the theatre staff missing. But why the hell did I worry? We were almost total strangers. When I stepped off the London train at Denton Station on that Sunday night before Christmas, I didn't even know you existed. The promised police car was waiting to take me to my digs. Doors open, engine running, impatient to get away. Detective Constable Clive Barnard. That's right. Get in quick as you can. I'm PC Jordan. That's PC Sim. Hello there. We've got to make a detour. A woman's phoned the station. Her eight-year-old kid hasn't returned from Sunday school. That's the sort of crime we get in, Denton, Mr. Barnard. None of your big London bullion robberies. How long have you been in CID? Three months. Oh, three old months, eh? And now you come down from London to show us how it's done. <laughs> Left here. I know, I know. I'm not down here to show anyone anything. I'm here to learn. It's a three-month exchange scheme of training I've thought of. Oh, uh... Other forces have sent people to London. What the hell? We'd just missed hitting a mud-splattered car which shot right across our path. The driver, a shabbily dressed individual in his mid-forties, gave a careless wave of apology as he disappeared into the darkness. The silly damn fool, he'll get himself killed one of these days. Who is he? One of your new colleagues, young Barnard. That was Detective Inspector Jack Frost. What? Him? He looks like an old tramp. No, he's not the world's snappiest dresser. Well, thank goodness I'm not working with him. I'm with uh, Detective Inspector Cull. Ah, this is Vicarage Terrace. What number? 29. Uh, there. That must be it. We stopped outside a detached house where a young teenage girl waved frantically to flag us down. I imagined her to be the missing child's sister. Mrs. Uphill? Yes. Mrs. Uphill? This kid? But in the light, I could see she was about 24 years old and worried sick. Have you found her? Give us a chance, Mrs. Uphill. We've only just got your message. Yes. Yes, of course. It didn't take them long to get the details... Her eight-year-old daughter, Tracy, had attended the Sunday school at the end of the road. The Sunday school finished at 
It was now a little after seven, and the child still hadn't returned home. Try not to worry, Mrs. Uphill. She's probably just wandered off somewhere. Kids do. I suppose so. Stay by your phone. We'll ring you as soon as we have some news. And you'll ring us if she turns up in the meantime. Yes, of course. Good. We'll show ourselves out. Come on, Barnard. Here, Mike, this Sunday school. Wasn't it the one where we had those complaints about the man trying to lure kids into his car? Yes, but that was months ago. Still, mention it when you radio the kid's description through to control. Mm. And tell them we are now taking our supercargo to his digs. <laughs> it's tomorrow you report in, isn't it, Barnard? Where's the meeting, Sergeant? Uh, down that corridor, second door on your left, sir. Denton Police. Right. I'll tell him. Uh, yes, sir? I'm not a sir, Sergeant. I'm Detective Constable Barnard. Oh, yes, the whiz kid from London. I was told to report to Detective Inspector Cull at 8 o'clock. Were you? Well, it's now five past. Uh, the meeting, Sergeant? Uh, down the corridor, second door on your left, Anyway, Barnard, Inspector Cowell won't be able to see you for a while. We've got a bit of a panic on. And, um, let me give you a little tip. We don't go in for flashy gear down here. I'm sorry. I don't know what you mean. That suit. Change it. I see nothing wrong with it, Sergeant. Don't be told, then. Look out, here's the divisional commander. Good morning, Sergeant Wells. Good morning, sir. Everyone here for the meeting? As far as I know, sir. Good. Uh, by the way, sir, this is Detective Constable Barnard. Barnard. Welcome to Denton. Thank you, sir. I'm Superintendent Mullet, the divisional commander. Did you have a good trip? Digs all right? Yes, thank you, sir. You're waiting for Inspector Carl, aren't you? I tell you what, come along with me and sit in on this briefing meeting. You'll find it informative. We've got this problem with a missing girl. There's a seat there you can have, Barnard. Thank you, sir. No sign of Inspector Frost. He doesn't seem to be honouring us with his presence. Was he told? Oh, yes, sir, he was told. Hmm, typical. Your attention, please. <coughs> Firstly, thank you all for coming. This child has now been missing for over 16 hours. 16 hours of sub-zero temperature. There's snow on the way. So if we're going to find her alive, we've got to be speedy and we've got to be thorough. For that reason, I have put Detective Inspector Cull in charge of this operation. And as he's in charge, it behoves me to shut up and let him take over. <laughs> when you're ready. Thank you. Now, Tracy Uphill, eight years old, fair hair, wearing a thick blue coat and a woolen scarf over a red dress. Clear. Good. Any questions? <coughs> uh, right, uh, yes, uh, Constable Stringer. I was wondering if it might not be a good idea to check on known child molesters, sir. Oh, that's an excellent suggestion, Stringer. So you won't be surprised to learn that it occurred to your superiors over 12 hours ago. A separate team is now out checking on every known and suspected sexual offender in the division. But a good point, Constable. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Very good point. All right, now, anything else? Right, then. Off you go, and good luck. Uh, <coughs> Inspector. Uh, yes, sir? What about the, uh, the new chap, uh, Barnard? Oh, I, I can't cope with him in the search party as well as all my other work. Huh? But there's no one else. There's Frost. Frost? I, I, I couldn't. I, I, I couldn't possibly. Uh, only until we find the girl. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but it's got to be. Now, if you'll excuse me, sir. Oh, all right. Uh, Barnard. Yes, sir. Um, slight change of plan. Uh, by the way, I, I suppose the rest of your luggage hasn't arrived yet. My luggage, sir? I mean with your proper suit. Oh. Uh, yes, sir. It's on the way. Excellent. Right. Uh, well, then, instead of Inspector Cull, you'll be working under Detective Inspector Frost. Frost, sir? Yes. He uh, wasn't at the meeting. But he's a very experienced officer, very experienced. But the thing is, Barnard, and I am taking you into my confidence here, you'll, uh, you'll have to make allowances for him. Uh, allowances, sir? Yes. He's a very experienced, as I've said, but he, he had a personal tragedy last year, his wife. 
Very sad, inoperable, absolutely nothing they could do. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. You took it badly, I'm afraid. You you can't expect these tragedies not to leave their mark, so we we make allowances. I see, sir. Good, I knew you would understand. Now, let's go down to Inspector Frost's office and try and find out where he's got to. Don't you knock when you come into someone's office. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, God, the briefing meeting. Yes, Frost. The briefing meeting. Would you mind waiting outside for a moment, Barnard? Sir. So, where were you? I'm sorry, Super. I, uh, I forgot. Forgot? Don't you keep a desk, diary? There's one here somewhere. This office is a disgrace. It's a, it's a pigsty, an absolute pigsty. Unemptied ashtrays, paper everywhere. And that should have gone off weeks ago. And there's that file. What I asked you for it, you said you didn't have it. Uh, I've uh, I've only just found it. I was going to bring it in to you. It, it was under these papers. How could anyone possibly work in a mess like this? Oh, get it tidied up, Frost, please. And while we're on this tasteful subject, your, oh, your standard of dress. You look as if you're wearing your gardening clothes. Your trousers want pressing, and I'm sure those shoes haven't seen a blacking brush for months. We can't all be tailors, dummies. Sir. Don't be impertinent, Frost. Now, listen. I'm putting this new man, Detective Constable Barnard, under your care. Only for a couple of days, until Inspector Cull can take over. Watch your tongue. Mind what you say to him, especially when referring to superior officers. And no bending of the rules. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly, sir. Good. Come in, Barnard. Inspector Frost, this is Detective Constable Barnard. Sir. God almighty. His proper suit is coming down with the rest of his luggage. Oh, I see. Well, I'll leave you to it. Remember what I said, Inspector. Oh, yes, sir. Well, come in, sir, and sit down. Thank you. If you clear those files away, you might find there's a chair underneath. How much do they charge for suits like that? Fifty-seven pounds, sir. Blimey. A proper shop, was it? Yes, sir. A bit of gratuitous advice from an old hand, son. Never wear anything on duty. You wouldn't be happy letting a drunk be sick all over. Come in. Ah, Inspector Cole. Oh, hello, Jack. Oh, this place is a mess. Yeah, our divisional commander was graciously pleased to bring that to my attention. I've got a job for you. Oh? Yes, this missing girl. I'd like a thorough search of the house. You reckon the mother's done her in? Yeah, it's possible. No, uh... Would you see to it, Jack, and uh, let me know how you get on? Any excuse to get out? Come on, son, we'll do it now. Give your suit an airing. Uh, uh, Bernard. Uh, yes, sir. Inspector Frost is not a typical officer. For certain reasons, he's uh, tolerated. As soon as we find the girl, you'll be back with me, all right? Bernard! All right, sir. I'm coming. <sighs> That's all this job seems to be, son. Pushing doorbells. Ah. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Uphill. I'm Detective Inspector Frost, Denton CID. Have you found her? Not yet, Mrs. Uphill, but we should have some news soon. We've got half the county out looking for her. Can we, uh, can we come in, do you think? In here. Please sit down. Uh, can I get you anything? Tea? Coffee? That'd be lovely. But uh, if I could just get a few details first. We were wondering if you had any further thoughts as to where your daughter might have gone. We've tried all the obvious places. Well, if I'd thought of anything, I'd have phoned. Did you quarrel with her? Or can you think of any reason why she might have wanted to run away from home? No. We, we went through all that last night. Ah. You've, uh, you've had a thorough look all over the house, I suppose. The house? How can she possibly be in the house? She could be hiding. Since half past four yesterday afternoon. Doesn't seem very possible, does it? But... Uh, Tell you what, just for our peace of mind, we'll give the house a quick going over while you make us a cup of tea. Uh, 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 give us a hand to get this back, would you, sir? Uh, Inspector, uh, where's her husband? Husband, son? Uh, that's got it. There isn't one. She's not married. The missus is purely a courtesy title, like calling mullet, sir. Uh, We'll try the next room. The kids' room. Ooh, it's cold. 
Radiator's on. It still feels cold and empty. Where does Mrs. Uphill get her money from, sir? There seems to be no shortage. You don't know? No. You're old enough, I suppose. She's a prostitute, son. Oh. Sells her body to men at ten quid a time. That's where she gets her money from. Uh, uh, damn! I found the toy cupboard. <laughs> and I bet Mummy had to work hard to provide this little lot. What's left on this floor? Only the bathroom, sir. Right. Go and give it one of your thorough London searches while I shove this little lot back. All finished, son? Uh, yes, sir. Hmm. No B-day, eh? I suppose she chucks her fag ends down the toilet. <laughs> Did you have much trouble getting the bath panel off? The bath panel, sir? The bath was boxed in by plastic panels screwed into internal wooden battens. So obvious a hiding place, I'd missed it completely. With an infuriating grin, Frost produced a screwdriver from the depths of his scruffy raincoat and sat on the toilet seat to watch me work. Uh, uh, there's nothing here, sir. Are you sure? Poke around, son. A 57-pound suit should stand up to a bit of dirt. No, no, there's nothing. No, I didn't think there would be. But it pays to be thorough, especially at the start of your career. Now then, let's see how quickly you can put it back on. Sir. Damn, she's coming up. I've brought the tea and some... Why have you got the bath panel off? How do you think she could have got... You think she's dead, don't you? Grab the tray, son. Take it easy, Mrs. Uphill. Am I supposed to have killed my own daughter? Why aren't you out there looking for her? That's put us in our place. I wonder if she's hidden the body in the airing cupboard. I've already looked, sir. And is it necessary to be quite so callous? You must make allowances for me, son. I'm sure you've been told that. What do you reckon to this? I found it tucked inside Tracy's Beano Annual. It was an unretouched enlargement of a nude girl, sitting on a draped box, leaning back to show the camera a well-developed body. The model could not be identified, as from the neck up the top half had been torn off, but traces of long dark hair could be seen resting on the shoulders. Processed by an amateur, son. You can still smell the acid fixer. What do you make of that crescent-shaped mark on the right arm? I don't know. Could it be a birthmark? Yeah, that's what I reckon. I wonder who she is, and how did Tracy get hold of it? We've finished, Mrs. Uphill. We didn't find anything. And I suppose to look surprised or relieved. You want to know something that puzzles me? What? Why didn't you meet Tracy from Sunday school yesterday? And like the lady's cigarettes, huh? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Why didn't you meet her, Mrs. Uppel? I just didn't. We've had a word with the Sunday school superintendent. He says you always met her. Winter, summer, rain or shine. Yesterday was the one and only time you didn't show up. Why? Well, I just didn't. There was no reason. I thought she'd be all right. I don't believe you, Mrs. Uppel. Last summer, a man tried to lure some kids into his car as they came out of that Sunday school. And ever since then, even though it's just at the end of the street, you've met Tracy every damn week without fail. When the sun was blazing down, you met her, but yesterday, when it was pitch dark, you gave it a miss. Why, Mrs. Uphill? Why? Inspector! Shut up. Come on, Mrs. Uphill. Why? Oh, leave me alone, you bastard! I don't care about your feelings, Mrs. Uphill. All I care about is getting help, not you going into bloody hysterics. So why didn't you meet her? Regular? Yes. Every Sunday. He was always away by half past three. Plenty of time for me to get down to the Sunday school. But yesterday he was an hour late in arriving. He didn't leave until just before 4.30. Th there wasn't time. No time? It would only take you a couple of minutes to get there. I wasn't dressed. Yes. Of course. Uh, by the time I had dressed and tidied up, it was nearly a quarter to five. Oh, only he'd been on time. Did he say why he was late? Something about a cancelled train. He had to wait for the next. Do you know his name or where he came from? No. He said his name was Bob, but they don't always tell the truth. When he left, which direction did he go? Towards the Sunday school. And he left here just as the kids were coming out. 
He could have seen her. We'll want a description, Mrs. Uphill. That, at least, should present no difficulty. He's about 34, 35. He, he has a beard, light brown hair. It was a very detailed description, right down to his appendix scar. When she had finished, Frost produced the photograph. Would this be anyone you know, Mrs. Uphill? No. We found it in Tracy's room, hidden in a book. Tracy's room? Where would she have got it from? You keep anything like that in the house? No, I... Oh, well, she probably just found it somewhere. It'd have been nothing to kids of her age. Well, don't lose hope, Mrs. Uphill. We'll let you know as soon as we have any news. Go on, sir. Where to, sir? Oh, we'll find somewhere to have lunch, and then I want you to nip down to the railway station. If he visits her every Sunday, the staff should remember him. Mm -hmm. Ah, now there's the Sunday school. Used to be the old vicarage at one time. The actual church is further back. Looks a proper dump. Yeah. My wife's buried in the churchyard. Oh, sorry. Will you be staying here for Christmas? As far as I know. Good. I'm on duty Christmas and Boxing Day. You can come on with me if you like. Now, let's see what the lunches are like at that place. When I returned from the railway station, Frost was sprawled on the back seat of the car, fast asleep. Inspector. Oh, it's you, son. Oh, that lunch was diabolical. And that tapioca. Cool. Reminds me about the bloke who drank the spittoon for a bet. Do you know him? Yes, sir. I've no. been to the railway station. I do know our man. He travels up every Sunday from Leffington. And his usual train was cancelled, just as he said. Leffington? We could be in luck, son. What train did he catch back? Usually the 4.33. But yesterday it was the 6.57. 6.57. And he left Mrs. Uphills just on half past four. Mm. It's only half an hour's walk to the station, even for a man with no appendix, which makes him two and a half hours adrift. What could he have been doing? There isn't a damn thing to do in Denton on a Sunday evening. Even the public toilets shut at five o'clock. It was just after four when we got back to the station to find Sergeant Wells deep in argument with one of the scruffiest, dirtiest, foulest-smelling old tramps I had ever seen. Not leaving here until I get it. Fine thing, isn't it, when the stinking cop spits your bloody money? Go on, Sam. Hop it. Get out or I'll run you in. I'm not going without my quid. Hello, Sam. What's this, then? Come to make your usual donation to the Police Benevolent Fund? I don't have to make a donation. To take it from you. I'm not being personal, Sam, but you don't half stink. Like a hot dustbin with its lid off. Oh, no, no, don't get any nearer. Just stay there. I'm getting itchy just looking at you. Never mind the bleeding insults. Where's my quid? Gentleman wants to know where his quid is, Sergeant. You came in here with sixpence and you were given back sixpence when we turned you out. We didn't charge anything for our hospitality, nor for the fact that you were sick all over our nice clean floor. You had that on the rates with our compliments. What was he in for? Sleeping rough, drinking meths and urinating on the gravestones in the churchyard. These young conservatives. I wasn't so drunk. I didn't know how much I had. But I had one pound and sixpence. Now, that young copper put it in an envelope and when he gave it back for me, the quid was gone. It was never there, Sam. You were full of myths. You didn't know what you had. I brought the myths up. All right, Sam. Now, if you had a quid, where'd you get it from? You hadn't been selling your body, I hope. I found it. And now you've lost it. Easy come, easy go. That young copper nicked it. Right. You've made a very serious allegation about a member of this force. Take it you're going to prefer charges. Name? <laughs> had a lot of good it to do me if I did. You'd all lie your heads off. Then get out. I'm going. But I'll be back. Got anywhere to sleep tonight, Sam? Ah, oh, mind your own business. What young copper was he talking about? P.C. Stringer, you know. He's as straight as a die. The search parties are all back in, by the way. No trace of the girl. If she's in the open, she won't last through the night. It's getting bitter out there. Yes. Oh, another thing, Jack. Uh, county have been on. They're screaming for your crime statistics return. It must go off tonight. We'll do it now. You any good at figures, Sam? Station sergeant. Oh, Jack, it's for you. Leffington, please. Oh, tough. Frost? 
You have? Well, bless your little cotton socks. No, no, we'll do it. We're on our way now. They've traced Mrs. Uphill's bearded Sunday regular. He's a school teacher. Come on, son, let's pay him a visit. Hey, what about the crime statistics? Bags of time. We'll do them when we get back. Yes? Uh, Mr. Stanley Farnham? Yes. We're police officers, sir. Uh, Can we come in? Police officers? Show the gentleman your warrant card, son. Oh, uh, yes. There we are, sir. What's it about? Something I think you'd prefer was not discussed on your doorstep, sir. May we come in? Um, in here. Very nice. Very compact. Well, I'm sorry it's so untidy. I've just got it from school. Yes, we heard you were a teacher. Biology, sir? Uh, no, English. Ah. <laughs> is it all right if my colleague takes a look round? No, it's not all right. What the hell is this about? Do you know a woman called Joan Uphill, Mr. Farnham? Uphill? Uh, no, I, I, I don't recall. 29 Vicarage Terrace, Denton. Ten quid a time and a cup of tea after. I'm sorry, I don't know her. She must be lying, then, because she says she knows you. Would you object to taking part in an identity parade? Oh, uh, oh wait a minute. Um, uphill, you say? Allow me, sir. You're shaking. All right, all right. I do know her. What has happened to her? Why should anything have happened to her, sir? Well, you know, these women, they do get attacked, but... Uh, she was all right when I left her. What time was that? Oh, about half past four. Our inquiry is regarding her daughter, Mr. Farnham. Tracy? Why so surprised? You must know about it. It was on the news. It's in all the papers. Isn't this your morning paper on the coffee table, sir? Uh, uh, yes, but I haven't read it yet. It isn't delivered till after I've left for school. Oh. There it is, sir. Police search for missing child. Oh, good Lord. How terrible. Well, you don't think she's here, do you? Is that why you want to search? Because you think she's here? Well, go ahead, look where you like. I've nothing to hide. Off you go, then, son. Right, oh, sir. And be thorough. Yes, sir. So you left Mrs. Uphill's about half past four, then, sir? Yes. That would be about the time Tracy was coming out of Sunday school. Yes, I know. I saw her. Where was this? She was walking away from the Sunday school. Towards her home? No, they were walking in the opposite direction. They? She was with a woman. What woman? I don't, I don't know. Describe her. I didn't take an awful lot of notice. It was dark and I was in a hurry. Medium height, wearing a whitish fur coat. Was she old, young? I didn't notice. You see where they went? No, I, I soon outpaced them. I didn't particularly want Tracy to see me and I was in a hurry. Why were you in a hurry, sir? Well, I had a train to catch. What train was well, that? Uh, look, I'm, I'm a bit confused. I... I caught the late train. I was hurrying because I had to visit my aunt. I was due there for tea. Your Sunday is a one long round of pleasure, aren't they, sir? Any luck, son? No, sir. Now get your notebook out, Mr. Farnham. He's going to give us the name and address of his aunt. Yes, oh, sir. Oh, uh, you won't go round there, will you? I, I mean, she's an old lady. Her heart's none too good. And... Don't worry, sir. I specialise in old ladies with weak hearts. Well, that damn form must be somewhere, son. Are you sure it's not on your desk? Yes, sir. Hello, Bill. Hello, Jack. Heard the news? They found her? Not the girl. Inspector Carl. He's had an accident. Accident? When? Where? What happened? A lorry smashed into his car. Is he badly hurt? A couple of broken ribs, at least. He'll be out of action for a while. Poor old Carl. I wouldn't even have wished that on Mullet. So who's he going to put in charge of the Tracy Uphill case? Some big head from county, I suppose. Answer that, Sam, will you? Sir? Inspector Frost's office? I yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mullet wants to see you right away, sir. Me? Oh, no. No, even he couldn't be that stupid. Mr. Mullet wouldn't be that stupid. Would he, Sergeant? 
I take it you haven't got a very high opinion of our Mr. Frost, young Barnum. Not for me to say, is it, Sergeant? Oh, come now. I've only known him for 15 years. You've known him for 10 whole hours. It doesn't take 10 hours to find out that a man's uncouth, untidy and a mess. You know yourself he's only tolerated here. Who told you that? Inspector Cull. Inspector Cull. That's just the sort of thing he would say. And do you know why Jack Frost is tolerated? No. He's tolerated, Barnard, because he's achieved something that Mullet and Cull would give their bloody eye teeth for. Keeps it stuck away in the back here somewhere. Ah. Have a look at that. Go on. Open it. A medal. Not just a medal, Barnard. Ever seen a George Cross before? Because that's what it is. The civilian equivalent of the VC. And it's his... Jack Frost's. That mess you mentioned. Mess? Someone talking about me? What's that doing out? I was just showing it to the lad, Jack. Oh. Give it here, son. How did you win it, sir? Oh, it's a long and boring story. Well, one of our local yobbos popped to the eyeballs on drugs, gets himself a gun and tries to pull off the crime of the century at Bennington's Bank. We turned up. And I marched over to get the gun from him. He nearly shot my head off. (laughs) Not a bad little medal. They prefer you to get killed before they give it to you, but they make an exception if their stocks are building up. What did he want to see you about, Jack? As headquarters haven't got any suitable officers to spare, I am now in full charge of the Tracy Uphill investigation. Congratulations. Mind you, I've been given my orders. I'm to stay well away from the press, buy a new suit and report to Mullet every five minutes. Apart from that, I've got a completely free hand. Well, come on, son. Stop messing about with those figures. Let's see how my subordinates are managing without us in search control. How's it going, Arthur? Hello, Jack. I'm told you're our new boss. Thank God you know. I was afraid I'd have to break the bad news. Oh, have you met Clive Barnard, alias Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat? Uh, Clive, this is Detective Sergeant Arthur Hanlon. How do you do? Any news on the woman in the white fur, Arthur? Nothing. Your bloke Farnham seems to be the only person who saw her. If he did see her. First thing tomorrow, son, we must check up on Auntie. Don't let me forget. Right, sir. A couple of other things, Jack. You know we've been checking up on known child molesters. Mm. Foxtrot Tango came up with something interesting. Oh, what? Mickey Hoskins didn't turn up for work today. Did he check his dicks? He hasn't been there since Sunday. Ah, I want him found and brought in, Arthur. Put an all patrols message out. Right. Who's Mickey Hoskins, sir? <laughs> He's got more form than your suit's got red stripes, sir. Indecent exposure, indecent assault, the lot. He's got a special liking for young girls. So he's still with Mar Bowsey, then, Arthur? God, I wouldn't need a meal she'd cooked or coughed over if you paid me a million pounds. Which reminds me, did I ever tell you the joke about the bloke who drank the spittoon for a bet? Yes, in the canteen over dinner. Oh, so I did. Do you know it, son? Uh, There was this bloke. I've heard it, sir. Oh. Anything else then, Arthur? Oh, usual crank calls. Oh, Martha Wendell's been on again. She says the spirits have got an important message for us about a body. Oh, I'll follow it through, Arthur, the way we've followed all our other spirit messages through. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to try and manage without us for a while, Arthur. We've got the crime statistics to do. Right, son, bring your chair over to my desk. Sir? Shouldn't take us more than a couple of hours. Ah, where's me pen? Hello? You haven't borrowed any of my money, have you, sir? No, sir. Well, that's odd. It was about 45 pence in small change here. Frost? Oh, blimey, Arthur, we've only just left you. You'll have to learn to manage on your own, you know. What? No, I'll handle it. I'm on my way now with Flash Harry. Forget the crime statistics, son, we're going out. Yes, sir. The headmaster of Tracy's school just phoned. He doesn't know if it's important, but a girl called Audrey Harding, 12 years old, never turned up for school today. And Audrey is a close friend of Tracy Uphill. It took us 15 minutes to get to the girl's house. 
and as a schoolgirl was involved, we'd collected a woman police constable on the way. The door was opened by a loin-stirring blockbuster in tight denim jeans and a cotton T-shirt that stretched a bursting point across a mouth-watering, unrestricted, jiggling bosom. Oh. <clears throat> I'm sorry to bother you, miss. We're, uh, we're police officers. Who is it? Carol singers? No, police! What is it? What's the matter? Uh, Mrs. Harding? Yes? Do you have a little girl called Audrey? I'm Audrey. You? How old are you? Twelve, nearly thirteen. She's big for her age. Mm. Uh, yes. <clears throat> uh, can we come in? We were ushered into a tiny hot house of a kitchen. Frost nodded for the woman police constable to start the questions. You weren't at school today, Audrey. She's uh, got a bad chest. <coughs> uh, camphorated oil's very good. About two gallons. They haven't sent the police down just because I kept her away from school, surely? No, it's about Tracy Uphill. I believe you know her, Audrey. I know her. Her mother's a tart. Maybe she is, but you shouldn't say so. Not in company. There's some things you don't talk about. My uncle was an undertaker, but we never mentioned it to anyone. Well, some things are best left unsaid. Mm. You, uh, you don't go to Sunday school, do you, Audrey? Only to ballet classes and tap dancing. Uh, we believe in religion and that sort of thing, but we don't want it rammed down our throat, especially on a Sunday. Tracy's been missing from her home since half past four yesterday afternoon, Mrs Harding. Didn't you know? Tracy? Is that the girl they've been talking about on the wireless? Well, I'd never connected her. She's with... a friend of yours, Audrey. I knew her a bit, but I haven't seen her outside school for a couple of weeks. Are you sure? My girl's not a liar. Can you think of anywhere she might have gone? <gasps> no. Well, she was seen going off with a woman in a white fur coat. Any idea who that woman might be? No idea at all. Do you play bingo, Mrs Harding? Twice a week down the old grand cinema. Yeah, how did you know? Well, we had these reports about a beautiful woman seen playing down there. And I happened to notice your bingo card on the mantelpiece. Oh, aren't you observant? <laughs> Eyes everywhere. Oh, I've had one or two very good wins. I thought I was onto a winner the minute I spotted you. And I bet you'll make a lovely cup of tea. Would you like one? It won't take a minute. Lovely. I'll put the kettle on. It only wants topping up. There's no rush. Oi. Fanny. You talking to me? Yeah. Does your mother know you borrow her coat? What coat? A white fur hanging behind the door. She bought it with her bingo money. She'll murder me if she finds out. You wore it yesterday, didn't you? When you met Tracy from Sunday school. Oh, I just wanted to show off the coat. I didn't want her to come with me. Didn't want her to, but she did. I said she'd have to go the minute me fella turned up. Your fella? My boyfriend. I was meeting him at the gates to the field by Meadow Lane. What happened when he arrived? Did she go? Well, she pretended to, but she followed us, hoping for an Eiffel, I expect. We ended up in the wood. Why'd you go there? To try and shake her off, but she kept following. In the end, we ran and hid behind that big tree, the one by the lake. She went racing past, so me and my boyfriend backtracked to the main road. You left a kid of eight to find her own way home from those woods in the pitch dark? We never asked her to follow us. Anyway, she knew the way back, and she wasn't going home. She said she was going to play in the old vicarish ground. So you left her. Where did you go after that? To me boy's house. His parents were out. What did you do there? What do you think? You won't tell me mum, will you? Not unless I have to. Yeah. Ah. The old brown juice. Now, help yourself. <laughs> so we sipped hot, sweet tea and chatted. My eyes were drawn to our policewoman who had slipped off her greatcoat. She was lovely. A sharp dig from Frost's elbow brought me painfully back to earth. The girl, son. Look at the girl. Twelve-year-old Audrey was examining the perfection of her right shoulder... She had pulled back the sleeve of her T-shirt, and there it was, a crescent-shaped birthmark, 
the birthmark we had last seen in black and white on the headless nude photograph found in Tracy's bedroom. As soon as we were back in the car, Frost radioed through to control for the woods to be searched thoroughly. At the market square, the WPC asked to be dropped off. You on standby then, Hazel? Yes, sir. I'll tell you what, I'll walk to the station from here. Young Clive can run you home in the car. All right, son? Yes. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, try and be good. Uh. He's sweet, isn't he? Is he? Yeah. Where do you live? Oh, Martin Road. It's about five minutes from here. Ah, you'll have to pass my digs. How about dropping off for a cup of coffee? Coffee's nearly ready. Good. Sorry, there's only the bed to sit on. Oh, it's very comfortable. Isn't it hot in here? Hmm. Mind if I take my tunic off? No, of course not. <laughs> oh, now I'm cold. Come and warm. <laughs> <laughs> There you are, son. Damn! Lucky I spotted your light. Oh. They found a scarf in the woods. Could be the girls. Oh, hello, Hazel. Didn't see you under there. You weren't talking about anything important, were you? We found the scarf here, sir. Caught on this bush. Mm. What's down there? Willow Lake. I reckon that's where we're going to find her. Perhaps. First light tomorrow, we'll have it dragged. Of course, it might not be her scarf. Come on, son, we'll see if old Mother Uphill can identify it. You want us to carry on searching, Inspector? Oh, we'll give it another couple of hours. There's the slimmest chance she's still alive, and a few more hours out in this would finish her off. An expensive car passed us as we turned into Vicarage Terrace, and the rich smell of cigar smoke in Mrs Uphill's lounge betrayed a recently departed visitor. Frost murmured something to me about business as usual... Then he showed her the scar. At first, I thought she was going to faint, but she pulled herself together. Yes, it, it's hers. We found it in the woods, Mrs. Uphill. We'll have men searching there all night. What's up, son? She shouldn't be on her own. Someone should stay the night with her. Thinking of volunteering? I'll lend you the ten quid if you're sure. <sighs> Where to, sir? Back to the station. We'll lay on the dragon of the lake tomorrow, and then off home. Your yawning's getting on my nerves. So, back again to the station, through the lobby doors and the arranging of the dragging of the lake. We were actually leaving when Frost remembered the crime statistics. Did you get those figures out, sir? You told me... To leave them, sir. Oh, well, bang goes out early night. Oh. Bring a chair over here. We should do it in half an hour. Even with Frost's hair-raising shortcuts, which grossly abuse the laws of arithmetic, it took us over 90 minutes. But at last, the job was done, and the return chucked into the out tray. How goes the time, son? Nearly half past one in the morning. Oh, well, just one more job to do, then we can all go home. As we passed through the lobby, he called out to the sergeant on duty. Just going to the woods with the new chap? The new chap. I felt as if I'd been trotting along behind Frost for 20 years. 20 long years. Found anything else, lads? No, sir. <coughs> All right, all right. What with him yawning and you coughing? Ah, <coughs> oh, pack it in. Hello. Did you feel that? Snow. All we need. It's going to be a bitch dragging that lake tomorrow. Trust me to get weather like this. Inspector Cole would have had sunshine and bluebirds. Hello, who the else is? Oh, no. 
Not in. Hello, Inspector. So, this is where you're hiding, eh? <laughs> Any luck yet? Sam, this is Sandy Lane, chief reporter of the Denton Echo. Oh. Sandy, Detective Constable Garner. Oh, she ought to be uh, hopping up to the surface soon if she's in there, shouldn't she, Jack? If she's in there? Oh, she's got to be. Well, if I haven't dragged myself here at the crack of dawn for nothing, I've already written the headlines. Local clairvoyance prediction fulfilled. Body found in woods. Here, yeah, and you could have a photograph of the girl's house with a caption, Santa won't be calling here this year. You know that's not bad. Hello. I think they found something. Excuse me. It's only a log. But let him find out for himself, and I hope he falls in. Yeah. Oi, Constable. Sir? What's that hut over there? The model boat club. Use it in the summer, sir. It's all locked and empty now. Are you sure? Yes, sir. We got the key from the club secretary and searched it last night. Well, let's take another look at it. I've got one of my nasty feelings. This door's been forced. Only since yesterday, then, sir. There's something wedged behind it. Ah. Give us a hand. Right, sir. Uh, oh, my God. You found her? Oh. Prediction fulfilled. Body found in woods. But it was the wrong body. It wasn't the child. It was an old man. Sam. The tramp who had marched into the station demanding the return of his pound. He had frozen to death. He must have broken in last night for somewhere to sleep. Poor old devil. So what chance does the girl stand Oh, I wasn't here when you found him, Constable. Sir? I've got enough paperwork on my desk to keep me going without filling in forms for him. Oh. What's up, Barnard? Never seen a dead end before? Not like that, sir. Oh, this one's caviar compared with the first body I saw. He was a tramp, too. Oh, no, Jack, not that story. The boy hasn't heard it, Sandy. Years ago, this was, son, when I was new to the force. They'd found the remains of this old tramp in a derelict house in the middle of a glorious heat wave. Well, they scraped him up oh. and delivered him to the morgue. And... Hello. They finished dragging. She's not... She, She's not in the lake, sir. Then where is she? Come on, son, let's try the Sunday school. Sorry we couldn't oblige, Sandy. Anyone at home? Rambling sort of place, sir. Yeah. This used to be the old vicarage years ago, son, but it was miles too big. Now it's just used for Sunday school, scouts, the odd mother's meeting. Uh -huh. There should be a resident caretaker somewhere. Anyone at home? Who's that? Who you want? You, Mr. Barrow, the caretaker? Yeah. Police. It's about young Tracy Uphill. Well, terrible business, that. Terrible. We want to look around, Mr. Barrow. Well, she's not here. How do you know? Why, no, she was here. Besides, I've looked around myself. This is a rabbit warren of a place. Too much for one man to do properly. No. It's, it's not convenient now. I've got other things to do. Can't you come back later? No need. You carry on with your work. We'll do it on our own. And don't worry, we won't pinch anything. I've got all the Bibles I can read back home. Come on, son, we'll start at the top. Last one, son. We'll do this, and we'll go home. Somebody's been in here recently. Smell that cigarette smoke. Try the light switch, it's pitch dark. None of the others have worked, sir. Wow! Blimey! Right. I think it's a photo flood, sir. I don't like the look of that, son. It was an ominously large, battered Edwardian cabin trunk. It was fitted with a new, strong brass padlock. One of my keys might conceivably fit. No. Uh, yes. Ah. Oh. Old hymn books. Hardly worth the effort. And hardly worth such a strong lock, either, sir. Like me, son, you compensate for your lack of dress sense with brains. Let's dig a little deeper. 
At the bottom of the trunk, we found a camera and an envelope. The envelope contained gems from Barrow's photographic collection, including black and white enlargements of Mrs. Uphill in full, unretouched nudity, and photographs of an undressed, nubile, 12-year-old Audrey Harding, sitting on this same cabin trunk, sprawling provocatively against the wall. Only this time, the head was not torn off. So now we know why Barrow didn't want us to search the place. Oh, I was afraid of this. I'd heard the odd rumour. What do we do now, sir? Stick everything back, say nothing. None of our business. None of our business? The girl's under age, sir. Well, she certainly doesn't look it. I'll tell you something, my son. If she stuck those monsters under my nose, I certainly wouldn't waste time asking to see her birth certificate. Oh. We're looking for a missing child. We're not interested in this muck. This is trivia. I'll have a quiet word with Barrow when I get round to it. He's fairly harmless. Just bung everything back as it was. We haven't seen it. And Harry, we should be back at the station. The silly bitch! Do you see that red mini? Shot straight out in front of us. Women, drivers. And I thought she could do no wrong in your eyes. Or don't you recognise her with her clothes on? Eh? It was your girlfriend, Mrs Uphill. I wonder why she's in such a hurry. Some poor devil in urgent need of her services, I suppose. We spotted her again as we drove through the market square. She was leaving Bennington's bank, clutching a large plastic bag. Stop the car, son. I'm feeling nosy. He disappeared into the bank, returning a few moments later, grinning from ear to ear. Guess what, son? Uh... She's just drawn out 500 quid in used onces. 500 pounds? She could be buying Christmas presents for her regulars, of course. But my guess is she's received a ransom demand. Inspector Frost, what's the trouble, Bill? <sighs> it's snowing like mad out there. It's been pretty stormy in here as well. Mr Mullet wants you. Oh, what have I done now? The briefing meeting. Oh, God. You were supposed to be running it in Inspector Cull's absence. Now you come to mention it, Mullet did tell me last night. I suppose he's upset. Upset? He's spitting blood. And to make matters worse, the chief constable turned up for a surprise visit. It was a shambles. Oh, God. Sergeant Wills? Uh, yes, sir. He's just come in. Yes, sir. Mr. Mullet wonders if he could spare a few moments of your valuable time. Mm. I'll wear me medal. He's too much of a coward to sack a gallant hero. Now, come on, Mickey. This way. Ah, hello, hello, hello. What have we here, then? Mickey Hoskins, our friendly neighbourhood child molester, sir, missing from his dig since Sunday. He's been hiding from us. What's all this about? I've got nothing to say. You can't hold me here. I know the judge's rules. You must tell me what they are, Mickey. I always forget them. Interview room, lads. Get the implements seated up. Sir. I've just got to go and have a rollicking from the divisional commander, then I'll be right back. How much longer are you going to keep me? Inspector will be along in a minute. Ah, about time. I was just going. Sorry, Mick. I've got so many ventures on the boil at the moment, I forgot all about you. <sighs> First, I must have a fag. Uh... <clears throat> Oh, I'd offer you one, Mick, but I've only got 16 left. Now, what did I want to talk to you about? Oh, I know. Tracy Uphill. Oh, she? I've got a photograph somewhere. Ah, there. You taking all this down, Sims? Yes, sir. Good. Well, Mickey? Well, what? It's a young kid. A nice-looking young kid. She anything like a photograph? When am I supposed to have seen her? How about Sunday afternoon? No. Did you ever go at her on Sunday, Mick? Did she like it? Did you like it? Stop it! Stop it! I never saw her on Sunday! You don't have to shout, Mick. You can lie just as well in a quiet voice. Now, come on, tell us what happened. What did you do to her? Come on, give us a cheap thrill. I didn't think she'd mind. Some of them don't. They love it. She was sitting all on her own, in inviting like. So I moved over and sat next to her. Where was it? Century cinema, next. That's what you're on about, isn't it? Uh, yes, of course. She 
She let me get my hand right up her leg before she screamed. If she didn't want it, why didn't she complain earlier? Perhaps she didn't want to miss a good bit of the film. Inspector. Excuse me, Mick. Yeah, what is it? Uh, we've uh, had a report of this incident, sir. Century Cinema man tried to molest this woman about 30. She screamed, so he hit her in the face, breaking her nose. It was a chase, but he got away. He's not talking about Tracy. Oh. <clears throat> uh, sorry about that, Mick. He just wanted to know how to spell dirty bastard. But the old dear was pushing 30, Mick. A bit ancient for you, surely. It was an X program. They don't let kids in. Oh, I see. Well, I'll send someone else in to take a statement, Mick. I get too excited when I hear about thighs and knickers and things. <laughs> I can't hold my pencil steady. Here, here, wait a minute. I just remembered. Tracy Uphill. That's that missing kid. Eight years old. You didn't think I had anything to do with her, did you? Of course not, Mick. Had to ask, though. Well, you'd have been offended if I hadn't. You wanted to see me, Jack? Yes, Arthur. And shut that flipping door. It's perishing. We haven't all got your fat to protect us. There's been a development. Young Clive's just got back from Mrs. Uphill. She's had a ransom demand. What? Read the note to Arthur, son. Sir. I have got your daughter, Tracy. If you want to see her alive, get £500 in used ones and wait by phone for instructions. Tell police and I kill her. Local postmark caught the 615 collection yesterday evening. Can she raise that sort of money? She drew it out of the bank this morning and wasn't going to tell us. You did well, son. Thank you, sir. You'd better rush it over to Forensic. Not that it'll do us any damn good. Come in. Oh, hello, sir. I hear through the grapevine that there's been a ransom demand, Inspector. Uh, quite right, sir. I was just about to bring it in to you. Uh, here. Mm. Better get this over to Forensic. What a good idea. Remember to do that, will you, sir? Sir, I've, um, I've brought these files from Inspector Cull's office. This is the electronic calculator theft job I'm anxious to see cleared up. Oh, thank you, sir. I can't wait to get my teeth into this little dot. What will you do about the ransom demand? I doubt if it's genuine, but I'll have her phone tap just in case. So if you're one of her regulars, sir, I'd lay off phoning for a while. I don't think that's very funny, Inspector. I'm sorry, sir. Mm. Now, what do you know about a woman called Martha Wendell? Cranky old cow. Lives in a broken-down cottage in the woods. Dabbles in the occult. And sends us a lot of worthless spirit messages. Ah, but are they worthless? She predicted we'd find a body in the woods, and this morning one of our constables discovered the corpse of a tramp. The chief constable suggests we might see if she can help in locating Tracy Uphill. You don't believe in that rubbish, do you? As always, I have an open mind. So let me know how you get on. A pompous git. What do you think he's running? A psychic research laboratory? Not in front of the children, Jack. Hey, Oh, forgive my little outburst, son. Sir. I hold all my superiors in the highest possible esteem. Sir. Right, Arthur, send somebody over to bug Mrs. Apple's phone and make certain they haven't got ten quid on them. I want a quick and thorough job. OK, Jack. Come on, son. We'll grab something to eat and then go and visit old Mother Wendell in the witch's cottage. I hate attending seances on an empty stomach. Always like to have something to bring up. Is it? Police, Mrs. Wendell, open up. Come in. I've been expecting you. The smell clouted us as soon as we stepped inside. An overpowering, acrid stench that rammed itself up our noses and stuck its filthy fingers right down our throats. Blimey, Mrs. Wendell. How many cats have you got in here? There were dozens of them. Dirty, mangy, sore-ridden, incontinent strays. The untouchables of the cat underworld. Oh, cats are welcome here. Sit down. Oh, Tom. <coughs> Get off, you cow, son. Charming. Cats are my friends, Inspector. Please be more careful. I will. I, uh, I expect the spirits have told you why we're here, Mrs. Wendell. Miss Wendell. Oh, Miss Wendell. It's about the missing girl. I haven't seen her. I told your men yesterday. 
It's been suggested you might be able to help us. I understand you claim special powers. You've had proof. You found a tramp. How did you know we'd found him? The reporter told me. <laughs> but there's more death in the woods. <sighs> more death. I see. I see an unmarked grave. Where? What's up with her? I think she's in a trance, sir. Miss Wendell. But don't touch her. It's supposed to be dangerous, sir. Earth. So cold under the snow. So cold. Bones. Old bones. Buried. Where is she buried? The woods. Hollow. Dead. Men's. Hollow. What'd she say? It sounded like Dead Man's Hollow, sir. Is there such a place? Yeah. I don't know its proper name. We've always called it that. But trance or no trance, Miss Wendell, I hope for your sake we don't find Tracy buried there. What do you think, sir? I don't believe in ghosts, son. If we find Tracy buried in Dead Man's Hollow... Then she put her there. She's mad enough to kill a kid if she caught one chucking stones at a lousy cat. But if she killed her, why tell us where she buried her? To divert suspicion from herself. Control to Inspector Frost. Control to Inspector Frost. Come in, please. Control. Frosty. Can you come in at once, please, Inspector? The kidnappers phoned Mrs. Uphill. Denton 2346? Denton 2346? Mrs. Uphill. Yes? Did you get my letter? Where's Tracy? All in good time. You got the money? Yes. Exactly as you said. And you've told no one? No one. I swear. Good. Very sensible. Now listen carefully. Is she all right? Well, all things considered. <laughs> yes. But it's up to you that she stays that way. What do you want me to do? I want... Hello? Hello? That's all there is. So what happened? Was he cut off or what? I'll turn the volume up and replay the last few seconds. I think you'll spot it. Stay that way. What do you want me to do? I want... Hello? Hello? Did you hear the siren? One of our cars must have passed the kiosk. He thought we were on to him and bolted. Blasted uniform branch, always in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oh, uh, hello, sir. Hello, Frost. Did the GPO trace the call? Yes, Jack. Uh, Inspector. The call box on the main Eastern Avenue. Charlie Alpha was in the vicinity, so I've sent them to investigate. No one there, though. Charlie Alpha. It was probably them that frightened him off in the first place. Are they keeping the kiosk under observation? For a while... But I can't see him using the same phone box. Never know your luck. You've had so much vandalism lately, you'll have a job finding another one that works. <clears throat> oh, I am sorry, sir. I'm neglecting you. No, not at all. I just wanted to know how you got on with the Wendell woman. Oh, it was quite interesting, actually. Her cat peed all over us, and then we had a seance. According to her spiritual snouts, Tracy is buried in Dead Man's Hollow. Dead Man's Hollow? Did you take a look? Well, we looked at the four foot of snow covering it, and it looked pretty much like the snow covering everywhere else. I don't think she's there, sir. We've got to check. Organise a digging party. I'm going to phone the chief constable. <sighs> Stupid twit. All right, Arthur, you heard the man. Organise a digging party, evening grass, spades and gumboots. <clears throat> I'll join them in the car park in ten minutes. Job for you too, sir. Yes, sir. Something we forgot. Farnham, Mrs Uphill's Sunday regular. We haven't checked his story with his aunt. Oh, damn. Now, don't forget, she's got a weak heart, so don't show her your suit and go easy with the rubber hose. I'll be in my office if anyone wants me. Yeah? Cup of tea, Inspector. Oh, Tom. Uh, hold on a minute, will you? Push the door shut. Sir? Sit down. You smoke? No, sir. Stringer, is he? Police Constable Derek Stringer? That's right, sir. 
Tell me, son. Well, to within a couple of quid. How much money have you pinched in total? I don't know what you mean, sir. Now, look, son, you might think me useless and decrepit, but I'd be a real right twit if I couldn't solve a simple case of somebody nicking money from my own desk drawer. Money that's always missing after you've been in with the tea. And you took that tramp's quid as well, didn't you? I'm not staying here. I, I, I'm reporting this to the Police Federation representative. If you've got anything further to say... Sit down. Wanted official, son. All right. I'll call the divisional commander in and tell him I want your pockets searched. You see, I marked the money. What happens now? Entirely up to you, son. I've got enough on my plate with missing kids, ransom demands and piddling cats. Come on, Jordan, put a bit of beef into it. If there is a body there, it won't bite you. I just don't like the idea, sir. You don't know how lucky you are. My first corpse was nearly liquid. Oh, Jack? Jack Frost? Who the hell's that? I can see a torch. Oh, no. Hello, Sandy. What are you doing here? I hear you're hoping to dig up another body. Then you hear wrong. This is a police allotment and we're putting in cabbages. Who told you? I have my sources. Uh, by the way, Jack, uh, drop into the office tomorrow. I'll... I've got a little uh, seasonal bottle for you, with our compliments. You'd have better not be too little. Inspector, signs of recent digging here. There's something buried. The girl? No, just some bones. Show me. Here. Give me that trowel. Well, not just bones. I'd say we've got a complete human skeleton. Damn. Just what we needed. It's a skeleton. There seems to be something chained to its wrist. If I could pull... Ooh. Ah. It's, it's a metal case of some kind. A case? Ah. Show me. Yeah. Wait a minute. Oh, I thought so. See what it says, Jack? Just about. Bennington's Bank. Yes. Ooh, the spirits have come up with a goodie this time. I reckon we have here the mortal remains of Rupert Faucus. Who the hell's he, then? Well, it would have been before your time, Jack. Faucus was chief cashier at Bennington's Bank. Back in 1951, he was sent to another branch with £25,000 chained to his wrist and was never seen again. We all thought he'd absconded. Ooh, this'll make the London dailies. 1951? If you weren't here, I'd cover it up and swear we never found him. Work this is going to cause... Here. Do you reckon that money is still in the case? Uh, oh, it's well rusted, sir. Shall I uh, fetch Axel? No. Leave everything. No. It's too complicated for the likes of us. Get control to send a full forensic team down here and a pathologist. Uh, right, and uh, tell him there's no great hurry. Mm. He's been waiting for us for over 25 years. So that's the way I've organised it, Jack. They start searching the outlying eastern sections tomorrow. Good. You must try and remember to turn up at the briefing meeting. Oh, damn, I meant to buy myself a new suit. Oh, Mullet's made a couple of pointed remarks about this one, and... and Ma Wendell's cats haven't improved it either. Unless it's you, Arthur. Thank you very much. Ah, here's young Barnard. Heard about my skeleton, son? Uh, yes, sir. Everywhere I go, I find bodies. Only I could find one about 19 years old with a big chest. Yes, sir. Yeah. When you get a chance, son, nip up the storeroom and dig out the Bennington's Bank file, 1951. Mm -hmm. I'll try and solve that before tea, together with that electronic step thing that Mullet keeps rabbiting about. So what happened with Auntie? She hasn't seen Farnham for nearly three months. Ah, he was lying. I knew it. You can never trust Randy Rascals. Oh, present company accepted, of course, son. Yeah. Mrs. Uphill's phone's ringing. Switch it through at the loudspeaker. Son, get control to ask Charlie Alpha if they can see anyone in the kiosk. Sir. Control, Charlie Alpha, anyone in the kiosk? Gender 2346. Quiet! Remember me? Yes. How's Tracy? <laughs> Do what you're told and you'll be able to see for yourself. Charlie Alpha reports kiosk empty, sir. Damn! Then tell me what to do. Put the money in a carrier bag. Walk with it down the bath road towards Exum. I'll go by car. No. 
walk. You understand? You walk on the left-hand side. Now, just past the antique shop is a public call box. Wait there. I'll ring you with further instructions. Hello, search control. Just a minute. GPO engineer, sir. Can't trace the call. No matter. Get him to monitor all calls from the phone box outside the antique shop. Sir? You, Sims. Sir? Get Mrs. Appel on the phone for me. Sir? Arthur, tell Control to send Charlie Alfred to the antique shop kiosk. No sirens, no flashing lights. They've just got to wait for Mrs. Appel to arrive, right? Mrs. Appel's not answering, sir. Don't tell me she's left already. Damn the woman. Keep trying. Right, sir. Charlie Alfred's in position, Jack. Good. There to report the minute Mrs. Uphill comes into sight. We should have someone following her, sir. Should we, Sam? Bath Road's as straight as a die. Anyone following will be spotted a mile off. Well, nothing to do now but to wait. How long should it take her, Arthur? Ten minutes? Quarter of an hour? Yes. Just a minute. Charlie Alpha, sir. What? Nothing to report. <laughs> Tell him not to be so efficient. I am not interested in nothing. Uh, thank you, Control. Something's gone wrong. She should be there by now. It's a weather, Jack. She won't be able to walk fast in the snow, not in high heels. She wouldn't give a damn about high heels. She'd run barefoot to get her kid back. She's had time to walk all the way to Bath and back by now. Are you sure those two bright Herberts are waiting at the right phone box? Shall I check? No, no. They're not that stupid. Own Mrs. Uphill's house again, Arthur. She might have popped back for something. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Bill. Sorry to butt in, Jack, but you've got Charlie Alpha standing by on the Bath Road, haven't you? That's right. Why? Reckon I could borrow them? We've just had a motorist phone in. He's found a woman unconscious at the side of the road. We've sent for an ambulance, but Charlie Alpha could be there in seconds, and I'd like details. They were just loading the stretcher onto the ambulance as we arrived. It was Joan Uphill. Her face grey and crumpled, her breathing almost non-existent. Jordan? How is she? What happened? We don't know what happened, sir. She's not regained consciousness. She's had a nasty crack on the head, but the ambulance man doesn't think the skull is fractured. It's lucky that motorist spotted her. She could have frozen to death. Yeah, yeah. Did she have anything with her? Only this handbag. Show me. Here. Ooh. Purse is missing. She should have been carrying a plastic carrier bag. Well, that's all there was, sir. Look for it. Held a large sum of money. Give him a hand, son. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is this the gentleman who found her? Yes, sir. Well, he's got all my details. Can I go now? A couple of questions, sir. I'm... Uh... I'm Detective Inspector Frost, Denton CID. Uh, did you see what happened to her? Oh, I've already been through all this. I spotted her in my headlights. I thought she'd been knocked down by a knit and run. I, I didn't expect to have to stand in the cold and answer the same questions twice over. I've got an urgent appointment and I'm late now. Always the way when you try and help, isn't it, sir? <laughs> you got the gentleman's particulars, Constable? Yes, sir. Well, then, I don't think... Sir? That... Yes, sir? There's no sign of it, sir. Ah. You you didn't spot a plastic carrier bag, sir, by any chance? I've already told you everything I saw. I can't help you any more. Uh, you don't mind if we have a look in your boot? Your boot? What the hell is this? I mean, I just stopped to report an accident. Won't take a second, sir. There's some money missing, you see. And you naturally want us to eliminate you from our inquiries. Seems to be locked, sir. Oh, thank you. Just a formality, you understand. I mean, I... Well, well, well. Electronic calculators. Hundreds of them. I think we've just sold one of Inspector Cull's outstanding cases, son. Yes, sir. Now, I believe this to be stolen property, sir. Would you care to explain how it happens to be in your possession? Oh, what rotten, lousy, stinking look. I, mean, I could have driven straight past, left her to die. I don't think you could, sir. You're not that sort. Escort the gentleman to the station, Jordan. Sir. If anyone wants me, I'll be at the hospital. I can't tell you anything. I... I heard a sort of rustling in the hedge, then... something hit me. Next thing I knew, I was in here. You're not too badly hurt, Mrs. Uphill. 
They'll be letting you go home tomorrow. Tracy? Any news of Tracy? No. No, not yet. That man who phoned. It was a trick, wasn't it? We think so, but we'll carry on monitoring your phone just in case. By the way, he took your purse. What was in it? About 20 pounds, my house and car keys. They don't matter. I just want Tracy. This hospital gives me the shadows. My wife was in here, you know. They were very nice. Unrestricted visiting. So there was no excuse for not going. And not a blind thing to talk about. <laughs> People think I miss her terribly. Between you and me, she made my life a hell. I hated her. But she didn't deserve such a rotten death. No one deserves that. Ah, that's better. This con man's only a small-time crook, you know. Why do you say that, sir? 500 quid. She'd have given him ten times that much to... Hold on. Here he's got her keys, and the house is empty. Yes, sir. Feel like taking a little drive down to Vicarage Terrace, my son? We caught the man leaving the back of the house staggering under the weight of two large suitcases packed solid with loot. The plastic carrier bag with the 500 pounds in used notes was on the back seat of his car, lying alongside a purse containing around 20 pounds. We'll need more cells if you go on like this, Jack. By the way, did you know young Derek Stringer has resigned? Has he? I didn't know. Pity. He was a good chap. Could have been another Jack Frost if he'd worked at it. <sighs> one tramp, one skeleton and two crooks. Yeah, not bad. I think we'll call it a day, son. Oh, yes, please, sir. Now, don't let me forget the briefing meeting tomorrow. Tomorrow. Blimey. Do you realise it'll be Christmas Eve? He made the briefing meeting and tried to inject some enthusiasm into the dispirited searchers. No one said anything as they walked out into the snow, but they all knew they were no longer looking for a girl. They were looking for a body. <laughs> Inspector Frost. Oh, well, the elders he want. Wait for me in the office, would you, son? Right here, sir. You want me, sir? We shut the door. Sir. The same suit, I see. Uh, yes, sir. Mm. The chief constable's breathing down my neck. Do you think we'll find the girl today? It's Christmas tomorrow. I'd like to get it all tied up by then. Our chaps deserve a break. So do I. We'll do our best for you, sir. Who's on duty tomorrow? I am, sir. And Boxing Day. Oh, well... It ought to be quiet. Give you a chance to catch up on your paperwork. Where do I file this, sir? There? Oh, blimey, son, give that here. I've been looking for it everywhere. And what's this you've dumped on my desk? The Bennington's bank file, sir. You asked for it last night. Must have been mad. Haven't got time to read that. Frost? Forensic? Hello, how's our skeleton? He was dead, I suppose. What? You sure? Right, I'll be down there as soon as I can. Yeah, well, don't we all want to pack up early for Christmas? Never rains, but it pours. That was forensic, our skeleton. First, there was no 25,000 quid in the metal case, and it hadn't been forced. It had been unlocked with a key. What? But here's the best bit, son. When they cleaned up the skull, they found a bullet hole right through the back of its head. So we got a 25-year-old murder mystery. Oh, God. I think I'll punish myself and go up to the canteen to have the special Christmas lunch. We returned from lunch to find Detective Sergeant Hanlon waiting for us. Well, if it isn't the fat owl of the remove. Clear out, Arthur. There's no tuck for you here. Cheek, I've missed the Christmas lunch because of you. You missed nothing. It was diabolical. You asked me to see that chap Farnham, Jack. 
Farnham? In which of my many current cases does he appear? The schoolmaster. Oh, Mrs. Uphill's bearded regular. And what did he have to say for himself? He admits he lied about having tea with his aunt. The truth is, on his way back to the railway station, he was accosted by a platinum blonde in a leopard skin coat. Cynthia Richmond. Don't tell me she's back on the game. Yes, I've seen her. He was with her until after six. So there's another suspect we could eliminate from our inquiries. Are you all right, sir? I'm all right, sir. I've been having a few drinks with Sandy Lane. <coughs> ah, he's been pumping me about our skeleton and the bullet hole. I met a couple of the search parties coming back. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. She'd been missing since Sunday, and what have I achieved? Damn all. <laughs> I've sold a couple of tubs, saved me little crimes on the side, but I've no more hopes of finding her than I have of finding out who killed that skeleton 20... 25 years ago. Sir? 25 years. Now, how did Martha Wendell know the skeleton was buried there? Uh, she's a clairvoyant. If it's been buried for 25 years, how come her clairvoyant powers hadn't worked before? We were told about the tramp in 24 hours. No, son. There were signs of recent digging. She had dug and she'd uncovered it, and that is how she knew. But why should she go digging in Dead Man's Hollow? To bury a body, son. A child's body. Dear God. But the very place she picked because it was hidden and out of the way had already been picked by somebody else for the very same reason 25 years ago. You know why we're here, Miss Wendell? Yes. I've been expecting you. She came here on Sunday. She threw stones at my cat. And one of them... She killed one of them. Go on. Well, I was so angry, I, I don't know what I did. I, I must have banged her head. I don't know. I, I didn't mean to kill her, just to punish her. Well, I tied the body. I fought a dead man's hollow. But when I dug... You uncovered an older grave. We know. Then what? Well, I waited until night, but your men were still in the woods and... Next day it snowed. Well, I'd have left footprints. So what did you do with her? She's in there. Son? Sir. What will happen to Marquette? I don't know. Inspector! What is it? Good God. Get an ambulance, quick. Sir. You can thank your lucky stars you did uncover that skeleton, Miss Wendell. Otherwise you would have buried her alive. She was alive, but only just. The doctors at the intensive care unit of Denton Hospital were non-committal as to her chances. But we were all keeping our fingers crossed. Back at the station, there were congratulations all round. And Frost's whiskey bottle was much in evidence. I seemed to have been given the evening off. So I took my policewoman out for a meal. And later, returned with her to my digs. And there was Frost waiting for us. <laughs> I'll show you when we get inside. Oh. <laughs> Hello, sir. Oh, damn. Hello, Hazel. Inspector. What do you want, sir? Well, I've been browsing through that Bennington's bank file, son, and I think I know who shot our skeleton. <sighs> I thought it might be nice to get it all tied up before Christmas. Or, uh, are you busy? Turn left at the top here. I appreciate this, son. You must take my guts. Sir. But since I'm on one of my rare winning streaks, I might as well play it for all it's worth. That's the house. And who lives here? A bloke called Powell. Been retired for years, but in 1951, he was Bennington's bank manager. Something of a heavy gambler, by all accounts. And he held one of the two keys that would open the money case. Now, if Powell did kill Forkus, he must be a bag of nerves now he knows we found the skeleton. Big house, 
Must have cost a packet. Who, who is it? Police. Go away. I'm Detective Inspector Frost, Denton CID. Mr. Powell, I'd like to question you about the murder of a Mr. Rupert Forkus on or about the 25th of August, 1951. I, I said, go away. Was that the gun you used? No. <laughs> Nip back to the car, son. Radio for help. Right, sir. Now, look, sir. This is silly. Put the gun down and we can talk. I just want to talk to you. I'd just reached the car when... The man, appalled at what he had done, stared down in disbelief at Frost, a crumpled heap on the snow, looking untidier than ever. Uh, Barnard! Hey? Oh, Mr. Mullet. Any news? Uh, they're operating now, but they're not holding out much hope. Mm. What a shocking business. Today of all days. Yes, sir. His wife died in this hospital, you know. Devoted couple. Absolutely devoted. You hardly knew him, did you, Barnard? No, sir. I hardly knew him. Three days ago, I didn't even know he existed. Leslie Sands starred as Detective Inspector Frost, with Steve Hodson as Detective Constable Barnard, in Three Days of Frost by R.D. Wingfield. Superintendent Mullet was Jack May. Detective Inspector Cowell, Walter Hall. Sergeant Wells, Jonathan Scott. Detective Sergeant Hanlon, Cameron Miller. P.C. Stringer, John Gray. P.C. Jordan, Henry Davis. P.C. Sims, Geoffrey Collins. WPC, Valerie Murray. Joan Uphill, Shirley Dixon. Old Sam, Godfrey Kenton. Farnham, Leslie Heritage. Mrs. Harding, Anne Rosenfeld. Audrey Harding, Anne Winsack. Sandy Lane, Crawford Logan. Mickey Hoskins, Harold Rees. Martha Wendell, Kathleen Helm. And the driver, Michael Tudor Barnes. Three Days of Frost was produced and directed by Graham Gold. Saturday Night Theatre. It all began with a phone call. Police Station, Cambridge. Inspector Buller speaking. Police? Oh, please come quickly. It's young Mr. Fraser. He's dead. I took his breakfast and he's lying on the floor. It's, it's horrible. What address? It's horrible. It's murder, I know. It's... What address are you speaking from? I... 23 Copper Street. He was only an undergrad. This was his first time at the college and... 23 he... Copper Street? No hurry, please. I can't bear it. I'm still in the house. And nobody... Yeah, all right, all right. Now calm down. I'll be over and don't touch anything. Please, sorry. I don't know what... Sergeant. Sir? Emergency call. I'm taking Walters and the police surgeon. Yes, sir. Anything uh, interesting, sir? I don't know. It might be murder. Murder? I said might be, Sergeant. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, sorry. Uh, stand by at the desk. Very good, sir. We present Brewster Mason and Marius Goring in Darkness at Pemberton. Not that I ever took murder for granted. You don't see enough of it in a university town like Cambridge. Besides, it was only a starting point. The moment where reality suddenly and unpredictably hinged onto dream. It touched off the fuse for nightmare.
by the side of what happened afterwards, definitely a mere case of murder. Blow me his brains out, sir. He's in the bedroom, on the floor. We haven't touched him. Uh, thank you, Constable Walters. I've locked the landlady in the dining room. But hysterical. She's cooling off, though. An undergraduate called Fraser shot between the eyes in his rooms. No witnesses, no weapon. Time of death between eight and nine on the evening before. I looked at the body and talked to Fraser's landlady. And then I got an urgent call from my sergeant. I was to go round at once to St. Bernard's College, directly opposite young Fraser's rooms. Hello, Inspector. You found it all right? Yes, Sergeant. Dr. Wilder's looking at the body, sir. Oh, who is it this time? Mr. Beeden, one of the history dons. A bullet through his head. Mm, business picking up. Well, Doctor, looks like suicide. The gun was in his hand. May even have been the same weapon as killed young Fraser. Here on the table, sir. Automatic with a silencer. Only one set of prints on it, Beedon's. Mm. The old town's waking up at last, eh? You're, you're a bloodthirsty brute, Wilder. Well, we haven't had a beano like this since that razor job. <laughs> anyway, I thought you liked a good murder. I like solving them when I get a chance. Is there anything else on this? They both died about the same time, if that's any help. Not later than nine o'clock last night. Mm. Well, sir, it's all right, Sergeant. There's no need to burst. Out with it. Oh, I was just going to say, sir, that, uh, well, that clears it all up, doesn't it? Does it? Well, sir, I, I wouldn't jump to any conclusion, but, well, young Fraser was shot from a distance, beaten from close up. If they were both killed with the same weapon, Beaton must have shot Fraser and then come back into college and shot himself. Yes. Why? Well, the motive will crop up, sir. You get some queer fish in these universities. Mm. You may be right, Sergeant. Uh, look, put up a notice in the porter's lodge. Anyone who came to Beedon's rooms in college last night after seven o'clock, I want to see them. Very good, sir. See you for lunch, Wilder? Yep. Usual place. I'm going to see the master of the college now. Perhaps he'll oblige with a motive. Right you are. No, no, Inspector. I'm, I, I'm afraid I can't. Not the ghost of a motive. Beedon was a thoroughly good don, a little reserved, perhaps, but he'd no enemies, as far as I know. This young man, uh, Fraser, wasn't a pupil of his. I, I, I doubt if he knew him. Mm. Well, that makes it more difficult. Incidentally, I, I called on Beedon myself last night here in college. His lights were on, but the door was locked and I got no reply. What time was that? Um, I, I should say about twenty past eight. I, I just finished dinner in a hall. Did you notice anything unusual? Hear anything? I, I, I heard nothing, except uh, there was a sort of swishing noise, I fancy. I, I, I may have been mistaken. Can you be more definite? What sort of... It was a mechanical sort of noise. Um, like a carpet sweeper? No, no, it was soft and regular. There were no bumps. It may have come from somewhere else, because... Was it a uh, gramophone running down? Yes. The, the, the needle on a gramophone disc, uh, after it had finished the music. There's a gramophone in Beedon's room. Hmm. Well, uh, thank you, sir. That will help us a great deal. Thank you, Inspector. So, someone was alive in Beedon's rooms after eight o'clock. Someone must have put that gramophone on at about... Fourteen minutes past eight. Someone... Who? Who? More leverer. More leverer? Yes, Inspector. I'm a fellow of St. Bernard's. I lecture in chemistry. I saw your notice at the Porter's Lodge. Yes? I'd arranged to go to the theatre on that tragic evening with Beedon and an undergraduate called Weens. There was a light in Beedon's room in college when we called for him, and Weens went up to see if he was ready. He got no answer. That must have been just after eight o'clock. Uh-huh. I went up myself, thumped on the door with my umbrella, and shouted Beaton's name. There was no answer. I stooped down, tried to pull the door open by inserting the tips of my fingers into the keyhole, but it was locked. And then? A gramophone began to play inside the room. A gramophone? I thought it rather rude of him. If we could hear the gramophone, presumably he could hear us. Anyhow, he didn't come to the door, so we went off by ourselves. That's all I can tell you, Inspector. So what? Beedon shoots young Fraser for reasons unknown at 5 to 8. He goes back to his own rooms in college and shoots himself at 8.15. The conclusive evidence being that the bullets were fired from the same gun which is found in Beedon's hand with only his fingerprints on it. 
obvious. An open and shut case. In the bag? Oh, hello, Doc. Yes, Scotland Yard take the obvious view. Case closed. Good show. That wretched bitch of mine's had pups again. Like one? Oh, thanks. I've just been sold one. Ha ha. Good old Scotland Yard. Think they're right? Why not? Ooh, I don't know. We have had our moments of time. Not this time. You know, there's too much confounded evidence. You crawl about on your hands and knees looking for the damn stuff, and when you've got it, you can't make head or tail of it. I don't get this case at all. But the Yard do. Oh, the Yard. They blow you up? Told me I waste too much time on irrelevancies. I've got to learn to discriminate. That's nothing new. Discriminate. Have you seen the evidence? How the blazes am I supposed to... Look, here. Look. Look at these. Photographs? Hmm. The tone arm of Beedon's gramophone. Hmm. Very pretty. You coming round tonight to listen to a spot of Mozart? Oh, hang Mozart. Look at that photograph. Well? I want to know how on earth Beedon put on that gramophone without leaving any fingerprints on the pickup arm. It's the old-fashioned kind. You have to lower the pickup onto the record by hand. Well, there must be some sort of a mark. Well, the arm's been carefully wiped. Do you see? Mm. Except for a slight smudge underneath. Yeah. The catch that starts the record's been wiped in the same way and is also marked underneath, but this time with a distinct line. Mm. Now, why should Beedon want to release that catch with a piece of string? Go on. Discriminate. Well, I wish I could... No comment. Anything else? Mm, the automatic. If you had shot somebody, carried an automatic across the street, put it down to play the gramophone, picked it up and shot yourself, would you have left only one set of prints? He may have wiped it for some reason or other. Oh, it's quite likely, but even then, when he picked it up for the last time, he would have changed his position in his hand. It's to get a grip of it, you know. Mm. Now tell me who shot them both. Oh, <laughs> you be damned. <laughs> no, now why? Why do people start gramophones with string? String is the basis of mechanics. Pulleys, ropes, chains, cranes. String is also used for fastening and for operating from a distance. We pull a string to discharge a cannon. <laughs> now, I don't believe that gramophone had anything to do with it. All suspects cleared? Or weren't there any? Well, once you entertain suspicion, Wiley, you can suspect anybody. I suppose so. Oh, perhaps I just need a holiday. Matter of fact, I had a letter from Sir Charles Darcy this morning. Sir Charles? Yes, he wants me to go up to his place in Derbyshire, you know, Pemberley, this weekend. If I can wind this up... I for... haven't seen him since... Oh, for years. Mm. And that charming sister of his. Uh, Elizabeth, isn't it? Uh, yes. She still live there, too? I, I, yes, I, I believe she does. Ho, ho! Then we must definitely see you clear by the weekend. What the blazes do you mean? Ho, oh, ho! Just that a holiday in Derbyshire will do you good. Oh, yes. If only I can get this confounded case off my mind. Look, Wilder, do me a favor. There may be something we ought to have noticed and haven't. Just in case, I wonder if you'd think over that post-mortem again. I have. Any little thing that you have? I have. And? You're the most selfish man I know. You go on and on about yourself and your own little neuroses. Well, well, now that you've purged your soul, I may as well tell you. Know what I did yesterday? What? I bought a pig. Oh, for heaven's sake. I bought a pig. And I slaughtered it. Though its epidermis was not characteristically human. Oh, please. I shot it dead, first of all, at a distance of four feet. Then I shot it point blank. Then I cleaned the gun and shot it first of all point blank and again at four feet. In each case, the second wound was fouler than the first, no matter what the distance of the discharge. Go on. The history Don Beaton was shot before young Fraser. I said that Beaton was shot before young Fraser. Yes, go on. I've redissected both Fraser's wound and Beaton's. Uh, Fraser's wound was the fowler. I've corroborated from microscopic examination of the bullets. So Beaton was shot first. That makes a difference, Wilder. In fact, it makes all the difference. Discriminate, huh? 
Case reopened. Come on, let's work it out. That holiday in Derbyshire? Uh, that'll have to wait. Here, pencil and paper. Now, come over here. This is going to be interesting. Right. Now then, let X be the murderer. We know that young Fraser didn't commit suicide. So let's see what follows. Come in. Inspector Buller. Come in. I have a rather grave matter to discuss with you, Mr. Molevera. May I see you in private? Certainly, certainly. Have some sherry. Uh, no, uh, thank you. I'll do without a drink. Oh, as you like. Well, I hope you don't mind if I drink myself. I've just been lecturing. Makes one so thirsty. Well, now you've come, I hope we'll have a pleasant chat. I doubt it, sir. Really? Why did you kill Beedon? My dear Inspector... I hope you don't go about saying this sort of thing to everybody. If you wish to, you can report me to my superiors. Now, don't go off like that. I don't take any offence. But you really can't go about accusing people of murder without telling them why. Uh, I shouldn't have come. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Are you free for an hour? We might take a little walk towards Grantchester while you explain yourself. Uh, look, there's no point. Uh, I made a mistake in coming. And nevertheless, you won't retrieve it by going. Now, you must explain yourself, you know, in common decency. I have no common decency. Not in my profession. Come along. Just a short walk. If you expected to get something out of me when you first came, why shouldn't you expect it still? Come, take your hat. Oh, you came alone. Well then, come, Inspector. I have something to tell you. Or perhaps you don't think so. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, turn down here. We'll avoid the crowds. I am sorry to have had to drag you out. Walls have ears, you know, and we scientific criminals get a little pernickety. Mm, you were unwise to drink that sherry. Not at all. You may be sure I'm not putting myself in any difficulties. I understand. Now I'm going home. Don't be a fool. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Pupils, uh, what was I saying? Yes, I gather from your behaviour that you haven't the evidence to convict since you haven't even warned me. Your call was just an effort to startle an advantage. Well, go on with it. After all, there may be something to be gained, if only in studying my mentality as revealed by conversation. Besides, I enjoy pulling your leg. I don't enjoy having it pulled. Goodbye. Inspector, I insist on talking to you. I shall tell you exactly how everything was done. Ah, we can lean on the bridge and bask. It's quite comfortable. I don't think I shall bore you. Here, I think. The delights of punting. Sailing down the river, eh, Inspector? When I was a boy, I used to lean over this bridge and drop pebbles as the punts glided underneath. It was usually someone asleep on their back. And one is so defenseless in a punt, don't you think? What do you want to tell me? Quite a lot. Quite a lot. I suppose you've established the priority of the wound by the autopsy. Mm. You'd never have thought of looking into that so closely if it hadn't been for an accident. It was that wretched pick-up arm and catch. Go on. I wanted to kill Beaton because I believed the master was getting shaky. Beaton would have taken the master's place if he'd survived him. Now I shall get it. I'm poor, you know, and there's your motive. I wanted to make it suicide. I got hold of an unregistered Belgian automatic. It might just as well have belonged to Beedon as to me. And then I made my plan about the gramophone. I proposed to prop the pickup arm on a thin tripod of ice standing on the record so that it would be knocked over when the record started. Then one only needed to release the catch for the needle to fall on the record, which was already revolving. It had a sound of the chap I was with as though somebody was putting it on quite normally. Now I was to release the catch by means of a loop of string through the keyhole of the door. When the catch was released, you merely let go of one end of the string and pull the whole length out. Only Beedon's finger marks would be left on both catch and pick-up arm. So, you see, I certainly did not intend to give him that suspicious wiping, without which you would have remained permanently in the dark, wouldn't you? Well, wouldn't you, Inspector? I suppose I would, yes. You see, it wasn't a stupid crime. I took enormous pains over it. The ice bridge, for instance. I made it myself in the university laboratories, so that it would melt in exactly 20 minutes. But as you say, Inspector, the best laid schemes, etc. What went wrong? I went into Beedon's room and shot him according to plan. He was more surprised and vexed than anything else and couldn't believe his senses while he had them. Then I turned to the gramophone. 
perhaps rather morbidly, I had myself given Beedon the record which I proposed to play for his funeral march, uh, chiefly to encourage him to play the gramophone and leave some nice fresh fingerprints. I found the record was on already. This made me look at the pickup arm through my magnifying glass. I was doing the thing scientifically, you must admit, and I was horrified to find my own fingerprints. That wretch Beedon actually hadn't touched the machine since I gave him the record and played it to him myself two days before. I just had to wipe the catch and the pickup arm. You recognized your own fingerprints? Of course. <laughs> I know most people know what color their own eyes are, but if you are familiar with their fingers, I think that's an omission. You rectified it in good time, Mr. Molivero. Naturally. Mind you, I still don't think you'd have noticed it at all if it hadn't been for the other miscarriage of plan. Other? Both miscarriages, I claim, were unforeseeable. Hello, sir. Oh, uh, sorry to depart in. Uh, hello, you... my dear chap. Are you on your way to rehearsal? Yes. Will you be coming along tonight, sir? I'll be looking in later on. Glorious evening, isn't it? Grand, sir. See you later, huh? Bye. Awfully keen chap there. Not much good at his work, but we're putting on much ado about nothing next week. I can get you a ticket if you wish. You were saying uh, the other miscarriage of plan? Oh, yes. Well, I'd wiped the automatic and put it in Beedon's hand, and I was just fixing my piece of string round the gramophone catch so that both ends came through the keyhole when I happened to glance out across Copper Street. That unfortunate undergraduate was standing at the window of his rooms opposite, staring at me open-mouthed. He'd seen everything. And I went straight out. I had to chance it. Walked into his rooms. He was waiting for me with an expression of horror and expectation. I shot him dead. Just bad luck? Rotten luck, yes. And nothing against him, of course. Oh, of course. Then I went to find friend Weems. When we were outside Beedon's door together, I pulled the loop of string under the pretense of trying to open the door. The catch was released. Ice prop upset. Needle dropped onto disc. Stark on that landing. Weens had no idea what I was doing. He never even saw the string. Well, that's, uh, that's all. If you've finished, I'll be going. Oh, oh just one more thing, Inspector. You should have devoted more time to the porter who was on duty that night. The porter? Mr. Rudd, I believe. He saw me coming out of young Fraser's digs. He was coming out of the Crown Arms at the time. But he didn't say anything to me about... I know. He didn't tell you he'd seen me for two reasons. First, because it implied that he must have left the lodge while on duty. And second, because he had not actually connected me with the crimes. Why should he? He was a stupid man, fortunately. For his would have been the one tangible piece of evidence you could have offered against me at a trial. Without his evidence, even on the full reconstruction which I have offered you, you will realize that, of course, no jury will convict. Now, the evidence is negative only. Now? Yes, now. But don't let me keep you from going to see the porter. What have you done to him? That, that, run along and see. I can promise you... Oh, don't hurry. Don't hurry. Shall I send you that ticket? We found the porter in the river with his throat cut. And, of course, no clues. One can't help him admiring him, in a way. Admire him? Three poor blighters turning into worms just because that little whippersnapper... Oh, I suppose I ought to feel sorry for him. Sour grapes, old boy. Oh. Well, anyway, you can take that holiday in Derbyshire now. Yes, yes, it's Pemberley for you. You might at least be grateful to him for arranging that. Oh, yes. Cheer up. I'm going home to sulk. I'm out of pocket on this, that confounded pig. Have to eat it now, I suppose. Remember me to Sir Charles? Yes, of course. Oh, and Elizabeth. And forget all about this. Try and get a real holiday. Bye-bye, old man. Enjoy yourself at Pemberley. Thank you, Kingdom. Yes, I did. It's always a pleasure to come up to Pemberley. Sir Charles will be down directly, Miss Elizabeth. Thank you, Kingdom. I'll see to the tea. Yes, Miss. Oh, you know, Kingdom must be the oldest butler in the world. <laughs> he is, and he's always right. It is good to see you. Tea? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. We don't get many visitors at all nowadays out in the wilds. And, of course, Charles doesn't encourage them. You're privileged. Mm. Thank you. How is Charles? Well, I don't know. He's been so odd. Ever since 
That terrible accident, you know. Well, hasn't he got over it yet? No. It's my fault, I suppose. I am only his sister, but I ought to be no, able no, to... No, no, you're not to blame in the least, Miss Darcy. Give him time. He'll recover. Will he? He'd only been married for four months, you know. And he was driving awfully fast. Mm, it wasn't his fault. He won't see it. All he knows is that Irene was killed. Mm, and he blames himself. Yes. And it's dull here at Pemberley, you know. He lives like a hermit. Did I ever tell you, when he first came back from the hospital, he tried to kill himself? No. Not suicide, not really. Riding point to point all day long, charging his fences. But he killed his favourite grey mare instead, oh. broke her neck. Poor Charles. Anyway, let's not talk about it. It's so nice to get in touch with the great big world outside. We've been following this case of yours, you know, in the papers. Oh, that... Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't talk shop. But we're such great fans of yours. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And Charles insists that... Oh, Charles, we've just been pulling you to pieces. Hardly necessary. Hello, man. Good to see you. Hello, Charles. Glad to be back. What the hell's all this we've been reading in the papers? Charles. Oh, he doesn't mind. Do you, old man? Or am I lacking in tact? No, no, not at all. No, I get enough of that in my job. You have got a job, then, according to the papers. No. No, it's quite true. I haven't got I resigned before I came away. But let's have another log on, Charles. This room gets so drafty. All right. The baronial hall. Then change the subject. What do you mean by resigning? Oh, Charles, don't you think that... I don't mind talking about it, Miss Darcy. It's over and done with. I resigned because I had no alternative. But surely it isn't your fault if you can't catch a murderer. No. Besides, you can't be expected to find out who did it straight away. Well, the trouble is that I have found out who did it. And I can't prove it. Well, they can't kick you out for that, surely. No, I've not exactly been kicked out. Why did you resign? General disgust. What at? At my profession. I'm afraid I've been a fool. What's wrong with your profession? Oh, nothing. It's a good profession. In fact, it's a magnificent profession. But I've been a fool. Well, then. I suppose what really made me do it was disgust with myself. You must tell us about it. Well, you see, if I'd acted promptly, I might have saved this last victim. But why can't you catch the chap? You say you know who he is. Yes, oh, yes, he's still there in Cambridge. But we can't prove anything against him. What happened? The three men were killed by a fellow of St. Bernard's, a man called Molevera. He says he did it for gain, but that's nonsense. He did it because he's a born murderer, just for its own sake. The history Don Beden did stand in his way, of course, and the idea must have occurred to him that he could get rid of him by murder, so he set to work to plan it out with the enthusiasm of a maniac chess player. And I'm afraid he pulled it off. But that's appalling. Do you mean to say that in this country, in this century, a man can be known to be a murderer and not be punished? Mm, I'm afraid so. Tell us more about this blighter. More leverer or whatever it is. Yes, more leverer. What did you like to know? More about him, himself. I don't know. He's a small man, rather petty and neat. I dare say he feels inferior about his personal appearance, and that contributed to his motives to, uh, you know, to sort of reassert himself physically. I should think he bullies his pupils. It doesn't sound very much fun. No, not very nice. But what worries me is that he might do it again. He'll get a craving for the excitement, the, the mental stimulus. And if he does, he'll keep on with it. Now, that's why I'm afraid of him. It, it's that I don't, it's that tiny light of insanity, of incomprehensible chaos behind the eyes. He sounds evil. Yeah, evil. Come on, old man, polish off that scar, and I want to show you my new rifle range. Oh, look at the time. I'm going to see Cook about dinner, and you don't have to be polite. If my brother bores, you say so. <laughs> oh, go away. <laughs> Coming, old boy? Yes. Yes, I'd love to. Good shot. Mm, not bad. Now, let's see what you can do. Right. How do you think Liz is looking? Oh, uh, yeah, very well. She's lonely here, you know. Not much fun for her, playing the good companion to me. I know. Why? And I can't talk her into going away. No? Isn't it about time you were married, huh? Oh, I, I beg your pardon? You're in love with her, aren't you? Oh, no, really, Charles. Well, aren't you? I have a great regard for uh, uh, Miss Darcy, naturally, but... And she's uh, crazy about you, my dear chap, so what are you waiting for? 
You must admit it's pretty hard lines on the poor spectator. You and Liz see each other once a year, so for two weeks every spring, I can't get a word of civilized conversation out of either of you. You sit and eye each other like a couple of frustrated sheep. I suppose you think it's beneath her dignity to marry a policeman. No, no, it's not that. And if you don't intend to marry her, you should be ashamed of yourself, keeping the poor girl on tenterhooks. And don't tell me you come up here specially to see me. Oh, look, Charles, you know, even if I thought that, uh, that uh, Miss Darcy wanted to marry me... I... And she does. Well, look, uh, even if I thought that, that I... that, that she perhaps... Oh, what... Give me that stuff. Bullseye! Good show, man. You can still here. Especially for you, Mr. Buller. You are in favor, my dear. We can't get this stuff out of it. What time is dinner? Eight. Here's the dog. Yes, it's got to be in bed, Alice. See what you've let yourself in for, old man. The life healthy. Mm. Liz says you've got to get in a good hour's steeple chasing every day before breakfast. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Wonderful or not, it's decided. You can forget all about Cambridge and your miserable old maniac. You're on holiday, and it's going to do you good if it kills you. And it probably will. Mm. Up at the crack of dawn, eh? Oh, well, nothing like it. As Liz would say, you don't have to be polite. Come on, old man. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Miss Elizabeth. Good morning, Kingdom. Hello, Kingdom. I trust you enjoyed your ride, sir. I'm really rather fond of horses, Kingdom, but uh, I don't think they like me very much. Oh, do they not, sir? Nonsense. You're a new man already. What's for breakfast? Ah, kidneys. The coffee on the sideboard, Miss Elizabeth. Thank you, Kingdom. Come on, my dear. Eat. Ah. Mmm. Coffee? I'll pour. You devour. Oh, this is happiness. In spite of the horses, in spite of everything. Pemberley in the spring, coffee and kidneys. And kingdom. And kingdom. Where's Charles? Charles? Hmm. Oh, yes. Charles. Where's he got to? I, uh, wanted to speak to you about Charles. Yes? What about him? It's just... Yes? Uh, my dear, I believe he's gone to murder that Don of yours. He's gone to... It's not surprising, really. After he went to bed last night, he came to talk to me in my room. Now Kingdom tells me he's gone off. Do you mean he told you he was going to kill Mulleverer? Oh, no, he didn't say anything about it. He, he said he was bored with life, that he had nothing to live for, no friends, that there were too many crooks going scot-free nowadays. So now he's going to see that justice is done. Well, he must be mad. Well... I suppose it is a question of justice, in a way. But I don't see how... Anyway, he's sick of life here. He says he wants to do something. Well, there are other things, you know, besides murder. Yes. Though I don't really see Charles murdering anybody. Still, I'm frightened. He hasn't been out of the grounds for ages. Hmm. Anyway, perhaps he'll come to his senses in time and change his mind. I wish I'd known. I'd have changed it for him. Your coffee's getting cold. Huh? Oh, yes. Or perhaps he won't find Malevera at all. Well, if he does, I only hope he breaks it gently. You insolent young puppy. Get out. Not yet, Mr. Malevera. You see, I believe him. Do you now? How very trusting. You made me break this wine glass. I think you're as sizable a swine as I ever wish to meet. You are impudent. Does the truth offend you? If what you heard is the truth, you may find me dangerous. Or hadn't that occurred to you? Apparently, I am quite clever. Small boys kill flies. It doesn't make them you clever. You dare to... As for being dangerous, I agree you are in the same way as a snake. But you won't be much longer. My dear Sir Charles, if Scotland Yard can't do anything, I'm afraid you don't stand much chance. Why don't you run along home? Your conversation may be considered brilliant in the backwoods. I find it childish. Well, I said you were vain. If you had anything to be proud of, but you haven't. Not a single decent impulse. It's a contemptible sort of vanity, isn't it? Get out. So I... contemptible that I'm going to rid the world of its presence. And how are you going to do that? I'm going to kill you. What a very humanitarian thought. I take it that you can think... I know what I'm talking about. Or hasn't it occurred to you that I might kill you first? I'm giving you one week to live. Why, you bumptious little puppet. Do you think you could talk like that to me? To me? But well, try to kill me by all means. Go on, try. I wish you luck. By God, you'll need it. One thing, though, before you start, make your will. Be sure to do that. 
Make your will, Sir Robin Hood. Now, get out. Go on, get out. Get out. So I got out. Gladly, I suppose. Yes, the whole thing made me feel sick, but once I'd started, I had to go through with it. Now I've had time to think it over, I don't feel so perky. I suppose I was a fool. Yes. And what are you going to do now? I don't know. I can't just hide behind a bush and pot him sitting. That would seem rather silly. Damn silly. But after all, he didn't give the history Don Beaton a fair fight, or young Fraser, or that porter. Wouldn't it be fair to give him a taste of his own medicine? It'll be fair enough, but I can't do it. Oh, good old sporting standards. <laughs> so now you're stuck. Yes, you seem to like rubbing it in. Oh, yes, of course, I'm delighted. Now, the best fun will be explaining to my late colleagues how you came to be murdered. What do you mean? If you want a fair fight, my dear man, you're going to get it. Only it won't be fair. Great heavens, man, do you think you can go and talk that sort of stuff to a homicidal maniac and get away with it? Well, that bit about making my will, you mean? Oh, he didn't mean that. I was rude to him. Oh, my dear Charles, you know, you're the most trusting man I know. How you managed to get through life without doing something you... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean it that way. Yes, you did, and you're quite right. Malevera said the same thing. But damn it, I must be able to trust my own judgment sometime. Not this time, Charles. Listen, Molevera is a killer. He's committed three murders with complete success and has no reason to believe that he'll be caught if he commits another. He enjoys his success, and he would be delighted to increase it. If you think he'll try to kill me, I'm very glad to hear it, but I don't believe he'll come here to Pemberley to do it. No, full term ends tomorrow, and he'll sneak off to hide himself somewhere on the continent. May you long continue to think so. Amen. Come on, it's late. Let's sleep on it. breakfast. No, 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 please don't get up. Oh, you look as though you've had a rough night, Charles. Thanks. I say, this has rather upset the apple cart, this blasted rain. Now we shall have to play billiards all morning. Well, it's rather a relief to me. I, I don't mean to be rude, but I had nightmares about that horse. <laughs> I wasn't at all looking forward to meeting it again. I'm glad you said that. I couldn't agree more. But I thought you were mad about it. Well, our visitors always go on so about the joys of country life. They expect us to adore everything about it, so we pretend to, out of politeness. Oh. Frankly, I hate horses. When I think of what I went through yesterday morning... <laughs> out of politeness. I'm speechless. <laughs> Marmalade, please. Thanks. It's Dempsey, old man. Your friend Molevera nearly had his chances spoiled for him this morning. What do you mean? Well, I, I was out by the stables before breakfast, and a tile came off the roof just as I was passing. Missed me by inches. A tile? Yes, came out a hell of a bat. I was lucky not to... Where are you off to? You wait there. Oh, you can't go out without a coat. Can't he? <sighs> ah, I shouldn't have said anything. I suppose he thinks more lever is taking pot shots at me from the stable roof. <gasps> Charles, do you think... Not a chance, I get. Old Buller's got professional nerves. Trouble is, he's nothing else to think about. I tell him it's high time he married you. It'd do him a world of good, but... Um... Jeez, you didn't. Of course I did. It's true, isn't it? If it is, it's nothing to do with you. Well, I have to put up with a pair of you. Oh, he must have been frightfully embarrassed, poor dear. You know how sensitive he is. Well, that's sensitive. Good God. Of course he is. <gasps> anyway, why should he if he doesn't want to? Well, of course he wants to, the poor fish, and he's afraid to ask. I think you better propose to him, Liz. Clear the air all round. That's out of the question. Yes, he'd probably think you had designs on him. He'd be frightened off for life. Then what you could possibly have designs on, I, I can't think... I think you're revolting, Chiz. Telling him... Uh, shut up, my girl. Here he is. Well, old man... Did you find the dreaded maniac lying up there with a catapult? Hmm, more or less. Oh, your coat's wet through. Take it off this minute. What do you mean, more or less? Oh, well, the stableman has looked at that roof. He says the tiles are as sound as they were when they were first put on. There's absolutely no reason why that single tile should have been dislodged. Do you mean to say... Our friend has come into residence. Oh, come off it, old boy. Charles, you just don't know this man. You've met him once and you both said you'd kill each other. Now, you're not so keen on the idea, so you think he'll fight shy of it, too. Well, he won't. I do believe you want the chap to kill me, just to brighten up your holiday. Don't be ridiculous. Look, whatever we want or don't want, you've raised a hornet's nest. And we poor chumps have no alternative but to guard you as though you were the Bank of England. I absolutely refuse to be coddled on the off chance that some miserable maniac may be after me. What is there to be afraid of? We don't know. Except that Molevera will try to kill Charles. I'm quite certain about that. How? Your guess is as good as mine. 
He'll certainly have to kill Charles in some way which leaves himself beyond suspicion. So Charles will have to be killed. I, I hope this doesn't depress you, Charles. No, no, I get quite a kick out of it. Charles will have to be killed either so that he seems to have died a natural death or by an accident. I suppose it will be all right when we get used to the idea. Now, look here. Granting all that, and granting that Molever is lurking about the ground somewhere, which I don't believe for a moment, what then? What are we going to do about it? Well, will you take my advice? Let's hear it first. No, no, no. Either you believe me and consent to act under my orders, or you must go your own way. I utterly disbelieve you, and I'm quite content to go my own way. Charles. Damn it all. It's my affair. It's between me and Mulnivera. If we're going to take pot shots at each other, that's our business. Um, I shall leave by the next train, and I shall notify the police. You will have a posse of constables on your doorstep. Now, look here. Uh, Charles, please. It's serious, Charles. Of course it is. We can't just sit back and wait for you to be killed. Supposing I get him first? You don't even know where he is. But it's against the rules, old boy. I said I'd kill him myself. I didn't say I'd rally all my chums to help me. I'm talking about protecting you, not killing him. But this is intolerable in my own house. Charles, please. Oh, go on, for heaven's sake, and don't bully. Right. Now, we're going to search the house and grounds. Then you are going to be locked up in your bedroom till further orders with a guard inside and outside it. I hope I shall be allowed out occasionally every third armistice day or something. Seriously, we can hardly keep the poor thing locked up forever. I know. He deserves to be, but we can't. But he's going to be locked up for the next six days. Because if I know Molevera, he'll try to kill you within the week you gave him to live. That would strike him as a neat joke. And if he doesn't? He's patient enough to wait for years. So what? So, after this week, I'm afraid we shall have to do what you said. And what was that? Kill Malevera. Oh, for Pete's sake. No, I can't let you be mixed up in this. Of course not. It's my affair. It's our affair. We have the misfortune to be your friends and relations. I'm surprised that you are, man, an ex-minion of the law, suggesting Look, that we... Look, damn it, Charles, do you think I want to kill the man? I don't want a skeleton like that in my cupboard. What else can we do but kill him? But you can't. Apart from the fact that it isn't done, it's a hundred to one we shan't pull it off. Anyway, it's in self-defense when you come to think of it. That doesn't make it right. And besides, it's Charles' funeral, not yours. I absolutely agree. So shut up, both of you. I am going to find Molevera now, alone, to kill him with my bare hands. Don't be a fool. We can decide who's going to kill him later. The first thing is to prevent him killing you. Let's search the house. Oh, all right. I'll get the staff together. You are the most infuriating guest I've ever had in my life. I shall never invite you to Pemberley again. Right, now lock that door. Stay guard on the landing. Kingdom, Kingdom, make sure that window's locked. Catch me if you can. Search diligently. Every room, every attic, every cupboard. Fasten the windows, lock the doors, plug the keyholes. Wait, haven't you forgotten something? Get a, get a ladder, Smith, will you? I, I think there's a lock up here. Quite right. Leave no stone unturned, Inspector. It's a big house, Pemberley, isn't it? It'll be a long job, even with how many of you? Butler, chauffeur, gamekeeper, the servants and the cooks, seven, eleven. It'll take you all morning, all afternoon because you can't afford to miss anything. Right, now the grounds. Kingdom, you wait in the main hall. Now the grounds. Leave the butler to guard the main hall. Be sure he locks the door. It's getting dark. You should really have warned him to put the lights on. But of course he's lived at Pembley all his life. He doesn't believe anything can go wrong. But hurry, Inspector. It's getting dark. did you see? A pair of hands, sir. White hands. Pull yourself together, <laughs> Kingdom. What is it? What's he seeing? Kingdom, what did you see? Hands, white the hands. It, it laughed. What laughed? Didn't you see his face? Oh, his eyes, his horrible great eyes, staring. Was the front door open? No, no, sir. I locked it inside like you told me. I was standing in the hall. Oh, damnation. We'll have to search the house again. Turn all the lights on. Check on every window, every door, every room. Yes, sir. Oh, Smith. Yes, Smith. Smith, go around the outside of the house with a torch and see if any of the windows are open. Yes, sir. What's this? He must have dropped it. Hmm? 
toothbrush. Oh, what the devil did he want with a toothbrush? Yeah, let's have a look at that. It's mine. Yes. How the blazes did that get on here? It was in my room. Give it to me. But I'll take it if you don't mind. Oh, all right, but Charles... Do you think Smith could get over to Cambridge in the car and be back before breakfast tomorrow? Well, yes, if it's important. It may be. I'd like to send this to a friend of mine. It's just an idea. Okay, go ahead. I'll check with the staff, sir. All the downstairs windows are locked, but Sir Charles's windows open at the top, and so's yours. So either he got in through a second-floor window to get the toothbrush, or he filtered through the wall. <laughs> are there any secret passages, Charles? I don't think so. No ghosts? Not that I know. Hmm. Now what? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I do. We're going to have some dinner. I'm famished. Me too. Come on. You can plan your campaign over the game pie. I can never think on an empty stomach anyway. <laughs> I suppose we may as well. Lead on. Bread for you, Charles. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Kingdom. This looks good. Uh, lobster soup, sir. Your favorite, is it? Oh, yes, so it is. How do you know? You said how fond you were of it the last time you were here. To die, by Joe. Kingdom, you deserve a medal. Oh, no, sir, not me, sir. It was Cook. She never forgets. <laughs> what did I tell you? Well, I'm deeply touched. Kingdom, you and Cook had better share that medal. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Your soup, Sir Charles. Thank you, Kingdom. Sorry about the scare you had. Oh, it wasn't what you'd call a scare, sir. Just unusual, if you know what I mean. We do. It's always been so peaceful here. And then tonight, uh, if I may say so, sir, it is... Not fitting. No, absolutely right, Kingdom. Sorry, anyway. Well, what are we waiting for? Tuck in. No, don't touch it. Lord, what a fool I am. Why don't I think of it before? Think of what? The soup. It may be poisoned. Poisoned? Really, old chap, what are you going to think up next? Listen, Charles. Look, I'm damned if I'm going without my soup just on the off chance that some halfway's been putting poison in it. Charles, do you think... Anyway, if he had, we'll jolly soon find out. But, Charles, don't be such a... Mm -hmm. Kingdom! Kingdom! What the devil's wrong with this soup? The soup, sir. Yes, the soup. It's foul. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid I... Somebody's been mucking about with it and it's not funny. Oh, no, sir. I will ask you to come round, sir. Yes, please do. Charles, are you all right? Yes, of course I'm all right. Did you swallow any? Of course I did. It was a revolting. Good I do believe you're at the back of this, Buller. You're just trying to scare me. Oh, not guilty. Anyway, you still look all right. Of course, it may take time to act. If it's strychnine, your toes will gradually begin to curl up. If it's laudanum, you'll be speechless before long, which will be some slight relief, I must say. But then it may be prussic acid, in which case you'd be dead already. Charles, you're such a fool. Oh, shut up, both of you. Cook, sir, yes, sir. Oh, hello, Cook. Come on in. Good evening, sir. Now then, Cook, is there any reason why the soup should taste odd tonight? No, sir never heard of such a thing. I made it from the very best fresh lobster, as I always do. And nobody could have tampered with it? I've been in the kitchen all the time, so no, I don't see how anyone could. This is the basin. I'll mix it in. Still half full. Let me look. Have we got a spoon? Yeah. Thanks. You won't find anything wrong with that, sir. Must have been after it left the kitchen, because... Well... Never. Now, someone's got a warped sense of humour. All right, Cook, thank you very much. I, I wouldn't do a thing like that, sir. My age? Why, it's... it's all right, Cook. We know who did it. Now go back to the kitchen and don't worry. No, miss. Well, Charles, you see what I mean? All right. All right. Now what? Well, we may as well get on with dinner. But... I think we're safe enough now, for the time being. Malever is just showing us what he can do if he sets his mind to it. Playing on our nerves, you mean? Mm, roughly that. Anyway, I, I don't think he'll poison us tonight. It, it'll be too much of an anticlimax. No, I think we can enjoy our game pie in peace. But we'll have to live on tins from now on. Exactly. Now, for the immediate future... It's vital that we give Malevera as few chances as possible. We've got to close all loopholes. So I'm going to sleep in your room, Charles, and we'll take it in turns four hours to stretch. Right. Uh, Miss Darcy, uh, you must lock your door and keep your window shut. 
Don't open the door unless you're sure who's outside. Uh, there isn't any danger, but we must work out a system. Of course. Good. Well, we've started in earnest. I seem to have put my foot well and truly in it, oh boy. I'm sorry. No, that's all right, Charles. We'll sort it out, all right. I, I don't know how, but we will. Anyway, there's nothing else we can do for the moment, except wait. <laughs> What's that? Oh. Getting jumpy. Wake up. It's morning. Oh, sir. Oh, oh. Morning? Oh. Mm. Morning. Good morning. And what a morning. Miss Darcy, uh, you remember Dr. Wilder? Of course I do. Hello. Hello, Miss Darcy. My dear Wilder, how nice to see you again. Boat race day, wasn't it? In... Uh... Must have been years ago. Didn't Oxford win? <laughs> Uh, how are you, Sir Charles? He's the fellow I sent the toothbrush to. As a delicate hint, I thought in rather bad taste. <laughs> Incidentally, I am gig crash. Nonsense, you're very welcome. But you must be absolutely exhausted. Uh, driving through the dawn, yes. I'll fix you some coffee. Thanks. Help yourself to breakfast. Grant. Well, come on, come on. What about it? That's what I want to know. You can't have an expert opinion without fee. I'm afraid this isn't public property. Bootlegging or murder? Sorry, it isn't my secret. Well, the toothbrush is mine. Uh, uh, forgive my abruptness, Miss Darcy. But Buller's so punctilious that he has to be stampeded into everything. Yes, I... Here's your coffee, Wilder. Oh, uh, thanks. Well, actually, you know, it's, it's up to you, Charles. Go ahead, old boy. Hang to hide. Wilder's safe, isn't he? If he's as keen as all that, he'll be jolly useful. Uh, can we put him up, Liz? Certainly, if you'd like to stay, Doctor. Oh, but it isn't exactly a house party. If it was, I wouldn't. Good man. Now, who's murdering who? My dear, the whole house is a shambles. Splendid. I shall give everybody a certificate of death from natural causes. You finish your breakfast and don't talk so much. I'm listening. Why is everyone being so jolly reticent? There's nothing secret about it. It's Malevera. Malevera? Mm, he's here somewhere. He's trying to bump me off, and I'm supposed to be doing the same for him. Better and better. But Buller won't let me. He locks me up in my room, and I miss all the fun. Now, Wilder, what about Charles's toothbrush? Oh, it's yours, is it? Yes. Well, I hope you haven't used it lately. It's simply crawling with diphtheria. Diphtheria? Yes, fun, isn't it? Fun? Charles? It's all right, old girl. Malevera's idea of a joke, I suppose. Yeah. Not a very good one. Natural death what you said he'd do yesterday before it happened. Yes. You don't suppose he heard you? Because if he did, if he'd already treated the toothbrush and then heard us, he'd certainly have changed his mind. Pride. So I couldn't say, I told you so. But it's preposterous. How can he have heard? How can he get into any room he likes? Well, if you mean... No, I haven't told you. You haven't told us what? I suppose I should have mentioned it sooner. Mentioned what? Well... I locked my door and bolted my window last night, as you told me. I looked in the cupboards, under the bed, and up the chimney. I was absolutely terrified, but I did. Then I went to bed. When I woke up, someone had drawn a face on my dressing table mirror, with my own lipstick. Were your door and window still fastened when you woke up? No. The door was open, but the key was still under my pillow. Miss Darcy, this isn't very nice for you. No. Liz, you've got to go away at once. No. Just for a week, you could stay in the village. If you turn me out, I shall walk round the grounds in my nightgown. But Miss Darcy, it would be much better if... No. Why don't you all plump for police protection? I wish we could. But even if we could get it on a flimsy story like this, it would only work for a few days. 
any case, if we have police protection, we can't polish off Mulevera. And that's the only real way of protecting Charles. Murder? Yes, I have no compunction about it. It's a case of self-preservation. I see. And how do you propose to get Mulevera? Well, to put it crudely, the bait is here in Charles. And if we can make it a trap, we must do. We can only sit over the bait and hope for the best. I don't object to being a bait, not in the least. But I'm going to find it boring being shut up in a room away from all the fun. Also, it's bad for the nerves, you know. Nerves? In a couple of days, nobody will be able to hear any strange noise without screaming. <laughs> oh, what's that? It's only some soot from the chimney. You'll have to keep your chimney swept, Miss Darcy, if we are going to keep sane. My dear, actually, they've just been swept. I did my spring cleaning early. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly hysterical, I think, that laughter. Well, the day dragged itself out, but nothing happened. Charles grew more and more bored, Wilder more and more facetious, and Miss Darcy... Well, I suppose we ought to have insisted that she went to stay in the village, but... At last, the spring twilight came down in rain and the darkness gathered about the eaves and crept up the great staircase. The clocks steadied themselves for their lonely concerts of the night. The house congealed again into silence. Human patience of clocks. What the devil? Charles! Charles! What? What is it? What's up? It's, uh, it's across from the servants' quarters. Get a coat on. Right. Come on. I'll be right with you. What the blazes is going on? What is it? Kingdom, did you hear that scream? What, I, what the blazes is going on? Oh, it's cold out here. I'm freezing. Yes, I, I'm sorry, Miss Darcy, but I've had to ask you and Dr. Wilder to come outside here because, you know, you're quite right about being overheard, Wilder. Mm -hmm. One can't be sure of saying a word in that house with secrecy. But what... Our friend has just entered Cook's room with the door and the window bolted and deposited a skull on the bed rail. Cook is of a nervous temperament. But how on earth? In the same way as he got into your room last night. Yes, but... Down the chimney. Chimney. It stands to reason, doesn't it? Cook's room was locked and bolted, but Malevra got in. Of course. They are pretty big, those chimneys. Big? Why, the whole house was designed so that you could roast an ox in your bedroom. The chimneys? Well, now we can... No, we haven't enough men to go after him. There must be at least 60 fireplaces. And yet this is the time to attack. If only we can think how. Yes. My great-aunt in Montreal had the same sort of trouble. Only with her, it was owls. In the chimney? What did she do about it? Nothing. She rather liked them. Sorry. <laughs> there is one way, you know. Look, are you going to be funny? It isn't funny. I have a friend near Manchester who's an experimental chemist. He's a good fellow. He trusts me. Of course, we couldn't use a real poison gas. Gas? Yes. But we don't want to wipe out the whole of Derbyshire owing to a change of wind. Gas. That's it. We'd have to use laughing gas or tear gas, uh, something lighter than air. Can you count on this fellow? I'll ring him first thing. Good. Then that's settled. We'll smoke Malevra out. Meanwhile, it's vitally important that he shouldn't smell a rat. 
We won't mention chimneys indoors, and we must be careful not to lower our voices if we want to say something important. We just mustn't say it. We should get the gas the day after tomorrow. Anyway, we've got to do it by daylight so that if he bolts, we can pot him. You aren't really going to kill him. Yes, we are. Honestly, Miss Darcy, you and Charles don't know this man. I do. And believe me, if we don't knock him off first, Charles is as good as dead. Well, if you say so. It's our only hope. I wouldn't believe anybody else. Oh, yes, yes, quite. Well, we'll put a, a cordon round the house. I hope to God he puts up a fight. No, you've got to catch him alive. You can't kill him. But, Miss Darcy... I'd rather you murdered him for revenge or hatred or just for fun than that you should be compelled to kill him at a distance out of fear that he will kill you. Yeah, I know what you mean. So do I, but I think it's madness. Look, we'll get the gas anyway. But there's one other thing we can try first. He's been living in the chimneys for two days. He may have brought some concentrated form of food with him, but he can't have brought enough water to keep him going. Agreed? Sounds reasonable. Well, it's a hundred to one that he comes through the fireplace into one bedroom or another every night and goes through into the bathroom for a drink. I suggest that we should lay for him tomorrow night... No, tonight, rather, and then... And when we catch him, what do we do? Knock him on the head, I suppose, and turn him out into the road. And what then? Don't ask me. Go up in a yacht till he dies of old age. Oh, it's a... A wretched situation, but I think Miss Darcy's right. Thank you. We haven't enough people to watch all the bathrooms. No, we shall have to trust to luck. You, Wilder, and Smith in the kitchen. That's likely because there's food there, too. Mm -hmm. Then I'll look around. He, he can't move about indefinitely without traces of soot. I ought to be able to pick up some signs which taps he favors. Now, he can cover three. You, Wilder, and Smith, one. Yes. Two of the servants, another. And the, uh, the gamekeeper, what's his name? Uh, Roberts. Roberts and myself a third. Okay. And if he chooses the kitchen, he's going to have a headache. Roll on tonight. Sir, what is it, Roberts? Something stood in the doorway. I waited for him to come in, but he cleared again. I I've been into the other room, but there's nothing there. Are you sure? I saw him playing, his hands before him in the darkness, and his, his eyes big like an owl's. Why did he go away again? Your watch, sir. Huh? Oh, damn. Are you sure you saw him? He was a black creature in the black of night. There's, there's somebody moving about outside in the passage. Yes, Kingdom's there. Kingdom never moved like that. What is it, then? Something dragging. Hark. It stopped now. This is no kind of a game. Either you've got nerves or I'm wasting my time. Oh, kingdom. Oh, my kingdom. I knew, sir, on the door. He must have written it while we were in there. No water drinks blood. Oh, God. An old man like that. What's the matter? What's going on? Oh, God. Do we call in the police? My God, I'm going to... Charles! Wilder, ring up your friend. I want that gas by this afternoon. Tell him to make it lighter than air and lethal. Inspector Buller will be along in a moment. Right, Sir Charles. I suppose it was sudden. Kingdom, I mean. He couldn't have known what was happening. He hadn't even time to cry out. Oh, what an inhuman beast. What a devil. Oh, jeez, I don't remember a time when there wasn't Kingdom at Pemberley. Don't cry, Liz. Liz, darling. Of course we should go for him now. You haven't told the police. No, we'll do it ourselves. Oh, this would never have happened to him if it hadn't been for us. The staff's ready, Sir Charles. Right, Smith. Is everyone ready? Ah, uh, good. Quiet, everybody, please. Ah, uh, you know why I called you all together? You are all armed. We are going to close and bolt all the windows and doors, and Dr. Wilder is going to release a poison gas in the hall and the main chimney stacks. Uh, you'll be posted in a cordon round the house. If this man tries to make a bolt for it, I want you to shoot him dead. Shout if you get him, and I will finish him off if necessary. 
We are doing this for the sake of Sir Charles's safety. Uh, does everybody agree and understand? Good. Now the gamekeeper will instruct you which positions to take up. Go to it and good luck. The windows are all shut and the cylinders are in the grates. Good. There's no danger outside. It'll go straight up. I only hope nobody will elect to fly over Pemberley. <laughs> well, I'm going to start. We'll give it to us. Right. are at home, they're dead. I'd have liked to see a bolt. Me too. What do we do now? I'll go in and open the windows. Light some fires on the ground floor, get an upward draft. Right. That stuff was definitely lethal. Oh, yes. So, Molever is dead. Yeah. Still, we'd better keep up the guards for tonight, just in case. If he's dead, he can't hurt us. Ah, but we don't know that he is dead. Well, if he isn't, he must have got away before we started. Yes. And he won't come back today. Probably not. Anyway, it's ten to one he's dead. There can't be any danger tonight, and we do deserve a rest. All right, Charles, we'll risk it. Come on, Wilder's waiting. It's safe to go back. What's the matter? The Bentley's just gone out, sir. Is it all right? When? About five minutes ago, sir. Well, who was driving, did you see? I couldn't make out, sir. Which way did he go? Towards Burton. Get the other cars out. Warm them up. Right, sir. Wilder. Wilder! What is it? The Bentley's just gone out. It must be Malevra. He's got ten minutes start of us, if we hurry. Get coats, sweaters, trousers, anything warm. Right. Charles would better come. We can't leave him alone. Besides, we shall want all three cars if we're going to cover the crossroads. I'll get him. And I'll get Miss Darcy. Hurry, we've got to move. Miss Darcy. Miss Darcy. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. We're all ready. smith has got the cars out. Is Liz ready? She's not here. Not here? He's taken her with him. In the calm hand. Come on. Come on. Smith and I will take the coupe, Charles the sports car, and you take the saloon, Wilder. Okay. He's heading for Burton on Trent. At Burton, Wilder, you turn east and explore the Ashby de la Zouche Road. Right, you are. Charles, go north to Utoxeter. Right. Stop anybody you see and inquire. We'll go straight through to Litchfield. Report by phone to Pemberley whenever possible. We'll keep in touch that way. Right, Smith, I'll drive. Uh, Good luck. Litchfield, sir. Hmm, half past three. We've averaged 40. He's under three quarters of a mile ahead. Ah, I can't see him. On the hill there, sir. Ah, yes. He must have been going slow for us to caught up like this. He's going at a lick now. Must have seen us. He's turning left for Tamworth. We'll catch him between two fires. Wilder should be striking through Tamworth towards us on this road. There's Wilder's lights coming towards us. Signal with your headlights. We'll trap him between us. Damn this. It's not the Bentley. Chasing the long, ruddy car. Wilder, I've been chasing the wrong car. He must have switched off his lights and gone on to Sutton Coldfield in Birmingham. We'd best follow up. There's a choice of three roads after Birmingham. Hmm. Phone Pemberley. Leave a message for Charles to bear south and explore the Birmingham Wolverhampton Road. You make for Worcester, and we'll bear southeast for Warwick. Okay. Come 
Constable, have you seen a black Bentley saloon go this way? I beg your pardon, sir. A black saloon. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I thought you said... Never uh... mind. Have you seen it? Ooh, well, now, there's not many cars go by at this time of the morning, sir. I'm sure I'd have noticed... Did you see it? Well, sir, I can't say that I saw a black saloon, but... Uh... Thanks very much. Five to five. I'll ring Pemberley from Warwick. He says you're to come back westwards. Right. If Dr. Wilder phones again, tell him I'm taking the Oxford Worcester Road. Chipping north, sir. Average 60. We'll phone again from Broadway. says the Bentley has been sighted going through Malvern in the direction of Ross on Y. Dr. Wilder is going through Ledbury and wants you, Mr. Buller, to make for Ross through Gloucester. Thank you, Roberts. I put in seven gallons, sir. Ah, uh, thank you. You haven't by any chance seen a black Bentley saloon? Filled up here about half an hour ago. Would that be it, sir? Would it? Thanks. Which direction was it going? Monmouth, I think, sir. Thanks. Why, well, yes. There was a gentleman in not an hour ago. In one of them long motor cars. Um, it... Black. What did the gentleman look like? Oh, uh, uh, sir, a medium-sized gentleman, I think. Clean shaven? Yes. So far as I remember, he... Uh, Glasses? Oh, yes. Or in rimmed. Hmm. Which way did he go? He asked to wait the long town, to be sure. Long town? Where's that? On the lonely road to Hay on Wye and Welsh Wales. Uh, your change, sir. Keep it. Now what's wrong, Smith? Puncture. Flat as a pancake. Oh, that's dished it. Not a village within nine miles in this godforsaken country. Look at those nails on the road. Quite half a crown's worth. God, he chose a marvellous place to maroon us in. All them mountains. Yes, the Black Mountains, they call them. Oh, well, come on, I'll lend you a hand. He's led us here by the nose, sir. He must have waited for us every time he lost the scent. Would you think, sir, that he wanted to entice us away from Pemberley? Oh, yes, that's it, of course. But I suppose he thought we'd leave Sir Charles unguarded. Oh, no, he can't have been such a fool. There's something else at the back of this. What the blazes does he want with Miss Darcy? What's he done to her? God, if that so-and-so's hurt a fibre of her body, I'll wring his blasted neck till his head comes off. Yeah, yeah. Give us a hand with this tire, sir. Right. Ah. Now, then we'll... Phone up and leave messages for the others and make back for Pemberley. Nothing else we can do. No, sir. Right not. You smoking? No, no thanks, uh, Wilder. Look here, I've been thinking. Haven't we all? Well, we can't let this go on. Listen. We know how you feel about Elizabeth, but you mustn't let yourself get rushed by your feelings. Be reasonable. If Molevera meant to kill Elizabeth, he'd have killed her already. And if she's alive, then he's probably going to use her as a hostage. Swap her for me? Yes, but you... we've got to wait. See what happens. Think what he may be doing to her now. Oh, bosh. Elizabeth can look after herself. And if he is going to use Elizabeth to get at Charles, then's our chance. As soon as we hear from him, we shall know where he is and can act accordingly. At the moment, we can't do a thing. 
And you've got to face up to it. Wilder was right, of course. We couldn't move an inch because we hadn't the faintest idea where Molevera was or what he was doing. We didn't discuss it anymore. None of us felt like it. We went to bed in sad disquiet. I was far too tired to sleep. I'd almost forgotten how to. My brain was swinging in my head whilst the imagined road of last night's chase swung to left and right before my smarting eyes. I was driving a car endlessly at impossible speeds along roads which forked and turned in every direction. Must do something. Must think of something. Relax. Where's Molevera? Molevera. What's his game? game? He's got us going round in circle. Going round in circle. Charles. Charles. God, what a fool I am. This is the third night he's slept alone. I should have insisted... I wonder if he's had the sense to light a fire. Uh, better put on my jacket, take my gun, and go and see. Good Lord, his door's unlocked. A damn fool. Molevera. Inspector, I thought you were asleep. Got your revolver too, have you? Yes, damn you. Try and catch me up this chimney. All right, you devil. But first, where's Charles? Charles? Charles, are you all right? But still breathing. No wounds. Drugged. Harmlessly drugged. And he's up the chimney. I'll go after him. Coming up to me, Inspector. Watch your step. It's dark up here. If it's narrow enough, I can... Work myself up with my back against one side, and my feet against the other. Come along. Harry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Damn. I can't find the way. Where the blazes does it go? You've gone the wrong way, dear chap. But never mind. Work your way up, inch by inch, like a bat. Except that you're not very silent. I'm following. God, what's that? There's someone breathing within an arm's length of your ear, Inspector. Hear it? Take out your revolver. Quietly, quietly. Wait in your hand. Simple now to end those breaths forever. Why don't you? End them forever. Fire! Elizabeth, you're alive. Elizabeth, you're oh, alive! Inspector Buller... Inspector Buller, are you conscious? Are you conscious, Inspector Buller? Are you conscious, Inspector Buller? I hit you with your own revolver. Are you in great pain, Inspector? Oh, don't try to move. I've tied your hands quite firmly behind your back. Your ankles, too. And I've got your revolver now. <sighs> I must apologize for all the suffering. Really, it's against my nature. Swine. Oh, really, Inspector. And I've been so looking forward to this quiet chat. Rather cosy in the dark like this, don't you think? Hearing you talk over my affairs in the various rooms of this fine house, I've longed to correct your theories, and you've probably danced on my strings long enough to wish to know how they were pulled. Eh? <laughs> I couldn't listen. There was a violent pain at the back of my head where he'd hit me with the butt of my own revolver. Besides, he made me feel sick. The vanity of the man, parading his twisted little mind, drunk with his own cleverness. But he insisted on telling me the whole story, every detail. He had to. We murderers seek our fame, he said. Yet fame for us must be anonymous. Ah. He reminded me of a gloating and eager spider. Evil. Because you were quite a promising pupil. I arrived here on the night of Sir Charles's visit to Cambridge, fully equipped, 
My black chimney clothes, charming, don't you think? But of course you can see them. And a pair of white gloves, so that I could see when, where, and if I was getting dirty. Dirty people leave traces, you know. Fortunately, our hostess had only just swept her chimneys, so it was easier than I anticipated. However, I was most careful. Whenever I left a chimney for a room, I used to brush myself in the grate with this soft clothes brush. <laughs> I was doing that when I sat for some time with a kitchen grate between your friends Wilder and the chauffeur. I flatter myself that I didn't leave many traces. I also brought ropes and a gas mask. You might have given me credit for that much sense. After all, in a chimney, one is usually in contact with the fumes of coal gas, at least. Whether I wanted to listen or not, I had to. He meant me to know that he was clever, and in his way, I suppose he was. But to what purpose? I suppose I was justifiably annoyed to think that he'd kept one step ahead of me. I ought to have been sorry for him, but I couldn't be. He went over all the ground again, pointing out with glee where I had miscalculated, how I had failed in the battle of wits between us, and ascribing any inadequacies on his part to bad luck, as he had done the fingerprints on the gramophone and the student in the opposite room. The little affair of the skull was unfortunate, of course. Bad luck again. The cook woke up just as I was putting my skull on the bed rail, and I had to leave in a hurry. I hadn't time to unlock the door. Unfortunately, because since the door and window were locked, you were forced to the conclusion that I must have entered by the fireplace. And so the next night you tried to trap me at my drink, and I was compelled to give you a warning lesson. And the next day, oh, your amusing gas attack, I slept through it with the greatest comfort. You thought that I was either gassed or gone. I was neither. And it was delightfully easy for me to steal into the room of the sweet Miss Darcy here, treat her with an innocuous drug and bring her up here. She's been here all the time. That's why I led you that dance to Wales, of course. But I had to get you out of the house. I really couldn't have had you poking about in these chimneys today. Highly successful journey, I may say, though I had the greatest difficulty in keeping you on my track. But now to business. Sir Charles, now I have to dispose of him, you know. Tonight, mm, I have to. Murder him. The knife, I think. He's lying innocuously drugged, waiting for it. But first, you and your lady, my mannequin. What are you going to do with her? Oh, not with her alone, Inspector. I have a treat in store for you both. Do you remember asking if there were any ghosts in Bemberley? What of it? The answer is no. The dead Darcy's press very little upon the house. We shall see now whether the mysteries of Pemberley may not be increased by a little, or whether the memory of me, her only genius, may not be kept green by succeeding generations. I should like the story of a lover and his lass to add amongst the others. What are you going to do? Listen, Buddha, I get to carry you down now, one at a time, and hang you both in the kitchen chimney. Not so as to strangle you, you know. There's a convenient ledge where I can trust you. The cook will light the kitchen fire, I suppose, the time before the household rises. I don't suppose the fire itself will burn you, though it is a large fire and a large grate, and it may roast you very uncomfortably. Your deaths, I should say, would take place within the hour and from suffocation. If they search the chimneys when Charles's body has been found, they ought to find you dead. On the other hand, they may never search the chimneys after all. They will have no reason to think that Buller is up a chimney. In whatever case, I'm quite content. Miss Darcy will have the satisfaction of dying in her own home, surrounded by her own servants. They'll be within a few yards of you, searching for you, of going about their business. And if you were not to be gagged, how easily you could call out. If you were not bound, how few steps would take you to safety. And I shall have the poetical stimulus of reflecting upon the glam's legend of Pemberley and of thinking of the old sooty bones wedged safely but forgotten in the bosom of this lovely house. He'd finished. He'd said his little piece, held the limelight for an hour. There was no applause, but he didn't need it. I think he even liked me, in a way. I was his public, the follower of his meteoric career. He meant to pour into my brain the full realization of every situation, and then, with the casket full, the safe stock to the last shelf, to insert his key and lock it. I was to be a treasure house for him. The dead brain, like a gramophone record without the machine to play it, retaining its impressions in an eternal secrecy. I can't think why, but I have a feeling of affection for you, Inspector. I shall save you till the last. 
He was busying himself for his task, bringing in ropes, working out his communications, spinning his web. To get us to the kitchen chimney meant taking us up the main shaft onto the roof, the kitchen being on the opposite corner of the house. He would have to drag us along the sharp edge of the V-shaped roof and lower us down a fresh stack. He was more like a spider than ever, scuttling to and fro. I waited for him to finish, rubbing my hands behind my back to keep the circulation. That's that. I shall take Miss Darcy to the kitchen first, and then pay my final visit to Sir Charles. Then I can come back to you and tell you all the news, whilst we're on our way. Charles's last moments, you know. How he enjoyed them. My little mausoleum, my house of fame, my finished gramophone record would be stocked up to the last moment in that case. Yes, that is what I shall do. And after that, I shall really have to be going. And now, ladies first, day. Eh? You will excuse me, Inspector. That's what I was waiting for. For all his cleverness, Morlevera was no expert in tying a rope. Somehow I had to intercept him before he could get to Charles, and surprise was the only weapon I had. After all, he'd got my gun. I worked myself up towards the sky. The stars were out, and the tang of the wind before dawn freshened me as I rose above the chimney. I rised out onto the roof and curled myself behind the brickwork and waited. Not for long. Morlevera came towards the chimney chuckling and put his hands on the ledge. I rose to my full height and we were face to face. You! you got your Oh, work. no, you don't. You won't get me. Give me the gun. Give me that gun. I'll teach you. Oh, damn you. No, you don't. Right. Take your gun. Goodbye. No for Miss Darcy. No, you don't. And I've got the gun now. <laughs> Damn. Missed him again. <laughs> got him. By God, I got him. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. God, I must get to her. Darcy. Darcy. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thank God. Just, just a minute. I'll take out the gag. There. Oh, darling. No, no, it's all right, darling. It's all right. He's dead. Charles. It's, it's all right. He's all right. Everything's all right. Now, look, let me help you. This way. There's nothing more to worry about. It's over. It's all over. Whenever he's dead. Oh, thank God, darling. Thank God. It's all over. All over, including the shouting. A happy ending, of course. Happy for all of us, as it turned out. Charles, rid at last of the brooding melancholy which had hung over him for so long. Wilder, once more a general practitioner, smiling sardonically over the coughs and bruises of Cambridge. And Elizabeth and I... Well... Take the right fork. Right. You know, I've wanted to know one thing very much. Yes? How on earth did you get yourself undone in that chimney? <laughs> I did rather swindle, I'm afraid. Well, left here. Uh-huh. I've always been incurably romantic, you know. I used to read detective stories far too much, and the hero always gets tied up at one time or another. And it occurred to me that all heroes ought to have a little pocket in the jackets of all their suits, in the lining at the back, in which they could conceal pen knives. Oh, you mean to say you had that? Yeah, ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the lucky thing was, I put on my jacket when I went after Charles. If I'd worn my dressing gown, we'd have been done. I think it all sounds very improbable. Left. Uh-huh. Yes, it does, doesn't it? This does... Uh, Elizabeth? Yes? Wouldn't it... Wouldn't it be marvellous if we could get married? Or something? Well, I'd rather be married. Liz! Wouldn't you? Liz, I... Look out! <laughs> <sighs> Do you know, 
darling. I don't even know your Christian name. No, I know Liz, but, well, you see... What is it? It's, um, Leonidas Jeremiah. Oh. I shall call you Buller. That was Darkness at Pemberley by T.H. White, adapted by Donald McWinney from the novel of the same name. The part of Malevera was played by Marius Goring, Inspector Buller by Bruce de Mason. Sir Charles Darcy by Peter Howell, Elizabeth Darcy by Susan Edmonston, Dr. Wilder by John Sharp, and Kingdom by Rolf Lefebvre. A Cambridge landlady was played by Betty Huntley Wright, a cook by Diana Olson, and a shopkeeper by Bonnie Harrow. The Sergeant and Smith by David Sinclair, Constable Walters and a garage man by William Slay, the Master of the College and Roberts by Vernon Joyner, a student and another constable by Neville Jason. The play was arranged for stereo and produced by Raymond Rakes. And their production of Darkness at Pembley will be broadcast again on Radio 4 on Monday afternoon beginning at five past three when once again can be heard in stereo.